What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK, live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Tuesday, March 26th, 20 and 24, and the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours. On today's show, the latest updates from Texas football spring practice, plus Texas baseball returns tonight and to the Longhorns improve on the hardwood in 2024-25. We've got the latest with Shohei Otani as that wild gambling story continues around Major League Baseball. We've got the latest from Dallas Cowboys head coach Mike McCarthy. What did he have to say about the Cowboys' lack of free agency spending this offseason? We've got another sports gambling story to get into. One of the world's most popular celebrities is on the run and, well, a hell of a lot more. We are jam-packed with sports, life, pop culture, and entertainment over the next couple of hours. What's going on this morning, Buck? It's a beautiful, beautiful day here in Dripping Springs, Texas, USA, America. Just beautiful. A uh, little cool, a little cool, but that's okay. Keeping the lettuce that folks that are still out there are doing a little bit of lettuce, keeping that going. But I spent yesterday in the garden, BK, about two hours of moving stuff. And I'll give a quick shout out to Relax the Back. Thank you so much for this office chair because my back is humming. I mean, it, you can you can feel the swelling in my thoracic area where I had surgery years and years ago. I overdid it for the last three days. I just had to. I wanted to get stuff in before I left town next week, and I wanted to get my, my garden going. But my peppers are in. The tomatoes are in. Squash is in. Hey, I got it. I got it. Rosemary. I got everything. Rosemary's baby. I got everything in my garden. You know, I'm getting it all done. So it's all in their raised beds. Uh, so it's just a matter now of let's grow. Let's grow. I don't need any rain anytime soon. I watered that damn thing. I forgot I left the damn water on for about an hour and a half yesterday. So they're probably the roots are probably all screwed up and wet, but it's drying up around. It's going to be drying up the next couple of days. Should be a nice day today. Just about 70 degrees. Because you can feel it out there. You can feel a little chill, but thank you. Thank you so much to relax the back. I'm doing great, feeling great. Like I said, I can't wait to can my own stuff. This is going to be funny. The first thing of tomatoes that I can, you know what they're going to taste like? Shit, probably. I mean, it's, I'm, it's going to be it's going to be my shit, though. That's what I'm going to like. It's going to be mine. Oh, you're going to eat cans of your own shit? If I have to, yes. Oh. We'll see how that works out. But uh, I have, you know, I've got two plots in my in my 15 by 15. And I gave my wife a separate garden because, of course, I can't have her stuff mixed with my stuff. It just can't be that way. She has to have her own. You know, she doesn't like bell peppers. She likes the she likes the red peppers, the sweet ones. I like the green ones and the yellow ones. So I had to make her a separate garden over to the side of mine. So this is not un a united garden whatsoever she she's doing her own gardening yeah well she's not i mean i've started but she always says well you know you have to take care of a garden which means she'll be out there taking care of her little plot because she will not want mine mine will be overcrowded like everything else like you know too many shirts too many golf shirts too much shit in the ad it, it's the same thing mm. inside and outside you know yeah well, there you go so are you going to sell any of the things that you're no. growing no 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 Doc Trey will get some things, but you guys don't want any tomatoes and peppers. Wags will pretend that he wants that stuff. His wife will eat it, but he's not eating it. Maybe mm -hmm. Rodney will have that stuff. And God forbid Jeff Howe eating anything with green peppers in it. Oh. That dude, if it's not the cow from next door, he probably don't want it. God, what a shot of Jeff Howe to start off a Tuesday. Why boy. not? Let's get them all today. Goodness Come gracious. On. Hey, good morning to the soldiers at Fort Cabasas, Texas, the soldiers in the state of Texas, and all those that fight for us each and every day. Thank you so very much for what you do. We do appreciate it each and every day to you and your families. Uh, be safe out there. Well, let's just get this out of the way. You know, I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Greensboro, North Carolina, to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where I learned how to play, of course. I learned how to play pinball as a kid growing up in uh, North Carolina. But then moved on to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where I was, you know, I I, I knew I, I used to go hang out at the, it was almost like um, the pharmacy 
they had the pinball machines, but they also had, you know, they had food there. They would serve grilled cheese, French fries, a little pickle on the side, but they had all the machines. And then they did Philly cheesesteaks. Now I grew up in a time where a, a Philly cheesesteak was probably about a buck and a half for, for a really good cheesesteak. Like and then, a bite of a Philly cheesesteak? No, no, a Philly cheesesteak itself. A nice size, great bun, special sauce on the top of it. But I also grew up in the time of hoagies. That's what they called them in Pennsylvania. They weren't subs, they were called hoagies. Sure. And, you know, we got a lot of sub, sub places around here. Uh, but I, 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 one of the, I, I encountered one the other day that in my lifetime, I thought I'd never see it. Well, I should have grown to be so old, as old as I am. I thought someday, you know, from a buck, now a buck and a, I've, I've had a, a hoagie for a dollar and a quarter, a full size hoagie at a dollar and a quarter. And this was with chips because a bag of chips in was like 15 cents for a bag of chips. Dude, I went to a place in Oak Hill. I'm not going to say the name of the place. And we we are at the point of my life now that it was the most ridiculous amount of money for a full-size sub. And I went with it. I bought into it. I bought a classic Italian sub at a place in Oak Hill, down in your area, by your McDonald's, you know, by my gyms, right there with Golden Chick. They cost $22. A large Italian was $22 with one bag of chips. I damn near hit the floor. I was like, I'm like, is a, does, does a Philly cheesesteak come with that? With that classic Italian? No. A full size. Now, it was nice. It was a nice size. It was thick. It had some meat in there, a good amount of meat in there. But I, I never thought I would get to the time where a hoagie cost $22. One bag of chips, no drink. I was like. I'm like, I, I, I'm like, maybe I should take my wife to dinner there. And I should take her on a date there. Yeah. Dollars. I mean, I was like, in, I was like standing there just staring. Like I kept looking up back up and forth up at the board. I'm like, am I missing something here? At yeah. So I brought it home and it was a nice size because I could only eat a half of it. You know, right. so I left the other half in the refrigerator for three days. And then after about three days, if it's in my refrigerator, it gets tossed away. My wife is like, are you going to eat the other $11 here? I was about to say, you better eat the other half to make it worth it. I froze it and getting ready. To, I'm going to take the meat out, out of the, once it thaws out. I'll take the meat out and give it to that crazy ass dog. <laughs> I can't even throw it away. This is something I couldn't throw away because it's like taking, go ahead and buy yourself a $30 steak and then two days later, throw it out. I mean, $22 for a, a sandwich? Where are you getting a $30 steak these days? Well, I mean, are you can go get them and make them yourself. You're not going out to eat and get a $30 steak. You know, you're allowed to make your own steaks, but you know, I, I mean, I don't throw those away, but I'm looking at this and I'm going, BK, I couldn't believe that. That's the world we live in your now, pops, man. Your mom and dad would know about uh, a, a sub sandwich for two bucks or one fifty or something. We're at $22 for a large 22 effing dollars. I'm not talking about for, I'm not talking about, you know, a big bag of chips and four sodas to go with it. Now I, now I got you. I mean, there's no movie with this. You don't go to even get to go to the movies. No drink, no drink, just chips. Mm. That's 20, the world we live in now, man. $22. I know. I feel like I've paid I'm around cheap. that. I'm not cheap. I just looked, I went, I took like a double take when the guy, and there were people in there buying that shit, man. They were buying that a Philly cheesesteak. I used to get a Philly cheesesteak. For a buck fifty, great Philly cheesesteak, good sauce on it, a great bun, cheese on the top of that thing, baby. Oh, it was. Man. I'm talking about a damn hoagie. Throw some lettuce and some provolone and some mixed meats in there. Hell, they don't even put below this. And back in the day, it was not just your classic meats, dude. They used to throw bologna in there. You used to get bologna in your in your Philly. I mean, it wasn't you know, bologna in a Philly cheesesteak. Oh, you kidding me? I grew oh, up eating wow. bologna like nobody's business. Bologna sandwiches with mustard. Oh. Well, that's fine if it's outside of the Philly cheesesteak. If you're getting a bologna sandwich, that's no, one not thing. in the Philly cheese, but in the Italian. Oh, but the other meats, they used to throw bologna in there. You Dude, think that, that sounds steep, doesn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, a dollar fifty for a big sandwich sounds like the greatest deal of all time. Yeah, those were the greatest deal when I was a teenager. Hell yeah, it was a great deal. Uh, give me a DeLorean and take me back in time for that kind of price. Oh, My goodness. Delicious. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when the uh, five dollar foot long at Subway actually cost five bucks. And that I was it, got- right? You mean you got you get some chips with that? Oh, man, just- remember that advertising campaign at Subway for years? It was five dollar foot longs, right? They had the whole jingle and the dance moves sure. and everything. It was Jardians before Jardians. Yes. Now, now you sure. go into Subway, you try to get a foot long sub, and you're paying at least twice that. I mean, they got sandwiches at Subway with that rubber bread. That'll run you like 12 or 13 bucks oh my for, God. for a foot long sub. Yeah, that used to be the cheap spot for me you know, when I was growing up. And now, yeah, you're paying more than double what you used to have to pay for those. Oh, my God. I walked in there. I, next time I go in that place, I'm going to have my hands up. Because, hey, you're robbing. Yeah, go ahead. Take it. Take, take my wallet. wallet. Take my phone. Take everything I've got. And so you've yeah. been in that, you've been in that place, you know, where you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that place is great. I won't say anything bad about it. And the, and the thing is like, that place is not alone. That's just the economy right now. That's inflation. I mean, you go to, you go to a place like Jersey Mike's, right? Yeah. Large national chain that, uh, chain, uh, chain that used to be pretty affordable. You and now, if, you're, large- yeah, if you're getting a large sub at Jersey Mike's, you're paying like 16, 17, 18 bucks. What? Yeah. That's like without the chips. And now all of a sudden a bag of chips is like two or three dollars. A bag of Doritos, a little plain Lay's chips, a little onion chips. That's yeah. Things are like two or three bucks now. They probably get them for like 10 cents and they upcharge them to two or three dollars a bag. Oh, yeah. General for 12 cents. It's the world we live in, man. I don't know. Am I supposed to blame Obama? Am I blaming Trump? Am I blaming Biden? Am I blaming FDR, I don't know who to pin this on, but that's Somebody's getting uh, rich. That's where we're at right those. now. So Buck is now growing his own now. I'm gonna I'm gonna eat smart. I can't do anything because I because I can't eat the cows from next door. Nobody's offered me any cow meat next door. I've mm-hmm. all been offered a turkey, but they got I see the hay out there in the rain molding. So the cows are probably eating that shit. That can't be good for you. If you're a farmer, I thought the hay was supposed to be hay's in the barn. That's where hay belongs, not big big rolls of hay out in the rain. That can't be good. That stuff will get moldy. And those cows, I don't know if they can eat. Maybe a cow can eat that. Maybe horses are the ones that can't. A goat can eat anything. Them goats don't give a shit. (laughs) And them chickens, they'll eat anything. But I know cows cows don't want moldy hay. That's the term. Hay is in the barn. That's where it belongs. Not sitting out there in big rolls in the rain. Hay's in the barn. Yeah. I live next next to the Farmingtons, so – you better you better start offing those cows to get you some cheap meat because I think we've talked about it on this show. If not, I know I've talked about it with Trey on the midday show from twelve to one. I think you go to McDonald's now, and I don't think it's McDonald's here because the economy in Texas is better than the economy in a number of other states in the uh-huh. union. But you can get like a Big Mac combo meal at McDonald's for like seventeen dollars now, and there are places that are literally charging that much for a fast food combo meal. I mean, you used to be able to pay four, five, six dollars for one of those deals. And now we're talking upwards of 15 for McDonald's. Like, what do you, I love McDonald's. What are you doing going to McDonald's if you're paying more than $15 for your meal? It's absurd. It's supposed to be for the whole family. The old man used to to go to, to Burger King and buy the whole family of eight of us. No, there was an eight at that time. There were six of us at that time. Dude, he'd get out of there with like fifteen dollars for everybody, burgers, shakes, the whole works. That was that yeah. once a month where he'd take us, sit us in that in the station wagon, eat in the car, not at the, at the house, not in. Oh, we're not definitely not getting out of the car and going inside of Burger King. That's when they used to say, "Get your food in a minute, sixty seconds, fast food." Which, yeah. you know, now people are pulling guns out on people in the fast food lanes. I mean, yeah. it's just, I'm like. I mean, my old man could feed the whole gang of us. Now I'm paying twenty-two dollars for a sub. This, this a is us sub. this morning. This is both of us this morning. Old man yelling at clouds. That's where we are right now. <laughs> like I'm yeah. on South Congress Street yelling at the high rises. I mean, it used to be a challenge to go to Taco Bell and spend twenty dollars. Like that was a bit when I was growing up. It's like, can you eat twenty dollars worth of Taco Bell in one sitting? 
And now it's a challenge to spend less than 20 bucks at Taco Bell. It's ridiculous. That's like four things there now. Used to be like 10 to 15 things and at then, Taco Bell for that price. And now it's like, hey, three three or four out, things. You know, there you go. Because I wasn't a chicken guy. I, I got somebody got to tell us back in the day when they used to go to the Colonel and get a bucket of chicken, what did a bucket of chicken cost? What does a bucket of chicken cost now? $50? You go to Popeye's and get a bucket, it's what is it, 50 bucks? Yeah, Screw yeah. that. I'm going to Jack Allen's. I was going to have my meals there if I'm to do this deal. As well. Uh, the prices at Jack Allen's are very reasonable. You can get off there for, well, hold on, phrasing. You can have a much better meal there for like the same cost as it will cost you to go to a fast food joint in 2020. Yeah. yeah it's, and I'm not, I'm not bitching. I'm just saying it's just it's so noticeable. I mean, that hit me out. But then again, it's not noticeable enough because a bunch of you people have been doing that because you go to places like that. And bring that and eat that sub for twenty two dollars. So you've been doing it for a while. That didn't just jump on the board. I don't believe, you know, no. the day that I went in. So it's it's crazy. But you're right. There's a guy Steven says it's <laughs> a blended six percent increase on fast food prices. Thank you very much for that, Steve Patterson. Thank you. No kidding. Patterson did it to us. Oh my gosh! All right, Dakota text line is open five one two 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 two. 9328. The YouTube comment line is obviously alive this morning as well. And hey, we want to help the people. All right. We know prices are through the roof right, right now. We want to give you all some free food. And thanks to our friends at Cabo Bob's, we've got some free food to give to you this morning. Another $50 gift card giveaway for Cabo Bob's. Yesterday, we gave a $50 gift card away for the Texas baseball team. Today, we're giving away a $50 gift card on behalf of the Texas softball team who swept UCF on the road over the weekend as we continue our partnership with Cabo Bob's. We were giving away stuff during football season last fall, and now they are hooking us up with more giveaways here in the spring. So if you want to be entered into our $50 Cabo Bob's gift card giveaway this morning, it's very easy. All you have to do is text the code of text line or leave a YouTube comment at any point between now and 10 o'clock. We'll bring out the randomizer. Whoa. Randomizer. It's already starting to work, starting to move already. I don't know what just happened there. We'll bring out the randomizer at some point between now and the end of today's show. And uh, yeah, someone is going to be walking away with that $50 gift card and some free food on us and on our yes. friends at Cabo Bob's. Yeah. We'll be having a bunch of that stuff come up. I got, you know, obviously for the mullet open next month and, Folks are starting to get me some stuff. So our, our, our friends over at Hat Creek Burger will be giving away some stuff. Also, I've got golf for two out at Lake Cliff. You know, Lake Cliff's going to, you know, they'll have their summer program with the kids out there. So maybe dad wants to go out there with a buddy and check out where maybe his kid would like to go to summer camp, which you should. If your kid hasn't gotten into golf, if you're going to be like BK and don't take lessons, then you're going to be just hitting the ball like BK too. If you refuse to do that, but they give great lessons out there. And it's, it's a wonderful spot out at Lake Cliff, out um, Spicewood, out in the Spicewood area. So they have got they gave me last time I was out there golf for two to, for the randomizer to shake it up too. So ready, we'll be ready to give that away too. Anytime the randomizer starts to to thump and thump and bump, I've got that here okay. for someone special that would like to go out and play some golf out there. I like that. We're almost go stay with your wife. Take your wife for a – yeah, yeah. Take your girl out on a – no – Take them bowling. How's Take that? Bo oh, oh, because women aren't allowed to golf. I didn't say that. There are plenty of women out there golfing. They're allowed to do anything they want, but they should possibly take up not playing that game. There's other sports out there for women to do. It feels like you're insinuating that women should not be golfing. There's pickleball. Remember that sport that's taken the world by surprise now? Women can pick, they can pickle all day long. You know, yeah, yeah men can play pickleball too. Men play pickleball. Women can golf. Yeah, I men can play ball. pickle. Women can play pickle. Men can golf. Women can golf. Men can bowl. Women can bowl. That's why they make Saturdays and Sundays at the golf courses. Oh, that's for the women. That's a good time for them to do it. But <laughs> leave the weekdays for the men. We've got business to conduct out here. Yeah, that's business. Business being done on the golf courses during the week. Mm. Uh, I don't know who. I don't know who. Does the cooking, but somebody who's cooking in the weekend? Goodness, I mean, somebody's got to cook, right? I guess. But there's there's tons of ladies that play on the weekends. 
You could just go out and spend twenty two dollars on a sub instead. Oh, no kidding. No shit. Oh my uh, god. Go spend a bunch of money on the golf course and then go pay twenty two bucks for a sandwich and a bag of chips and you're set. Goodness you know, I, it was very tasty, but never going back. God, yeah, 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 yeah. And and keep the women in the pro shop cooking at the <laughs> golf course. Did I, did I truly say that? You, you might as well have said that. I don't Come know on. if you actually said that, but you got very close. Got kind of close there. All right. Uh, shout out to all of our great sponsors. We gave some love to Relax the Back. Just gave oh, some yeah. love to Cabo Bob. Some love to our friends now at 7-Eleven. Uh, one of our great sponsors here on TSU. I don't need us to tell you what they've got at 7-Eleven because you know what they've got at 7-Eleven because you've been going there for years just like we've been going there for years. And, you know, they've got great food. They've got those sandwiches. They've got the pizza. They've got the wings. They've got the rollers. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to pay $22 for anything in that store. Uh, they've got it all at 7 Yes, they do. And I had myself little Debbie's from there yesterday. Yeah, that's right. Oh, come I on, broke the dude. Chain. I broke the chain. My wife doesn't know. That little Debbie's tastes so good. But I did have a nice, I had a bottle of water. They didn't have Olipop where I went yesterday. But guess what? I had a nice bottle of water with that little Debbie's to wash it down. No, I did not have, I did not go to McDonald's and have a McFlurry. Just a bottle of water with that. Mm. How about our guy, Tom McKay, speaking of wonderful people. He said, let's make the mullet open grand prize really big this year. They are going to need to bring a pickup, it'll start at a 98 inch TV with all the fixings, with all the extras for the grand 98 problem. inches. Yes. Wow. And I know 98 inches. Let me tell you 98 inch big screen TV with all the extras from Tom McKay for the 23rd oh. annual mullet open grand prize this year. Oh my gosh. I didn't know they made TVs that big. Trey Allen, you will not be getting it. That rabbit will not be coming out of the hat for you. Holy crap. Yeah, wow. You're not rigging that one. That's going to be an authentic. What do you mean rigging? Who are you talking about? What did you say the word rig? That's not. Hey, don't make me go Kim Mulkey. Where's my lawyer at? You know, <laughs> I got the greatest lawyer. I got the greatest lawyer in group. Hey, just in case you were, you're trying to insinuate something. I didn't say you were rigging anything. I'm just making sure you're not rigging that one. I hope you oh. don't rig any of the giveaways at the mullet open. Why, what? Why'd, you, why'd you get so defensive there? Mulkey. I'm <laughs> just, just trying to, Hey, it's about the team. It's about the kids. What are you talking about? About the kids. It's always about the kids. Yes, it is. Make sure you remember that. Except for when I got that sandwich the other day. It was about me. Mm. And, hey, you could buy raffle tickets to the Mullet Open even if you don't play in the Mullet Open, right? That's true. Yeah, we invite people to come out and have that great dinner. Yeah, they've got that great Thank silent you know. auction oh, yeah. every year. That's uh, Anybody can stop by Lost Pines and sign up for one of those prizes. And then, yeah, Louis Miller the barbecue room. dinner. Man. They're coming yeah. again. He's 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 footing the bill for that again. Speaking of guys that don't give a rat's ass, Wayne Miller loves coming out there and doing that. He does that for a night stay. That's that's all he gets out of the mullet open. Um, but a chance to feed all the people. And they, his food is fantastic, man. You do a great job throwing that every single year. And there are a bunch of folks around Central Texas who uh, contribute a lot. They it just shows. Come from Dallas. They come yeah. from everywhere. Just shows shows the gratitude of uh, of you, but also tons of folks, including Tom McKay, including Wayne Miller and the whole team. Uh, Top everybody, gun. Brandon Top just gun. said, "What do you need? What do you need? You got to have something." Yeah, it's got to cool saw see. something down. Yeah, always, 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 always. So, uh, really excited for the Mold Open coming up at the start of May. I know you've been working hard behind the scenes to get everything rolling for that. And major shout out to our man Tom McKay at Audio Visual wow. Consultations for that awesome donation. Uh, we'll give Tom extra love this morning. Make sure y'all give Tom a call, 512-255-8678. If you don't win that prize, you got to make the call to AV Consultations wow. to get the home TV setup of your dreams. You can get the multi-screen setup like I've got behind me. You can get the 85-incher that Buck has at his place. You can get that home theater room. You can get really anything, TV, audio, home security, lighting, you name it. It's all there for you, and they install it perfectly, and they make it super easy to use. Our man Tom McKay, just give him a call, 512-255-8678, or go online to avconsultations.com. All right. We got to get into this Shohei Otani story, Buck. We, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but we spent so much time talking, you know, NCAA tournament and Texas basketball and 
just kind of got lost in the shuffle. But obviously, one of the biggest, if not the biggest stories in sports right now involves maybe the biggest star in sports right now, new L.A. Dodger Shohei Otani, who, of course, signed that mammoth free agent contract with the Dodgers a couple of months ago. Well, he's in some hot water. I think everybody knows at this point uh, what's going on with Shohei. Yesterday, he and a new interpreter spoke to a group of assembled media in Los Angeles. It was a prepared statement that Shohei Otani read. There were no questions asked by the media, uh, but Shohei spoke, you know, Shohei and his interpreter combined, I should say, spoke for almost 12 minutes. So I was expecting, hey, maybe one to two minutes, maybe a couple of lines, and then he'd be out of there. But he spoke for about 12 minutes yesterday in Los Angeles. We don't have the whole thing, but here's just a little bit of Shohei Otani and then his interpreter explaining kind of what's going on with him and the whole gambling investigation right now. え、まず初めにえ、僕自身はえ、何かにかけたりとか、え、誰かに代わってえ、そのスポーツイベントにかけたりとか、え、それをまた頼んだりえ、っていうことはないですし、え、まあ、僕の口座から僕メカに対して、
but obviously the money handed out to players back then isn't the same as money being handed out to players right now. But those guys weren't hurting for cash, and yet they couldn't they couldn't stop it, right? Phil Mickelson, that guy wasn't hurting for cash. And we've heard stories about all of the gambling that he's done outside of golf. So, you know, everyone's – Buck, you, you know this better than I do, man. Everyone's got their vices. Everyone's yeah. got – you know, it, it, it can seem from the outside that your life is perfect and you've got it made. And sure. why would you do something like this? But I'm not, you know, I don't know. I don't know if Shohei did this. He might be telling the truth, but something about this is fishy. Like, even if Shohei didn't place any of those bets, Buck, there is no way, there is no way Shohei didn't know this was going on. Like, it is, you talk about wire transfers and you're talking about transfers of $500,000 or more at a time. It's not easy to do that. Like you've got to go through a number of channels to transfer that type of money. You got to go through the guy with the money in order. Exactly. To do like that. you can't. You can't. I can't wire transfer money from your account today, even though like you're like one of my best friends and you're my brother and we work together. Like I can't. I can't just steal money from your account like that without you knowing about it. So unless Shohei, like, just I, I don't know. He signed off the rights to his. I, I believe. Account. I believe he signed off that he knew his buddy had an addiction. And he was willing to pay. Yeah, he was willing to. He was willing to pay for this for this guy to do this. But I mean, it must have got to the point of, hey, first you told me this thing was a million dollars, then I find out it's four million dollars, or then I find out it's two million dollars. Next thing I know, I'm missing four million dollars because I gave you the okay to do it one time or two times. Now you've gone into my accounts yeah. because you know people know that you know me and that we're close and that you're my interpreter. And now you're, you're now you're actually stealing money from me. You're not. I'm not helping you pay for something that you did. You're actually stealing my money now. Right. I, I got. He knew about certain parts of this guy's betting when it was, when it was not into the four million dollars. It may, you know it may have been to the hundred thousands of dollars, but not into the millions. I got to believe this was this was the guy actually having ways to get into his money and steal it after he's after he's done it a couple times. He's able then to take out as much as he wanted. And people are saying, well, Shohei knows he did it. Shohei, get, Shohei gave us the okay when it was $200,000 or when it was four hundred, when it was a million and a half. So yeah, he's cool with another million. It's not going to bother him. He's got it. But I, yeah. I can't believe he, he knew in the beginning this guy was, you know, that he was paying for this guy's gambling addiction. But I guarantee you when it got into the $4 million, now it became stealing, you know? I mean, the, yeah, I, believe he knows, I believe he knew about some of it. You don't, you don't, you're an interpreter. You're one of your best friends. You don't not know about that. Right. I mean, the biggest red flag of this whole deal is that there's not a bookie in the world that would let someone making $85,000 a year. That's the listed salary for Shohei's former interpreter, this ePay guy. He's making $85,000 a year. There's not a bookie in the world that would let somebody with that salary get into four and a half million dollars of debt. No. Like no. the only reason that that debt was allowed to accumulate the way that it did was because the bookie knew that Shohei Otani or somebody like such as, in the words sure. of Miss in South Carolina, was going to be able to foot the bill. Yes. That's, that, that's the only way any reasonable bookie, and hell, I'll take out the word reasonable, any bookie would be willing to let that kind of debt pile up for a guy making that little. So, yes. yeah, I mean, th there are two options here. The first one is... Shohei was doing the gambling and he pays the fall guy, which I don't believe. The second option is what you just said, right? Like the, the e pay was doing the gambling and because Shohei's his boy, he was willing to, to foot the bill and pay off some of his debts. And unfortunately they got caught. So e pay had to take the fall. And this is the stance that Shohei has taken to try to preserve his public image and to try to preserve getting in trouble with major league baseball, with uh, the feds, with everybody. Cause like uh, this, this is illegal stuff. That's going on here. So yeah, four million dollars. The feds want to know how much are they getting, and if they're getting nothing, now they're pissed. Yeah, 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 yeah. And God, I hope like this. This is weird, right? Like Shohei, I think is already getting superstar treatment because if this just happened to Joe Schmo on some random major league baseball team, then I think that guy would have already been suspended until the investigation's over, right? Like Shohei's getting the treatment of oh man, like we'll we'll, we'll wait and see the facts before we do anything here. But man, it, it'd be I mean, are so you bad. To, are you allowed? I mean, if you're not doing the gambling yourself, are you allowed to pay a friend's gambling debt if you're a uh, a a star athlete? What I mean, it's your money. I mean, if you're not making the bets yourself, 
but you're helping out a, a, a friend, like an interpreter that you've known forever, that you've brought with you, you know, that interprets everything you do, everything you say, he's with you everywhere he goes. That's your, that's your best friend. That's your guy. I mean, if he has a, 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 an addiction to gambling and you can afford it and you've done it for him before, but now it's gotten to the point where he can get into your own accounts. I mean, are you allowed to do that? Or do you just have to, I mean, that's what I don't know about major league about sports. I mean, if he's your friend, maybe you're, you are allowed to pay for that. You're not, if you're not doing it, why can't you make the payments? I don't know. Obviously, if he's made the payments. Yeah, I don't know if there are rules in the MLB rule book that are against this. I don't know if there are any rules about this at all, because I don't, I don't know if we've had a situation like this. I mean, obviously, everyone keeps bringing up Pete Rose. And, oh, by the way, did you hear what Pete Rose had to say in response to this story? Let Otani free? No. No, the exact opposite. Here's uh, Pete Rose. This is some video that was posted to the internet. I think yesterday, Pete Rose giving a brief comment about this whole Shohei situation. Well, back in the 70s and 80s, I wish I'd have had an interpreter. I'd be (laughs) scot-free. You still need one, Pete. Oh, my God. Yeah, Pete Rose, of course, banned from baseball because of allegations and not really allegations. It was proven no. that he was gambling on baseball back when he was playing for the Reds. Uh, but yeah, 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 that's his bit. I wish I had an interpreter to pin this on. So Pete Rose saying Shohei's guilty of the gambling, but I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever find out the truth. Uh, that's the story that Shohei's running with. Baseball can't lose Shohei Otani, man. They can't. Like he, he is the biggest and best thing that they've got going. And we know baseball has kind of been a dying sport recently. It's there, there aren't a lot of young baseball fans out there, which sucks, but Shohei Otani has been a guy to, to kind of bring people back into baseball and not only bring people back, but also bring some new folks into the sport of major league baseball. And if, if he had to miss a significant amount of time, that would be disastrous for the sport and the marketing of the sport too. Yeah. I just don't know where, where it falls that you can't pay for a debt from, of your friend. Now he's fired the dude, the dude's gone because the dude is actually stealing from him. Yeah. That, that cat can go to jail and that's going to be that. That's not going to be, I don't think in Otani's hands, that's going to be in the, the feds hand. If that guy's going to jail or not, because then Otani's going to end up, they're going to ask him. So you paid 4 million for this guy. What about these taxes? on all that well otani's money anytime that disappears gets taxed i mean somebody's in control of his money besides just him and that dude yeah so when money starts to disappear the federal government has something to do with that i mean those guys sometimes get taxed in every state they go into you know when they come into a city and pitch they get taxed so he's somebody's believe me the feds are getting their money in the cities and everything they're going to still get their money from that guy he's going to be missing a considerable amount if you, but he's paying taxes. He's paying all that stuff. He's got the money to pay for it. But I just don't know where it says that you can't pay for a friend in, in, in the rules. I don't I don't know if that's there or not. I can't imagine. I don't know it could if it's there. My, my, my guess yeah. is Joey stopped, well, stopped paying. Joey stopped paying. Joey stopped. Somebody stopped paying. Someone stopped paying the bookie. So the bookie turned this into a story. He leaked this story to somebody. So somebody was trying to avoid paying somebody some semblance of money, and that's why we know about this right now. So, yeah, you know the feds are going to get involved. They already are investigating this right now. So this thing is just getting started. Like, I know Shohei gave that prepared statement, but this thing is just getting started. And, oh, by the way, the Major League Baseball season starts on Thursday. So I know Shohei didn't take any questions yesterday, but he's going to get asked a bunch of questions about this very, very soon. Maybe he decides not to answer this, but this thing ain't going away Anytime no. soon. And Major League Baseball is doing their own investigation. You would think the SEC is doing its own investigation. Uh, this is, it's a wild story. So I don't know. I don't know what the next step is here, but we got a text from someone on the code of text line. Uh, I'm a financial advisor. When my clients want to wire, I always verify with a call to my client to confirm it's legit because the financial institution could be liable. Right. And that, okay. That's it. Like there's, there's a 0% chance in my mind that Shohei did not know what was going on here. No, oh, no, I believe he was paying for this guy's gambling debts. Yeah. I, be- I believe at, at a certain point though, it became to the point where this guy would make the call and they knew how close they were. And, and if he paid 2 million, believe me, another million 
somebody at that financial says, oh, no, we heard from Otani. It's cool. We've, he's done this before and said, oh, it's cool, but didn't really get the word from him. And then it got to a point where that's not cool. Four million dollars is way more than I, I thought. And how did this guy get into the other two million that he screwed up? I didn't give him the go ahead for that. So I, I don't think Otani's involved. I think I think he's never placed a bet. I believe he's never placed a bet, but his guy has placed a bet. Right. And it's but it's his account though. That's that's how he could be liable for this. Like it's money coming from his bank account. So well then he'll know. have to pay the taxes, but it's his money. Once again, it's his money. Sure. He's got the money. He's got the money. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's for sure. He, he definitely has the money. I mean, four and a half million dollars. I don't know if chump change is uh a fair way it's to describe change. it. In his in his world, it's chump change. Yeah, he just signed a seven hundred million dollar deal. Now he did defer yeah. most of that money towards the end of his contract, so the Dodgers could go out and spend even more to build a World Series yeah, roster he's around him. Banks that are filled up because of him. But yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's doing okay right now. So yeah, I mean, how far can you go for a friend? That's that's what's going to have to. That's what Major League Baseball and all these other sports are going to have to come out. If that's my friend and I'm not making a call and I'm not doing the betting, he has a problem and I'm just helping him out to the tune of four million dollars. I mean, people buy homes and boats and shit like that for their friends. I mean, but this, I guess Major League Baseball, as you said, Major League Baseball is not gonna, if he's not actually gambling himself, they're not gonna do anything to him. They're just gonna say he's helping out a friend, he's got the money. We have no evidence that he's making bets through this other guy. Now, what kind of information is Shohei giving out to this guy? If this, So we don't know what that guy's betting. We don't know if that guy's betting on baseball, basketball. I mean, we don't know if he's placed bet when he, when he was with the Angels. I mean, that's that gets to be shaky, you know? The yeah. Atomic, that guy goes everywhere with those guys. Yep. Yep. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's not been going on. The Angels because they suck. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the bets were. I think it's been going on for a little while, though. Sure. You have to assume some of this happened when Shohei was with the Angels because, yeah, the interpreter was there, too. So, yep. uh, yeah, look, MLB, I think they're going to do whatever they can to preserve their star. I watched sure. this statement live on the MLB Network yesterday, and they had a couple of guys in the studio on MLB Network kind of reacting to what was said right after it happened. And, oh, my God, it's like – it was the most Shohei defending I think I've ever seen, right? It's like Fox News after Donald Trump would speak or MSNBC after Joe Biden would speak. It's just like, oh, we're going to go to bat for this guy because uh, he's our guy and he's important to us. I mean, MLB, they're going to do, once again, whatever they possibly can to make sure that Shohei Otani is okay and he gets off scot-free in this deal. But sure. it, it, it might get to a point where that just can't happen. Well, you can't mess with the cash cow. You got to leave the cow alone. I mean, that's and and it's, and how far are they going to really dig in to find out if he was doing it? They don't want to get too deep. They want to get deep enough where the where Major League Baseball says it's it's okay. We don't have any evidence of him doing it. We have the evidence of him paying for his friend. That's it. But that's his friend. He's allowed to spend the money his his own money. He can spend it any way he wants to. Well, he, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying he spent it. He's saying it was stolen from him. Well, he's that's, saying he that's, didn't do anything for him well no i gotta believe he's paid something for that guy oh and also as steven says yeah it's, it's illegal to bet in california so the whole premise of these bets is illegal in the first place he did say the word bookie right yeah and it's offshore because you know this isn't nevada a state over where yeah you can gamble no problem this is not only against rules of the sport but this is against that yeah. state too so uh, wild, wild story. Once again, we See, originally we, I, we heard it, it was offshore stuff, and it was through, you know, yeah. some some of those some of those betting services that it was offshore stuff. That's what I thought it was. I did, then I heard the word bookie being said, or cousin being said. That made it a little different. When I heard this statement, and it said I've never paid a bookie, I was like, uh oh, that's the magic <laughs> word. There's a magic word. Because those guys are going because those dudes are going to squeal if you didn't pay them the rest of their money. What that is, cousin's, what is about, he, cousin's about to tell. I wonder what Epe's got to say here. I'd love to hear from the interpreter because he could come out and be like, "Yeah, I'm not the fall guy. To hell with this. He was the guy betting on everything, and I'm the guy who's getting stuck with all the blame." Well, he's going to get the blame, and he's still going to get paid by Otani some way, shape, or form. He may not be his interpreter anymore. But in order to keep his mouth shut, he's going to get paid through somebody yeah. through Otani. You know that. Somebody's – he's not going to lose his 
his career because that guy gets a chance to squeal. That guy will make enough money he can keep his mouth shut forever. That guy might be going to jail is what might happen. That, that's true. Then afterwards, he's probably making enough money to keep his mouth shut forever. But uh, wild, wild, wild story in the world of sports. And uh, this is not an all pub is good pub situation for Major League Baseball. This is the biggest story in the sport. Once again, opening day is two days away. And baseball wants people talking about that and the opening weekend of games that they've got coming up. But uh, instead, it's all about Shohei right now. And even when the games start, the biggest story will still be Shohei Otani for the foreseeable future. Uh, man, 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 man. All right, we'll uh, we'll take your thoughts. Keep the text coming. Dakota text line 512-222-9328. Uh, of course, the YouTube comment line is on this morning as well. We've got plenty more to get into. We've got some Texas football spring nuggets to talk about yeah. here in a second. But before then, Buck, how about another great Shout out to another great sponsor. Our good friends over at Leaf Landscape and Supply Services, Monterey Oaks and 290 South and Pond Springs Road up north. If you're thinking about getting your garden, spending two hours like I did in the garden yesterday, oh, my back. Uh, this is the place that you want to go. Whether you want to do your own gardening or, your, or do all your landscaping around your property, talk to the folks at Leaf. Get their experts to tell you what will fit in what kind of soil, what's going to work on which side of the house, northeast Southwest, the whole works. You got to figure out these kind of things. Don't take it upon yourself. You'll just be wasting your money like I've done for years. Now, I'm a landscaper. I'm a gardener. I'm a farmer. You know what I'm saying? I do all those things, but I pay the price for it because I try to experiment with stuff. But you don't want to experiment with your money or you don't want to screw up your landscaping. And, you know, two months later, the stuff is dead right in front of your yard. You want to do that. Talk to the folks at Leaf about fertilizing and what you need. And if you want contractors, they will get in touch with them to do the landscaping for you, uh, whether it's trees, flowers, shrubs, vegetables, anything you name, PK, they have it there. As I said, they have experienced folks that know exactly what to do. Once again, I was there again yesterday. I go there just about twice or three times a week because I always see some some kind of whether it's a desert rose or something that I think is going to work on my landscape. And they will tell me, uh, Buck. You live in the hill country. That's not going to work. It's not a Texas native. This is a California plant. So when the heat hits it, it's going to die. You know what I do? I'm the big man. I know exactly how to do it. And it's dead in about two weeks. But I've been doing it for years. I love to, I love to experiment with my money like Shohei. You know what I'm saying? So that's oh, what I'll do. God. But go to, go to the folks at Lansky, uh, Leaf Landscape and Supply Services. They are truly the experts. Yes, they are. I've got to water my plant, I think, sometime soon. You didn't get any from that rain that Dee Dee told you when it was going to rain? Oh, Dee Dee didn't tell you about any rain, did she? No, she's disappeared. I mean, we didn't we used to hear from her every morning, at least a hello? Yep, she entered the listener portal, I guess. But she was batting a 1,000, and she still is batting a 1,000 with her weather forecast on Texas Sports Unfiltered. but the weather guessing, of course, she, yes. She just disappeared, so she's uh, about as reliable as all the other weather guessers. Now, I'm, that's when, now, I'm, now you're starting to talk. Now you're sounding like the BK and Trey <laughs> Elling that I know. This is, this is how you treat weather people. Well, I'm a weatherer. I haven't been treated this way. You, you, you lack confidence in me for a little bit, which, was, which hurt a little bit. Then you took on Dee Dee like she was – Queen Elizabeth or something, you know? Who? Queen Elizabeth, the old queen. She's still alive. Uh, I, I'm going to venture to say no. Okay. What's going on with Kate? An old, an old dude died, her husband. He's gone. Got, something's going on with Kate over there, too. I don't know why they're bothering Kate of Windsor or Windsor Kate or wherever she's from. Uh, yeah. Dover, Dover Kate, Dover Down, Kate, the racetrack. Kate of, Kate of West Campus. <laughs> Kate of West. Did you know a few Kates of West Campus? Uh, a couple of Kates in West Campus. Great. Oh, my gosh. All right. Shout out to uh, Woods Comfort Systems oh, yeah. as well of our great friends at Woods Comfort Systems. If uh, something is wrong with your AC unit or if you're moving houses or building yes. a new house that needs yep. a new AC unit, you got to reach out to our friends at Woods Comfort Systems. They're the best in the business, and they've been in business here in Central Texas for nearly 70 years years that's right they've been providing top quality hvac services in central texas for almost seven decades and now they do plumbing as well so if something's wrong with the toilet a sink whatever 
they can come by and they can get it fixed up for you. They are dedicated to keeping you comfortable in your home all year long. And you're not comfortable if something's wrong with your plumbing. You're not comfortable if something's wrong with your AC, especially sure, here. sure, the AC. You're yeah, not especially here in Texas. So, uh, yeah, check out their website, woodscomfortsystems.com for more information. And, of course, you can give them a call as well, 512-842-5066. That's 512-842-5066. Five zero six six. Make sure you tell them you heard about it from Texas Sports Unfiltered when you reach out. It's Woods Comfort Systems, where comfort is our middle name. All right, Buck. Hey, baseball, we'll get a little game tonight. Got a little Texas baseball tonight. Yep, the uh, tenth and final game of this ten-game homestand for the Longhorns. They are taking on A and M Corpus Christi at the Dish tonight. Uh, Texas coming off that series victory over Baylor over the weekend. They took two of three with wins on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, man, still can't get over Ace Whitehead. Strong performance, a complete game in that victory on Saturday. He was magnificent. It feels like Texas now has its Saturday starter going forward. Uh, and the Max Grubb, I'll give him some love too. Seven strong innings on Sunday as the Longhorns run ruled. Baylor. That's right. They only needed eight innings in that series finale, the 11 to one victory for Texas on Sunday. So yeah, hopefully they can uh, ride the high from those last two games tonight against a and Corpus trying to go seven and three on this 10 game homestand. It, it's been a little disappointing. And this was one of those where a couple of weeks ago at the start of this stretch, we were talking about, hey, you'd love to go 10 and 0, nine and one, maybe eight and two at our oh, yeah. And well, right now it's six and three for Texas. So obviously there's nothing you can do about the past at this point. Love to find a way to uh, get that seventh win tonight against a, a team that you absolutely should beat with Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And then it's back on the road. It's a quick turnaround because Easter Sunday is this Sunday. Uh, this weekend series will be Thursday, Friday, Saturday instead of the normal Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So a trip to Manhattan. Assume the team will travel up there tomorrow. Yep. And Kansas State right now is in first place in the Big 12. So we'll obviously preview that series a little bit more when we get to Thursday. But, uh, yeah, Texas baseball, a pretty important week. Take care of your business tonight at the dish, and then hopefully you can find a way to take two of three against a K-State team that's been better than I think most people thought they were going to be this season. And did you say Major League Baseball is up their season tomorrow? Thursday. Thursday. So I'll be wearing my Yankees gear on Thursday, not tomorrow, but Thursday. Yes. Full regalia, full regalia. That's right. That's right. I'll have the hat, the shirt. I'm even wearing my long socks. You gonna wear your cup? I, I I'm not a cup guy. I never was a cup guy playing baseball. I never took one there. Oh, that must hurt, yeah. huh? Yeah. What, what, were you playing in right field or something? No, I was a little. I, I played pony league. I played up. Uh, I played up when I was in little league in like eighth grade or whatever it was, I played on the Pony League team with the teenagers, and I sat the bench, oh. which which was the dumbest thing. I played third base, BK, and oh. I, I just sat there like the whole summer. Just sat that's, why you, that's why you didn't need a cup. You were never on the field. Well, even when I was out there practicing, I never took one to the Nats. I've never had a baseball hit me there. And that oh, cup man. doesn't seem – you know, I still got my jock. Maybe I'll, I'll wear my jock on Thursday, the one I have from high school, the one I kept that it never went away. Please cover that up. Make sure your baseball pants are on over that thing, please. Don't go I pants as the, they don't have to even be on. Don't okay. Don't go pants as bottom layer and then jock over the pants too. Yes. You don't need any sight of that jock strap. The thing I used that jock strap was for COVID. When everybody was wearing a mask, I was fighting it with a real, real mask. That's right. <laughs> I forgot about that. You used your game worn jock strap as your COVID mask in 2020. It was okay. I was out yeah. at Onion Creek. We were doing shows at Onion Creek. It worked. You, you were just sniffing and eating your own nut cheese for a year. <laughs> no, dude, that thing has been, you know how many times that thing has been washed? Dude, you say you can't wash ass out of jeans. There's no way you can wash nads out of jock. Yeah, well, nobody's wearing somebody else's jock. I, I would just go bare barrel. I would never, ever put, no. Even if I couldn't afford a jock, I wouldn't wear somebody else's jock. Oh, I've got a nice used jock. My mom washed it. You're okay to wear that. No, I'm not ever okay to wear your jock. No. Never. I do it. I wouldn't wear somebody else's cup. I mean, no. don't you? Well, I don't know about a, a cup because I never wore it. Do your nuts actually go into a cup or is there something? Is there something 
under the cup and then the cup? Does the jock come first and then the cup? Or does the cup for, come first on the nuts and then the jock? No, the, the, the cup does not. I mean, it depends. I think it's different strokes for different folks or whatever the expression is. Okay, but, so if you're packing, how does that work? No, I, the, the, the cup was in the jock. Okay. So. So your nuts hit the cup. My nuts were not hitting the cup. It was well, protected by the jock. Yeah, but your nuts were in the plastic or whatever. What's the cup made out of? Fur? What's it? What is it? <laughs> is it made, what's the? What is the cup made out of? Uh, plastic, hard plastic. Hard plastic. Your nuts were on on hard plastic. No, they weren't touching the cup. Okay, well your well your or your junk was in the cup. You can't remember back that far. I never. Trying, it's been a long time, all right. And I'm trying to like, kind of think of a Google search. Well, that's got to be that's got to be some for kids in the car line. So our our little leaguers must know that. Well, wear a cup, kids. That's that's the advice right here. But where does the? I mean, so the Johnsons in the cup, but the but the nuts <laughs> hang outside. You mean like? You know, I got I've got low T's, but mine's would be hanging down to my knees. I'm just talking about for a normal oh. size cup wearer, a person who wears a cup. So it's all packed into one. It's all like bunched in there, crunched and in the here's, cup. Here's a little screen share here. This is this is quality sports talk right here. You only get this on Texas Sports Unfiltered. So you're okay. welcome welcome. Okay, you see this? Yes. This is like a, a jock strap with the cup. Okay. And there's like a layer of fabric on the back of this jock strap that prevents the cup, the plastic cup, from actually touching these. Oh, okay, okay. I got that. Okay. You understand so that fur, now? It's fur, it's fur plated on the inside to keep those I comfortable. I don't I don't know if that's fur, but it's like it's fabric. It's cotton or something, polyester. I don't know what it's made of. Like your underwear made of. Right, exactly. Like so that's what, yeah, okay. That, that's what it's touching. And then the cup is like in a pouch. In, oh, it's pouch like a kangaroo. Yes, like a kangaroo. It's like you got a little kangaroo in there. Oh, so the nuts do go in there. These nuts go in there too. They go in there. Yeah. All right. All right. They don't hang down below that thing, and they just get hit by the ball. No, that the, the whole point of the cup is to make sure the whole area is protected. All right. So that that must be too much. The nut shot hurts more than the actual Johnson shot, you know? The, the, the nuts are the things oh, that really yeah. have oh, to get Oh, protected. those are the ones that make you throw up. Exactly. So that's uh, – the, the cup is definitely protecting that as well. No, I didn't – I never wore one of those. I wore a jock strap, and, the, and, and these were inside the jock strap. And so no matter what hits you there, that jock never protected anything. You wore a jock strap, and then 40 years later, you wore it on your face. <laughs> yes. You're smelling your own weird duck sausage, dude. <laughs> that oh. is gross. It's not gross. I'm People run D, baby. The silly ass mask on. Go. You needed a you needed a mask that covered everything. It covered my look. Only thing was peeking out from that jock were my eyes. Mouth was covered. Chin was covered. That jock went around my chin. That was the perfect mask. Okay, not the ones that people run around now with the little thing with their nose hanging out. Their ears hanging out. Come on, man. Somebody should have somebody thought, should have thought of that during COVID. We needed more people wearing jocks around their face than oh, those silly God, little no. voiceless mask. I I think uh I think it's a good thing that we didn't have people wearing jock straps around their face. That would have given us a whole nother pandemic. <laughs> Tom was McKay was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look at that. That's <laughs> That's what it's supposed to be. That's what life should have been here during the pandemic. This is what we should have been wearing, more of this. <laughs> is that the ball cap in there, too? Oh, my God, dude. This is disgusting. I want Tom McKay to wear one of those. That should have been Tom McKay walking around. No silly mask when you could have put a real jock, been an athletic, you know, a couple of years for us. Man, people running around with that silly mask with their nose hanging out. Half of their face was hanging out, I think. You get a good jock firmly on there. Look at that. Only thing is, look, the eye. That's the only <laughs> thing you get to see. <laughs> oh, um, this is so gross, dude. Oh, it's not gross. I'm bringing that out. I may put it on my face <laughs> to start and then put it on 
through the course of the show. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, please, oh. please wear your jock strap on your face on Thursday. That would be maybe oh. our highest rated show we've ever I had. I never got rid of that thing. I never Why? Got Why? I got rid of that like as soon as I was done playing baseball. No, because I knew I'd be an athlete for life. I don't know why I don't wear it to play golf. The way these guys hit the golf ball, I should have a jock on. Oh, my God. Are you going to start wearing a cup on the course? I should, obviously, after I've seen it. And now that I see it's fur line, hell yeah. Yeah, one of your boys did get hit in the back a couple of weeks ago oh, on the course. Hit right in the back. <laughs> that was awful. That thing hit him, and it sounded like a gunshot when he hit him. But he has this he has this way about him of going way in front of but in front of you. Like, dude, eventually you know you're going to get hit. Somebody's going to hit one from behind us, but you're not off to the side. He likes to go in front of you. Man, when I was right, I was about 20 yards from him when it hit him, and the sound of that, the thud that hit him, and he went down to one knee. And then he's yelling at the guy who hit the ball. I'm like, dude, you're the guy who's pulled out in front of everybody. Eventually you're going to get, you know, guys are shooting balls from behind you. You're out in front of them. You shouldn't be like that. You should go yeah. to the side or behind them. Yeah, you guys play ready golf. I mean, there's yeah, no I, waiting. I once hit a pro. I hit Sandy Lyle in an ass in his ass in a pro am. His wife was his caddy at the time. She oh. was about six foot three. I mean, she was she was very large, very tall, round shouldered, big lady. I oh. think she was pregnant. She was pregnant at the time, caddying for him. He's fat. No, she was pregnant at that time, dude. Fat. He got out in front of me. And he, he was way off to the side, and I shanked one. It took one bounce and hit him right in the ass. He never, ever – he was everything – you know, he, he was very kind. He came and talked to me about golf. But he was never, ever out in front of anybody at the Pro-Am again during the regular part of that. He was always back to the side. But I know guys that can hit you there, too. If you're not totally behind – I know guys that have hit the marker on, at the tee box that the ball has gone backwards that could hit you. Oh, yeah. So, I was, so forget I was about that. At, uh... I was playing at Great Hills a couple of weeks ago, and my first shot of the day, there was a gallery there. I'm not used to that because I guess the first tee is by like the outdoor patio bar oh, yeah, area yeah, yeah. by the clubhouse. And I shanked the first shot of the day onto the hole to the right, and I had to yell four and I almost hit somebody off the first tee. They're on oh, a different man. hole. Oh man. Oh yeah, and the whole the whole gallery saw it. I was like, ah, shit. I've only, done that with a good, I've only shanked a football. I've never shanked a, a golf ball into anybody. Uh, you just said you hit somebody with a golf ball on a shank. What do you mean you've never shanked a I golf shanked ball? A, I shanked a a football. Yeah, we. What was the Sandy Lyle story? That was football. Oh yeah, that's right. I you literally, that. you literally just said you shanked one and hit somebody one well, I mean, time. I didn't hit them when they were having breakfast. Uh, this was in competition. Right. No, I yeah, I didn't I didn't hit anybody, thankfully, but I got close to hitting a few folks on the golf course. Folks don't like to be hit with the golf balls. No, nobody likes to get hit with the golf balls. It shit hurts. You know, a couple of years ago during was it Ryder Cup play, I forget who it was. A lady got hit and lost her eye. Oh. She was down the fairway. One of the pros hit her, USA guy, slam one. I mean, when a when a golf ball is coming in, you can hear the sound of that thing coming down, whistling down. And it got her right in the socket, and she lost her eye. You know what they say, Buck? What's that? That's why women shouldn't be on the golf course. I didn't say that. That's not – no, no, no. I'm not – this lady lost her eye. I'm, I didn't say that. Don't put – no, that's not me. I didn't say they shouldn't be on the golf course. I just think that there's there's a time for supper and there's Sunday brunch and things like that. I mean, I'm not saying they shouldn't be on the golf course. <laughs> Who was doing the cooking while she was out there? Is that what you're saying? I, I mean, right. I guess I don't know. Maybe the neighbor came over and cooked for the day. I don't have no clue. I have no clue. But yeah. I'm not saying they shouldn't be. You know, they, she paid to get into the Ryder Cup. She was there. She was a Move. spectator. Moving she on. She wasn't playing in the damn Ryder Cup. No, no, they don't let women do that. They got. I think they got a female Ryder Cup. Do they? Oh, they got female jockeys. Yeah, they do. Yeah, I think is there a female a, Ryder Cup? I don't know if there's a female Ryder Cup. There may not be. I've never heard of it. They have a President's Cup. For the men or for the ladies? For both. Oh, it's the Solheim Cup. Oh, the Soul, Soul Plane. <laughs> not the Soul. We're moving on here. We're talking Texas football this morning. 
All right, Steve Sarkeesian, Buck, you, you tell me if you've ever heard this expression before. Okay. This is a new one from Sark and one that I don't think I've heard from anybody else. So spring practice continues for the Texas Longhorn football team. They are four practices into the 15 that they have coming up this spring. They'll have their first scrimmage, I believe, next Saturday, April 6th. So. Okay. A few more practices this week. They'll send everybody home for Easter. They'll get back at it next week, and then boom, you'll have the uh, the first scrimmage coming up a week from Saturday. Uh, the pads have been coming on. Apparently, Saturday's practice was very physical over the weekend, and they had another physical padded practice yesterday on campus. And then Steve Sarkeesian uh, met with the assembled media a little bit, and he also met with the team after yesterday's practice, and he – talked about guys being either a thermostat or a thermometer here's what he said thermostats they set the temperature they bring the energy they set the temperature thermometers they just react to what is set so we need more guys that take the field with real intent we need more guys that take the field with great energy so that the other players that may not know quite yet can fall in line with what that looks like so the thermostat thermometer comparison or metaphor from Steve Sarkeesian. That's one that I hadn't heard before, but I kind of no, I've heard it. it. I've heard it from him, but it doesn't work for me. That's way too deep into coach speak for me. You know, that, that, that just is, I mean, that's maybe some new stuff that he got over the last couple of years or so, but yeah, I mean, you want guys that are, are going to bring, bring the energy to practice all the time. You know, they can't, it can't be a big day situation. It can't be just, you know, say a, say a spring game or, a scrimmage on Saturday. He wants guys that are bringing it on Tuesdays and Wednesdays of spring ball. They have to bring that same kind of energy, energy that they would bring to a uh, a scrimmage on a Saturday. He wants guys that are playing at that kind of level all the time. Hard to do, hard to wish for, but yep. that's what every that's what every coach wants. He wants a guy that comes out on a Tuesday like he'd come out on a Saturday. You know. Yeah, and Steve Sarkeesian singled out a few players after yesterday's practice for being thermostats. Alfred Collins was somebody who made that cut, and also Baron Sorrell and Ethan Burke, a couple of other guys who were mentioned in that category. And, and three that's, guys that need to be that for yeah, him. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, you need those guys to step up. We've spent a lot of yes. time talking about Alfred Collins. Of course, he's expected to be one of the starting defensive tackles for this year's team, one of the guys replacing Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy. Uh, and this is – the final year for Alfred Collins here at the University of Texas. And there's always been so much potential, and we've seen flashes of really good play from him, but obviously we haven't seen it consistently enough to this point in his Texas career. So he's a guy the Longhorns need. And, yeah, also Baron Sorrell coming off a solid season. Ethan Burke also coming off of a solid season. All three of those guys I think are going to be supremely important to uh, the Longhorns' success in their first season in the SEC. Yeah, I mean, for Sorrell, I mean, I understand how good he can be against the run. But he needs to be more explosive as a pass rusher. I mean, he needs sacks. He needs to beat guys one on one and get to the get to the quarterback and make some things happen for this team. So they feel like they have a consistent pass rush, a, a consistent pass rusher that can get after it. You know, he's got the ability to do that because I, I like him against the run. I think he's a stout guy. He doesn't give up. He doesn't give up the edge that easy. Uh, and he's gotten better every year. And this is it. This is his ultimate year right here, where he becomes a where he becomes a pass rushing threat. Anytime there's a, a pass, a passing down situation, he's one of those guys that puts pressure. Doesn't always have to get to the quarterback, but he needs to put an awful lot of I mean, yeah, if he wants to play at the next level, I I don't think he wants to be done after this season of playing football. So he has to pick up his game and be that guy, you know? Mm hmm Yeah, there were some rumblings about Baron Sorrell considering taking the leap to the NFL after this past season. And I didn't think he was ready for that. You didn't think he was ready for that. And I think he made the right decision by coming back to Austin. But you're right. He's absolutely a guy who has NFL aspirations. And if he puts together a really good season, he could be That's in the right. 2025 NFL draft. And, you know, looking at the stats from last year's team, like Ethan Burke was this team's sack leader with five and a half. I would love if the Longhorns had a double-digit sack guy this year. Now, they don't need – they don't yeah. need to have a double-digit sack guy. I mean, they had one of the best defensive lines in college football last year. And once again, the, the leader had five and a half. But you'd think because you're losing your two interior defensive linemen that you're not going to get as consistent a pressure from the inside of your D-line, which means you're going to need your edge guys to step up. Yes. So whether, whether it's you know Ethan Burke, whether it's Baron Sorrell, uh, whether it's 
uh, Colin Simmons, even though he's a true freshman, whether it's Trey Moore, the UTSA transfer, I would love for Texas to at least have somebody flirting with 10 sacks this year. Once again, they don't need to get there, but I'd sure as hell love the team leader to be closer to 10 than five and a half like you had last year. You know, Trey Moore has had some success, independent, and even at the level of football that he's played, and they played some pretty good teams at UTSA. I mean, they played, they're not playing chumps every week, and he's had success as a pass rusher, so he has some skills. You know, I I, I got to believe that he's going to be one of the guys that really puts the pressure on the quarterback. When he comes into the game, I think you're going to see pressure from him because technique-wise, you don't get as many sacks in the, in the career as that guy's got. No matter who you're playing against, you know you've got some tricks. You know, you've got some tools in your toolbox. So I expect him to be the guy. The other guys, strength-wise, size-wise, and competition-wise, they've played against some of the best. So now it's just how they hone in on their individual skills. And for Alfred Collins, it's just got – you got all the tools. You've got it all. You've played at this level now for, for three years. You understand the expectations of you. You're a five-star athlete coming out of high school. You've already you've been already been gifted with a lot. Now it's all about your heart and what you really, really want to do down in and down out. Not just this game, but then not, not play well the next two games and then show up in another game with two pressures. No, it's got to be in every – it's got to be consistent with him. Sure. It's, it's his time. There is no other time for me with him. And after yeah. about two or three games, you're going to see it and you're going to go, if he's not getting it done, you're going to look at him and go, that guy's not going to all of a sudden in game six rise to the occasion. He won't. Oh, it's a contract year for Alfred Collins. Yeah. It's a contract year for a few of those guys. I mean, how many, the guy was born with the tools. Yeah. Came out of yeah. high school with those tools, you know? Looks, looks like he was sculpted by the gods. I mean, yes. it's ridiculous. He's a first guy off the bus type of player. Absolutely. But the, uh, yeah, the play, once again, needs to match the looks a little bit more often than it has. Your defensive and, line coach has a lot of work to do. It's a great point. Yeah, I was about to yeah. go there, right? Kenny Baker, uh, it's his first year. You know, it was a little bit of an off-the-beaten-path hire for Steve Sarkeesian. Uh, not the biggest name out there. Right. He's got some NFL experience as the assistant defensive line coach for the Miami Dolphins this past season. But, uh, you know, going from Bo Davis and all the skins that he had on his wall to Kenny Baker, it feels like a little bit of a downgrade. Well, what are you going to do, Kenny Baker? I mean, you, there's talent to work with, even though there's no t and no Byron Murphy. You've got a room full of four- and five-star kids and Trey Moore, the transfer from UTSA, right. had 14 sacks last year. So you've got some pieces to work with. Can you put them all into this puzzle that looks really good? By I the would year? agree. I would agree. I think he's gifted some really good players right now that yep. if he can coach, then coach him up. Let's get them going. Let's get them not just pressuring the quarterback, but sacking the quarterback. And you've got the and you've got the right weapons to to get it done. So I'm expecting a lot of a guy that I don't know that much about. I really am. Because I think you walk into a great, I think he's walked into a really good situation. I, I really do. Not a great situation because he's gonna have to have his foot in a couple rear ends, like he's probably never had to do that. But hey, you want to make money, you want to coach at this level right here, then you've got to be able to do that to these guys. And they've got to they got to respond to your coaching. They just have to. Yeah, I heard Chip and Zay talking about Kenny Baker yesterday, and Chip described him as a technician. Like, that's why he got the job. He's just a great teacher okay. of defensive line play, and that's what you need, right? Like, not to say that Bo Davis wasn't that. Bo Davis clearly was that, but the hope is uh, Kenny Baker can do what Bo Davis did in terms of development with that defensive line because it's not like – I mean, Tamandre Sweat was a three-star recruit coming out of high school, and Bo Davis helped turn him into the Outland Trophy winner as the best defensive right. lineman in the country – last year. You know, Byron Murphy was not uh, a five-star player coming out of high school, and yet he might be the first defensive tackle taken. He probably will be the first defensive tackle taken in the draft this season. So the development has been there. You need it to continue to be there as, uh, yeah, you move to the toughest conference. Yeah, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to expect any less of of, of the, the new def defensive line coach as I did of the wide receiver coach who walked in here <laughs> and made guys just – Incredible. There, he was. He was. He he had two gifted wide receivers, or three of them, and you can include the tight end if you like. But he had some gifted guys with some gifts, and they didn't take a step back. They all took steps forward. They just did. Sure. I mean, including Jordan Whittington. I mean, that Chris Jackson made those guys better players than they were, and they were already had gifts. They already had speed and and talent and size and stuff. He helped them become better. You brought a pro guy in here. Now you're bringing another guy in here. So I expect that Sark hasn't made many bad moves when it comes to coaching hires. So I don't expect this one to be one. 
we know this fan base. I mean, even though it's year one for Kenny Baker and you'd like to give coaches a couple of years to figure some things out, if there is a precipitous drop-off in defensive line play from last year to this year, uh, this fan base is going to be calling for Kenny Baker's head. Now, I don't know if Steve Sarkeesian would be that quick on the trigger, but we have seen him. I mean, he did fire his wide receivers coach after one year, his first yeah, year mean, in and, Austin. And Sark is not going to hang back and let this, these two secondary coaches – have another year like they had last year either. And a lot of fans he, wish he didn't let them hang around for as long as he has already. They were they well, if they weren't great recruiters, they would have probably already been gone. So yeah. both, of them, both of them are really they're good for the recruiting, they're good for the base of, of recruiting. So that they've got that going for them, but they got to be able to coach. And I don't think you get away. I mean, if they're just getting burned left and right and guys aren't and guys aren't improving. Then that's going to be a problem for the sec that group in the secondary. Recruiting at Texas is not that hard. Like some guys are better than others, and this coaching staff has been sure. better than the last two coaching staff, so they deserve their credit there. But I mean, Charlie and Tom were still bringing in top ten classes every single year. And like, top and, 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 play, you're right. And that was pre NIL. And that was pre upgraded facilities. So like that that can't keep you around. Does that help? Sure. And once again, it's an art form. And if you can't recruit well, then you shouldn't be on this staff. So I'm not diminishing the importance or value of recruiting you at all. Recruit well. You yeah, should look, be. Look at every team that wins a national championship. Like you can't win championships in college football without elite talent. So of course, recruiting is important. If you followed my radio career, you know how I feel about it, but it ain't that hard to recruit to Texas. You've got to develop. The issue in the 12 years of suck was not that Texas couldn't recruit. It's that they couldn't develop. So if you're not developing talent and the jury's still out on Terry Joseph and Blake Gideon uh, Gideon on how well they are developing talent, then I'm sorry, you got to go. So it's a make or break year for them and it should be a make or break year for them. And I'm fine with them coming back. I'm not over the moon that they're back after what happened last season, but I, I think they should know. And I'd be surprised if Sark didn't get those guys in a room and say like, we need more out of y'all in 2024. Otherwise you, you guys are going to leave me no choice Folks are going to be begging me to make a change, and I'm going to have to listen to them. Yeah, and, you know, I've got an open checkbook to get who I need and who I want, who I think is the best, and who others around the country thinks is the, are the best. So he's going to be able to have – he's going to have the means to do that. So Plus, you don't stand pat anyway like that. You don't – you just don't do that. Mm -hmm. If it's not yeah. getting done, you just move along. You move to – you know, they don't do that in business. They don't say, oh, no, you had a great year three years ago. But you know what? We're going to let you have – we know you're going to have another mediocre year, so we'll just wait it out and see how it goes. Maybe maybe you'll do something special in the, in the you know, selling selling this many computers. You knowing that they're going to have another mediocre year of them hanging around doesn't do you any good because right. you know what you're they expect. Getting, you yeah, know? If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian right. has said that before. So, uh, yeah, this secondary has got to take a step next season for sure. Uh, a couple of other guys who were singled out by Coach Sark yesterday. He did talk about Trey Moore. I know we touched on the UTSA transfer a moment ago, but uh, he was praised as a guy who tries to squeeze every drop out of the day. The exact quote from Sark, Trey Moore brings it. That guy is wired right. What I like about Trey is his work ethic. You could tell a guy who comes into the program and he has a chip on his shoulder. Trey has something to prove, and I think there's some serious value to that. End quote. Yeah, I mean, he he could be your primest, that's a word, candidate to have double-digit sacks in yes. 2024. He had 14 last year. Uh, obviously, it's a big step up going from the ACK to the SEC. But as you mentioned, UTSA, it's not like they played a bunch of chumps. Like, they did no. play some good quality teams. So, I wouldn't expect 14 from Trey Moore, but I don't. I, I think he is going to be an impact player, and I sure as hell hope he will be for this defense. Well, he's got some skills at that position. It's not just you going against a bigger – uh, more sophisticated five-star guy every week because you're not in the in in some of the major college football games. But there's some tricks that you have to learn in order to do to anybody. He must have some of those tricks. He knows he knows how to do. You know, he knows how to get on that outside shoulder. He knows what lever how important leverage is. So, I mean, now he'll get a chance to use it. He's at 14 sacks. That's a good year for anybody. Yeah, yeah, it is 100. percent And onto the running backs. And I, I, I mean, no disrespect with this one, coach, but, you know, when, when you were the running back coach here, like there was a time where Texas just did not have to worry about who the next running back was going to be. No. Right. It's like there was just a, another beast waiting I mean, in the wings. In the state of Texas, they wanted to come here. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like, all right, yeah, you lose a great player, but all right, hey, this guy's next up, and he's about to become a great player. I mean, sure. this, this place was RBU, it felt like, for a long time. And I, I think we're kind of getting back to that here at Texas with – you go back to Deontay Foreman and then to Bijan and to Rojo sure. and to Jonathan Brooks. I mean, C.J. Baxter and Jaden Blue – hearing great things about those guys in the spring. And then Trey Wisner, uh, one of the, the lesser heralded running backs, that guy, just based on all the media members who were at practice in that open window over the weekend, said he looked really good. And Steve Sarkeesian has been raving about Trey Wisner. So, like, it's not just the top two guys. You might have some more depth in that running back room, and Texas might be getting back to the point where it's like, even though you're losing a guy to the NFL seemingly every year, you might have another NFL guy just waiting in the wings ready to go. Yeah, you had to be careful. You, you're not playing three running backs, so that's – you're playing two of them, but you're not getting to a third in games where he's getting a significant amount of time unless somebody just gets hurt flat out. The second guy gets hurt or the first guy gets hurt, then he gets time. If he's the third running back, it's always good to say nice things about him, but that dude ain't playing very much, you yeah. know? Yeah, and it might be, you know, a 2025 thing for Trey Wisner. Um, but you're, look, you're right. right. I mean, it's, it's CJ Baxter and Jaden Blue are, are going to be your top two guys, but you throw Wisner in the mix. You've got Savion Redback from last year. Then you've got Jarrett Gibson and Cameron Clark, a couple of early enrollees who are super highly touted on the recruiting trail. Uh, you got you got some guys there, so you're right. You want it to just yes. be two horses. Obviously, if injuries become a factor, then you've got to uh, utilize your depth a little bit more, but and it just it feels like Deshard Choice has done just a tremendous job in, in reloading. Forget rebuilding. It is reloading that running back room. Yeah, I mean, Savion Red has to come onto the scene this year. I mean, he was he was okay. I thought he was pretty good. But you can still see him learning that position at running back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's some things about him that just don't come natural. You know, he's got the power. He's got a lot more strength than you think. He's got the ability to make you miss. But there's – there's some of those little nuances about the, the running back position that he looks more of a wide receiver than a running back at times. And maybe this is what this spring is going to be about for him. So yeah, Savion Red might have to shed a few LBs because he came into the spring at 240. That's big for him. I mean, the guy used to be a receiver. Yeah, he's he's only like 5'10", 5'11". Yeah. So it's not like he's, you know, 6'3", 6'4", looking like Derrick Henry out there. He's looking like he's looking like my goal line guy. That's what he started. My goal line lead blocker, full house. Uh, That's the Andre guy. Andre Sweat. Yeah, hmm. starting to look like Audi Crooks from Iowa State women's basketball. Oh no, no, didn't, no! <laughs> didn't need to bring Shaquille O'Meal into this again. Shaquille O'Meal. <laughs> Sorry girl. about that one. Hey, she's, she's a great player. She's not playing golf on a Sunday. I guarantee you that. Uh, Sunday, brunch to, Sunday brunch to be had there. Oh, oh, okay. She's got to eat. You're saying what? That's no, what you do at brunch. Well, she has to go to brunch. I mean, yeah. Oh, because she's a woman, and all women do brunch. I mean, that's not. That's not really a far off comment at all. Actually, <laughs> the, brunch, 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 is, brunch, brunch is the right? official meal of women for <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, trying to see if there's anything. By the way, shout out to our friends at Horns 24-7. I'm reading uh, some nuggets from Chip Brown right now, posting uh, some of his biggest takeaways from practice. We'll give one more here today. A lot of love for Andrew Makuba. I I'm so excited to watch Andrew Makuba play. That guy's uh, just a player. Uh, the local pro deck from LBJ High School. You know, Texas tried to recruit him, but uh, he ended up going to Clemson, spent three years with Clemson, and then obviously hit the portal and decided to come back home this offseason. That guy, I think, can play safety. He can play nickel. I think you can line him up at outside corner, and he'd be really yep. good for you. It will be interesting to see uh, where Texas does decide to play him. I think they need him most at safety because I feel like Jade Barron is going to be your nickel, just like he was last year. Uh, but, man, I mean, Sark raved about him, talking about a guy who could play multiple positions, use the words aggressive, use the word tough. He says he just he knows how to practice, and uh, he just loves the intent that Andrew Makuba has brought in to this Texas football oh, yeah. game he's, he's, the moment he, he got was, here. He was like that as a high schooler. He was like that when he played the wide receiver position. He was pretty dynamic of a football player. He just understands the game. He understands – where you need to be. He understands the angles when you watch him tackle on defense. You know, he can cover guys faster than he is. He, you know, he does, you won't see him in a lot of chase mode. Right? And if he's in chase mode, he understands that the quarterback's not going to get, that he's probably going to more, more likely underthrow a ball. 
he understands the game. He's, he's he looks like a guy who's been studying the game for a long time. Yeah, I think you're right. And look, he, he comes from Clemson. I know Clemson's fallen off a little bit these last couple of years, but Makuba was a part of a CFP team in oh, his yeah. first season up at Clemson, and it's still a championship coach. Like Davo Sweeney is a two-time national champion, absolutely head coach. And the biggest reason for Clemson's fall off is they just they haven't embraced NIL the way that they should. So their roster is not nearly as talented as it used to be, and it's not as talented as some of the best teams in college football now in 2024. But that's still a coach who knows how to coach, and he knows knows how to run good practices. So Andrew McCuba, he's got good practice habits, right? He's always been a guy like that, like you said, dating back to his time at high school. But he he went to learn uh, uh, from a great coach, and he went to be a part of a great program up there for a few years, and I think that is translating here to Texas, which is exactly what this team needs. You saw A.D. Mitchell, right, a guy who played for and won a couple of national championships at Georgia in his time there. Like, I I think he brought a lot of that championship pedigree and culture over to Auburn. Yeah, he never had to come here and learn what culture was about. He already knew. Exactly. So, yeah. so getting guys like transfers are, you know, transfer players, you take them from anywhere, right? You'll take Trey Moore from UTSA. They've done a lot of winning, but they, you know, they haven't won at the highest level. You bring in guys from Clemson and Alabama and Georgia and Ohio state. Like th- those are the guys that, yeah, you don't have to worry about when it comes to culture and, and culture. You're right. And what they need to do to win in uh, the highest level. Yeah, Those are high level players. They were high level players in high school. They went to really good programs. They just decided to make a switch. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, in Makuba's case, it's not, oh, he wasn't good enough. No, he was great at Clemson for years. Yeah, this is just an opportunity yeah, to come home. He was good Texas when he came out of high school, believe me. 100%. And, and, and wide receiver, whatever position he wanted to play, he was that good. Yeah. A football player. He Absolutely. just wanted to get away. Just wanted to get away, like Southwest Airlines. Just wanted to get away, yes. Got to go on another flight tomorrow. I feel like I got lucky. It's past weekend. Now I'm a little worried. see a lot of that happening. I don't know if they throw you out in the middle of the flight on Southwest, but they don't generally put up with a bunch of crap. Or they put up with just enough that nobody goes over the top. None of your girls come in there with condoms on or see things and, you know, see dead people and all that kind of stuff. They have normal people to get on Southwest Airlines. Yeah, and I think Southwest is avoiding the newest Boeing planes that are having all of those problems. So I think that's why you haven't heard any panel flying off the plane stories about Southwest. They've refused to adopt those new aircrafts that are having all of those issues. Yeah, they're still there. driving. They're still flying those same ones 30 years ago when I was traveling on Southwest coaching. Those but or- goodies, goodies, but oldies, but goodies that stay together. The Orville Redenbacher ones. When they ran down there and just, or they came and flipped the blade and got it going. <laughs> that's... God, you were around for that, huh? I was, yes. Oh, the Wright man. brothers. The Wright. Oh, that's Redenbacher. not Redenbacher. Sorry, Orville Wright. Yeah. Who's Redenbacher? That's the popcorn. It's the popcorn dude. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I think it was Orville Wright, and what was his brother's name? Moody? Uh, Monty? Monty? I am, I am Moody. Uh, not Jurassic Monty. I think it was, <laughs> it was, wasn't it Wilbur? Wilbur and Orville Wright. Yeah, and the captain of that was something Wong, I believe. <laughs> we don't talk about that. It was it was Wilbur and Orville Wright, but also something Wong and We Too Low were on there. Yeah, they were on board the first flight. Oh my God! All right, we'll uh, we'll take your thoughts. Some Texas football spring updates for the people. Five one two 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 nine three two eight is the code of text line. The YouTube comment line is open as well. A reminder, we will be giving away a $50 gift card to Cabo Bob's before the top of the hour. Make sure you send us a text or leave a comment on YouTube to enter. Doesn't matter what you say. Doesn't matter how many times you say it. One entry per person. You shoot us a text. You leave us a comment, and you will have a chance to win that $50 gift card from our great friends at Cabo Bob's. Yes. All right, Buck. How about uh, before we – Man, I, I got some nightmare fuel when I woke up this morning and checked Twitter. I got to show you a, a video here. We've got some NFL to talk about. A big rule change coming down in the NFL that was just announced that we will discuss here momentarily as well. But first, another great sponsor shout out. Good friends at Texas Orthopedics. Now, if you're seeking specialized patient focused orthopedic care, contact our friends at Texas Orthopedics. Their physicians offer surgical and non-surgical orthopedic care for children and adults, spinal care, sports medicine, trauma, 
joint re joint replacement, of course, rheumatology, and even more. Dr. Christopher Daney, who I coached at the University of Texas, and Chris Stockton, who I did not coach, are dedicated orthopedic surgeons there, and their goal is to get you right back into good health and the great quality of life that you definitely deserve. Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. For more information, folks, if you definitely need that surgery, maybe that knee replacement or that orthopedic care, contact them at txortho.com. That's txortho.com. Yes, indeed. Shout out to Texas Orthopedics. And how about some love from our friends over at Covert BK? Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. And well, my, well, my boys are probably having some all stats today, I will be having some mocktails from Big Hat. Got to have that thirst quenching goodness for sure. Ginger and the mocktail, delicious. They've got orange in there. They've got lime. They've got lemon. And it is fantastic, folks. Over some ice, just get that can, pour it over a little bit of ice, get out there in the golf course, get rid of the soda. No soda. You're either drinking mocktails, you're drinking your all stat, or you're drinking water. Forget about your Coca-Colas, your Pepsi, your Mr. Dr. Peppers, Mrs. Pepper, the whole the whole bunch of that. You don't need all that sugar. And these mocktails do not have it. They've just got a small amount of sugar in them, but they taste so good. And they'll, th they'll quench your thirst. Others may need something else. BK, that's all I need is a nice mocktail drink from Big Hat. Yes, absolutely. Can't go wrong with the mocktail from Big Hat. They've got the margarita and they've got the new mojito. The mojito's mocktail. coming out, yes. Mocktail as well. And shout out to our friends at Jack Allen's Kitchen. If you're looking for a great spot for lunch and or dinner tonight. That's right. I say and because you can get something great for lunch and then go back a few hours later for dinner and have something completely different. But you're going to enjoy both meals at Jack Allen's Kitchen. You got to go see them. Five Austin area locations. Of course, they start you off with that house-made pimento cheese served with those flatbed uh, bread crackers. You don't let get me get there first. You don't want I me was going to gonna say, first. if you're going with the buck, you better get there early because that cheese will be gone. Yes. By the time you arrive. But they've got everything. The chicken fried steaks, the chicken fried chickens, the fish dishes, the hamburgers, the chicken sandwiches, the South Texas plates. They've got that great weekend brunch as well. I mean, we could really spend the last 30 minutes of the show mm -hmm. just reading off the items that they've got at Jack Allen's Kitchen. Uh, there's so much to choose from, something for the whole fam, something for the whole office, more importantly, something for yourself. The great bar, the fantastic service, the TVs, seriously, everything you look for in a good restaurant, you can find at Jack Allen's Kitchen. Love it. And you mentioned the Altstadt beer. Of course, they've got Altstadt beer. Yes. Uh, because Altstadt is the best beer that is out there. And it's all over Central Texas, and it's all over the state of Texas. So if you're tuned in from the Metroplex or from Houston or from San Antonio, you can find Altstadt at your favorite bars and restaurants and also at your favorite grocery stores and liquor stores around the area. Bunch of different Altstadt brews. Something for every beer drinker out there. And Altstadt's slogan is no impurities, no regrets. What that means is there's no additives, there's no preservatives, there's no unnecessary sugars in any of the Altstadt family of beers. So none of the impurities that you find in some other beers, which means, yeah, you're going to enjoy what you're drinking, but you're also going to feel good about what you're putting into your system. You won't have any regrets about what you are putting into your system and the taste. That's really what matters. I tell you all the time, and I mean it. One sip, and you won't go back to the other beers that you have been drinking in the past. It is the official beer of TSU. It should be the official beer of you as well. It's Altstad beer. No impurities. No regrets. About this, we've got Mr. Sorrell in the building today. Yay, asked Mr. Sorrell. Asked if we spoke on the edge room at Texas. We did. We talked about them earlier. And yes. your son was getting some rave reviews from Coach Sark after practice yesterday. So kudos to y'all for that. This is his year. This is his year. Yep, excited to have him back, and that edge room should be very good with Sorrell, with Trey Moore coming in, with Ethan Burke, with Colton Vosick, with Colin Simmons. You got some dogs. What, what, what will Burke be? Is this just going to be his second year? Is his son or the junior, and the other kids as the freshman? I think it's uh, I think it's redshirt sophomore year for Ethan Burke okay. coming up. 
So he's got a couple of years left if he wants them, but he's already been here for, uh, I think. I might be – I got to double-check myself on that. But, yeah, uh, both the kids in Westlake have, have the, the length. It's just the size that they're looking for, a little bit more yeah. girth on these guys. Hey, Ethan Burke's a freak athlete, right? He was an All-American lacrosse player oh, in yeah. high school. So, yeah, for, for that size, the fact that he can move as well as he does, that's that's a rare combination of traits right there. And, you know, people are trying to make the Max Crosby comparison, which slow your roll a little yeah. bit, everyone. Uh, but, man, I mean, if he could be a fourth as good as what Max Crosby has turned into, then I think every Texas fan would sign up for that immediately. Yeah, and everybody can't have that motor. I mean, I know people – think that when when we talk about people's heart not everybody has that that kind of motor to some of these players that we talk about that are that are all pro guys that are future hall of famers you can people's heart works they just work in a different kind of way what they think is giving all may not be the same as somebody else and what they do and how they can get to do it some people give you their max and it is their max you know people always say well you need more from you we need more from you but some people understand that that is what they're doing Mm -hmm. they are maxed out you know and i hope that's just not the way for collins i hope he's not maxed out bk i, huh. I just hope, i just hope what what i saw when i first came to the state of texas coming from from illinois when i got here one thing i did notice about football players here is they played so much high school football and high school football was 24 7 it was you know you didn't get chances to have off at that time you weren't just playing high school uh you weren't playing high school football basketball and baseball you're just playing high school football and your burnout rate of the game of football. When I got here, I was like, I, I used to get players. I used to look I'm like this dude is already burned out. Yeah. He's, he was, he's already peaked out. I can come here and try this or do that, but I'm looking at him. I'm like, he's not going to get faster. He's only going to get so much stronger, but mentally in this, in this sport, he's, he's like already at his peak, which may not be good enough, but people just, people, they work differently here. The game of football is different in this state. Oh, and you can sure. kids in high school. You can actually lose them in high school when they go to the next level. Now, everybody's not like that. But I've, I've seen kids that are. That their, their expectations were so high. And they got to this level. And you're like, damn, they gave everything they had in high school. Uh, high school football is religion in this state. Yes. And I'd like to think that – you know, none of the guys in that Texas defensive line room have reached their ceilings no, yet. Oh, no, none of them. Not, no. Forget just the D-line room. Like, I'd like to think that nobody on the Texas roster has reached their full potential to this point in the season. But, yeah, look, that, that happens, right? Some guys peaked sure. in high school. Some of my friends peaked in high school. I peaked in seventh grade. So it happens. You know, it's that's how it goes in this life. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I think everyone in that room can get better. I think everyone in that room will get better. I we know that the has to get better. I I, I yeah. hate saying that kid's name for the last four years, but I'm saying his name. He's got to get better. Yep, and and he's he'll be a test for Kenny Baker, right? Like this, yes. this coaching staff. Obviously, Kenny Baker is new. For the most part, this coaching staff has passed the test when it comes to development. The last two coaching right. staffs, yeah, guys peaked in high school. Guys got worse when they got to Texas. This, this, You're right. You know, five stars would become three stars. You want it to be the Absolutely. opposite. So as this place was a star remover instead of a star adder. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Right. So, yeah, now this, to this point, the staff has done really, really good with most of their players. Some guys, it's just the guys themselves. That's that's just how it goes. But I'd like to thank Alfred Collins and, again, everybody on this team still has a, a little bit more that they can do for sure. And Mr. Sorrell says 88's got more to give. I absolutely think go. he does. I think he only goes up from the solid 2023 season that he put together. I, was, so, I would agree. I mean, I, I thought the same thing of the linebacker, the, the big kid at linebacker. I said, guys. If you're expecting something different from that big old dude, you, what you did last year is you got a lot from a lot more than I thought. Mm -hmm. And, I'm, and I, I think he only gets better. And the fact that he's coming back again, David Benda, I think is, is fabulous for this football team because you can see improvement in him. Six year? Six year. Yeah, I mean, you can see it. You, you, you see it where at times you thought, okay, this is he's kind of peaked out here. He's not – He's just that big. He's not going to get any smaller. He's not going to get any faster. But he, one thing he did, he's got smarter to the game of football and how to get to certain spots. And I thought he did that well last year. And I expected him to be not just a, a guy playing for him next year, you know, amongst a bunch of stars. I expected him to be one of the guys who knows exactly where to be, what to do, how to make the tackle. You know, he doesn't have to call. He doesn't have to call on help. I think he'll make a bunch of tackles himself. 
because I saw him run down things that I didn't expect to see from him last year. You know, yeah. following following plays and running guys down from behind. I thought he improved tremendously last year. I'm glad he's I back. Do. I did too. I feel the same way. And with no Jalen Ford, you're going to need good. He's going to have to be that. He's going to have to be that guy. Yeah, I mean, you've got Anthony Hill seemingly making the move there, and he's the five-star, and he was awesome at times as a freshman last year, sure. kind of bouncing around that defense. It feels like he's more of a middle linebacker now, so those might be your two starters at linebacker with uh, Anthony Hill yeah. and David Benda, and you still got Mo Blackwell there as well. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I, I love that David Benda's back for another year, and hopefully he can take another step in what I think has to be his last season of college football. I don't think he can come back for a year seven. So I think this is a uh, nut cutting time, if you will, for yes. 33 in the middle of that Texas defense. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sorrell for stopping by today. Thanks to everybody for stopping by today. Um, Buck, I, uh, tragic story from the Baltimore area that uh, I woke up to today, the Baltimore bridge, the Francis Scott key bridge. It's 1.6 miles long, apparently collapsed overnight oh well, it's not apparent we've got a video of this and a, a ship a cargo ship a giant cargo ship ran into the bridge and well here's uh here's the video of this catastrophic incident so here it is once again overnight just past midnight here in baltimore you could see on the left side of your screen that cargo ship runs into the bridge and boom i mean the entire bridge once again this thing is just over 1.6 miles long, the entire bridge collapses and falls into the water. Boy, those sticks went down, not just a portion of the bridge. Yeah, that is awful. And, I mean, there's no bright side or silver lining to this story, but the, the best thing is this happened overnight, and there weren't a ton of cars or people. Well, there had the to be bridge. somebody on that bridge. There, huh? were, there were people and cars on that bridge, and there are folks still missing from that incident and i got a hunch that uh, they're going to they yeah, yeah if they are found they, they they won't be alive so uh just awful awful tragedy there in baltimore and dude that is like i, I never thought about that crossing over a big bridge like that like i'm just you know, i'm going about my business i'm driving i'm walking it's all good i never thought that one of those things could collapse hey captain the you missed Second. the mark you ran into the the support beams there you didn't get into the middle of where your ship goes underneath. You hit the beams to the bridge. Yeah, it appears something was wrong. Something wrong. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they weren't in the middle. Somebody's navig. Somebody wasn't using their navigator. Mm -hmm. Hey Siri, I'm trying to get to the middle of the bridge. Yeah, according God. to according to the uh, Baltimore City Fire Department, up to 20 individuals and multiple vehicles plunged into the river as a result of that crash. And you could see, I, I didn't show the full video, but there's a longer video out there. And it, you, you see, like, the lights on the ship go off. Almost looks like the boat lost power right before. Oh, lost its navigating system, huh? Right. So maybe something turned off and the boat lost its navigation system or it, it just couldn't see. Like, whoever was the captain of the ship just couldn't see because it was dark out and he didn't have the lights on the boat. Like, the lights went out, then they came back on for a second, and then they went back out. I don't know if there's foul play suspected here. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, however it happened, it's, it's awful. Yeah. So, that's, awful. that's, that's an awful tragedy right there. Uh, now, now that's something to think about as I cross over those bridges, I gotta be going, I'll be going even faster to make sure I don't get stuck on one of those things. Oh no. That yeah. is horrible. What a, what a horrible thing to wake up to. Yeah. 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 Uh, and to be yeah, aboard I, that ship wasn't, didn't, that wouldn't have had to be any much fun too. Right. You know what I'm thinking of? This ship's about to go down, too. I bet it did. I bet it did. So Man. thoughts and prayers to those folks in Absolutely. Baltimore affected by that. Yeah, scary, scary scene right there. Feel for the crew and uh, feel awesome. for the families impacted by uh, what happened out there for sure. All right, Buck, um, back to sports here. I want to hear from Mike McCarthy. Of course I do the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys and well, no surprise because Mike McCarthy's the head coach that the Dallas Cowboys haven't been very active this off season. If you catch that double entendre, right? There. For him, that's why I'm paying $22 for sub sandwiches. Oh, cause, cause he's ordering so many sandwiches that they had to increase the price. 
probably. No, it's the opposite. If they were selling more sandwiches, they wouldn't have to increase the prices, right? Is that how that works? The I, know he does. I know he did live in Austin the year he was, was not coaching, right? The year between his Packers stint and his Cowboys stint, he was living in Austin. I saw him at a couple of Longhorn basketball games. Well, I'm not saying that there are poor folks, that everybody's poor down in your area, down in your Monterey Oaks and Oak Hill area. But $22? Really? Yeah. That's for a, a hoagie? Lot, for a hoagie and a bag of chips. Don't forget about the chips now. It's five bucks. Chips, I bet that thing must cost five bucks for the chips. I bet the chips were like two fifty. Two fifty for a little bag of yep. lays. Yep. No, it's ridiculous. Flavored. Come on, man. That's ridiculous, man. Prices are out of control in the food industry, in every industry right now. Go to the grocery store, try to get you a carton of eggs, see what you pay for that shit. No, I go I go to farmers markets on Sundays and grab my eggs. Look, how much you pay for those? Eight to ten dollars a dozen. Oh my god. But they're big ones. They're not like those little like those little robin eggs that you get at the store now. Do you know how long your eggs could possibly be sitting around before they actually go to the store? Over 90 days, BK, from from the from the chicken's ass to the store it could be over 90 days. Uh-uh. I reckon I reckon right from the chicken's butt onto my table. Oh yeah. You you uh grab the eggs when they're released. I, I like them within the, the next two weeks. Put your hands under there, grab that egg, and then take Thank it straight you. to the kitchen. If I have to, uh -huh. I like I like fresh eggs. I'm a, I'm a fresh egg guy. I don't like. I used to. I just I just needed my eggs, but I don't like them sitting around for a long period of time. And fresh eggs, you know, I could go next door, but can't go over there to the Farmingtons. Oh uh, yeah, your neighbors. That the, you, the Farmingtons that you love so much. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, let's hear from Mike McCarthy. The Cowboys continue to do absolutely nothing in free agency. Mike McCarthy had a one-on-one -on -one sit down with ESPN's Adam Schefter and Shefty asked McCarthy about the Cowboys lack of spending in free agency. Here's how that conversation went. I'm a big believer in a second or third year jump. You know, we have some young players. We got some guys coming back off of IR that were young players that we're excited about. So we are definitely improving. You know, we're just, we're just not part of the uh, free agent market right now. So is that what Cowboys fans can hang their hat on? The fact that there are guys coming back that are going to be getting better because people keep waiting for the Cowboys to make moves. Well, I think that, and also it's, I mean, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot left. So, I mean, it's, you know, you'll probably have a market right before the draft or post draft. And then you got your June 1st market and, you know, obviously we'll have another draft class. So I have great confidence in our roster. Yeah. Well, you better stop having all that confidence in your roster because you need some players. That aren't yeah. on your roster. Yeah, I mean, talk about kicking the Cowboys fans while they're down. Jonathan Hankins, the defensive tackle for the Cowboys last year, who was hurt for parts of the season, but when he was on the field, he was the best interior run stopper that the Cowboys had. Uh, he signed a one-year deal with Seattle, and the details of that one-year contract came out yesterday. Uh, one year, just over $2 million. So the Cowboys couldn't pay $2 million to bring back a guy who could help fix their biggest weakness, which was stopping the run. Two million dollars, Buck. That's that's too rich for the Dallas Cowboys in 2024. You know, the most valuable franchise in sports, maybe the richest owner in the NFL, that a two million dollar deal was too much for them well, to spend. Well, what it is is Jerry just letting you all know that he's not making very many moves. He's going to keep his quarterback, but his coach is going to be gone. If it doesn't work out with the players that we have He's gone. We're going to start some things over again. So when I'm not making these moves, I'm just trying to tell you, I'm setting up everything so we'll have a new coach next year because they're not winning with the same. They're not just running that back. If he's thinking those guys, if he thinks that kid from Michigan all of a sudden is going to become an all pro, they're out of their minds. I love the way they keep saying we have players already on our team, guys that were hurt. I saw how that worked with Michael Gallup. That didn't work. No. The Cowboys, the Cowboys had awful defensive tackle play last year. And, yes. I mean, the guys behind Jonathan Hankins were graded out as some of the worst defensive tackles in all of sure. football last season. So that's that's what the Cowboys are relying on, right? Second and third year leaps. They're just hoping and praying that guys get right. better. That's not a plan. Hope is not a plan. Yeah, Rod B used to say that all the time, right? Hope is not a plan, and it just feels like that's what the Cowboys are doing this offseason. Yes. They are hoping – that the, the guys that they had on the roster last year 
who are coming back because they've already lost a couple of key pieces from that team last year. Right. The guys that they bring in in the draft next month are going to be enough to get them to at least the NFC Championship. They're not actually doing anything to get better. They are just, just hoping hard. what they've got is going to magically – get better and improve to the point where they can get to a place that they haven't been in almost 30 years. Yeah. And Mike McCarthy has to watch what he's definitely saying, you know, cause, cause he's, he can't agree with Shefty. He can't just say, yeah, you're right. We didn't make very many, but I don't make those moves. He can't, he can't come out and say what he really wants to say. It'd be great if he did. It sure would be great, but he put Jerry just falls there. in line in that organization. They all just kowtow to Jerry Jones. And yeah, I mean, he can't there. put Jerry, he can't put Jerry on blast. Wish he did. I mean, he could or he'd be gone. I know everybody wishes he could. He's, if he came out and just said, you know what? I wish our owner would have done something. We needed to have guys at this time. He just, we just didn't feel like it was necessary or not. He can't use the word we. He can just say the owner of the Dallas Cowboys just didn't feel like it was time to make those moves. So we're going to go. He can't put him on blast. He'd be gone the next day. That'd be perfect. That's that's a double whammy for us, right? I mean, it's... Get rid of McCarthy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Someone finally puts Jerry Jones on blast. You know, someone within the organization. Everybody outside right. of the organization has been destroying the Jones family for the last right. couple of months now. But, yeah, if Mike McCarthy comes out and says, I wanted more players. These guys are giving me nothing to work with. These guys are terrible. Maybe they should hire a real GM. That'd that be perfect. Been, that would have been perfect. And then Mike McCarthy would also be fired, and that would be even more perfect. <laughs> Give me that, that was, right there, two please. Two birds with one stone. Is that what you're trying to do? Two birds stoned at once, as I yeah, like to say. Come on now. Mike McCarthy also said in that interview with uh, Shifty Adam Schefter that getting Rico Dowdle back was, quote, big for the team. And if anyone knows about big, it is Mike McCarthy. Is he fat? Yeah, I like Dowdle. I, I, I just will have to see him. He's going to be their starter now. Uh, right? Yeah. As, as, as of now, I guess. Until that third or fourth rounder comes in here and takes his spot. I still think the Cowboys starting running back is the guy that they draft with their second round pick, number 56 overall. Uh, I don't know if that's Jonathan Brooks. We found out last week that Jonathan Brooks had a top 30 pre-draft visit with the Cowboys, so there's some serious interest there. I don't know if it's Trey Benson, the kid out of Florida State. I don't know if it's Audrick Estime, the kid out of Notre Dame. I don't I don't know who it is, but I, I still feel like the Cowboys starting running back. I said this before free agency, and then the Cowboys went out and didn't bring in anybody at that spot in free agency outside of bringing back Rico Dowdle. I, I think the Cowboys, yeah, starting tailback is their second-round draft pick right now. That's interesting. Yeah, that'll, that'll be um... – you know, as I said, if, if it wasn't a second round, if it was a third round rounder and Jonathan Brooks was there, I'd go ahead and take my chances on him. Yeah. I really I really would. I'd say, you know what, this guy, they're talking about him being back for um, training camp. If that guy's back in the middle of the season sometime where he can we can see him, his movements and everything else, I would take I would take it that the following year in twenty twenty five, he would be ready to play. He'd be ready to be my starter. Yeah, you know? I think Jonathan Brooks is very worthy of a second round pick, but I just don't know if he makes sense for a win now type of team like the Cowboys. No. If the Cowboys even are win now. I don't know what the hell the Cowboys are. Like I I never buy into the Cowboys. I haven't picked the Cowboys to make an NFC championship game in years, right? I know the stereotypical Cowboys fan is, oh, this is our year. Like I'm I'm not that guy. I have way too much PTSD from rooting for the team to come close to thinking like that. But usually I don't give up on the team until the start of the year. I'm, I've given sure. up on the team, and I think most Cowboys fans have already given up on the team before the NFL draft has even gotten here. So I, I don't know what to expect. They should be a win-now team. Lame duck head coach, quarterback going into the final year of his contract. They've won 12 straight games and three straight – or 12 games in three straight seasons. Yep. All of that stuff tells you they should be going all in, like Jerry said. This off season, but actions speak louder than words, and they're not doing that. So I like Jonathan Brooks. Yeah, he could you could stash him for a year. You don't want him to be your bell cow coming off a torn ACL. No. The Cowboys need a bell cow right now. They don't they don't have one. It's not Rico Dowdle. It's not Deuce Vaughn. They need an RB one. And as much as I think Jonathan Brooks can be that and will be that, I don't know if he's that his first season. I don't think he's that the first season coming back off a knee. No. No, 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 no. So no, they've I've seen I've seen how they've had guys with knees. I've said I watched Michael Gallup. It's taken him two years before he's 
even able to make the kind of cuts that I that he made originally when he had that fantastic year. He's two years into this surgery, BK, and now he's gone. Well, some guys some guys can come back quicker than others, right? That's like true. I don't. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right I don't know if that's that. a cowboy specific. Th- it's just some guys are great at it, and some guys hell, some guys are never the same. Like Michael Gallup. I don't think he's ever going to be a thousand yard type of receiver again. I would agree with you. I don't think he's ever going to have that same kind of burst he did the year that he had the great year. I agree. So Brooks could be Michael Gallup. We obviously hope he's not, but he he could be, I don't know, Adrian Peterson, where he could come back from an injury like that and be dominating dudes. Like that's we we don't know. So it's too big of a risk, is the point I think both of us are making. Right. Like, that's yeah, you're right. It's too risky. You can't have you can stash him and have him as an RB two, but to have him as RB one coming off of a serious leg injury that required surgery. Yeah, well, they're talking about expecting him in the in the, in the practices, and I'm yeah. not. I'm ex- not expecting to see him until midway of next season. If he's yeah. that good, you're not going to take that chance. If he's really coming along, unless you absolutely need him, and as you said, they're in win now. There, There is no other win the following year, 2025. It's win now where everybody's going to be out of there. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, we'll still see what they do with Dak Prescott, but even with the Dak Prescott contract situation being as it is, the Cowboys still have more money to spend. And sure. They, they are not spending it. Now McCarthy's talking about the draft and the June 1st cut date, and it's like, Jesus, man. That's, I know. That's reaching. That really is a reach. Uh, what a it's time. about the players that they had last year. If they were that good, they would have been good last year. What's the deal with all this? You know, they were injured last year. They'll be much better this year. I'm like, no. No, they'll be you'll be the same. Those injured guys will be injured again. Who really? Else, who else you have? I know. It's it uh tests your loyalty being a Cowboys fan. You know, if you're if you've stuck around with this team for this long, then uh, God bless you. You're a very loyal person. For a long time. Yeah. Yeah, especially for guys and gals like me born in the nineties or after who didn't get to see any of the early 90s Cowboys and obviously the 70s Cowboys. and Yeah, because uh, don't, don't think for one second that the Eagles are not going to be better. Oh, everyone got better, right? The Giants got better. The Commies got better. The Eagles got better. Like, everyone in the division is getting better. And the Cowboys are almost trying to get worse. It's not like they're spending and now they, they just they misspent. They brought in the wrong dudes. They overspent on guys they shouldn't have spent on. They're just like, eh, we're good. We don't, we don't need to get better. Why, why would we need to do that? We're fine. Yeah, I, I, that's, I mean, that's hard for me to understand why that if you have the money to do it, that you're not doing it now. You've got your, you've got your quarterback. Sorry, you're going to have to spend some more money on him, but he's your guy. Let's go and 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 win with him. You had a decent defense. You've got a superstar on. De- you got two superstars on defense. What is it that? What are you doing? You can't stop the run. Okay, we've got a cornerback that's a superstar. We've got a defensive end that's a star. We can't stop the run. Let's plug that up so our other guys can do what they need to do and we can stop teams that try to run on us. They don't they don't care about winning. They care about making money and they're doing that. That'll never change. And they care about being talked about and they're doing that by not doing anything. They have become maybe the most talked about team in the NFL this offseason. So that's what Jerry likes. He's the ultimate businessman. He's the ultimate yeah. marketer. And it's it's annoying that you know that's that's the guy in charge of the football it's operations. It's hard to be a fan for that. Yes. I know what they expect of the Vikings. They're gonna lose and they're gonna get to the playoffs and they're gonna lose. But I don't have to go through the background of their years. I just know that they've not won a Super Bowl, they've been in them, and they've not come close to winning them. They always y'all are, try, you know y'all are y'all are trying. You just made a pit, you just made a trade oh, yeah. with the Texans to get a second first round pick, and I think you're gonna try to trade into the top five to get a quarterback. Like that, that that's trying. Now, some organizations are just bad. Like they try and fail. Better to try and fail than to not try at all. Don't go down looking. Yeah, we'll have JJ McCarthy. It's all good. Yeah, he might. It's oh, your yeah, boy. I mean, he's he's going in the first round. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He is. He There's gonna be five going. or six of them going in the first round. Somebody's getting all these quarterbacks are gonna be gone. They're not gonna be around in the second round. These those top six guys are gone. I agree. All right, let's give uh, some quick sponsor shout-outs before we give away that Cabo Bob's gift card. Some love to Shelby and the team over at SendTextTickets.com. Yeah, A lot of great concerts coming to town here in the not-too-distant future. There's always great concerts coming to town. You can get tickets to all of those shows over at SendTextTickets.com. Any sporting events, any concert, any Broadway show. Basically, if it's live, you can be in the building if you just head over to SendTextTickets.com. 
com. All their tickets 100% guaranteed, and it's that easy. Just go on your phone, go on your computer to that website. You'll be able to purchase tickets right there. Also, some love to Olipop. I literally right. bought two cans of Olipop yesterday, and I, they're sitting in my fridge. I was supposed to go get one to drink during the show. I'll bring it out for the midday show a little bit later. I got the orange squeeze. I've never tried that flavor. You had that before, Buck? Yeah, no, I have not. You may need to get the ginger for your because you got a little sore tummy. Maybe you need to stay with some ginger today for your innards. Oh, yeah. Okay. You're going to have to watch your intake today. I'm not a big ginger guy. You're not? You don't like the ginger root? Redheads, ginger. No. Stuff. No. Olipop is, Olipop is the good stuff. I'm going mojito kind of today. Mocktail. I'm drinking mocktail on the course today. There you go. That's good stuff right there. And also, Buck, how about some love to our friends at Sue Patrick this morning? I was going to say, 5222 Burning Road. Head on over there. I got to get over there before uh, Easter Sunday because I have to. we're not having an Easter egg hunt at my house. My wife and I just alone, I was thinking about, you know, getting her another jelly cat. King of the jelly cats is going to be back at it this week. I think I get something. I got to get one of those big jelly cats, you know, like the, the big lion that they have. Yow. Mm. That's going to cost you. Okay, Shohei. Can you loan me some money, Shohei? <laughs> yeah, just a wire transfer from my account. I got you. That guy took $4 million from his friend. I, it, it'd be hard to, for me to be friends with somebody that went and bet $4 million, made bets, and then had to come to me and say, hey, you know, we've been friends a long time, and I know you've got $700 million. You think you could loan me? No, not loan me because I'm not paying you back. It's one of those deals where you loan some, you ever loan somebody money and you knew you weren't getting it back. You oh, just yeah. knew it. And you said, and the best thing you can say to them is get it to me when you have it. Don't put any dates on it. I've, I've done that with, I've done that with people before. Hey Buck, I'll get you your money back in a month. No, they won't. No, you're, it's almost like I want to say, no, you won't. Mm. You're not. First of all, it's taking you the balls to ask me for this. Now, do you seriously think, you're going to get that back to me in a month. So don't say that. I'll have it back to you. What day is it? Okay, I'll have it next month at this time. No, you won't. Mm -hmm. So Shohei's buddy had to say, I need the money. I, I've got to have the money. But I don't know when I can pay you back. That's had to be that deal. Because you're not getting it back, ever. Here's the fellas. We got double R. We've got WAGs. It's... Okay, I know you got the money. Doing, I need the $4 million. I know you can do it for me. <laughs> got a little bit of a gambling awesome. problem. You got a bookie that I got to pay. And I know you're making 200 mil a year with BK. Do you mind giving me $4 million so I can pay off this bookie? Uh, I'm not going to pay it back to you. So I'm not even going to tell you I'm giving it to you back because I know you make 200 million a year. Is it okay? We're boys. Can you just give me 4 mil? Wags? You guys buying? Are you really buying this? Wags, can you can you help me? See, I'm not I, giving I need, you any I money. Need a friend like that, thing, Bucky. Shohei didn't give any money. Shohei bet the money, Buck. Oh, see, there's another. There's a. Mm. That's what he's believing. Get out of wow. here. Go go take your little Jeter back there and go talk to Shohei. Go buy a little Shohei doll and then you know give him give money to the madman or something. I, I don't I don't know what to tell you. If you're believing this horseshit that my best friend stole my money, come on, Ronnie, guys. can you just give me four million? You're making two hundred million. Would I you can know tell you one thing. I can tell you one thing. Otani also plays poker because the way that he sat there with a straight face, and even at the end, you know, he was kind of like, I can't believe, you know, that somebody yeah. I can I can't believe my great buddy Bucky Godbolt did this shit to me. It's like uh that dude, straight face, man. Straight face. So uh should have won an Oscar. Obviously, you guys wow. aren't buying. Did, we, we, mean, we've got some we've got some Asian haters on chaos. Here. On. Don't you no put disrespect. that on me, Ricky Bobby. No disrespect. Don't you put that on me. No disrespect. I mean, what are we? We too low? What, what is? What are you hey, doing? Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, everybody, why don't you get down there to fifty-two forty-two Burnett and see uh, Sue Patrick? You're, 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 not you're not believing. You're not believing that the guy had just. What does Hills Cafe him. have to do with this? <laughs> help a friend. How about helping a friend? Oh, that thing would burn down. You wouldn't have to worry about it. That's get, what I'm talking about. Uh oh. Oh, there it Lord, goes. It's shaking. Goes. It's shaking. Here it goes. BK oh. girlfriend walked in a room. <laughs> here comes the a jardians effort. lady oh <laughs> stop god it. stop it jill from jardians leave hey, her alone she's on, she's on a reese's uh reese's easter 
uh, candy. No, candy. no, she's oh, she did hair. Oh, her A one C. What about the A one C? Yeah, it was like that that Easter egg candy from Reese's. She was sitting there and she's like promoting that shit now. I'm like, come on, what is this? Uh, uh, hey, money talks. Money That's talks. Right. <laughs> Those gigs are hard to get, boys. Those gigs uh, are hard to get. The, give me an Easter the, dance. The, the randomizer. Give me an Easter dance. The randomizer is talking. Here we go. <laughs> Spoken. The winner of today's $50 Cabo Bob's gift card is someone from the Coda text line. A 512 oh, number. 9246. 9246. The winner of that $50 Cabo Bob's gift card. Texted earlier, pick me. I hope the randomizer did, in fact, pick you. Really? Just like that? That's how that thing works? Uh, just like that. Like, it's completely random. Yesterday, it chose somebody from the YouTube. Today, it chose Chose Choose. somebody from the Coda text line. So there we go. By the way, can I bring back a bit right now? Buck, right. you have a couple minutes here? Yeah. What bit? So there's a bit that uh did on the old RBKD show that I also brought back to, or I brought down to Houston for my two years there called Hypothetical Tuesday. Not sure if you guys remember this one, but it's where I posed a hypothetical slash would you rather question to the other folks on the show. Okay. And I got their responses to said question. So I kind of want to bring that back when we do crosstalk on Tuesdays. Y'all up for it. that? Cool. Idea. Let's get it. I'm a fan. I like ready that. For, ready for the first one? Yeah. This could go anywhere. This could go anywhere. We're going we're gonna to start with a bang here. All right. Are you going to uh, bang and Jill? Oh, from Jardians? I, I don't know. Maybe Wood you are with I want the maybe you are with girl. Jill in this situation. Yeah, I, I know all these girls. You, I know all three of you would be all over the Jardians ladies. <laughs> Absolutely. I know hypothetical there. Okay, let's say you're at a bar, you're on a date with the Jardians lady. Let's let's incorporate her. Okay, in okay. I'm like it. All right, we're we're having a great night. We're having a great yeah. night. And your date opens her purse, and you accidentally see there's a Ziploc bag in there with human teeth. She's got a bag. <sighs> Full of human teeth inside her purse. What do you do? I'm asking her whose teeth. I'm are asking there. her what the f is that. That's exactly what I'm going to say. Is, well, that- is there an answer? Is there an answer that would suffice? As long uh, as she no. says that they're her granddad's, I'm fine. No, that that no. would work. Why the hell do you keep your granddad's teeth in a bag? BK, I'm kidding. I want to know whose teeth they are, though. No, but are you are you are you staying with her? No, no. um, probably not. Probably not, but I, I'm I'm leaving as soon as I get. I'm not leaving until I get the answer of whose teeth they are, though. I'm like, only I'm only staying. I'm only staying with you if you put those back in your mouth. Well, oh, like dentures. I'm, yeah, <laughs> so that's what I'm picturing. So wait, so wait, are they just? Are they, they're just loose, like random single yep, teeth in a random, bag. Random teeth, a bag full of of chiclets, teeth. like yep. chiclets, a bag full of chiclets. I'm gonna I mean, go. I'm out. You're just leaving. I don't. I don't think the tooth period's got to. Got a deposit. I don't think you're getting your money back on layaway or some shit like that. It's gone. Um, it's you're gonna have to put those teeth away, lady. Kids looking under kids' pillows and taking their teeth. Rodney, what what about hey, you? I'm running. I'm running for two reasons. Number one, I've got a lot of gaps in the back of my mouth where teeth have been pulled out. And number two, in the corner of this part of my mouth, I've got crooked teeth, and she's gonna pull mine out too. So oh. I, I'm like, I'm gone. What if, what if, what if, what if the date's, getting what if the date's here. going really well? Yeah. Like you, got, you guys are all married, so this is to, like put yourself in single guy's shoes. You're trying to find the one. Date's going incredibly well. You're you're vibing. You're jiving. It's all good. And then that happens. You're you're out. I'm out because yeah. I'll never get because I'll out. never get over that. That'll never yeah. go away. Yeah, that's just no part weird, of that, man. No part that's of that. Just weird. And now I gotta like, how do you know this situation? How do you know this scenario? Well. It's like so, no, so no, Rod, 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 Rodney. Hold on, hold on, BK. How do you know about this scenario? D- this he is up here, brother. Oh, okay, okay. I'm, I've got a master <laughs> hypothetical list. I got like three hundred of these. We got a Stephen King just writing all kinds of shit out here. Oh, I'm a this I'm is... a psychotic, dark piece of shit. You guys know that. <laughs> This is this is one of those things where you talk about people like they put a notch on the bedpost or whatever you want to call it, or yeah, or yeah. or somebody keeps panties or or whatever the case is. Oh. This is one of these things where you're going to get in there in all the passion, and then you pass out, and then you wake up, she's gone, and and you're like missing a molar or or a front tooth or something like no, that. No, I don't. A girl that would mark your back just to make just to say that she was there. No, right. dude, like I'm, I'm putting a claw in you. I'm all right with that. I don't court, mind that. Too much court TV to find some girl with a bunch of teeth in her purse. I watch. I see too. I watch too many of these shows. 
that would be enough for me. I'd be like, you're too weird. I'm gone. Here, I'm going to pay for dinner, but you need to get the hell out of yeah. here. I'm going to pay for dinner. I'll probably, I'll probably finish. Seriously, like, I'd probably finish dinner. I'm definitely asking why the teeth. Like, like yeah, where are these teeth fine. from? Whose teeth are they? Please tell me they're yours and you just kept them over time. Um, I hope they're not an, an, another individual. <laughs> well, I mean, depending, depending are there earrings on earrings in there, do your earrings belong in there with the teeth too, honey? I mean, what, depending, what, depending what kind of date it is. I mean, it could be like maybe a single female with a kid and it could be like, well, that's, I'm the tooth fairy. I'm the tooth fairy. So I just kind of put them in there. So, I mean, you may get that story. I mean, in this day and time, she's you know, still too weird. she's still too weird. Yeah. yeah. She's, she's yeah. going, what, well, what's okay. Let me ask you this. What's the hot to crazy ratio that we're looking at here. If uh, she's still from, if she's still uh, from this Jardians, is, this is we're, at, we're out after the appetizers. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, she's yeah. not, she's got the rest of a meal to finish. <laughs> yeah. Then and, and, and I'm not looking, I'm not really, I'm now, since you've asked me this at this age, I can't go back to the days. I was never really looking for crazy. It just happened to find it me. Found you. Yeah. Going, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I'm not going out of my way looking for crazy. I just, yeah. I, right now in my mind, I just move along. And and by all means, eat something soft. <laughs> yeah. eat something soft. <laughs> Don't be eating, you know, all this hard shit, you know, that, that that's going to be making your teeth, teeth even looser. You know, what scares me is maybe her teeth are falling out. And then that dream you have where you're kissing somebody and your tooth falls out in your mouth. It's like, yeah. oh, oh it's, no, no. It's like She's that. Gone. It's like that French kiss. You stick your tongue in there and you hit the retainer and knock the whole thing oh, out. Oh yeah, the <laughs> French tooth comes. <laughs> all right, yeah, all right. right. All right. See you guys. <laughs> Later on, guys. Leave us with that. What a hypothetical. Yeah, welcome to Chaos Theory on a wild Tuesday, where BK through the hypothetical Tuesday of teeth, teeth. Well, yeah, I didn't see that one coming, dude. I, I didn't come see from a town coming. where you put them, you know, you put all the women together, you might get a full set of teeth. So, I don't know. A rail, yeah. a railroad town, the Brunswick Railroaders, right out, like I'd say, right outside of Baltimore, but it's a suburb of Baltimore. It's like, um, not even a suburb of Baltimore. It's like an hour away from Baltimore, but nobody else knows where Brunswick is, unless you've seen the Blair Witch. If you've seen the Blair Witch, you know where Brunswick and Burkittsville's at. Hey Wags, um, I want to ask you before we before we dive in. Just I know we're having fun, and and you know we raise a lot of. Hell this is gonna on be here. a fun Tuesday. This is gonna. I mean, we got a little bit of NBA to talk about, man, but we ain't got. I mean, we ain't got much college sports except for it's going to be a lot, dude. I do want to ask you. I mean, I know that I'm kind of the social media news person. Did you see uh, uh, the news out of Baltimore this morning uh, with the yeah bridge? The, with the key bridge? Uh, yeah, the key man. bridge. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I was actually struggling if we were going to talk about that or not because you know not a lot of people are from Baltimore or back east, so it's not really relevant to them. But huge story from back home where I'm from. Um, the key bridge, which connects uh, the mainland and helps connect it to the islands there. Uh, across to the Chesapeake Bridge and and whatnot, um, got hit by a by a boat. Uh, the captain says that the freight or the the vessel lost power and it went right into the key bridge. They're calling it a mass um, casualty. Mass mass casualties. Thank you very much. Uh, all of my family are safe. All of my friends are safe. Thankfully. Um, and if you guys got anybody back east that's around the Baltimore area, please do check in on them to make sure that everything is okay. But what an actual disaster and catastrophe that has happened back east, folks. Yeah, and you know, I meant to mention this uh, yesterday as well, Wags, and, and, and I do want to, and I'll keep it short. Um, I know we have a lot of folks that are checking in, whether on the Code of Text line or on YouTube. Um, there was a horrible incident uh, down south uh, in Hayes County um with um a school bus from tom green elementary oh my I, believe, God. I believe that was friday um head on um collision there with a with a cement truck and um it was uh there was a young young five-year-old that that perished in in that and and lots of injuries and um it was um it was really bad um and I, i've got a lot of friends down that way um as a matter of fact Bo uh bobby my, my show partner yeah bobby chad um, his um one of his best buddies was uh behind the vehicle that ended up in the head-on collision with that oh, bus no. and um his friend you know as 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 we you know good people do went in and 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 helped um uh, as that was happening and it's a pretty rough um story oh, sure, to hear man. that told but uh so so lots Arts of prayers, and prayers man. i mean seriously yeah, like Tom green elementary that's yep, all that's, we can do, man. Thoughts and prayers. In, in Hayes County ISD. So uh, lots of 
prayers and thoughts to our friends down south and folks back uh, your way in Baltimore. It's a uh, shout out, shout out to them, right? Yeah, that's that's always that's you know the news is tough to talk about because usually the news isn't really good, right? And yeah, um, I feel like we we've, we've kind of gotten away from the news cycle to where it's not actual factual. We hell, we kind of talked about it, we touched about it, um, with the whole Shohei or uh, excuse me, um, with the whole Kim Mulkey. Yeah, uh, scandal with with Brian Kelly and the Washington Post or whatnot with yellow yellow journalism. Um, look, man, we know we're supposed to give you like the facts and everything, and we know we're we're supposed to you know entertain you and make it you know fifty percent fun or whatnot. But sometimes we we got to talk about the the rough shit, and and usually the news is kind of rough. Um, because honestly, man, I'm I come and subscribe from the ideology that no news is good news, right? Like if yeah. you didn't hear about anything today, nobody died. So, yeah, uh, it's usually yeah. a good thing. But yeah, um, hearts and prayers back east and hearts and prayers down south. That's for sure, man. Yep. Like, hopefully, you know, hug your loved ones, guys. You just right. you hear, never know, never know. Absolutely, you're here one day and you're gone the next, man. Uh, what's some good stuff to talk about, though, man? What's what's something that's gonna put a smile on my face? Uh, what can we do? Uh, uh, the Otani thing, I think, was a really big story. Um, it's you know, still a big story. Are you really believing this bullshit to where he's saying that somebody actually stole the? Like he, he's now come out and it's officially say, made a statement that says I'm you know taken back by it you know I'm heartbroken grief stricken uh, my best friend who I've known all my life just yeah. I never thought that he would do anything like this how in the hell does he have access to that type of money. Yeah, you know, I think it's one of those things where if you listen to like yesterday when at, when at, right after I happened to catch it live and then they had a couple of dudes there on MLB that were like, of course, making the case, uh, you know, for it. And and the same thing on ESPN where they're making the case to where and, and I do understand when you're in a situation like that where people are handling your money and so forth, where, um, you know, you, you, you don't a lot of times you don't know how much money you have. You don't know where it's going and so forth and so on. But that that that's just a really hard pill to swallow um, and, and really hard to believe. I guess I mean I, I've been broke, not broke, but but I mean it's been one of those things where I've never had a huge abundance of money. Sure. So I guess that, 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 that's I, I, where I, we think about it different. Most you know of us I mean? live from check to check. You know what I mean? Like most of us do. Like thankfully, you know, in in my thirties, I lived you know from check to check, and I don't know how it happened, but like when you get to your forties, you just become more comfortable. I don't get it. I don't know. There's not a, a real valid explanation. Uh, maybe you just don't blow your money like you used to or whatnot. But yeah, in my thirties, we were check to check and now yeah. we actually, you know, we're, we're, I wouldn't say we're thriving, but we're doing well. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's most, I, w I feel like most Americans are check to check. Are they not? You know, I, I really think it is. I, I mean, because like with the soaring costs of, you know, right. rent, what, yeah, if you're renting or, or whatever. Uh, Property tax goes up every exactly. damn year. Exactly, dude. I mean, and that's where, like, like I admire my wife so much because what she does. I mean, like with our house, we don't we don't have an escrow, and so she is like, and our property taxes in Williamson County are fucking out the roof, ridiculous. You, you ain't got to tell me. And thankfully, I'm exempt. So I. Oh well, yeah, that's right. You are. Yeah, I got my rating back, and thankfully, you know, now I, you know, yeah. Uh, that's the only that's honestly rodney that's the only way that i can afford to live where we live yeah is yeah because but, i don't have to pay the property tax. but but it's one of those things to where uh, you, you know like every month when i get my credit card bill or, or she gets a credit card bill because i fuck, i don't even know where my mailbox is for crying out loud it's like I, I get this thing set in front of me and it's like okay what was this what was this what what was this and i, I just find it really hard to believe that and the whole thing is that this story's been so wishy washy, just the whole way that it started out. And oh, I thought Otani spoke English, right? Uh, I guess he's like no mas. Well, I I'm guess telling you right now, guys, Spanish. give the guy <laughs> an Oscar. Spanish. Give, Sorry. <laughs> give the guy an Oscar because this is one hell of an act. Unless you're that, I don't know. Keanu Reeves is a pretty good dude. Like, I, I think like Keanu Reeves is probably pro the, the most purest soul on all of them, all this earth, right? Yeah just from what I've read on Keanu Reeves and what, you know, the tragedy that he's gone through and what he's persevered, persevered. I mean, he lost his daughter, lost his wife. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, lost best friend. I mean, he's just, he's gone through it all, man. He's gone through the ringer and he's still just one of the kindest and most humble dudes. Right. Um, unless you're telling me that we have a, a second coming of Keanu Reeves and another, the, the, the second purest soul in all of the world is Shohei Otani. And he just, 
is so naive to where he doesn't know that four point five million dollars. We're not talking about four hundred fifty bucks, guys. Four point right. five million dollars. We're talking about. And I don't know. I've never had seven hundred million in my bank account, so I wouldn't know what four point five million looks like. Maybe it does just kind of it's a blimp and it just goes away like that and you don't notice it. No. Four point five million dollars. It's if you be, come on, you you really want to be entertained and, and told and believe a whole bunch of bullshit if you believe this story. That's all I gotta say. I can't yeah. believe the actual official statement. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is. I, I was talking to a friend. Uh, I was talking if to a friend. If it smells like shit, it's probably shit. That that's right. That's right. Uh, what what was the one that uh, who was it that said if it walks like a duck? I, I don't know. They got in trouble for saying it. Uh, I forget what that whole thing Probably was. Probably a duck. Uh, yeah, something like that. But no. I was talking to a friend of mine last night um, after my uh, revved up show, and uh, she's a reporter up in California. And to, just, just I reached out to her just to kind of go back and forth on this. And she actually at one time was married to an MLB player. Um, and she was telling me, she said, you know, with a lot of these guys, I mean, you do have people that handle money and, and they do all this for you. And you, do, you don't know the amounts of money that are going out and you're spending charity money. On this. My, my dog's chirping. I'm listening. Yeah, you're good. You're good. You're good. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're giving money to this and you're doing whatever the whole thing is. Um, but the whole, the, the, the question that I came back to her with was, so is it just random people when, when her husband you know did, did he have random people and he was he was not a foreign guy he, he was an american and she was like no she, he had money managers See? that would handle right and, the, may, maybe a charity you know somebody that, that that dealt with nonprofits and charity somebody else that did this or or whatever and they wound up running a foundation and all this different stuff and i said but but, but these were legit people right and she's like yeah i said interpreter I said that that's that's kind of hard to believe. A bet, and she's like, "But it was his best friend." I'm like, "Doesn't well, matter, I, you know." And and you don't and you don't you don't just say, "I don't realize that four point five million dollars has left my bank account." It right. doesn't, work. guys. It doesn't work like that. It just right. really. And of course, right. I'm I'm being very presumptuous. I get it. I know. I just if I'm telling you right now, it stinks. It absolutely it does. Stinks. It really does. And like Daryl G says, I mean, there's got to be somebody. I mean, unless this dude was the financial advisor, which I don't think uh, it was. But the whole thing is, I mean, if if all of these multiple $500,000 wire transfers are happening, and it's not easy to wire, tra it's not easy to wire transfer $10,000 for a home down payment, I can tell you crying out loud. No, and it, you're going to. I yeah. get a bank account. I get a notification from my bank account. Shout out to Navy Fed. If $10 gets um gets withdrawn from my account it doesn't matter if it's ten dollars it doesn't matter if it's a thousand i get a i get a withdrawal notification from my account right so uh, show hey get a better get a better bank buddy get a better friend get a better get a, story get a better story <laughs> move on I mean, find I, another story to write my I god that, anyway, that's the whole talk about another story there was some oh. nfl news that came across oh. uh this past week and over the weekend man so the owners agreed on outlawing the drop tack or the hip drop tackle which what and, and i'd love to hear from the peanut gallery here i'd love to hear from everybody that's watching chaos theory and especially everybody that's you know mobile and listening to us on that code of text line 512-222-9328 i'd love to hear from you guys and chime in what's your all's thoughts on outlawing this it feels like the defense is already at a damn disadvantage anyways right it, it sooner or later i and i i kind of talked about this uh maybe two years ago too i i harped on this it's going to come to a situation where the defense can only hit the offense in one little zone and it's going to be like right around the heart or whatever yeah. and they're going to have to wait until the offense is squared up and can see them coming fully on because hell but, but when we get to that my that point we might as well make a two-hand touch and shit like that maybe I've, I've also seen a lot of people from the other side of the aisle that think that this doesn't really do much with the hip with the the hip drop tackle anyways I'm I'm all for the defense. Maybe it's just because I played defense and whatnot. I think they they're already at a clear disadvantage, um, and you know, hell, their safety's almost at risk now because they can't even lead with their head. You know, they yeah. can't give full force. They got to basically absorb the blow from the running back or the ball carrier. And now you're telling them that they can't utilize a form of tackle. So you tell me, Rodney. 
Uh, you know, I, I think this is something to where, and here we get to these discretionary calls. I mean, that, that, that's where, I mean, this is just going to be more, you're extending games. I mean, here's a hell of a lot no, no, of more. You, you were kind of flirting with it right there. I thought you were going to hit it. Um, yeah. You said extending games, of, but I thought you were going to say influencing games because well, there's a really good chance that you could do that too. We yeah. talk about betting with Shohei Otani. We also need to talk about that, the, you know, there's sometimes that there, there are clear officials that that influence games rodney yeah and the whole thing is i mean that's where you go back to i mean it's going to be i mean it's like the pass interference thing and and the tuck rule and just you name it i mean it's just something else that's going to be so discretionary as to was it really that i mean this move here i mean from what i've been told i've got i've got you know folks that that i know that play rugby this is this is like a rugby move. This is what you do in rugby. You're using your weight it, to take you're, 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 you're distributing your, your weight to take the defender down. Yeah. Or not the defender, the ball carrier down. The ball carrier down. And that's, I mean, what, what's happening with all of this is that you've had, you know, a handful, well, more than a handful of plays to where, you, you know, you've had folks. I mean, the first, uh, Tony Pollard is the one that I think of, you know, in, in the playoff game to where these Boy. things have happened and, and they get injured. But I'm like, dude, let's. It, it, what are we going to do next? What DZ, are we going to do I, next? DZ, I get this, but you play defense too, man. You're you're going to sit there and tell me that you're not going to take – you're going to sit there and keep allowing the, the committee or the commission to uh, take another um, tool or skill set away from the defense? This is bull – I mean, so what? Now, now you got to actually – you got to be able to hand clean 315 pounds to absorb any type of running back just so you can make a fucking tackle? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's you're off on this one, Dave. Come on. I mean, I know that they're getting hurt, but come on guys. Come on. Yeah. I saw, I saw a tweet uh, this morning from Sean Salisbury. I actually just pulled this up and he's like, and this, this is kind of the path. I mean, this won't happen, but this is kind of what you start to feel as an NFL fan when, when this bullshit, you know, continues to happen next up for NFL rule changes. Number one, defenses have to play patty cake with the ball carry before they tackle him. Number two, defenses have to count to five alligators before they rush the pass. And blow him the kiss. Yeah, exactly. Catch a tiger by and, gotta play catch a tiger by a toe before you get yeah. in there too. And and this just went down uh just minutes ago. Uh this was kind of the other story. The NFL I, I owner, no, I get it. It's a money driver. I get it. I, I get it. Yeah. The the NFL owners approved the uh the, the change on, on kickoffs to go to what the XFL was doing, which that one, if uh, in the in the thought of safety, I mean kickoffs are Kickoff no, I'm, I'm I'm for that. Yeah. Like I actually, yeah, I like it that sucks because a lot of people make the make special teams that way, right? A lot of a lot of people actually get on a roster because of their ability to right. play special teams, right? And I think like if you do restrict this, you're you're basically making a roster spot irrelevant. You could take essentially third string linemen and put them on special teams because it doesn't matter that much to where you don't need a, you don't need a hands team ready to go out there. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just think it takes jobs away from people if you uh, eliminate or restrict special teams to only certain much. But I get it. Like I'm yeah. all for it. like I, I was a a wedge blo- a wedge buster. You can argue that not, I'm not all there. Um, I don't think it's just because of you know but busting the wedge or whatnot. But still, man, you go down there and you're just running full steam to to break running the three people just to bust the wall so somebody else yeah. can make a tackle. And then also you got people running head on. You got the you know, if the the returner is running full speed and you know meets a damn headhunter or whatnot, yeah, full speed, that just, is just that is that is one yeah. hell of a wrecking ball in a collision, man. So I I, um, yeah, I do bad I do shit like can that move. On a but bad shit can happen on any damn any yeah, regular absolutely play the absolutely. I I like the kickoff thing. I, I mean, and, and and it does. It actually hey, looks pretty I cool. Too. I do it looks too. pretty cool. To be honest with you, but and, but back to the back to the hip. Hip toss oh, thing. Hold on one second. What, what's the what's the thing in the is it the XFL or not the XFL, the AFL where they lined up like 10 yards away from each other? So yeah, um, so so that's what they're gonna do. You'll okay. have the kicker kicking from the from the spot wherever he's at, and then you'll have I think the the kicking team lines up on the opposite team's 40, the other right. guys are on the 35, and you can't you can't move until if it goes in the end zone until, or until it hits the target or, or the receiver, correct, or, or until the target. The which, which that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool because that that's like the old uh, the old drill where you're just one on one. I mean, you're five yards apart, and then boom, you go. And you know, I think at the same time, that's really cool because the 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 re- 
the guy bringing the ball out of the target zone doesn't have a distinct advantage because he's not that far behind. And at the same time, you don't have guys going, you know, full fucking bore into each other uh, because that really is dangerous. And you actually, you you get more like authentic blocks too. Like if you're lined up, you know, basically five yards away or, or, you know, that, that if you're reducing the distance from when you got to make contact with somebody, you're actually going to get sound blocks or I guess you could, you could make me it's maybe more of a stick one-on-one. with your blocks a little bit, but yeah, yeah, it'll be a lot better than running back there, forming a wedge, and hopefully yeah, nobody yeah. takes you out. So. It, it eliminates kind of the wedge buster and all that. I mean, you had the gunner on the outside. I mean, it eliminates all of that. I mean, that that's the real hard contact right there, which inevitably that's the goal here to make everything safer. And and I think this is going to be the cool part is that you get the runner back in the target zone if he's able to get through all of the the blocking going on. This is where. You one on one with the kicker, yeah, because his ass is way back make there. Move. And you got to think that the ball carrier is going to be able to make that absolutely make that thing go. So. I'm good with that, but but that hip toss tackle, I, I mean, come on, that uh, I know hips and and every I, I totally get that, but I don't think that that's something targeting. You look is at targeting. Bo Jackson, is this kind of like this is? You could argue that this is why Bo Jackson got hurt. The hip thing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you really could, because that was really what because he was. I mean, he was dragging. He was trying to actually drag and get out of the tackle, right? And somebody was. I don't know, but I mean, is that a hip drop tackle? That's not a hip drop tackle. That the guy was just well, he was hanging on. But shit, was he that's so dim? Now you gotta. Here we go. Now and now it'll be up to up to determination, like you were talking about not too long ago. But the the whole thing is this is where I kind of go back to this when you look at like what you call a chop block you know the chop block where where it's like you're you're going straight to the knees I mean you're like boom you're going right down to the knees well chop block the, a chop block is or I guess that's a cut block or whatever yeah, it's, cut uh, block, whatever, it's whatever when someone's it. engaged with somebody up low and then someone comes down and chops yeah. you in your leg yeah I was I was taught to chop block because we used to could do that back back when I played football way back before we had uh when we had leather helmets but this whole thing with the with the tackling with the with the hip toss man I I think it's a pretty cool craft and I I heard uh D'Amico Ryan say that it's not something that he teaches um bullshit <laughs> but um you know it's um uh, I mean I personally think it's a beautiful tackle it's a great way to tackle and what you're going to come down to is it you're going to, we're going to have so many of these wags to where it's going to be these we're okay. We got to review it. Right. We gotta, what was the intent when you start doing intent, it's like, okay, you've got all these other people that are going to judge the intent of one fucking person. How do you not person. make it? How do you not, how do you hold my whole thing is how do you hold back and not make a natural football play? Like that's right. a, like as a linebacker, that's a natural, like you, you, you don't just train yourself to not, drop tackle or or to not hip drop or whatever you get the guy on the ground any way you can like i i that's the goal right right it's, it's a tackle it's like, the guy okay, it's like okay you know i got the guy around wait now do i gotta you know sit here and get myself in position to do a fucking gut wrench suplex yeah like like where are we going with it yeah it's like you, you get a hold of this guy and what do you have milliseconds if even that you're trying to hang on and, and, and you're thinking okay okay i can't swing my hips around because that's 15 yards um i can't do this uh, see, i can't leave I, I, I think c is right i think jonathan brooks was hurt on this kind of tackle because it was a defensive back that couldn't get him to the ground so he tried to yeah. drop that he just tried to drop him and get him uh get him down to the ground any way he could instead of you know, waiting for his yeah yeah for his it, mates to come and corral him. And you know what? In, in credit to the dude that did it, I don't I don't remember the guy that actually tackled him. But I mean, it sucks that Jonathan Brooks got hurt like this. But that's it's part of the it's part of the game. Yeah, it, think, it's man. it's called tackle football. You have to knock the guy down. I mean, it just seems like the the, the longer that we go on, and and it's more and more and more where we're just uh, you know uh, outlawing things that I mean, I totally get. Don't lead with the crown. I I, I, no, I I'm totally with you there. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you, even though that's how we were taught, you know, you leave with the crown and then rise up to kind of decapitate the player and knock the ball loose. Um, that's a that's a very efficient way to tackle. Uh, but, but you you know the other part, and, and, and I and I'm not and I'm not saying that I'm proactive of leading with the crown and doing all these different things and 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 tackling the way we were taught. I've got a helmet hanging over here in in my studio right now that Anthony Wood gave me from Westwood High School, and it's um it's it's a new helmet. It's a new helmet. They gave it to me as a gift. And I look at I look inside that helmet and I put that helmet on, and it's like, man, it's one of those air helmets, you know. Mm-hmm. 
You can air that thing up. I've aired it up. When's the last time you played? You didn't have an air helmet when you played football. When's the no last time? Wags. You're no only 10 wags. years older than no me. Wags. We had air helmets. Wags. I did not have an air helmet, Wags. I had I had the old Rydell. I mean, some of you older folks can tell. I had the old Rydell that had the big old little thick things all across the top and across the sides. If you were lucky, you could keep the fucking ear pads in. If you hit somebody too hard, it was going to fall out because the because the little you really didn't, have, you really didn't didn't no, have a helmet where no, you could pump wax, it up. Wax. No, I didn't have that, dude. I'm fifty to something years old. We I'm didn't 43, have three, man. I'm forty three. We had no, them. We didn't. Uh, maybe, I think it was maybe short, technology just kind it, of. It was, it was shortly after I left. I left, and they said, "Okay, th this dude's got a this dude's got a bad melon. We got to figure out a way to air up these helmets." But. uh it, again, I'm not advocating leading with the with the head and all this stuff because that is very dangerous. Dangerous I am. In, the, in the back and all that. I but, am. But but look, this hip toss thing, forget that. I mean, I don't know, man. They're just making it too soft. I mean, they're making it way too soft. So I guess it's going to be up to the UFL to figure out a way to. That's where fix we're, this we're going to be residing. We're going to be going to the UFL to watch our real football. That's for sure. Here, my okay. guys. Uh, or at least they're going to be the ones setting the setting the tone and making all the new rules coming in. Or at least that's a that seems. To be <laughs> yeah, the yeah, Daryl G. I had the I had the kicker helmet. I had the kicker helmet. Oh, with the one bar, one, one bar, bar? One, one bar, and it was down here. <laughs> I had a I had a noose ring, like the the bull or whatever. I had a noose ring right there. Yeah, with the full full cage and the noose ring, man, looked pretty yeah. gross, looked pretty sick. All right, let's get into it, man. We got some NBA to talk about a little bit. Well, hell, before we get into that, man, we'd be remiss if we didn't tell you how we watch our sports and watch all of our entertainment. It's with audio visual consultations. Not only do we watch it, we also hear it. 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. For 35 years, they've been setting the standard in audio visual automation in the Austin Central Texas area. So if you're in this area and you want you know, have the guys come out and check out your pad. Give them a call, 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. If you don't have an idea of what you want in your house, if you don't know if you want the, the two TVs or the two arcade cabinets or the four TVs or whatnot, or the dream theater that I have downstairs, just go to the website at avconsultations.com and see the gallery of projects I've done over the past 35 years, and then maybe you'll get an idea of what you want. Call Tom up. He'll come over. He'll, he'll say, hey. You should get a Sonos surround sound system too, and then you'll be, you'll absolutely be in heaven, man. Five one two two five five eight six seven eight. That's avconsultations.com. I was talking to a guy at uh, at uh, I was going to say a covert because because covert's coming up. I was talking to a guy at uh, Coda the other day on Sunday on race day, a friend of mine that I ran into, and he said, "Hey, I have one of those Tom McKay uh, systems." He said, and you know, he was he he was standing in a spot where he could only see one thing. He's like, I'm probably going to roll out of this bitch early so I can go home and, and really get my full surround. So uh, stuff really works. Hey, a couple things for Covert. Uh, the code of text line, 222-9328. Full blown going this morning. I think it's going to be loosely applied where the flag's only thrown uh, like the like the Tony Pollard one against the 49ers. Grabbed, him from, grabbed from behind up high. The defender throws his hips forward, lands on the guy's legs without using the momentum to make a tackle. Well, I'm sorry. That's kind of the craft. And that's pretty badass to be able to do that. So. I totally get that. Uh, one more from a 512 number, 9580. Don't forget, you guys drop your handle if you had one over at the horn. We'll get it uh, on the Coda text line. I'm 33, never had a pump, never had a pump helmet growing up. Not that I remember. Boom. That's like me. Really? That's, yeah, yeah. That's that's why and, I can't remember. Um, where, where, where's that number from? Is it a 512 number? Is it a yeah, Texas yeah, number? That's 512 number. Yeah. Yeah. 512. That's, we, so that's, so I'm wondering, we were in Maryland and we had, pump helmets so um, yeah no and we no. but we also like we had to pay 50 bucks to mm -hmm. play on any like any sport you had to pay 50 dollars for your sports fee your athlete's fee See, that, that's really where it's different here okay. here everything was you you just signed up and you tried now, to it's, boost, now it's boosters oh yeah yeah now now like, it's like all boosters like, get you everything down here man and, and you would say that this is the mecca of high school sports and high school especially high school football they, they um, get you down here and there's and there's <laughs> <laughs> recruiting going on down here <laughs> there's recruiting in maryland too like don't i don't want to sell that short i mean hell like you know well you're in this zone well if you went to here it's an engineering school you know yeah. we, you would you you could go you could go anywhere any school in baltimore if you went here you know that it doesn't matter where you lived as long as you go to an engineering school you're fine yeah, yeah no doubt hey your cars trucks suvs new or pre-owned only one place to go. It's Covert B Cave. They're great sponsors with us. 
not only on Chaos Theory, but Texas Sports Unfiltered. How about our uh, word from our friends at Cobra Hi, BK? I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Cobra BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous Hill Country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Absolutely. And hey, back to, back to that with the uh, with the helmet. Uh, this is actually someone that went to Westlake, as a matter of fact, never had never had the pump up helmet. Uh, but a very good point that they're making. We had huge. I mean, our shoulder pads. I mean, it was like, dude, they were massive. Even our leg pads and all that that you would stick in there. The, those things were huge. Very huge. So, yeah, totally get that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, don't trade Derrick Henry. That's all I got to say. If you if you were thinking about trading Derrick Henry because you thought that maybe you know his his years were declining and he he might have one year left, one really solid year left, well, don't trade him on this year because this is the year that he probably runs for three thousand yards and shit. Oh yeah, he God. he just extended his career by about four years with oh, not yeah. he, the, this rule just extended. And, and look, uh, I mean, guys, oh, take a flyer on Baltimore. Actually, yeah, I don't, does he get utilized? I, is he going to be underutilized at Baltimore? That was my whole thing. It was like, does Derrick Henry get underutilized at Baltimore? You would think not because they're such a run-heavy team, but most of that running is is done with the legs of Lamar Jackson. Well, I, actually, I that's, that, that's that's, that's tongue-in-cheek because Gus Edwards and Justice Hill got busy, man. Well, and I think this is where it, it really is a great move for them because they can take a little bit off of Lamar Jackson. Right. Kind of, no, kind of keep some tread on the tires right there. But, I mean, with moves like this, I mean, this really does extend the life. It does. This, this is funny. Like, we've been talking about how the running backs devalued, and it's they continue to be devalued, and here's this. And it's like, okay, this is going to extend some guys, but they're, they're still going to be devalued. So I, I yeah, don't know. Still, still, they won't be paid anything. You know what I mean? It'll yeah, just yeah. now we can have our cheap workhorse last a little bit longer. Yay. Yeah, yeah, this is done yeah. by design. No, that's it. everything. Cheap everything is calculated. My guys, everything is calculated. Let's remember that. Okay. Cheap if there's one labor. thing that, that wags teaches you, it's that everything is calculated. Nobody does mm. shit by mistake. Show. Hey, nobody. Yeah. 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 No doubt about it. Hey, let's no. talk a little NBA real quick. Can we, can you humor mm -hmm. me? Can we talk a little NBA. How are we sure. feeling Dallas? Man? Now look, I, I'm, I'm saying that because, you know, coming from the East coast, I find myself the residential Washington wizards fan here. And so usually I'm in, I'm in misery. I'm in company or I need company to, or people to keep me company from misery. Um, my son, which I can't, you know, I can't fault him at all. Uh, he's, he's abandoned the Washington wizards. Um, and I get it. You know, you live in purgatory for all your life. You don't know any types of winning. Uh, he didn't even really understand the John Wall and Bradley Beal deal. Uh, he didn't get to see that come flourish and actually, you know, turn into something that uh, beautiful that it could have been. Um, he just knows that Washington Wizards have the worst contracts in all of basketball. And he used to like Jordan Poole when Jordan Poole was at the the Warriors, and now that Jordan Poole's on the Wizards, he don't like Jordan Poole anymore. So I don't know. I don't get it. It's just different. But anyways, my guy, um, he has moved on and became a Mavericks fan. So it's engaged me with a lot of Mavericks uh, entertainment as well. And hell, it, it's it's hard to watch one of the most entertaining backcourts in all of the NBA, which is Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic. Um, it, what what's your take, man? I mean, I don't. I know you're a San Antonio. Uh, I know you're a San Antonio Spurs fan yeah. guy, but. I'm telling you right now, I think the Mavericks, Mavericks could make a shot at this. I know they're sitting at the seventh spot right now. It's a little bit daunting, you know. It, that we talked about how ruling the West can be, um, but they could probably make a run at this thing, man. Now I still think I got Joker and the boys from Denver at my top spot, man. They're probably going to be tough to knock out and, and beat, but I'll, especially if you get some really good forward play, man, the Mavericks can be solid, man. They can be deadly. I'm with you because in. And it is, you know, it's kind of Denver, like we've talked about. Denver sitting right there on top, but then when when you when you start stacking them up behind them, I mean, what's OKC is only a game back, but you know, I, I don't know, you know, if there if there's anyone that that can knock the Nuggets off. But the thing is, with Dallas sitting in that cluster right there, it um, it is where if they can, like we talk about with the tournament, I mean, if they can get hot at the right time, which I, which I it, it seems like we they, only got about it, ten games left. Yeah, yeah, it seems like it's about that time for that to happen, and 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 they are somewhat. 
I, I really do think they can make a run. Can they knock off Denver? You never say never. But uh, again, so Oklahoma um, matches up well. Oklahoma matches up well with with Denver, or they can because they of do. like Hol- Holmgren and Joker, Joker, right? Like that. Yeah. That's gonna be a good piece. But you got to think that it's Joker. Like Joker's gonna win that battle. My yeah, dude. Joker's yeah. absolutely gonna win that battle. Yeah, but I, I'm not. I'm not discounting Dallas. And and honestly, Wags, I, I'm not as so, again. I, I'm I, a fan I, of Lively. I think Lively coming in and yeah being huge in his rookie season fantastic yeah huge yeah i agree that it's going to run through denver but i'm not as sold on the nuggets as i was a couple of months ago now i think they're for the taking i think they're for the taking like you still about. man i don't know why i i they're the strongest damn it here's why you it's really hard to beat them in seven games mm-hmm. that's why like you could be, you might be able to beat denver on a night you know what I mean, but but to beat them in f- four out of three, yeah, four out of th- or or four out of seven regular, mm-hmm. well, that, that's tough, Rodney. That's that's tough. But but it's it, like like we're talking about when when you get into the playoffs and and I mean what Dallas is what are they won four? I mean they're in a four game run right now. Um, hell, even the Lakers are the Lakers. I think have won three or four in a row, and they're way down. I don't really see anything happening with the Lakers, but I, I just don't think where I was so apt before to say it's just going to be Denver. I mean, now with Oklahoma City, Minnesota, Minnesota. I mean, yeah, it's it's yeah, there. Dude. So, so I'm not discounting Dallas. Dallas can make a run. With no, that I, I got you. For me, I just think you know if if you're going to play Denver and you got to play, you got to you know, beat them four games. Yeah. They're going to, yeah. if it's a race to four that. or not even a race to four, if it's, if it's best out of seven um, against Denver, Denver's going to win that. I, I just feel like I, I'd put the mortgage. I'd put the mortgage on that, man. I would. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'd love your thoughts talking about the West. I mean, here comes Houston. What, what the hell's getting into the Rockets right now? These dudes are sitting right down, right below the cut line, as we say in racing, but man, these dudes are, I mean, they're, they're going for 10 straight. And they're there. Yeah, they're I, I think this is just I think this is just, you know, young entertainment Late season um, surge, for what yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they'll finish out this wrong. I'm sure they want to kind of finish as low as they can to get themselves in better position for the NBA uh, draft. But I, I don't even know. I don't think they're going to get a lottery pick any or they should get a lottery pick. I would think mm-hmm. so. Houston, I got to check. I got to see the draft next year. I'm actually I don't know uh, yeah. the draft well, order. As a matter I, of I'd be all right if they get up ahead of Golden State. That, that that I'd be good with that. I'm ready for that to be done. I mean, past Golden State, you're a half game behind them. Just jump up ahead of them and let's go. I'm, I'm not I'm sure. I'm not sure it quite works like that, where you just engage the damn uh, throttle or whatnot and say, "Hey, we're gonna go." I, I'd like to think that people are are trying to no switch tank just a little bit, or yeah. if if you're doing the it right uh, down, maybe maybe I'm just in Washington mode, Rodney, to where I'm hoping that everybody's tanking in, on Washington just so we get out of purgatory and actually get a pretty decent pick. Projected number one overall right now. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. But hey, well, I'm not a, I'm not a Wizards fan. I'm jumping. I'm going to be jumping ship earlier or well, later. And this, is, and this is like what Rob's saying right here, and this is where I'm talking about Houston. I want them to miss the playoffs. I, I, I'm I'm tired of Golden I don't State. Think that's going to happen, guys. It, it, it's close, man. It's close. Here come the Rockets. Here come the Rockets. They're blasting off, my man. I, I, I feel like I, I feel like, like Steph Curry. You know, talk about engaging a throttle. I feel like Steph Curry is going to put the Warriors on his back and keep them in playoff contention. I mean, I know they're sitting right on the cusp right now with Houston mm-hmm. breathing down the neck, but I think the Warriors actually hold on to this thing and they stay in and solidify it. Mm. I hope you're wrong, my man. I hope <laughs> you're wrong. I'm a Rockets fan right now. <laughs> yeah, because my guy. Because for me, it's a you know my team's four or five years off, so I'm I'm just a I'm just a casual fan right now. I'm just enjoying watching everything else at this point. I'm enjoying watching Boston. I'm enjoying watching just enjoying the game at this point because uh, my time is a coming, my friend. And meanwhile, on the other side, Boston, they're all hooked up. Yeah, that's, that's what I was much easier in the East. <laughs> you want to talk about even you know just the differential in, in talent in terms of of talent just with the East and the West here. Boston's running away with this thing where you got people you know you got basically the West Coast playing for breathing room essentially man um i don't want to discredit you know anybody any team from the the east because hell you know you've seen my my ideology you know with you know conference play like uh, this strength of conference you know this team coming out of you know this strong of a conference is probably going to do better than this you know midwestern uh mid-major winner or, or whatnot um I don't know. Usually, my my ideology with basketball sometimes it 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 connects and hits, but 
I don't know, the past couple of weeks I've just been off, man. So I'm kind of questioning all my thoughts for basketball. Um, yeah. Well, and then- I don't know. I- but that being said, Rodney, I I still think you know the second best team in the West is probably just as good as as oh, the absolutely. damn Celtics, man. Like yeah. you'd have to think so, dude. I'd even I'd even venture to say that that the Mavericks could beat the Celtics in a four game series. I really yeah. could, man. No. I just don't think that the East is that strong. I don't. Well, and of course. But now now you'll see my. You talk about the Rockets making a, a surge, right? Here comes them. Dead, here comes the Heat. Right at the end mm-hmm. of the season, like they always do, man, starting to get hot, starting to get blazing hot, like the Heat do. Well, and then you know, la- last night, I mean, when when Boston gives up thirty, you know, blow a thirty point lead to Atlanta, I mean, th- that kind of tells me that that the Celtics are kind of flipping the switch off and and just cruising. I mean, and why wouldn't they? I mean, at this point, I mean, hell, you got a massive advantage. You're almost eleven games up on everybody else. I mean, what? I hadn't heard that. Can we confirm this? Are we talking about? Are, are we talking, talking about, about the one and only Vy? There's Texas no legend. Way. Yeah, there's that's the only Vy I know. Yeah, that's what I'm talking Colin, about. Colin, what? Are you serious? I gotta look. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm searching. Rodney, tell them about tell them about autograph. Oh, while I check the EMP. yeah, ha ha, yeah, yeah. Search that on Twitter or X or whatever that damn thing's called. Hey, if you want to get rewarded for listening to Texas Sports Unfiltered, as you should, our friends at Autograph, co-founded by Congressman Tom Brady, are redefining the fan experience uh, by letting users earn points for acts of fandom that they do take every day, like listening to us, not just Wags and I, all day eight to five. We're live and local right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. The Autograph app gives you access to your favorite Longhorn content in one place and offers rewards like uh, exclusive merchandise, tickets, and more. You're listening to TSU. You might as well earn points. Go to your app store or check the uh, YouTube link down below and uh, download it and use the referral code TSU. That's like Texas Sports Unfiltered. TSU. And you can check that out. Again, that link is down at the bottom. Yeah, this was uh, reported uh, about uh, an hour ago. I see the uh, bar fight happening right there. Uh, a bar fight. Well, I'm gonna. I'm not. I'm screening, this, I'm screening this before I put it on. Yeah. On the yeah. air. Yeah. Uh, don't, so don't don't quite does know not the look, location. So Vince Young is clearly not being an aggressor or anything like that. Um, it's February fourth, by the way. Fe- February fourth. Okay, well, all right. Somebody pushes Vince, so now Vince is. Yeah. Somebody gets in Vince's face. Yep. Vince responds, or from what I can tell, yeah, it's just a, it's just somebody being an asshole is all there just, is to somebody it. Somebody threw a drink in his face. All right, now, yeah, all right. V wise and V wise clean on this. Yeah, he ain't done nothing wrong right there. Then he gets jumped. That's that's now just, it's, now it's now I'm not going to show the video. I, I won't do that. Um, yeah, I'll that's, wait. I'll, one, I'll I'll make sure that it's cool with with. BK first that's, before we that's, show a legend, legend like that going down some shit. That's that's an all likely some asshole probably walks up and doing horns down and talking to whatever and, and oh just, oh just takes, oh takes yo yeah. yo he gets yeah, dropped right. he yeah. gets dropped yeah that ain't right that ain't right right there holy moly yeah this is just breaking now it happened uh back on February 4th but oh, this uh, video damn. just released from TMZ um uh, about seven hours ago. Um, oh, sucker punch. He gets sucker punched. What a yeah. fucking. Ugh. Yeah. Dude sucker punches and then stands over him. Oh, yeah. That's not a. I mean, you guys can go to it. It's on TMZ. I'm not going to show it. I'm not going to glorify that shit. But yeah, the dude, it seemed to be all said and done with and all uh, maybe simmering down. And then Vince looks away and then the dude takes the opportunity. The guy's like clearly a foot and a half shorter than a little fucking punk. Um, looks up and then just jacks him as soon as venting looking hits him right on the chin and then drops him Bull- yeah. absolute bullshit yeah and knocked him i mean cold cocked him yeah him yeah out. i mean it just che- just a cheap shot you anybody would have gone down if they took a shot like this especially if you're not looking at it you don't think it's coming man you don't get a chance to react at it uh absolute bullshit man but yeah thank you yeah. for bringing that to my attention i didn't even see that um and that happened in Jeez. february yeah, February fourth was the date of that, and and this is just footage that apparently TMZ is just um is just releasing. It doesn't even say the bar that it was at. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I would assume that's in Austin. I mean, he works. Well, I know there's a lot of joke about if he works or not, but uh, he he works in Austin. I, I could only assume that this is somewhere in Austin. 
um, where this shit happens. And and again, this this goes back to it doesn't it, it doesn't it's it's in Houston. It doesn't list the venue. Oh, it's in so Houston. That, but it's in that's, Houston. That's his place. Yeah. So golly, man. Get, be better, people. I mean, it's one thing, you know, if you're going to go razz somebody, that that's one thing. A little, a little back and forth. I mean, that, that that's totally cool. But when you get to that point right there, oh, Tokyo Joe, Tokyo Joe's shot bar in Houston. Yeah, yeah, you ain't got the balls to 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 go nose to nose with a man if you want to be trying to throw hands. Yeah, that's fucking wrong. do it when he's looking the other way. That that God, that is so chicken shit. They, and then Steve, yeah, thank you, Stephen. Appreciate you. Yeah, St- uh, Tokyo Joe's shot bar in Houston. Got it. I saw it. Uh. Don't have the glasses on. Saw it a little late there, but yeah, okay. So here's the thing, right? And this all, and you know, this kind of gets me on, you know, Paul and Tyson here too, right? Like, if you're going to be able to, if you want to fight, you know, be a be a damn man, like Rodney was just saying, square the hell up and and fight on. I I, I say fight honorably, but on the battlefield, there's really, you know, you, you survive. But this is a fight, like this is an actual fight like if you're trying to throw hands with somebody there's no weapons involved be a goddamn man and stand there and take one man if you're, if you're afraid to get an ass whooping then don't fight that's the whole damn thing man yeah that yeah, chaps my ass like when you cheap shot people that chaps my ass dude if you can't fight one-on-one if you got to have your boys to, to fight three-on-one to, to beat up on somebody you're just as big of a, a coward and a wuss as, as anybody out there so yeah um, yeah that's that's the whole yeah. thing man when you go rolling up that like that and you want to start talking shit and you got all these other guys with you i mean that that's little man syndrome right there well, uh, well that, he was a little dude he, he was, was a little dude little, little fucking dude that that's just some fucking little guy. Oh, Texas A&M, and actually, I'm not gonna throw that on Texas. No, A&M. no, no, no. That, 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 I can't that, do that. I can't that, make it. I'm, I'm not gonna make light of that dude tongue and cheek on Texas. A&M. That's that's just some that's just some dude that that is probably for the longest time goes up and starts shit, and he always has all these all these other people. It's one of those guys. Have you ever had one of those friends? Yeah, I got like, one. I got one in our group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're in a group, and the guys over there talking shit, and yeah, whatever. And, when and we are more the ones that end up fighting. And he's he you fucking turn around. And, and yeah, I got one. Yeah, yeah. He's in. We the all bathroom. got one. He's we in all the got, We all got that friend. Oh, we all got that friend that runs their mouth, and then we end up fighting for that friend. So, oh my god, I think better, I think man. everybody knows. <laughs> I think everybody knows that guy. Um. Anyways, uh, Mike Tyson and Logan Paul, or excuse me, not Logan Paul, Jake Paul. Um, is this fight real or not? One. I saw, you know, I've seen a whole bunch of people. I've seen Shaq talk about it. Like, how can you feel good about, you know, even if you do beat Mike Tyson, how can you feel good about beating a 57-year-old man, um, regardless if he's a professional fighter or the best shape that he's in? I don't know if you've seen Mike Tyson work out. I've seen his footwork. It doesn't look like Mike Tyson's gonna, going to lose to Jake Paul. No. Um, and if this, is, if this is the validation that Jake Paul is looking for to make him a authentic fighter professional prize fighter you're going about it the wrong way fight somebody that is actually in the circuit fight some or or get yourself registered into the damn circuit right be a professional claim to be a professional uh fighter and fight professional fighters right get an actual record that's going to compile or or accrue right um i don't know you keep fighting these exhibition matches and yeah. i don't see your your prize fighting career or your boxing career flourish and take off to me you will always be a youtube sensation that a bunch of kids that love pokemon uh fell in love with because they have no idea or recollection of what boxing actually is exactly yeah no, no clue i mean no clue i mean and and actually wags the day that the day that Stu was on here the day that they said Pornhub was down and Stu was like this what the the what happened? what we were talking about on Friday when 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 Stu was on here that one day and and they messaged us that Pornhub was down and I said Stu the hub is down and he was like this. <laughs> so so that day we were actually talking about this because I was mean this the doctor was he distraught because he can't get to the hub. I, I think I, or he, I, or did he just I'm not know what the hell the I'm hub not, was? I don't think he knew what it was. <laughs> but uh, so so that day we were actually talking about this deal. Because I said, is this a fight? Is it a boxing match? Is it an exhibition? Stu actually sits. Yeah, see, we, we we brought that up. We we said that that he was basically not even looking at the dude, and the dude took the opportunity to to sneak one in. Stu Stu actually sits on the committee on the committee here in Texas, where they're trying to determine if they're going to classify this as an actual fight or if they're going to call it an exhibition because they, they don't know which route to go with it. I don't know why it matters one way it's or the other. Sl- it's going to be a slaughter, Rodney. Or well, it, 
I don't know. So here's the thing. If you're my, here, here's my, my beef with this, right? Like I hold Mike Tyson is one of, or I regard him as one of the best fighters, not boxers, right? Best fighters. Um, there, there's a complete difference with that. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Evander Holyfield is a boxer. Uh, he's going to point the hell out of you. He's also going to knock you out. Mike Tyson is, b- before he got into his antics of fighting or, or whatnot and just kind of lost his cool in the ring, he was a pretty good boxer i mean technically especially coming from uh the olympics or whatnot yep. but he was always a like he was just so aggressive such a brawler just a brute force in the ring just dominant always coming at you almost almost like george foreman like i i, I felt like watching mm-hmm. you know, going back and watching old heavyweight fights george Even foreman never backed yeah. off of anybody yeah. george foreman always kept coming at you like a bull yeah. man that's kind of yeah. like how how tyson was too but tyson doesn't didn't really point you he would get in he because of his short arms he'd get in he'd work the body and then try and knock you out man that's that's you know tyson's brutal mentality that's his fighting style right if he takes this into the ring and goes full force at jake paul jake paul is going to get destroyed he's going to get paul ain't got a chance yeah he he does not have a chance he's gonna shit his pants if that happens i mean Uh i'll 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 give jake paul some credit he'll probably stand toe-to-toe with tyson but he's going to get knocked out and if yeah. that doesn't happen, then I'm questioning. The, then I will be questioning the validity of the fight, and that takes me to every Jake Paul fight that goes down. I'm always questioning the validity, the validity of it. Even if you bring in a solid boxer or an old relic boxer like Tyson, like there's no way that he's going to want to give his his reputation a, a little bit of a dive. You yeah. know, if he even yeah. loses yeah. to Logan Paul. Yeah. Are, are you? <laughs> Look, you yeah. can't tell me that Mike Tyson's in the best financial situations right now. He probably doesn't have everything. I'm, I'm and I'm, I'm just speculating, of course. You know, a, a lot of older athletes probably want a little bit more money coming in. That's that's all I'm speculating here, right? It's, it's one of those things where if if you're Mike Tyson with the legacy that you have, and yeah, it's been a bumpy fucking ride. It's been a bumpy fucking ride. But he what you're saying, he, still gets, he, he gets good. He gets some some paychecks from time to time. But sure. I would think that you sure. want something else coming in. Rodney, I'm not speculating, but there is there a good chance that Tyson could be on the take for a Jake Paul fight? Man, I think that that's where you, you tarnish your legacy as one of the greatest fighters of all time if you go in there and you're going to let that fucking dude knock you out. Not, I mean, but he doesn't even have to knock you out. He all he has all Jake a win for Jake Paul is to survive the, the fight. fucking fight. Yeah, just win the fight. Uh code of text line. Uh Jake Paul is a fucking bum. Well, that's uh, shocker. Yeah, you know, it uh this this is where I mean if you're Tyson, I mean for for the amount of money, I mean money money does talk. That's also on the code of text line. I mean, if you're Mike Tyson, do you do you even give a shit at this point? Or do you just want to get paid? So yeah, I'm with CB here. I'm I'm the Paul brothers are so and I, I I'm a fan of Logan in or I was a fan of Logan in wrestling until he took a year to defend his title. Um, I, you know after he got the Intercontinental belt, you know where where'd you go, Logan? You you went out yeah. there mar- doing marketing schemes instead instead of wrestling. I don't know. Um, I believe that if you get the belt, you should be able to uh defend it and you know stay yeah. earned if you will, inside well, the squared circle. But. And, and, and Wags, here's another great point on the code of text line. Same person. Uh, when we talk about Tyson, Tyson does have a very successful uh, brand of weed um, and a really damn good podcast. So depending on what happens here, uh, that's only going to help. Uh, oh, one, dude, 100%. Like, I'm uh, telling you, I, I said it earlier, guys. Everything's calculated, all right? Everybody, oh, absolutely. No, nobody does something without the the thought or the, you know, the follow-through thought of what's going to happen, you know, after with, with pros and cons, man. Like, yeah. it, everything yeah. is absolutely calculated. You got to think that there's going to be a lot of money being, you know, um, generated from this thing, and Tyson's probably going to be able to collect some some decent revenue. Um, look, look, Jake Paul and Logan Paul are making a lot of money doing these YouTube fights, and what logan paul is now he doesn't even fight like he's just a wrestler but logan paul is there you know advertising his prime drink or whatnot so yeah youtube is uh, we're on youtube I, like clearly like this is this is the future streaming is absolutely the future in terms of entertainment so yeah yeah and this is this is where you go back to you know is, is tyson going to be in this to help not, not so much put him over but you listen to like the old stories with i remember no, one of the you're right you're you're absolutely Put him over. You know, one of the, one of the old ones that I remember hearing is like what when it came to pro wrestling was you like see, I was just getting to go. That you see Hogan come back. You see all these yeah. old timers come back to get these new guys over, man. Yeah, and it's like I mean, back in the old days when when it was like Andre the Giant goes to Hulk Hogan and says, "Never been body slammed," and he tells Hulk Hogan, "You're gonna body slam me." 
he's going to put him over. And, and look, look what that did. And look what that did. So it's so like Daryl G said, hits it right on the right 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 head here. I think he's doing it for the money, but also to put Jake Paul in his place for disrespecting boxing. I hope that's what it is. I really hope that's absolutely what it is. And he takes offense to this because Tyson, Tyson loves the sport. Tyson, I mean, ate, breathed, shit, and slept boxing growing up, man. Prize fighting growing up. So um, yeah. you see him growing up with Customato and Teddy Atlas. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, learning from the best there. And yep. you think, you know, maybe Jake Paul coming in here trying to disrespect prize fighting that Mike Tyson actually has something to say yeah, about it. And absolutely. Finally shuts this punk up. So. I, and I totally miss, I mean, cause again, here's showing the age thing again with the helmet. I mean, I saw Ali fights. I saw Leon Spinks. I saw Sugar Ray Leonard, you know, with the welterweights and flyweights. Now, and all I remember that. Sugar Ray, but I don't remember. Yeah. I don't Dude, remember Ali. It's like when when you really wanted to talk about one of those sports. I mean, boxing back in those days that 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 was that was the ultimate one on one man to man sport. Far before extreme sports and all this other shit. I, I've always said, Wags, the the two the two sports to me that were extreme sports way before fucking extreme sports were anything are boxing and motocross because that's where it's like that's balls. That's wow. balls right there. You on a motorcycle doing that shit that they do, and these other guys with a mouthpiece and gloves beating the shit out of each other. That's how we call American gladiators with balls. Dude, we, we need to American break that Gladiator. documentary down. We need to break that down. Yeah, we will break that. I don't know if you've been seeing that. I don't know if you've seen the whole thing, dude. dude. Binge watch that that that's on Netflix, man. You got to yeah. check that one out, man. Yeah, that was good. That was good. That was Fantastic. really good. What we got coming up here? We got uh, only an hour uh, coming up here in just a couple of minutes. Um, I'm going to speak of the devil, and here they come. And then uh, um, what do you got going on for the rest of your Tuesday, man? On your oh, hypothetical man. Tuesday. I'll give you a hypothetical. Yeah. Jake Paul gives you a chance to win a 1000 or win however his purse is. We'll say a million dollars to fight him. Would mm -hmm. you fight him? You remember those crooked teeth I was talking about in the crosstalk? Yeah. You damn right, because I'll get them fixed. Yeah. <laughs> I'd knock him out for free, baby. I'd knock, knock him, out, him for out for free. Kick him right in the balls and put him right on his knees. Man. Absolutely, man. We bring Jeff in right now uh, from only an hour, man. What's going on, Jeff? Happy Tuesday to you, my guy. You're talking about Mike Tyson knocking out Jake Paul or what? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Like, really? one, I, I, that's kind of what we were just talking about, Jeff. Is, is, it a, is Mike Tyson taking this because Jake Paul has been disrespecting boxing or does Mike Putting Tyson need a little bit of a payday or is this, Whoa. you know all market just a whole bunch of marketing you know uh, i mean it's all about marketing right at the end of the day i mean could mike use the money maybe but i there's just such a i think the money would have to have been worth it for him to do it number one number two man there's still such a uh, an aura around mike tyson right for better or worse right uh, it's polarizing yeah that, i look man i'm gonna watch it just because I'm kind of a sicko Mike Tyson fan, and I want to see like, do, does he have does he have one left in him? Does that one knockout left in him? Oh, I, I think he absolutely destroys Jake. Like, oh, Mike, that's my question. Dude, like, yeah. how does he not destroy Jake Paul? Man, I I saw. I think it was. I think it was. He, he was getting ready for the Roy Jones exhibition, and it just showed him just sparring and just teeing off on a sparring partner. And I'm like, I, Mike Tyson could be wheelchair bound and like right, dude. 80 and decrepit. I'm not. I'm not asking for a shot at the title. No, no way. So I, I, I saw him. I saw him sparring. It was on. It was on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, getting ready for this. And that dude is still like so quick. I mean, just so quick. And it's like I. I that's what, that's, what that's I was just, just telling. Work, man. He's still. He's still absolutely fast. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. I, I find it. I find it hard to believe that he would kind of take that dive. But because I know money now. drives everything. Yeah, I know money drives. No, look, he doesn't. Again, he doesn't have to get knocked out. Like for uh, to me, all Jake Paul has to do for success is just go toe to toe with Mike Tyson. That I mean, hell, that's that's more than a lot of men can do. You but know, you what know I mean? now Honestly. the the thing that Mike's got in his favor. You, know, you guys know this. Mike's got that old man strength. Oh yeah, old man, oh, yeah. old man strength is a different kind of strength. You know, so well, Mike. I'm not the Rodney's got it yet. I I haven't. I'm just tapping into <laughs> it a little bit. Rodney still embraced it full force. Wags, you know, and and your your son's older. Wags, are your dad reflexes still pretty good? Yeah, yeah, I got it. That's what I've noticed, man. Since my kid was born, like my my reflexes have been just tenfold. 
Spidey improved. senses, like, baby. Spidey yeah, senses. And, and the way that and stuff left and right, like, oh, you know, man, I don't really think that goes away, though. I, I honestly don't think that goes away. Maybe it gets hold, uh, dulled down and, and, you know, kind of puts, gets put on the back burner when, you know, our, our kids are in our 40s or whatnot. But still, I don't yeah. think it ever goes away. And the oh, older they no. get, the older they get, they get better. You ought to see me pivot to the beer fridge right now. It's a <laughs> fucking roadrunner, man. What's, uh, what's on the docket for uh, it's only an hour, guys? Uh, we, we didn't touch on any recruiting yesterday, so we got to do that. But I'll say this, man. I, I, I like the dad instincts, the parent instincts that I've got, you know, the little hand-eye coordination, reflexes. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have that old man strength yet. So you're gonna tap into it. Well, well, you're you're not even you're not even approaching forty yet, though, right? I turned, still... I turned forty last September. Back in September, I turned forty. You, you might start tapping into it. It might just start. You never know. You're gonna wake up one day. You'll be taking a piss, and all of a sudden, excellence is just gonna come out. You know, <laughs> I, I, I thought it did already, but <laughs> <laughs> you, you have you have. I promise you, brother. I promise. I'll, you. I'll tell you guys this right quick before we exit. It. Uh, I, I never really realized it at the time, but what, when my dad and I were racing cars full time. You know, I, I was younger. I was in my 20s. Um, you know, we didn't have a fancy shop. We didn't have all this other stuff. So we're sitting there changing out motors and doing all these different things. My dad would lay in the driveway with the car up on jack stands and just bench press transmissions into the flywheel. Yeah. Just pull it out. Nope, nope, nope. Don't like it. Let me get it back down. Just bench pressing transmissions. It's like, holy shit. Yeah, that's, um, that generation, uh, just a different generation, my guy. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the greatest generation for a reason. That's for sure. All right, guys, I'm going to get out of here, man. Y'all have a great Tuesday. We'll see you guys tomorrow for Athlete of the Week. Woo, Later, Ask Wednesday. See you guys. All right, it's Jeff. It's Jordan. It's only an hour. We got to talk some recruiting. Jordan, we did talk about that Jake Paul, Mike Tyson exhibition, though, because you, you, you found out about it the day before it was announced. I inadvertently found out about it. Oh uh, yeah, and the uh, I think I said it already, and I, it's common sense for. I mean, I'm not a boxing guy, but uh, I think it'd be common sense for anyone that pays attention to that uh, to that world. But the week before, they're gonna call it an exp an exhibition, but apparently they're gonna treat it like it's not <laughs> all the way up until the week before. So isn't that isn't that what they did with the Roy Jones Mike Tyson deal? I have no idea. Don't <laughs> I don't the I've watched like three like martial arts i guess fights in my life and not even maybe not even three and one of them was mayweather pacquiao um yeah that was boxing just yeah. straight up that boxing, was a humongous man. thing uh one was didn't floyd mayweather and mcgregor fight mayweather mcgregor yep yeah, and then after that, I can't remember. <laughs> and the only thing, the only reason I remember those two, not because I'm a Floyd Mayweather fan or anything, but it's just because those are like large cultural events almost. You know what I mean? And um, I was for both of them. Like, uh, I had a buddy who I grew up with who's really into like martial arts and shit. So whenever those two fights happened, he had him and all of his buddies come over to his house. We watched at his house, but. Yeah. Outside of that, I've never, I've never been in it at all. Not a big, not a big combat sports guy. I, I'm really not either. The last fight, you know, other than the ones you mentioned, which you kind of like, you know, it's, it was a deal somebody bought him. Like especially Mayweather Pacquiao, it's like, all right, I know what I'm getting into, so just suck it up and get it over with. It's going to be terrible, and it, it pretty much was. But I, uh, I went on the Twitter machine and found a. Uh, periscope might have been dead but i don't remember what so somebody was but i found a basically a pirated stream of the uh the second deontay wilder tyson fury fight the one where deontay wilder started bleeding out of his ear like in the fifth round or whatever that's probably the last last thing i watch um i see cb and some other people tweeting about it i i've never i i liked you i was into ufc like when it first like the first iteration of UFC when it was just wheels off, and you had like, you know, like somebody like Hoist Gracie, like fighting like Tank Abbott, like stuff that just made no sense. And it was just kind of total wheels off and kind of an outlaw promotion. But, you know, this other stuff, I've watched a couple Brock Lesnar fights and things like that. But other than that, I haven't really gotten into to combat sports much. But I will watch Jake Paul Mike Tyson because I do want to see. So you only know Mike Tyson, Jordan, from like YouTube videos. You have no recollection of, of Mike Tyson back in the day. I still I'm still I'm still intrigued enough to wonder, man, does Mike have one more just 
hellacious knockout left in him. Especially now, like I said, you combine the boxing instincts which haven't gone away with the old man strength he's got now. I'm I want to see it, man. I just want to I just want to watch it and see what happens. Oh no, I'll I'll, I'll be watching it. Um and I'll be watching on stream east. You're out of your mind if you think I'm paying for that. <laughs> um and yeah, if one of my buddies wants to pay for it or some uh, family friend wants to pay for it and invite me over to watch it, that's fine. But I'm not uh I will not be calling my cable or satellite provider to order that on pay-per-view. Yeah. Uh C B. Mm-mm. Nope. So yeah, I'm young, man. I I don't know who that is. Boxer Dude, or the rapper. Roy Jones didn't have like multiple rap albums, though. I think he only had one. And then mm. Antonio Tarver knocked him out and that's pretty much the end of Roy Jones. And did his rap career. And <laughs> did, did you ever see Rocky Balboa when it came out, Jordan? Is that would have been the sixth Rocky movie that came out in 2006. Who's Rocky? No, I'm playing. Uh, um, I was about to end, no, I was about to end I, uh, the show, just walk out. I was in a stage of walk out. Nobody would have blamed me either. No, yeah, hell yeah, I've seen Rocky. Um, don't, I mean, shit, he got, he had like three. And then uh, isn't there like a fourth or fifth one or something? I don't so know. That I, was, so I that remember was... I've seen the I know for a fact I've seen the first two, not 100 percent sure about the third. And then all the the Creed movies, the Michael B. Jordan I've seen. Rocky so. three was my favorite. Right. Because that's that's uh, Mr. T and uh, Hulk Hogan is Thunder Lips with the exhibition in the beginning. And then Apollo like reinvigorates Rocky's career Four is Drago Four is Drago where Rocky goes and. Uh, in two different movies, Sylvester Stallone helped end communism, so good for him. Uh, Fuck yeah. Four, five, we'll just never pretend Rocky Five happened. I'm still pissed off that I actually once upon a time watched it and swore I would never watch it again because it's that bad. And then you've got Rocky Balboa, which came out in 06, and then the three Creed movies, which Stallone's not in the third Creed movie. Spoiler for anybody that hadn't seen it, but. Creed three was okay. I, mean, I didn't was, even know there was a third Creed. It was fine. It was fine. It was well. It didn't. It it, it got pub, but Jonathan Majors was the uh, the antagonist, and yeah. like so that kind of yeah, because all that stuff about him came out like a couple weeks before the movie came out. Whoa. So yeah, it was, it was for uh, Michael B. Jordan and company. It was it was bad timing. But now the reason why I was asking. I mentioned Antonio Tarver. You probably know him more from playing Mason the Line Dixon in Rocky Balboa more than you know Antonio Tarver, the boxer. Sure. Uh, yeah, like <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about with this thing from Rocky. <laughs> All right, that's enough Rocky talk. Let's uh you know, Antoine asked a question. And by the way, CB, uh Alex is in on this, Antoine, uh Double D, everybody that's in the chat, we appreciate you greatly for uh being a part of the show. I always like to interact with the chat. So and Antoine sorry. asked it, and I don't want to just get you on a yeah, – Sorry, but before we get into recruiting, I just don't want to forget about it. Have y'all seen the video of that bridge in Baltimore collapsing yes, this morning? That was wild, man. Like, okay. I, I, I saw it on Twitter, and I genuinely thought it was fake the first time I saw it because I'm like, oh, like this – you know, no way. And, you know, you know people my... Photoshop shit. They, they edit shit. So that's what I thought it was. And then I scrolled down and I saw like another thing pop up and I was like, yo, what the, like, this is real. No, you're right. Cause I saw like, uh, I fell for one of those, uh, those hoaxes, like one of that was, uh, at Disney world, Cinderella's castle catching on fire. Like I fell for that hoax and I was like, oh, okay, it's a hoax. And there's all, there's all kinds of hoaxes, but yeah, by the way, Jordan, that's one of my like big irrational fears in life is driving across the bridge and driving across the bridge and it collapses. Yeah, I mean, shit, thank God it was at like 3 or 4 in the morning or whatever time it was, and it wasn't, you know, 5 p.m. when bumper to bumper on that thing. But, Man, I, like, I'm pretty sure I, I've been to Baltimore once in my life, and I'm pretty sure we went over that bridge. Yeah, And it's I, like, yeah. I, it, I I couldn't tell what the ship is. It looks like a cruise ship, kind of. Cargo ship. It was a cargo or, ship. Cargo ship. Mm -hmm. But, like, there is, there's people posting videos of how high up that bridge is. Yeah, man. Like it's that's wild. It's wild. Yeah. It's uh, you know, you've been to South Padre Island, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that bridge got taken out at one point in time. Really? Yeah. Uh, 
I'm trying to think of some other ones. Uh, I've driven across the the Tampa Skyway. That's had yeah. their accidents over the years. Yeah, that's like you know that bridge in uh, in Baton Rouge. Like when you're going over the river, going yeah, to Baton Rouge, the I-10 that one, bridge. Yeah, like F-10. my uh, my sphincter is just so puckered, dude. You couldn't get a nail up my ass with a jackhammer, dude. It is like why I white knuckle it the whole way over that bridge man it's just i'm gripping the steering wheel and it's that's not the scariest bridge i've ever been on though there's one in uh i think it's called the rainbow bridge down around orange i think it goes from it's in the golden triangle i think it goes from orange to port arthur or vice versa i forget i've driven over that bridge i know what you're talking about that's the one that i'm like I still have re- like recurring nightmares about that one where like I'm driving up it and then just start to slide back and then the car just tumbles and I die. I don't know. Uh, maybe I need to see somebody about that, but I digress. No, yeah, I did so, see it, man. That's, and that's yeah. Wild. And a- apparently people were saying, I mean, you can kind of tell in the video, um, apparently the ship lost power like twice before it oh, ran into real? that thing. And that's why like all the lights are coming off and then on right before it runs into it. I was uh, wondering what happened, so. man. Cause it, yeah um that's scary man so you know hopefully i don't know it it didn't sound it didn't sound like a good situation but Mm -hmm. i don't know how we transitioned from that into recruiting (laughs) but yeah so i just i was i genuinely thought it was fake when i first saw it so i just want to make sure we no man it's all good um but antoine asked the question and i don't want to turn this into a keelan russell versus kj lacy debate Mm -hmm. but let's just start let's just start out with kj lacy first because he goes to the Elite 11 Regional at Westlake. He gets his invite for the Elite 11. He, you know, go, goes to Texas yesterday on an unofficial visit. Give me your vibe. I know Hank's been a little bit closer to that recruitment just in terms of the day-to-day with KJ, but this is the first time you've had a chance to really kind of be around him. What, what, give me your vibe on KJ Lacey. Um, I mean, I don't know. He seems more locked in than ever. Uh. Honestly, when I when I went out to Atlanta and under at Under Armour Atlanta in February to see him, um, there's some things I learned that I won't ever be able to report. And <laughs> you know, it seems like uh, he's changed a lot with his commitment since then. Um, and yeah, again, it seems like he's more locked in than he's ever been. And I think honestly, a part of that has to do with the fact that. You know, once we had heard from sources at Texas, they were talking with Keelan um, and that they had interest in him. You know, we, of course, talked to him, got quotes from Keelan. And, you know, we we double checked with sources at Texas first because you never want to, you know, be the reason a kid decommits. So we checked the sources at Texas first. Can we report this stuff on Keelan? Are we allowed to? Yes, you're all good to go. And whether KJ will ever admit it or not, I think that's part of my – that, that might be part of why, you know, he seems a little bit more locked in. He feels that kind of pressure Plausible. down his neck. Plausible, yeah. But, um, I mean, as far as Keelan and KJ go, if you had to ask me to pick one, I'm picking Keelan. Um, and okay. it is no shot to KJ. Uh, I think KJ has NFL arm talent. Um, but it just has to do with, man, what Texas does um, from an offensive perspective it, Keelan makes so much more sense. Like, I, I, I've joked about it that, you know, KJ's tiny, but, like, he's 5'10", 170, 175. In Texas and Kyle Flood, the way they recruit alignment is go get the biggest, fattest guys we can find. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. in the Texas offense, how many designed rollouts are there? You know yeah. what I mean? So. Yeah. Um, another thing about, you know, Keelan compared to KJ, I had Hudson Standish and Colin Kennedy, two good friends of the show, uh, stay the night at, uh, me and my parents' house in Austin the night before. And that morning we woke up Sunday morning of the elite 11 thing. My dad was like, it's super, super, super windy outside. Mm-hmm. And Hudson was like, well, shit, we're only actually going to be able to see three quarterbacks throw the ball. Cause only three of these kids are going to be able to actually push the ball in the wind. Keelan is one of them. KJ wasn't. KJ could throw the ball downfield, but it would lose a lot of the velocity and, you know, his spiral, where Keelan just has a different level of arm strength than the other quarterbacks that were there. Yeah. Another thing about Keelan, his release is quicker than KJ's. And also, KJ's been very successful and is playing at the highest level in Alabama. He also had Ryan Williams. 
I'm not going to say Keelan didn't have Decorin because he does have Decorin and yeah. other number one receiver as well. But, you know, I'm always going to like the District of Doom 6A competition that Duncanville plays in over, you know, whoever Sarah's playing in Mobile. So, that being said, um, yeah, if you had to ask me, I'm rocking with Kate, uh, Keelan. Keelan. Um, but, you know, a two-quarterback class is what they'd like. And if those are the two guys and you asked me to bet some money on who would end up portaling and who would win out, I'd go Keelan for winning out. Um you know, he's really, really impressed me uh, at Under Armour Dallas, the way he threw the ball, by far and away the best quarterback in attendance. And then Elite 11 uh, on Sunday, again, same thing, by far and away the best quarterback in attendance. And while I think, uh, you know, KJ might have had a decent performance, it's worth mentioning that these Elite 11 invites to nationals are usually predetermined, right? Yeah, yeah. Because – I think Keelan 1,000% deserved an invite off his performance. The other two guys, there are other guys with better performances, I'll be honest. So, um, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this all unfolds with Keelan. Again, I think he's incredibly talented. Uh, I love his ranking. I believe 24-7 sports has him higher than the rest of the recruiting industry. I believe we have him 63 overall or in the 60s. He's, he's top 100 for us, I believe. Um, whereas KJ's in our 180s or 190s, somewhere in there. Um, so, again, not that KJ – not that I don't believe in him, but it's just like Keelan can do so many things for you that um, I'm not sure if KJ can. And another thing about Keelan, man, you get Keelan Russell, that would almost guarantee you to core in more. And not only that, Duncanville is two standouts in 2026 as well. KJ Ford, the D lineman, who's the number one edge rush or number one player in Texas by 24 seven sports. Uh, they also have tight end Zach Turner, um, who caught two touchdowns in the state championship game as a sophomore last year. So there are studs at Duncanville coming through the pipeline. As long as Reginald Samples is still coaching there, that, that won't be a trend. That'll just be a concrete thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you get Keelan Russell, that helps you a lot with the coin, helps you a lot with the guys on 26, but also just helps you in Dallas, man. Jaquindon Jackson was a, a god in Dallas, like a, a legend in the city, and yeah. he didn't even win one. Mm -hmm. the Corian and Keelan have two already, and they could get a third one next year. So if he does that and they go, they go three in a row, they three-peat, like, Keelan is a legend in that part of Dallas, right? And that, that only helps you with recruiting going forward. Like we've talked about it. Kids look up to other kids. And changing the way they look at things, that's what Keelan could do. Um, even if it is in Texas, do you think he stays with the SMU commitment? It'll be interesting because um, A&M and Florida and some other big-time schools that I guess, you know, could be considered blue blood or top programs alongside Texas – um, they're, they're pushing, but also they have their own quarterback set up just like Texas does. Yeah. So, and M, uh, I feel pretty good. I've talked to enough people. I trust that they're going to land Hussein Longstreet, who's a 2025 top 100 four-star quarterback out of California, if I remember correctly. Um, so would Keelan end up there unless A&M's going to fumble that and mess that up? Uh, I don't see Keelan and A&M. And then Keelan in Florida. Um, Keelan probably won't ever say it, but I think, you know, his interest in Florida, he he understands what's going on over there, and I don't yeah. see him having too much. So uh, I know Cal is someone who has his eye um, as well. He's interested about the academics and things like that. But um, I think a lot more schools are, are going to come off from him uh, once they see him in the spring. Yeah. But on the same note, it's just hard with quarterback recruiting because most schools are – they have their guy by now, or they're they're pretty shoot in to land a guy just like how A and M is. So, quarterback recruiting is delicate too because you know Texas, you've got the idea that you want to take two, but you need to. And I'm not saying anything that Steve Sarkeesian and AJ Milby don't know. You need to play it as carefully as possible because there becomes a chance where you might not get either of them. You know, there's there's that possibility. Yeah, and so, yeah, go ahead. And I mean, why you say that, like. Yes, could Texas be potentially offering Keelan Russell? Yes. Are they recruiting him without having it offered? Yes. But, man, like, y'all, 
people don't understand how much belief there is in KJ Lacey from the Texas side of things. Yeah. Like I was, I was speaking to um, <laughs> actually game day, a new NIL source on Sunday. And in nice. our conversation, I was kind of breaking down, you know, the quarterback dynamic at Texas and recruiting. And I was telling him a little bit more than what I tell y'all, cause I'm not on the record. Right. <laughs> and he told me, you know, he has a pretty good relationship with some coaches at Texas. One of them is A.J. Milwee. And he told me, he's like, man, I get what you're saying about Keelan Russell and, and you know, potentially two quarterback class. But he's like, I don't – he's like, A.J. Milwee genuinely believes, like, this – they have Bryce Young coming again on their hands. Like, they, they see that in him. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's funny you say that because his commitment quotes – he told us that uh, whenever Sark first watched this film, he wrote down on his notes, Bryce Young 2.0. So yeah. um, that comp, you I mean, pretty outrageous. That was a Heisman winner, number one pick, a lot to live up to. Um, but, you know, that shows how much Texas likes him and, and yeah. how they feel about him. So that um, that gives me pause only because I, I go back to and I use this as the kind of the classic example of you need to understand when you've got kind of a, a player who's an exception, not the rule. And I remember Texas went through a period from 2000, let's say 2005 through, you know, probably 20, well, probably 2009. And a coach on the staff, on Max staff, told me this. He said, we, we got so obsessed with trying to find the next line of Swede, trying to recruit the next line of Swede that all of a sudden we just had a bunch of big guys that couldn't run very fast. And that's a problem. Like you can get so blinded, you know, so don't, it's hard to, when you recruit that guy and you land that guy and he is special, maybe you can find the next one, but you know, I I'll give an, I haven't had a reason yet to doubt Sark and AJ Milby on their quarterback evals. I, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt until they give me a reason not to. But I think too, with KJ Lacey, from everything you're talking about, yeah, he's got some advantages, whether you're talking about the competition or you know, he had Ryan Williams as one of his receivers. I, I think it goes back to kind of the when you go, you can look at Sark. I think Sark's ideal offense, like the perfect offense, even if Sark wins a national title at Texas, I don't think he'll ever have an offense that's as close to perfect as that Alabama offense he had in 2020. Yeah, and when I think when you go back and look at the decision that he and Nick Saban had to make where it's okay, we're going to go with, cause you lose two to the draft. Do you go with Bryce young knowing that the upside is there and he's probably ready to go as a freshman or do you go with Mac Jones, the guy that you've had in the program for a few years, that's bided his time knows the system. And at the end of the day, they went with Mac Jones because that offense Everything was on time. Everything was on schedule. All you needed was a guy that just really had a good grasp of understanding where the ball needed to go. And you didn't really need Bryce Young's ability to to ad lib and extend plays. Mac Jones knew the system better, knew better where to get the football, who needed the football, how to get it there. And that's why they went with Mac Jones. I wonder if part of going with KJ Lacey is start thinking, look, I see the mechanics. If we get, we just develop him a little bit, get him to learn the system, we're going to be so good on the offensive line, so good at receiver, so good at running back and tight end. We don't need, you know, Superman back there at quarterback. We need a guy that just really understands this offense and knows where to go with the football, knows how this thing is supposed to operate. And I think they like – obviously, if the physical tools weren't there, there wouldn't be recruiting him. But I I wonder if part of that is looking at K.J. Lacey thinking, okay, for an on-schedule offense, an on-time offense, he's exactly what we want. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, there's still a lot to like about him. Um, and, you know, I don't want to take nothing away from him with anything that I've said so far. But, no, no, no. But it's – But, yeah. I'm trying to – and I want to make it clear, too. I'm just trying to play – I'm trying to psychoanalyze Sark and AJ Milley. I'm trying to gather, you know, what they're they're saying. And you know, they I'm not saying that they would they would mess around with their quarterback recruiting like this, but you wonder if like, okay, he's our guy. 
How's he going to react when he finds out we're recruiting another quarterback? Like, how competitive is this guy? Does he just say, I don't care who recruit whoever you want? Or does he look at it and say, eh, maybe I want to go somewhere else. Maybe AM's more inviting or Auburn or whatever. Um, yeah. Um, they, I don't want to say they did it like a, like a test because they, obviously they're serious of recruiting Keelan Russell. But you know what I'm saying? Like, you get, you get glimpses. You don't have that much information to go off of, not as much as you'd like when you make that decision on a quarterback, it's just maybe another data point to say, Hey, we told him we recruit a second quarterback and he didn't flinch. So maybe this kid's got something, maybe the, maybe the competitive competitiveness that we assumed was there really is there. Yeah. Um, and I mean, K- KJ gave quotes where he's like, you know, I wouldn't be wild about it, but you know, I'd still show up and do my best to be QB one. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, Keelan, he was like, I'm not wild about the idea of a two quarterback class either, but like Texas is my dream school and I think I could win out. <laughs> That's what Keelan said. So yeah. um yeah, you know, I, I love to see that competition. And man, I mean that that could be next year's room. You know, think about it. Arch Manning, Trey Owens, and those two guys. So yeah, it would- I, and I, I say the competitiveness thing because, again, talking I talked to A.J. Milley about this at the Sugar Bowl and talking to you about it because I know you were close with Trey Owens during his recruitment. T- to get a guy in that class, like your, your 2024 quarterback take to be the guy in the class after Arch Manning, that guy was going to have to have something special about him from just an innate ability to compete, knowing what he's walking into. And it's belief in yourself, but it's also belief in, dude, I'm just – I'm just going to get in there and work my tail off and I'll, I'll show you I'm good enough to play here. Like it's, and it turns out, you know, Trey Owens, uh, I haven't talked to Hudson or any of our guys on the rankings council about Trey Owens, but you know, obviously that crew saw something they liked because he ended the cycle as a, as an unranked four star for us when he was a three, most of the cycle, the, the physical talent seemed to, to get close to matching some of those intangibles that I think made him really attractive to Texas. Not that the physical tools weren't there, but the production. In other words, everything oh. kind of started to come together for Trey Owens' senior year. Oh, no, Jeff, you are 1,000% correct. Um, I was stuttering over my words, but I, I eventually got where I wanted to be. So. Yeah, and, and no disrespect <laughs> to Trey. Like, I've had this conversation with Trey. Yeah. When Texas first offered him, I was like, huh? <laughs> because I'd seen him in camps. Uh, Baylor was recruiting him, who I was covering at the time when Texas offered him. Um, and that was kind of who Baylor was putting all their eggs into the basket for. And I had known Texas was talking to him for like a month before offering. So I didn't say anything to Baylor, but I'm just like, you, <laughs> y'all have no idea like what you're up against. Um, but I, I, originally I wasn't wild about Trey Owens as a prospect. I saw him prior to his junior season. Uh, He got offered by Texas, I believe, in November or December of that junior season. Um, And look, I was like, this is a big, tall, long, white kid from Cypher who has a lot of traits, a lot of tools to work with, but, like, he's just not amazing right now, right? And – you know, he showed up to Under Armour Dallas, looked a little chunky, um, but he was throwing the ball. It was him and Lagway were really the only two guys who could put it through the wind that day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like, okay, Trey Owens, he's starting to come into his own, develop. <laughs> In his senior year, he played out of his fucking mind. Out of his mind. And he beat Katie and knocked Katie out of the playoffs in the second round. It was Katie's earliest playoff exit since 2008. Right. And then he had to turn off the Xbox and they played North Shore the, the next week. But anyways, um, he earned a lot of respect from not only me, but people at Texas. And there are conversations I had with people at Texas like, you know, can you believe that Trey Owens is actually better than everyone ever thought he'd be? And yeah. thought he could accomplish in high school. And he was like, yeah, we can't wait till he gets here in January. And at All American, he showed up um, and was a little chunky. He put on a lot of weight. A lot of it was good weight, but it was some bad weight he put on. So mm-hmm. seeing him at practice was interesting. He's definitely slimmed down a little. Um, you know, the nutrition and strength and 
conditioning program, all that at Texas, second to none, uh, and especially not second to Sci Fair, whatever they got going on over there. So, uh, you know, I'm excited, man, because, you know, this is a kid. He, he's not stupid. He knows the situation and he knows what everyone yeah. thought about him when he committed. Like, he knows those things and he uses it as motivation. And he knows that, you know, if he has to play this year, it's because something has really gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the same next year. But he understands, you know, where he is as a player, where he is as a prospect, that it, that if he's ever going to want to start at the University of Texas, that he's going to have to show up and bust his ass every single day. And he understands that. Um, this isn't a kid that I could see after – a year or two being like, man, F this. I'm going in the portal. I want to play. I don't see that happening. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if Texas ends up taking two quarterbacks in the following cycle, you are going to need that 2024 guy to stay, and he will because he's Trey Owens. But mm -hmm. I just think, you know, he's already been underappreciated. Um, I was happy we got him that, that four-star at the end. I think he deserved it. And, you know, I think he's going to continue to be underappreciated because – if Texas does end up going with two quarterbacks in 2025, one of those guys is transferring eventually. So, yeah, it's, you know, gone are the days of I was trying to think about it, man. Who who was the last? You know, I know everybody gets all worked up about this label. Who was the last game manager quarterback that won a national championship? Mac. Would you call Mac Jones a game manager? Shit, I mean, at the NFL level, yeah. <laughs> but in college, I mean, think about it. Like, how many games that year did Mac Jones himself have to will Alabama to a win? None of them were close. <laughs> exactly. He had, like, the dream team at receiver. <laughs> None of them were close. And they didn't even have Jalen Waddle half the year. Um, and see, now, okay, Greg McElroy, all the Alabama quarterback, you want to throw Jake Coker in there too. Hey, A.J. Just, McCarron, fuck <laughs> I think, I think unless unless you've got, you know, I mean, as good as that LSU offense was in 2019, that LSU offense we talk about, there were some games where you needed Joe Burrow to pull the rabbit out of the hat, yeah, to get to get you that undefeated season. I think it's just unrealistic to expect. And now everything I said about you know Sark looking at what an on schedule offense looks like, an on time offense looks like, and KJ Lacey pulling the trigger. I'm about to blow that into smithereens because how many times in college football is your offense on schedule? And unless you've got just that much of a talent advantage over everybody, which you're very rarely does that happen in college football today, it's not going to happen. Your, your offense isn't going to be on time. I mean, look, look at how Quinn Ewers has evolved. Quinn's evolved from a guy that I think everybody assumed was just a straight up drop back guy to how many plays has he had to make with his feet? How many plays has he had to extend on the move? How many times has he had to pull the ball down and run or do something on his own to move the chains, extend a drive, uh, keep you in a game, whatever the case is, stymie the other team's momentum. I just think it's really hard unless you've got that much of a talent advantage to, to win in college football with a game manager. You have yeah. to have an insane amount of talent on your side of the ball. And even then you still probably need that quarterback to, to do something to help you win ball games. Yeah. Shout out Rex because JJ McCarthy is the correct answer. Um, and again, shout out Rex for the comment. Cause <laughs> when you don't throw a pass versus Penn state in the second half and you win the game at Penn state, like you're not useless, but <laughs> very replaceable. But there My was opinion. there there were games in there. If you watched Michigan season, there were games in there where they needed JJ McCarthy to make some throws. Like you can't just. I understand. Just I'm just. I, I'm a big Michigan hater, and specifically JJ McCarthy hater. I don't think he's going to be super successful in the league. Um, but be yeah, I don't know. But I, I would say Mac Jones is more of a game manager than JJ was. Um, or that one year Mac, I'll, just because I'll again, it felt like he never that. really had to will them to anything, but but yeah, I, I just my personal opinion and pick it apart. Anybody in the chat, pick it apart if you want. You're not, I, and I, the guy I'm about to, it's gonna sound like I'm knocking him. I love his work as an analyst, I think he's one of the better analysts in, in, in college football, one of the analysts, period, doing football games right now, like just like hearing him talk ball. Man, you're not winning the national championship with Greg McElroy as your quarterback in 2024. 
It's just not yeah. happening. Um, even you know, Stetson Bennett got the game manager label, but man, even you look at Jordan, man, Stetson Bennett had to step up and make throws and make plays. You at some point that guy is going to have to do something to win you a football game. And if Sark and AJ Milwe had determined that you know what, KJ Lacey can be that guy, then okay, go 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 with it and and, and see what happens. But you know, we're still so we're not early into it, but you're at the point where you can still take Keelan Russell. And if you decide that Keelan Russell can make those kind of plays, you can make a run at Keelan Russell and just tell yourself, Hey, whichever one of these guys it is, we feel like whichever one is left standing at the end of the day, we can go win a national championship with those guys. That's, that's what you have. That's what you have to ultimately ask yourself about a quarterback take. We can, we can talk about the tools and the intangibles and winterness and moxie and all this other stuff. Do you, but at the end of the day, the question needs to be, do you really believe you can go win a national championship with this guy? And if you have to wait more than five seconds to give the answer, then it's probably a guy you don't need to take. But clearly, they've give they've answered that question yes to KJ Lacey, and I believe they've answered that question yes to Keelan Russell. Otherwise, they still wouldn't be recruiting him and risk losing KJ Lacey. Yep. No, great points. Great, uh, great points. Um, so, anyway, we'll take your quarterback questions if you got them. But Jordan, anything else? Because you did uh, battle seven on seven. Um, yeah. Did so you do the five on five lineman deal too? Did you go over for that? No, nah, I didn't. I was. My plan was originally I was going to go grab them at uh, at their hotel because um, I talked to some of the California power people, but uh, they weren't back from their A&M visit, and I stood out in the sun from 8 to 6 p.m., so I'm like, I'm just going to drive home to Austin yeah. instead of waiting for these dudes to get back from college That was station, the, so. the California power is Brandon Brown's group, right? Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> – I, I mean, I don't know. Y'all know how I feel about Brandon Brown's commitment. I was like, this isn't worth it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. or, or not not for him, but I just meant like he's going to be back at Austin again. We're going to see him in person again. Like, I'm not going to get home at 2 a.m. so I can stay back to interview him. Or whatever. Yeah, and I don't, I don't remember if it was you or Hank that had the quotes. It might have been Hank, but, you know, the, the, the visit got high marks. I mean, the visit probably did what, it needed to do to show Brandon Brown that they Texas has more to offer you than just Bo Davis. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, California power the weekend and seven on seven uh, started off at battle Houston. And I guess I'll just run down the list pretty much. Um, Brandon By the Brown, way, uh, are, you, are you going off the stampede? Yeah. 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 All um, right. So there's some other guys I didn't seven. include. Get over to Horns 24-7. We've still got – it's still our lead story because it's that damn good. Uh, the Stampede drops every Monday. That's Jordan and Hank with their uh, VIP recruiting news notes and nuggets. There's a bit on K.J. Lacey, some on Brandon Brown, Keelan Russell, who we talked about. Uh, Jordan, you just want to start with Lamont Rogers? Yeah. Um, okay. So, Lamont is a, a really, really, really interesting recruitment um, because, one – uh, he's an interesting prospect, pretty unique. So he actually plays goalie for Mesquite Horns varsity squad. And then in basketball, he's their starting center as well. And he, it's not like he's just, you know, he wears a jersey and stands on the bench. Like he's starting and is a major contributor in both sports as well. So um, big fan of Lamont for that. Uh, I think, you know, that makes him super fun prospect um, and fun to watch. And you can tell because he's super athletic um, and he kind of has a basketball leg still where it looks like he's kind of got a little toothpick legs. But mm -hmm. all that will get sorted out once you get into, you know, a strength and conditioning program at the college level. Um, but look, I'll be honest, Texas was completely out of this um, for I don't know how long uh, <laughs> because that's how out of it they were. And I don't want to necessarily say something happened um, because I wasn't told of something happening, but I just think other schools prioritized them so much more, whereas mm -hmm. Texas just kind of did their thing of recruiting them at their own pace and, in a sense, not contacting him a ton during his junior season. And 
No, wait, never mind. I remember something did happen now that I think about it, but not ready to say it on air yet. Um, but the person that's brought this back for Texas in this recruitment has been none other than Chris Gilbert, who, if you remember what he did for uh, for Texas in, in 2022 and even 2023, you'll know how important Chris Gilbert is to uh, the trajectory of this program because he is. And – uh, it, not only has it been Chris Gilbert, it's been Jamal Fenner as well. And a lot of that is because the whole staff at Mesquite Horn came up under uh, Coach Gilbert, coached yep. under him, learned under him, was mentored by him. Um, and then Fenner it just has a ton of connections in the Texas high school coaches world. And also, um, it's an important room to note, Mesquite Horn is mostly an African-American staff. And, you know, I think that has a – they have a lot of connection with Fenner. They've known him going back to his days at LBJ. And, you know, there's not a ton of old school recruiting where, you know, you're recruiting the high school coaches too and making sure they're happy. Yeah, A lot of that doesn't go on anymore just because it's the NIL world. Uh, trainers are more involved than they've ever been. Handlers are more involved than they've ever been. Third-party guys. It's where high school coaches are becoming less and less of a piece of the puzzle. So – the fact that Texas used their relationships and went back through them, these are people that Lamont trusts. Um, and they're putting in a good word for Texas. Not that they're not doing it for other schools, but, you know, they're helping them build that relationship with Gilbert. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's helped Texas a lot. They've yeah. gained a lot of ground in this one, but there's still a long way to go. Um, say Let's Mizzou and A&M seem to be the two schools really at the front of this. Uh, Oklahoma's also involved. Um, who else? Who else? I'm trying to think. I got it right here. Hold up. Uh, Tennessee. Yeah, it, it's mostly OU, A&M, Tennessee, Texas, um, and Mizzou. Those seem to be the main five right now. But um, I'll, I'll be back on the, campus. Sorry, the, go ahead. The Lamont Rogers recruitment with texas mm -hmm. and then texas kind of getting behind the eight ball a little bit how much of that is did they just evaluate all three and just decide they liked michael fasusi and ty haywood better um i think that could be part of it but at the same time um texas understands kind of how the dynamic is between those three kids and that uh ty haywood is most likely going to ou um yeah we talked about that and Fasusi to Texas and I don't know I just I think I can say it but basically what happened um there's also another kid at Mesquite Horn who has a Texas offer named Markel Ford he's a 2026 safety um for him he's probably going to be UT A&M OU or SMU I feel pretty strongly he'll end up at one of those four but Texas, basically, whenever they go out to Mesquite Horn, they recruit those two kids at the same time. They'll have them in separate meetings. Um, but in early January, when schools are making their rounds and there are a bunch of Texas coaches at Mesquite Horn, they sat down with Markel. They didn't with uh, Lamont. Can I tell you why that is? Nope, because I don't know. But I can tell you that that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Um, so... Chris Gilbert has helped, and there was also some other stuff that went on for a few months before that um, that, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about. But Chris Gilbert has done a lot of dirty work in this one, and he's helped out a lot in this one. And I really do think Texas is going to have a contending shot come decision time in July. Now, if Fair the decision not. was to come right now, I wouldn't think Texas would even be a hat on the table. Yeah. But at the rate they're picking up steam and momentum in this one, when it comes OV time in June, I think they're going to be in the thick of it. Fair or not, all my years of dealing with high school, and I love my high school football coaches in Texas, but the complaints, I don't really hear complaints about stuff that TCU has done, stuff that Baylor's done, U of H, SMU, Tech, pick your school. Fair or not, A&M in Texas – when it comes to the Texas high school coaches, are held to the highest of high standards. And anything short of that standard is just deemed unacceptable. The I the complaint if I've heard a hundred complaints about how recruitments have been handled over the years, 
Jordan by from Texas high school coaches. 97 of them are about either Texas or AM doing something that was perceived to be wrong. Yeah, and I mean the Mesquite Horn staff is cool. They they're cool with me. They trust oh, me. Yeah. So no, I, no, I no. heard about the other schools that I messed up too. But I just yeah. y'all don't want to hear how UH yeah. is fucked up at Mesquite Horn. This is a yeah, Texas no, show. No, no coach when they fair again, fair or not, when they see the 24-7 polo or whether it's you know on three or ESPN or whoever, they don't want to talk your ear off about oh man, um, you know. UTEP came in here and disrespected one of my kids. It's it's a sexier story of man, so and so from AM was here and that guy was just a dick, or so and so from Texas was here and was just arrogant. Like that's fair or not, that stuff happens. At least because those two schools, it leaves a bigger impression because still for, I think for the percentage is smaller than it once was, but for a pretty big percentage of kids in this state those two schools the offer from those two schools means more than it does from any other school in the state because yeah. of the platform both those schools have it it does um so for lamont right now he's got three ovs uh mizzou ut a and m and in that order i believe um wouldn't be surprised to see him book something to go see uh tennessee or uh ou um and he's looking at, you know, a late summer decision sometime between official visits the start of his senior year. Another thing I didn't bring up, um, or there's two other things actually on Lamont. One, like all recruitments, NIL is going to be important. Um, there are already elements of NIL that have been discussed, just like a lot of other recruitments that are going on in 2025 right now. Um, so th that's going to be an important part of it. Um, as well, specifically for this recruitment. And the other thing, uh, I found this out actually through uh, a source Sunday, um, but him and Michael Fasusi are actually building a pretty tight relationship. Um, okay. And I I've said it on the show. I believe I've written it on Horns 24-7 as well. But I've always felt like if of the three regional rivals that are really in the mix of these three offensive tackles in Dallas, the only school that would be able to sign two of them would be Texas. And it's because pretty much uh, of those three guys, um, everyone feels pretty confident Haywood's going to end up at OU. That's probably the the kid people are most confident in where he's going. Mm -hmm. uh, next after that, I'd say Fasusi to Texas. A lot of people feel pretty strongly about that. And then Lamont, almost no one really knows what's going on with him <laughs> outside of a select few people. But um, Lamont and Fasusi have been building a, a really tight relationship. And, you know, I that's going to mean something because yeah, uh, I, I strongly feel like Kyle Flood in Texas will end up with Michael Vasusi. And if you get that guy committed and he's helping peer recruit another top 100 prospect, you know, that that's only a good thing. So no doubt. It, it's interesting, too, because two things interest me. One, with offensive linemen. Yeah, I mean, is left tackle the sexier position? Yeah, but you can sell – multiple guys on coming to be a part of a successful offensive line so it's not like quarterback where you're only taking one you you can recruit multiple guys and, and i think as you will see it with kelvin banks next year and hopefully other guys along the way if texas can start putting those guys in the nfl that's going to make the recruiting pitch even stronger i know that's not going to ha have an impact so much on you know Fasusi or rogers but going you know, going forward if texas can start putting offensive linemen in the nfl it's going to help the other thing, too, is, man, you start throwing out some schools, not just with Lamont Rogers specifically, but, man, we're talking about kids that are interested in Tennessee, LSU, whether it's Auburn, you know, whoever it is. You Though losing a recruiting battle, like, say, to Tennessee, you used to be out of sight, out of mind. And I know Texas isn't going to play Tennessee until 2026 at the earliest, but that's a conference game now. That's a conference opponent. So – it is a big deal if you lose a recruiting battle to Tennessee. It's a really big deal now if you lose a recruiting battle to LSU or Auburn or Arkansas or whoever, Florida, whoever it is. It's a really big deal now because that could though you could actually lose a game on account of one of those high level recruiting battles you lose. Yeah, and it's crazy because I, I can't remember if I talked about this on the show, but um, when I was down in Houston a couple weeks ago. 
Uh, I watched a, a big training session with a ton of linebackers at Shadow Creek. Uh, Deuce Williams is one of them. Uh, Kosi Akpala, a bunch of other names. And it was with uh, Donnie Bags, the boy, my guy. Um, mm. Best linebacker trainer I've ever come across. Um, or former, former Aggie. And, yeah, former Aggie, former Dallas Cowboy. And uh, has stories for days about those Johnny Menzel teams. Um, but while we were out there, way down the field, I see this big-ass kid wearing a Tennessee hoodie, working out, doing O-line drills. And I can't see his face because the hood's on, but I know who it is. It's Bennett Warren, who's like 6'7", 350 pounds. Tennessee signed him in 2024. He was a uh, four-star top 247 offensive tackle. And a uh, good friend of the show, Colin Kennedy, was down there with me. We had a conversation, and it's like, it's ridiculous how much NIL has changed college football. And you're probably like, well, no shit, Jordan. I don't necessarily mean it in that way. But we're looking at Bennett Warren from 100 yards away and seeing this mammoth dude just work on his pass, bro. And I'm like, Colin, five years ago, this kid is not going to Tennessee. He's not. He's not going to Tennessee. Four years ago, three years ago, he's not going to Tennessee. You know, think about how much the NIL world has changed everything. Um, yeah. it's, fuck, three years ago, Missouri isn't involved with Michael Fasusi or Lamont Rogers. I mean, come on. <laughs> like, that, they're not. SMU isn't involved with a lot of these kids either. So it, it's crazy to see how much the landscape has changed just because of money, you know, because it's always been around, but now it's legal. So. Yeah, uh, Seth, who's a better goalie, Lamont or Micah? Uh, Micah, if he was on varsity, was only the second stringer. Um, he most most of his goalie was as a JV kid, but uh, so I gotta I gotta say Lamont then. Yeah, NIL did kind of even things a little. It did. It's true. Um, it made the strong stronger and the weak weaker too. So, um. Let me think. Do I have time to run through? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll run through these. Well, let's just, let's just, we, there's a couple we can get out of the way real quick. Uh, yeah, I just want to talk about Byron Washington real quick. That's what I was, was going to Byron Washington and Floyd Gidry because at one point in time we were talking about those two guys as, as maybe shoe ins to be in the class, and they have both committed elsewhere. Yeah, so uh, Byron Washington, um, you know, we all know about him. Humongous kid, six eight. Uh, Whatever is less of that isn't probably true. Um, <laughs> but uh, Cal Flood fell in love with him, man. He's a big human. Honestly, the, the biggest offensive line prospect I've personally ever seen. And, yeah, uh, Texas continued to recruit him. That was his biggest offer. Uh, he reciprocated the heavy interest and, you know, told me multiple times Texas was his number one school. Uh, I remember when I went and saw DeSoto play Dallas Skyline at home. Uh, this past fall, I interviewed him after, and I'm like, what are some schools standing out? And the quote he gave was, the only school standing out is Texas. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I put in a crystal ball. And a lot of other people put crystal balls in. Your boy was first um, and, you know, tracked it. Uh, I knew he was wanting to decide in the summer. I was a little worried about it just because, um, I'll be honest, he's not that good. He's just humongous, and there's a lot to work with. But right now, he's not that great of a prospect. And so I would, there's always a little bit of hesitation with me putting in that crystal ball, knowing that he was probably wanting to wait until the summer. Yeah. Um, but then uh, a, about a month, two months ago, um, you know, I, I spoke with a source who had told me Texas had decided they, they're done with him um, and that they're probably done recruiting him. They apparently, whenever they offered him, had said you can commit here as long as you can commit to losing weight and losing weight before you commit, and that hasn't happened. In fact, since the offer was made, he's only gained weight. So uh, that being said, Texas felt like it was okay to to cut ties there. And um, if you're worried about potential politics at DeSoto, Soto coaches understand. Um, you know that they, they have they have to coach Byron as well, and. They, they they understand the game. They understand why things happen. Um, and I, I don't think anything bad will come from it. And he went ahead and committed to Syracuse. Obviously skipped his summer timeline. I think that could do with just, 
you know, kind of similar to what Texas did, where a lot of schools might have turned the other way and you wanted to lock in a spot, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and then Floyd Guidry, on the other hand, he's a kid from Spring High uh, outside of Houston or suburb of Houston. Uh, D. Lyman, three-star. He's a kid who Texas offered, I believe, like mid-December. Um, I remember the first time I'd ever spoke with him was the National Combine at the All-American Bowl in San Antonio early January. Me and Hank were talking to him, and it, it was clear, man, where where he wanted to go. Uh, he was telling us stories about how, you know, he grew up a Texas fan and how when he got the offer, he called his whole family, called his girlfriend, all his cousins, telling him, you know, hey, I got Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, he talked to us about how he had all these jerseys in his closet, um, you know, Texas jerseys growing up and posters in his room, all these other things. So, you know, you can assume what we got to thinking. And – you know, I checked in with a, a source at Texas, and I'm like, what do y'all think about this kid? Because I think he's going to Texas, but, like, I haven't watched his film, and we have him as a low three stars, so I don't know what y'all think. And the guy was like, we're a little torn on him. Some people see, like, Byron Murphy 2.0 in him. Other guys don't want to touch him with, like, a stick. And I was like, okay, well, interesting. Continue to monitor it and visit for the junior day after that. Haven't heard much from Gidry in Texas, and uh, you know I'm driving from Houston to Austin, and I see that he commits to TCU. So, um, I, I, you know, what you assume about Texas, I assume the same thing <laughs> with yeah what happened there at the end of recruiting him. I don't think it needs to be said. Um, so, you know, I wish him the best at TCU, and it was an awesome kid. Uh, when I did watch his film, there are a lot of things I like. So, you know, I think he could be an impact player for us or for TCU and. You know, with what Syracuse is doing recruiting with the the new guys they brought in from Georgia to coach the Orange Men, I think Byron Washington could be a great ad, just even from an NIL perspective, because that's a very, very popular kid. You know, that changes the way other kids will look at a school. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Trey and BK are here for the midday program. I think we've talked to both of you guys. I've asked both of you guys this, but for the sake of it being top of mind, I'll go ahead and ask again. Is it weird for you guys to start looking ahead to the 2024 football season and just not be concerned at all with, like, you know, TCU or Oklahoma State or Tech or whoever, and you're like, man, what's what's Kentucky spring practice look like? How's, uh, well, how's things going at Arkansas or Mississippi State or Florida or Georgia, these new teams on Texas schedule? Mm. Yeah, hadn't really hit me yet that I need to start paying attention to those schools. Kentucky like, football is a thing now, BK. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm so focused on Kansas becoming a football school again. I got to focus on Kentucky being a football school now. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it'll be fun, right? I mean, just seeing the schedule for 2024 and then also seeing the schedule released for 2025. It's just a couple of other pieces of evidence that this thing is real, but uh, yeah, it, it'll it'll take me a little bit of time, I guess, to stop caring about the teams that we've been forced to care about in league play for as long as we have and just realize that, oh, shit, no, it's not just – we're not just paying attention to the SEC because it's the best league. We're paying attention to the SEC because it's the league that we're in now. So yeah, that, that transition will be ongoing, and it's kind of hitting me, but I don't think it will really hit me until I see the Longhorns play with that SEC patch on their jersey. Yeah, anything, anything, Trey? Any any feelings one way or the other? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I try not to look too far ahead, but it is exciting to think about in those moments. I, I already don't care about any of these schools that we're leaving behind. Of course, that's <laughs> also been the case really since the announcement was made, which is why me and plenty of others were just begging Texas and Oklahoma to make it happen as soon as possible because you knew yeah. things would only get uglier before – the ultimate split occurs, and now we are so close to that finish line. Looking forward to the celebration happening on the 40 acres and probably up in Norman on, what, June 30th into July 1st, and then uh, we enter a whole new world in college football yeah. and otherwise uh, starting just a couple months later. Heck, less than, less than that if you want to count media days happening in mid-July. which That's, that's when it starts, yeah. That's that's when it starts for me is, is the yeah. media days. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll be honest, Trey, I'm kind of with you. I, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I really have not one F to give about the big 12 at this point. 
I just don't. I know BK is invested because it's a Kansas thing. I totally yeah. get that 100%. But well, you're, I, I, you're invested. You're invested because baseball season's still going on. Like, well, you, the, you, got, you have to care. You don't have to care about Big 12 football, but you got to right. care about Big 12 something right now. Let me, right? Let me, let me rephrase that. One, ooh, ooh I, not me. The yeah. 2024, the 2024 Big 12 football season, I give not one F about what happens in that league. There, there was there was one school that I did care about when the announcement was made, but the way that they've conducted themselves and we've been towards one another since that announcement has me not caring about them anymore, and that would be Texas Tech. Initially, I was pushing for some sort of res, uh, continuation of rivalry with Tech. At this point, good fucking riddance. Sorry, yeah. people that I love so much. I want nothing to do with your school and sports. I, you know... Of continuing any of those games, the only the only one I even gave consideration to was Baylor, just because it's an hour down the road, an hour and a half down yeah. the road. Um, but if Texas never played any of the Big Twelve schools again, I'll I'll sleep just fine. If Texas never plays Baylor or TCU or Oklahoma State again. Because we love to manufacture rivalries, if Texas and Baylor do ever play regularly in football, we can call it the Battle for Temple. That have <laughs> the, a nice ring to it. The Bruce, the Bruce Villetti Cup. Yeah, Battle just for play Temple. it at Wildcat Stadium, man. There you go. I always wanted to go to a game in that stadium. Ever since, I mean, I've been driving past it for my entire life as a kid, especially. And it was always the coolest looking stadium back in the 1980s and 90s and of course it's been it would when times. they got the lights on too exactly at night yeah I no i uh, I saw, i've years. seen probably five or six games there over the last three years because mm -hmm. uh baylor had a commit out of theirs now at a m touring york and man it's it's not the greatest but it's a it's a dope little stadium a lot of history in there and every time I drive by it, I'm like, oh, it's the house that Tory and York built. So so it sounds like they need to spend a little bit of money to uh, to update things. Is, that, is getting a little bit of that uh, that Wrigley Field feel to it? Whereas oh, no, nah, it, it's stadium. classic. But another thing that Temple ISD screwed up the home game experience, which I'm kind of sad if you ever do end up going to a game, it's not the same what it used to be. But about four or five years ago um, – the, the school district got this deal with the local news where every single game is broadcasted to the, the county. So there's like no one at their home games because yeah. they haven't been super good as of late and everyone just watches it on TV because the, the community at Temple still very much supports the, the, the kids in the school, but they're just not going to the game anymore because they're watching it on their couch. That's and also, I, come on, I, Temple, be less lazy than that. My gosh. And also, there's still... I think it's fine saying it. There's still a lot of people who hate the Temple head coach because if y'all remember what he did a couple years ago at the playoffs, mm -mm. he uh, – I forgot what – Jeff, do you remember this? It's not coming to the top of mind. I remember there was a uniform controversy that almost happened, but the people in Temple were up in arms about. But I don't know if this uh, is – right So, like, the way the – you know how districts are lined up in the first round of the playoffs? So yeah. the way it was lining up, I forgot. I think it was they were going to have to play uh, Mesquite Horn or uh, a Duncanville or someone who was really, really good that year, and they would have lost in the first round if they ended up playing him. And so instead of being the one seed that would have lined up with them, uh, they ended up losing their last game of the year. In Quentin, it was when Quentin Johnson was at uh, Temple. Mm. And Quentin Johnson um, apparently only played like one half or something like that. To where, you know, they lost the game, but everyone was like, oh, no, now we don't have to lose first round because we're playing this other school. But the thing is, they lost that first round game versus the other school mm. and didn't have a district championship either because they lost that week 11 game because they were trying to play a different team in the first round. And after that happened, like the whole city of Temple lost it on uh, Stewart, the head coach, and. I've just heard from – I still know a lot of kids who have come out of Temple and who are over there, parents, coaches. Um, there's still a lot of animosity in the community towards him, and I think that could also be part of their low attendance. Trey, so. and your, uh, your trips up I-35, do you remember in uh, – I think it, it was in between Troy and Bruce Valletti, I think. You remember a big rig video 
It used to be like a, just an 18 wheeler that was like a porn shop on the side of the highway, <laughs> the big inflatable gorilla on top of the trailer. Yep. Texas and Baylor are going to play, just play in that patch of grass right there. That would be amazing. It was that in the monolith that always caught my attention the most between, um, between Hillsboro and Waxahachie. <laughs> It was those like partially below ground structures that were made for preppers in the 1980s. Oh, yeah. In no, Italy, that- the little igloos. Yeah. 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 Little know. igloo looking structures. How do we yeah, get- well, y- y'all know about that weird ass tower that's on. It's after when 35 forks, it's on 35 east, and it's on your left hand side if you're driving north. It looks like this big ass lightning rod or something. I don't know. I need to find. I remember I looking something mm-hmm. up about it, and it was something that. Um, like someone overseas made is uh like some work of art, like a sculpture or something, some gift to someone in America, and it somehow ended up in that part of Texas. Wow. Um, I just I don't even know what to Google because I don't know what to call it. But so it's where it's where thirty five splits and it goes west to Fort Worth and east to Dallas. It's when you take that east a little bit further. Uh, not not a little bit. It's probably I mean shit. I don't know. Probably between the fork and Waxahachie. Uh, close to halfway on east, and it'd be on your left side if you're drove, driving north. Left so. side, okay. Well, that was a uh, gift to America. My gift to the listening audience is I'm going to shut my mouth and get out of here and let Trey and BK run the midday show. So. Yeah. Well, you guys have a good show. See we'll you tomorrow. To- good job, boys. Thank y'all. All right. There's some crosstalk. We're going all over the map with today's crosstalk between Trey and BK, and it's only an hour. Now it's time for the award winning. Midday with Trey and BK right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Got a little dance going on today, a little pep in your step. Everything good in your world? Everything is great other than me waiting too long to rent a camera for the total eclipse that's going to be happening here in less than two weeks. I had an opportunity a week and a half ago at Precision Camera and Video, and I just assumed that doing it this week would still be okay. Damn coaching mistake by me. So I may just be taking pictures of this thing and in and around Kerrville with my iPhone. Hmm. What do you need pictures for? Everyone else is going to be taking pictures. Just soak it in with your own eyeballs and Google the pictures after the fact. I like to try and take care of some of this stuff myself. I fashion myself as an amateur photographer. What are you going to do with those pictures after you take them? Blow them up. Blow up the camera that you're renting? Nope. Uh, make Assuming that the pictures turn out decent, I'm going to make them bigger, and maybe I'll put them on a canvas and hang them up in the house, or uh, just perhaps it'll go and we try and make annual picture books of stuff that we've experienced as a family. It might go in something like that. Uh, generally, I'm just uh, I'm interested to see what this looks and feels like. Like NASA is asking people to just take audio recordings of what the animals sound like during a total eclipse. They've got an app that you can like set your phone up pointing towards the sun. You don't have to put the filter on or anything, but they want to see uh, they're trying to figure out the shape of the sun. So having everybody film the total eclipse as it's happening, you can do so through an app. You get the pictures afterwards. So, yeah, there's a there, there's a lot of intrigue around this. I mean, it, this is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity for us for those of us who live like living in the path of totality and not having to go someplace to experience that you you don't get that except once in a lifetime some people don't even get it in the lifetime so it's really cool that we get to experience this here in early april yeah i've gotten about 14 once in a lifetime eclipses in my 30 years of life so yeah this one's different though the the partial eclipses are one thing the path of totality is the once in a lifetime event that has been a a misconception that we are all taught as elementary school kids the path of totality thing is once in a lifetime no, no, there's just a different term for the path of totality for every other eclipse that exists that will also only get once in our lifetime. I, yeah. NASA is paying you or something. I, I get it. You're in on their payroll and you were brought to Texas Sports Unfiltered to try to promote this eclipse and get people excited about it because we are in the path of totality. So you're on their uh, their checkbook and you're getting compensated for trying to get people excited about this deal. But I'm just letting you know it ain't working on me. All right. All right. Well, you're you're welcome to just ignore it. You will. I think it's supposed to pass through Austin. 
like in the 1.30 to 2 o'clock range, maybe a little bit after that. So theoretically, you're going to be off the air at that time. So you will have the chance to go outside. And I've been told, and I've read online also, that with the path of totality, while you do need to have the, the glasses on when the eclipse is starting, when it gets to that path of totality and you just have the corona of the sun around the moon, that you can look up at the eclipse without your glasses on. Oh, and you can take getting... pictures without it too because it's it's dark enough at that point that it's not going to burn your eyeballs. Oh, now we're getting another virus to go along with this too, huh? A more oh, the, corona. Corona, yeah, the the corona of the sun. Yes, that is a different different sort of virus, more of a mind virus than it is a, an actual physical flu. It is an election year, so no surprise that another pandemic is coming our way. So I what mean, look if if Biden or Trump are in the path of totality and they look up before it actually hits path of totality to where it could cause some serious long-term damage that could kill either of those guys. So we just need to be very careful here leading up to the actual moment of totality at various places in the US, Mexico and elsewhere. I'm not sure if people would be too upset if uh, if that actually happens. Yeah, there are a couple of really old guys that a lot of people don't like running for president this year. It's uh, this this whole process seems to get worse and worse each election election cycle. Okay, so how does it work? So I'm going to be because I'm not I'm not going to Colin Kaepernick boycott this thing. Like I'm going to go out and look at it. Uh, but I'm I'm still going to believe it's a crock of shit even when it does happen. I'm still going to think that I'm going to see something just like this in five years, or I'm going to believe that I've already seen something like this in my lifetime. But it's super bright and then it gets super dark and then it gets super bright again. That's, that's what we're doing here. Yeah. Okay. It'll get, it'll get pretty dark. I'm guessing for like five to seven minutes or sometimes a little bit less. Like the reason why so many people are going to Kerrville this year is because the path of totality is like a, a stretch. I don't know if it's a hundred miles. Maybe it's a pretty big stretch of like how the, the path that the sun is traveling that you will be able that you will be within the shadow and the center of the path of totality is going right through like Kerrville Ingram is right there Hunt Frederick uh, Fredericksburg is pretty close Kerrville is literally expecting like 50,000 plus people to go there not this coming weekend but the weekend after that with the eclipse happening on Monday it's crazy but like people realize Again, this is a different deal from the eclipses that we would go watch outside as kids or that happened last fall. Those are those are partial eclipses. Those are still a cool thing to witness, but from my understanding, it's nothing like what is about to happen here. All right. And you're going to be in Kerrville for this. So I'm going to be in West Texas for a bachelor party that la uh, that weekend. Initially, I thought the eclipse was on Saturday, so I was considering skipping the bachelor party just to get the eclipse, which I understand why I always called all sorts of names for that. But the good news about me being wrong about that is that it happens on Monday, and we literally have to drive through the path of totality if we can get on the road at a reasonable hour on Monday morning to where it'll be an easy stop at my granddad's place right off the highway. There's probably going to be a lot of traffic leaving town after that too. So we may want to figure a, a different route uh, back to Austin altogether. But yeah, the timing is going to work out to where I actually get to be in the Kerrville area for it. And if I can figure out a solution with a camera here, then I'll actually get to take some pretty cool fucking pictures too. I'm sure we got a buddy or a listener. Most of our listeners are buddies at this point who has a camera that you can borrow for that day. If you've got a telephoto lens and a good camera body and a tripod, I will happily rent those things from you. Because I, I want it also for our trip to West Texas. We're going to fucking hike and mm. go across the border and uh, all sorts of other shenanigans, I'm sure. But yeah, the path of totality is the biggest reason why I need that camera. One of those pro goes won't work, whatever they're called. GoPros? No, that GoPros. not... Not going to work, unfortunately. I've got these little cameras at my house, and I could buy a, uh, a lens that will do so much. It really is about the lens more so than the camera body. You just need a lens that gets uh, that can basically take close-ups from much further away. And there are lenses that do a good job of taking taking pictures of things in the sky, to put it too simply. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, yeah, if you've got one of those, hit tray up. I feel like most people who have that stuff are – 
going to try to use it on that day. Probably so. Uh, donkey show, yes. If there is a donkey show that I'm allowed to photograph, I will take those pictures, yes. Yeah, please take videos so we can play them for the people on TSU. Where we're going doesn't really have donkey shows. The other the other side mm -hmm. of the border from Terra Lingua where we're staying, and I guess you do either take a boat or you can wait across the Guadalupe to get to the other side, and there is a uh a border checkpoint there so we have to have our um our passports with us but this sleepy mexican border town on the other side of the river doesn't have donkey shows yes i already did ask uh they do have a pretty cool cantina and a few decent restaurants but no donkey shows to speak of mm, yeah you got to change the reservation on that bachelor party. I know it's not yours, so you're probably not in charge and you don't have much say in what's going on, but I'm just a I, driver. Yeah. Oh, you're driving out there. You're one of the two. Of course. Would oh, you, yeah. would you expect anything less after a <laughs> New Orleans? Yeah. Everybody else volunteered and you're like, absolutely not. I'm not going on this trip if I'm not driving. So I, I am a control freak in not many areas in life, but I like to be in control behind the wheel. It, it bothers me to to deal with other people driving, even good drivers, by the way. It's not it's not a you thing. It's a me thing. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I did a good job driving my stint to New Orleans for the Sugar Bowl. And then you're like, I'm taking over. And I offered three or four times. I'm like, dude, I'm good. I, I'm ready. I got plenty of energy. Let's go. And you're like, no, nah, I got this. I was like, all right. You're not only a Jewish mother with your generosity, BK, you're a bit of a Jewish mother with your uh, how fast you're willing to go. And you weren't <laughs> going right at the speed limit or below. You were going five to ten over. That wasn't fast enough. Oh, my God. Yeah. Hold on. Don't don't put the Jewish mother hex on me there. I'm, I'm a Jewish mother <laughs> in plenty of other facets of life. But on the road, I'm at least faster than that. But uh, yeah, you uh, you fly out there. I'll, I'll say a prayer to everyone else going on that trip with you before you guys depart next week. Oh, and it's oh, gonna be man. it's gonna be even better slash worse on that like flat straight stretch of I ten, where I think the speed limit does get up to eighty five once you get through the hill country. Nice. So yeah. yeah, never made that drive before, but that's right in your wheelhouse if it's eighty five plus because that means you're going triple digits at minimum. That worries me to to push the pilot to triple digits, but we may have to see where where we can get. There we go. All right, some sports stuff to get into. We got to talk about this Shohei Otani situation, and I'm sure you and Kevin will get into that a lot this afternoon today because I talked to Katie last night, and he, he had plenty of takes for me, so I'm sure he's got plenty of takes for the people now that he's been able to marinate on that little press conference slash statement read from Shohei yesterday. Also, some rule changes coming to the NFL, including a big one coming to kickoffs. I want to get your thoughts on that, Trey. Real quick, though, some love to some sponsors. We'll let you hear from one of our great sponsors first. How about a word from our buddy Tom McKay over at AV Consultations? Hi, this is Tom McKay with Audiovisual Consultations. Today's home electronics can be a bit daunting. My company has spent the last 36 years making sure they are not. For those of you who have not experienced our services yet, we'd like to invite you to give us a try for all your home electronics needs. We carry all the major brands of televisions and stereo equipment at prices you can't find in stores. And we come to you. There's no need to leave your home to find great pricing and incomparable service. No traffic and experienced sales geeks or pushy showroom tactics. We believe in having some fun and dreaming big. Do you have a dream for your home entertainment? Let us know. We can make it come true. And we are always there to help after the job is done. We cultivate clients for a lifetime by treating everyone like their family. No, not those family members. I'm talking about the ones you actually like. So relax, hug your kids, make love to your wife, and smile. Then, when you have a moment, give us a call at 255-8678. It's 512-255-8678 or online at avconsultations.com. Yes, indeed. Shout out to AV Consultations. Also, some love to Altstadt Beer, the best beer in the world. Make sure you pick up some the next time you're at the grocery store or the liquor store. And if you're hitting the town, your favorite bars and restaurants all throughout the great state of Texas, make sure you're asking your bartenders, waitresses, waiters, servers, whoever, for Altstadt Beer. They've got a bunch of different brews, something for every beer drinker out there. And it is phenomenal. Brewed in Fredericksburg, you're supporting a local Texas business every time you buy Altstadt more importantly, you're supporting yourself with a great tasting beer that doesn't have a bunch of filler ingredients. It is Altstadt beer, no impurities, no regrets. All right, Trey, five NFL nuggets to get into, and we'll save the biggest one for last. These other four we can just kind of run through, and I want to get maybe a quick thought from you if you've got it. But uh, it's been a wild day for NFL headlines with some rule changes and some television announcements 
coming to the sport this coming season. Uh, we'll start with this one. You know, in-season hard knocks has become a thing in recent years, right? They do the hard knocks before the season during training camp, and they've added the in-season hard knocks in recent years. Well, this year's in-season hard knocks will feature four teams instead of one. So instead of deep diving into one team, they're going to look at an entire division. So all four of the teams will be in the same division, and it will be just a view of those four teams and I guess the division race over the course of the regular year. Have you watched either of the end seasons over these past two years? No, and I wish I had because Hard Knocks is cool, and I love the behind-the-scenes access that you don't normally get as a sports fan, but I have not. What about you? No, and like cool for those who do. This doesn't really affect me one way or the other. I guess maybe it's hard to generate too much drama within a program like that, focusing on just one team because the task at hand is so important and it's a week to week thing and you have your routine. So maybe you do get a few more nuggets from just going a little bit more generalized with the look at each of the four franchises but this is not going to necessarily get me to watch. I, maybe if it's like the Cowboys or the Texans division, I might tune in a little bit. But even then, I'll probably just rely on others to uh, to pluck those nuggets for us. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, you took such a deep dive into one team. If you're doing four teams instead of one, do you get the behind-the-scenes access that you normally get, right? The reason people fell in love with Hard Knocks, or is it just going to be uh, just – more highlights and game recaps and press conferences. I don't know. I feel like they'll do a good job with it, but I wonder how it will work when with a broader horizon. Yeah, I, th I think they'll still go behind the scenes for sure. You're, you're just going to have more of a likelihood of interesting stuff happening because I think that like the inner workings of a football team, unless there's some like off week drama where guys go fucking hit it hard in Cabo and they're all way too hungover to where they play like shit the next week. Like there's just not a whole lot of that happening if you are picking teams that are competing for something yeah and i don't who who were they on these last couple of years was it the dolphins this last year and the cardinals the year before or something sounds right yes yeah so dolphins were obviously competing for something this year now tyree kill is a character and you do want to focus on the uh the characters on a given roster but the arizona one just struck me as boring like kyler murray is a you know he's an angry little person and uh, there were a few other decent names on that roster. Cliff Kingsbury, I guess, had a little bit of interest. But to to put it to four teams, I th still think you can take that deeper look while also just having more compelling content. And that's what it comes down to. If they were getting enough interest with one team, we wouldn't see this change. But they probably realize that this show is a little bit stagnant, happening week over week during a season where these guys are, are trying to, to focus on winning football games and not – not getting into a whole lot of the other BS in their off time. What was your description for Kyler Murray there? Angry little person. I like that. It's good. That is good. All right, the other news. The Philadelphia Eagles will play in Brazil in week one. So we've seen plenty of international games over the years, and I think we knew that the Eagles were going to be playing a Brazil game this season, but now we find out it's a Friday night game in week one of the NFL season. So no word on their opponent just yet, but uh, that's a big deal. And oh, by the way, congrats to everybody because that game will be streaming on Peacock. So people won't be able to watch it. Yep. So that's Thursday, nice. Friday, Sunday, Monday, and there's probably going to be three or four Monday night games at this point. <laughs> yep. That's it. That is it. No Saturday yet. They'll at least let college football have that one. And I'm pretty sure the first NFL weekend is the weekend that Texas travels to Michigan to take on the Wolverines. So hopefully, true. hopefully, yeah, week two of the college football season gets to stand alone uh, on that Saturday. Uh, speaking of streaming, Amazon will now exclusively broadcast a wild card playoff game. So last year we had a playoff game exclusively on Peacock. I don't know if we'll have another one on Peacock, but we will have one on Amazon. So once again, at least one postseason game will now be stream only. All these sports streaming services were supposed to come up with a collective app to make all of this a little bit easier. Can we go ahead and implement that now? Because I'm getting really fucking tired of having to bounce back and forth. Such a first world problem. Bounce back and forth from YouTube TV to Amazon Prime to Peacock to pirating something on my computer to 
uh, just saying fuck Longhorn Network altogether. We need all of this within one app to make it simpler for all of us because I think this does serve as a sort of turnoff for a, a certain faction. Now, football fans will still figure out a way to make it happen. I'll be pirating that game because I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to pay for a subscription to the Peacock or the cock, as the kids like to call it. Uh, but uh, yeah, we get that app in place, and it's going to make it more likely that people like me will just pay the extra couple bucks a month to have everything at, at uh, in such an easy fashion. Yeah, that is definitely what your kids are talking about when they use the term the cock. Oh, thank you very much for letting us know, Trey. And, you know, it's, it's funny. Like, if only there was a place where we could watch all of our favorite channels in, in one spot. Oh, wait, that existed. That was cable, and we decided to get rid of that because we thought we were better than that. Mm. I, I've got cable still. I'm proud. I'm I'm the last one. I'll be the last one to cut the cord in the world. It's, it's a race to the bottom between you and Kevin Dunn right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Thank you very much. It'll be whoever lives longer, I think, will have cable longer. I don't I don't think either of us are ever gonna give it up. It's just whoever dies and the bill doesn't get paid, that will end our run with cable uh and then lastly before the kickoff rule the nfl will have two wednesday christmas games this year so i guess christmas day will be on a wednesday which means we'll have yeah two nfl games on a wednesday and the four teams that are playing in those two games will likely be a part of a double header the previous saturday to even out the timing so it's the same as going sunday to thursday they're going saturday to wednesday and I guess they'll just round robin the four teams to make it work for TV. This is fucked up, dude. They shouldn't be doing this. I'm sorry. Like, you can say, oh, well, you're going to get the extra day because you're playing on Saturday. You're shortening that previous week, too, though. So don't just sit here and harp on player safety when you care very little about player safety when it comes to the most money on the line having to do with playing games on exclusive days at exclusive times. This one annoys me. This one does piss me off for the players. Yeah, I mean, you're smart, Trey, and I think most football fans are smart. Like The NFL doesn't actually give a shit about player safety. They just say it to protect their image. Like They care about their bottom line, and these primetime games give them more money. It's as simple as that. So they'll have Wednesday, Thursday, Sunday and Monday that week. Hell, they might have some Saturday games because at that point in the year, the NFL usually does play on Saturdays. So yeah. look, five days of NFL games in that week of Christmas in late December this year. That's why they're doing the Brazil bit on Friday night at the start of the season. That's why they're playing games on Wednesday towards the end of the season. That's all they care about. They do the bare minimum to, to get by acting like they care about player safety, but they really care about owner wallet. You guys can go this one fucking week, this one year, I should say, and not have a game on Christmas Day. Next year's going to be on a Thursday. You'll get it on the Thursday. Then you can do it on the Friday, Saturday. So, I mean, you can do it for most uh, most years of every decade. Just take the fucking Wednesday off. It's okay to let the NBA, and, and I'm guessing the NHL has a game or two on that. Actually, no, NHL may not have games on Christmas Day. Let the NBA just have that day, this one year. It's okay, but no, not for nah. the NFL. No, that's not how it works. Alex says nobody will watch. Everyone's going to watch. I'm, I'm going to watch. I'm watching. <laughs> that's, that's not because that's not just because I'm Jewish. Like, I, you know, if I was Christian celebrating Christmas, I'd, I'd be watching. But I, I sure as hell will be tuned in on that Wednesday. Yeah, I'm hoping that I'm still in the fantasy football playoffs and I've got some guys playing that day so I can uh, focus fully on those games. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, if you won't, that's all right, you know, to each his or her own. But the NFL crushed it on Christmas this past year. They dominated the NBA. They dominate the NBA with everything ratings-wise nowadays. Uh, and they're going to they're gonna dominate again on Christmas this year. So um, that's, that's just that's how it goes. The league is all about money, and they do a good job. It's a big part of why the NFL is – as popular and as financially sound as it is right now as they uh, sometimes ignore common sense and ignore what the players want. They just go about their business and that's uh, it's worked for them. But yeah, morally it's like, eh, what's going on here? All right. The biggest change, once again, a wild day of NFL news, notes and nuggets. The biggest change is a change to the kickoff rule tray. And it appears that kickoffs will actually be fun again. The NFL is doing something that I've been clamoring for them to do since really the pandemic year, because that's when the XFL came back and only lasted for a couple of months before it had to shut down due to the pandy. But the NFL is adopting the XFL kickoff rule. 
in mm-hmm. 2024. And here's a little video for the people and for you. And then we'll explain just kind of how the rule change works. Also, this will help those of you listening on the app. So here's what NFL kickoffs will look like this upcoming season. All right. There you go. So the biggest changes, there are a few changes to the rule, but the the most obvious one, and I'll show this one more time, the kicker stands alone. Uh, The kicker will be the only person at the 35-yard line, so they're not moving where the ball is going to be kicked off from. It will still be on the team's own 45-yard line, but instead of all 11 guys on the kickoff team being there, the kicker will be the only player standing back at the 35. The other 10 players on the kick team will be standing at the opposing 40-yard line. And the other and the members of the receiving team, nine of the 11 members of the receiving team will be standing between their own 30 to 35 yard line. So instead of there being like a 40 yard gap between the kick team and some of the gunners on the return team, some of the blockers on the return team, excuse me, uh, those guys are going to be within five to 10 yards of each other. And the purpose of this is to limit injuries, right? And the XFL been around for a couple of different stints. They did not have a single injury on a kickoff play. And we know that kickoffs have been the most dangerous play in the NFL for years. And the NFL has already changed a bunch of rules to try to limit the amount of injuries that they do have on kickoffs to the point where there's almost no point in having kickoffs anymore. So the purpose of these rule changes is to try to bring back the kickoff. Obviously, it's a different look. Uh, You've got some weird sub-elements to this kickoff change rule, number one, you can't do a surprise onside kick anymore. So that, you know, with this formation, it'd be impossible to do. So you have to actually let the refs and the opposing team know when you are doing an onside kick. And that will be the old school onside kick that we've seen in recent years. That's not, probably- the old school, Rod, uh, not the old school onside kick rule, the current onside kick rule, you mean? Uh, Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, and then another thing. And people Steve, are, hold on are like, a second. That's stupid because I think that's the most important aspect that they need to figure out how to get right. Because that percentage, which was already a low percentage, went down greatly to where it's really close to moot. Uh, the uh, the chances of you actually getting uh, an onside kick, unfortunately, especially if you take out that surprise element, because they do factor in the surprise element when they talk about onside kick recovery percentages so that pathetic number goes down even more i don't know if you implement and i forget if it was the xfl or usfl that did this where you implement like the fourth and 15 or fourth and 20 whatever it is and if you convert that then you get the ball right there or you keep the ball and you can try and take it down for another score yeah. but they, they need to figure out something that other than the traditional idea of an onside kick Agreed, one hundred percent. I would love them to adopt the fourth and fifteen rule. Uh, we don't we don't watch games for kicks, and the onside kick has become incredibly ineffective due to the recent kickoff rule changes. So yeah, fourth and fifteen, Mahomes in that spot, something like that. Yeah, sign me up for all of that. But um, yeah, I like this. And by the way, touchbacks, touchbacks will go out to the thirty yard line. So I can hear people saying, "Well, you know, well, the kickers are still going to just try to kick touchbacks." Well, now this decentivizes the kick team from having touchbacks because the ball is going to go out further. So this is the NFL saying we want kickoff returns back. Like we hate the rules that we've changed that basically just encourage touchbacks and they're getting rid of the fair catch rule too. In I recent years to ask that. So you can't fair catch and get the ball moved up to the 30. Okay. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So like they, they are trying to bring back the kickoff return. It's going to be different. Like it won't be what Devin Hester was doing or Dante Hall was doing back in the day. But they are trying to make kickoff returns an actual part of the game again instead of literally just kickoff touchback start at the 25-yard line. So I will commend the NFL for doing this. Of course, I miss the older school kickoff rules, but I, like this is, once again, the NFL kind of pretending to care about player safety. This is them actually trying to care about player safety, but also – trying to make football a little bit more enjoyable for the fans. Yeah, no, you're right about that. If we're going to call bullshit on the Christmas Day game, we should give them a little bit of credit here. They they deserve a little bit of credit, but this is still a process that needs to be needs to have more done than some tinkering. They they've got to figure out the onside kick part. Four teams that are trying to come back in games who used to have like 15 to 20% chance on getting that onside kick and now it's down into the uh mid to low single digits. 
Mm-hmm. And in the XFL, for the two years that the XFL existed, more than 90% of kickoffs were returned. So what was the percentage for the NFL this last year? Do you know? Uh, let's see if it's on this article. The NFL says they're hoping for at least an 80% return rate in 2024 with this rule change. Uh, I don't think I see it. Okay. But that is a good, that is a good stat. It felt like 0% of kickoffs were returned in the NFL this year. Hmm. Uh, Let's see. Oh, here we go. Return rate fell to a league record 21.7%. So 80% of kickoffs were touchbacks last year, and they're hoping that 80% or more of kickoffs will be returned this year. So that's credit the NFL. Like you said, you hit the nail on the head. You you, you give credit where it's due. We'll see how this thing works, but I loved watching it in the XFL. Once again, I've been like right away four years ago when I saw that rule. I'm like, this is something the NFL needs to adopt, and thankfully they have adopted it. So I think it's just a one-year trial run for right now. But my, my hunch is, Trey, this thing's going to work, and it will stick around for a long time. Cool. So there you go. There's your latest out of the world of the NFL. All right, before we uh, get into a little Shohei Otani talk today, uh, Trey, you've got some time for a word for our friends over at Big Hat Spirits. I sure do. Big Hat Spirits. BigHatSpirits.com. That is the website. If I can get to the website to pull it up on the share screen as I tell you people about the greatness that is the Big Hat Cocktail in a Can. There you go. You see me scrolling through the website right now down to all those delicious flavors. The ranch water, jalapeno ranch water, the margarita, that prickly pear paloma there on the left, blackberry smoke, Texas mule, and those mocktails for you non-alcohol fans of the margarita and mojito varieties. Big hat cocktails in a can are high in the good stuff and low in BS. That means real alcohol, real kombucha, no added sugars, no syrups, or not, no gluten, non-GMO, BPA-free, 100% natural, real spirits. Now, when you yourself go to BigHatSpirits.com, where I'm at right now, you'll start at the top of the webpage there. Scroll down just a little bit, and you'll see that map of Texas. That's right. It's expanded from Central Texas. That's because they're now selling Big Hat cocktails in a can in Waco, uh, a little bit northwest of Waco. And yes, across towards Houston. Eventually, they will tackle that Houston market. You click on the Big Hat icon closest to where you are and that's where you can get that big hat spirit cocktail in a can big hat spirits.com yes indeed much love to big hat spirits and now a word from our great friends out at covert bk hi i'm dan covert with my wife hayden welcome to covert bk our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes buick gmc cadillac chrysler dodge jeep and ram and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from we have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car truck or suv with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about covert born and raised in austin Oh, yes. Much love to the coverts. All right, Trey, I don't know if you saw this yesterday, but um, I was locked in to Shohei Otani's. It's hard to call it a press conference because he didn't field any questions. It was him with an interpreter out in Los Angeles reading a prepared statement in regards to the bombshell story that came out last week in regards to Shohei Otani's interpreter gambling on sports and allegedly using money from Shohei Otani's bank account to pay off some gambling debts that he had accumulated over the last few months. Uh, here's a little bit. It was about a 12 minute long statement read. If you, Oh include. my God, 12 minutes. Well, it was, it wasn't like in a row. It was Shohei would read 30 seconds worth interpreter would English 30 seconds worth. And then so back six to Shohei. Speech. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it was all split up. So it took longer than it needed to, but it was still way longer. Like I was shocked. It went on as, as long as it did, but here's just a, a part of Shohei Otani and his new interpreter. In LA yesterday. Eh, 
、誰かに送金を依頼したことももちろん全くありません。So I never bet on baseball or any other sports, or I never have asked somebody to do it on my behalf,、uh, and I have never、uh, went through a bookmaker、uh, to bet on sports. So it was a lot of that. And, you know, Shohei went on to blame his former interpreter, Ipe, and said, like, he did all of this. He was the guy betting. He was stealing money from my account. I had no idea he was taking money from my account. I found out about this basically the same time all of you found out about this. And it was Shohei just saying, hey, this wasn't me. This was all the interpreter. I had no idea this was going on. And, well, that's, that's what we had. Unfortunately, once again, no, no questions asked. To Shohei after this was over. But Trey, your, your thoughts? I mean, now that you've read the story, heard about the story, I'm sure you've、uh, had some time to collect some thoughts on this whole situation involving baseball's biggest star. I don't know, man. It's hard when a story、uh, comes out of nowhere and then changes a couple of different times, including from Otani's camp, to eventually settle on him being completely、uh, non complicit. In the amount of money that ends up getting sent to a bookmaker, it's just something still smells fishy here. I didn't necessarily not think anything of it when the for- story first broke last week, but it was Kevin who first opened my eyes to, th- to the weirdness going on here. And while I didn't sit through the six slash 12 minutes of him talking,、um, it's, it's hard not to still wonder and to see what. Major League Baseball ultimately decides on. And by the way, this isn't just in Major League Baseball's hands. This is in the hands of the feds at this point. There's a federal investigation going on surrounding this. So if MLB does actually find something substantive that will link Otani to these bets being placed, they better be careful not to try and say otherwise because the feds could come up with a、uh, different interpretation of things and it'll spoil all. The hard work that Major League Baseball has done to bring more fans to the game over these last several years. Yeah. I mean, MLB is already giving Shohei the superstar treatment, right? I feel like if this was just an average baseball player, he'd be suspended until the investigation was complete. But、True. because it's Shohei, I mean, he's, he's baseball's best thing. He's baseball's biggest star. Like the future of the sport is almost in, in his hands. Uh, yeah, they're saying, all right, now、nah, we'll let you play and we'll do the investigation on the side. And if we find something, They're really going to try to avoid finding something. But if we find something, then we'll have to lay down the law a little bit. But yeah, I mean, I, like, I, I don't know if Shohei was betting on sports. It's funny. Like, Bucky and I were kind of in the same, pay,、uh, in the same boat, and then Wags and Rodney were on the opposite boat. Like, I don't think Shohei was gambling on sports, but I have a tough time, really、uh, an impossible time, believing that Shohei had no idea this was going on. Like, it is well, not easy to tra- wire transfer money. Like, you can't, you can't wire transfer those amounts of money from a bank account without calling the account owner to get approval. So maybe it was Ipe who was doing the betting, but I, 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 there's a 0% chance in my mind, Trey, that Shohei had no idea this stuff was going on. At the advice of a crisis manager who was hired by the Dodgers to help Shohei when the story surfaced, he was initially saying, That he was trying to help his interpreter friend cover massive gambling debts. And it had to be sent in $500,000 increments because that was the maximum allow- amount that you could wire from point A to point B. And then the story changes again. Yeah, there, there's something very wrong going on right here、um, in terms of、uh, sports bets being made by a big time figure. Now, if you didn't bet on baseball, Then it does matter significantly less. And the reports coming from ESPN or that they have multiple sources saying there were no bets made on baseball. It was in September and October. So are we totally sure about that? But、uh, it just depends on, on what you're taking at face value right now versus what you're calling complete bullshit on. And at this point, I'm not sure what is, what is real and what is fraudulent. So I, I look forward to seeing what the feds come up with because I don't have a whole lot of faith in Major League Baseball telling us the truth either. Yeah, last thing for me on this. I mean, that interpreter was making $85,000 a year. There's not a bookie in the world that would let somebody making that amount of money incur $4.5 million worth of debt unless they were confident that somebody with the money was going to be able to pay it off. Shohei Otani just signed a $700 million deal. Pretty sure the bookie felt good about Shohei paying. Seemed like he didn't pay. And that's why this story got leaked. And here we are. So, yep, just the beginning of、uh, a story that's going to have 
numerous twists and turns. I think over the next few weeks, months, years, who knows how long, but uh, man, wild, not what major league baseball needs two days before opening day, by the way, like this is baseball's biggest story when they want it to be about the teams and the games who start playing on Thursday. Uh, This is what everyone's talking about and what everyone will be talking about for a while. This may have to resettle on Otani saying, look, this guy was gambling degenerately and I helped him pay off his bets. Like they, they need to walk back the, uh, the money was completely stolen story because he, he has already said, he has already said himself otherwise to go along with the very rational thought that you just laid out there that a guy who is responsible for a certain amount of money has to give some sort of approval for that money to change hands. I mean, it has to happen at much lower level than that. If you're talking about the maximum wire amount, I mean, come on, guys. Yeah, there you go. All right. Um, we'll shift gears here. We'll take your thoughts. The code of text line 512-222-9328. YouTube comment line, of course, is open as well. We move to where are we at in society? I think we're due for a recorded today, Trey. Sure. Here we go. Hey, it's Steve from Pest Wranglers, and I don't know of a single mosquito that owns a home with a backyard, but they sure like to hang out in your yard and make you miserable. Pest Wranglers can fix that for you. Our mosquito treatments are designed to kill adult mosquitoes as well as keep mosquito larvae from developing for up to three weeks. Use us all summer or just once before that big party. No contract, no hassles, no blood-sucking mosquitoes. Check out our reviews and see what others are saying about Pest Wranglers. Pest Wranglers, effective, reliable, affordable. Online at pestwranglers.com. Where are we at in society today? That's right. It is time for your regular look at stories that show we as a people are headed in the wrong direction. Very occasionally, I will bring you a story that provides a sense of optimism that has us all saying to ourselves, hey, maybe we as a people are starting to figure something out. But sadly, today is not that day. First, though, I need to show you one of my kids' school pictures. My son, Calvin, when I picked he and his sister up yesterday, was laughing when he got to me. And I was like, what's so funny, kid? He said, we got our school pictures back today. I said, oh, yeah? Uh You look as handsome as ever, ever, handsome devil? He said, no, they're embarrassing because I have that hair. I mean, I said, oh, you mean the mullet that you insisted on keeping through school picture day, even if mom and I were gently encouraging you to maybe cut the hair before them because you might be embarrassed at how it looks uh, with the end result? And he said, yeah. I said, ah, you're such a handsome devil. I bet it still looks pretty good. And if nothing else, we're going to be able to laugh about it for the rest of our collective lives. And so with that, I bring you Calvin Ellings school photo <laughs> from the spring semester of the 23-24 academic calendar. Got the crazy longhorn shirt on and more importantly that mullet with a little bit of a swoop up front too oh it's the gundy 2022 quinn ewers combo there oh good call i like that yeah wow look at that lettuce way to go calvin he shouldn't be embarrassed by that at all that is fantastic i tend to agree with him on that i said look you're you're embarrassed right now it's hilarious and you can get away with it like you've got cool hair and you've gotten away with a bunch of different styles now that's just one of those styles and i said to show you that i'm not bsing you that's going to be a new picture in the background going forward as you're you rocking that mullet this school year so he was uh he had a smile i mean he was He was joking about it, although he did think it looked like shit because it is a mullet. He was kind of joking about it, too, and he's got a really good sense of humor for seven. So we we did have some fun with it as a family the the rest of the day and night. Looks like he's going to a Def Leppard concert after taking that picture right there. I mean, he's got the full 80 metal hairband look going there. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, he and his friends went there and are coming back after drinking too many beverages. One of them gets into an accident and loses an arm is having to do things one armed the rest of the time, you know? Mm. Yeah. I'd be a little surprised if that happened to your son. Well, it was a far fetched deaf leopard joke. So you're just going to have to be okay with that. Headline. Headline. Florida mom accused of trying Boy. to sell daughter to store employee for $500. Dollars was P Diddy the store employee by chance? Oh, <laughs> no details suggesting mm. as much, but no details just uh, saying that's not the possi- not the likelihood either. We go to P- Palatka, Florida, for this story, where a Florida woman was arrested last week for allegedly trying to sell her daughter outside of a local business. 
Police said that the woman, Jessica Woods, aged 33, had been loitering around the business with her 18-month-old daughter on March 5th. Quote, Woods had been observed around the business with her daughter for a few days. An anonymous citizen made contact with her and asked if she and the child needed any assistance. The anonymous citizen was an employee of the business who knew Woods because she came through the area regularly. Woods told this person when asked if she needed help that she didn't need anything, but instead offered to sell her daughter to the employee for 500 bucks. The employee refused, causing Woods to walk away, leaving the child behind. As a result, the employee picked the child up and brought her to the police department, telling officers about what had happened. In response, the kid was taken into custody, uh, custody by the Department of Children and Families, been placed in foster care, and Woods was arrested on March 7th, where she faces charges of unlawfully deserting a child, trying to sell a child for money, aggravated child abuse, and three counts of child abuse with great bodily harm, which makes this story less funny and much less sad. Wow, I didn't realize trying to sell a child for money was actually against the law. I didn't either, but it is, and I'm okay with that being against the law too. Oh, 100%. I just I've never heard of something like that happening, and the fact that that is a law means that there have been other people who have tried to do that in the past and the government felt the need to turn that into an actual law. So I now have to ask you this question, BK. It's an unfortunate question. It's an offensive question, but it's a question befitting of this show and you. Thank you. Would you? Uh, mm, no. Mm, a few drinks? Mm, no. Is that honeycombs in her hair? What's going on there? Mm. Like curly fries hanging off of her dome. What is that? Uh, they look like uh, really bad twists, maybe. Yeah. Those, uh, what is it? Fritos twists? Mm. They make those? Kind of looks like those. Uh, now I'm getting hungry here, but not for her. Um, I don't know. How many beers kind of thing? Sure. I think uh, I think after 10 beers. So scale of one to 10 beers, you're going full throttle. Yeah, well, you can get more than that, right? Like it's it's not a full 12 pack um, and we're not approaching, uh, approaching case territory here, but it would take more than a sixer for me to take that home. Yeah, that's that's probably the accurate gauge is one to 24 on a one to 24 scale. Would you? Yeah, it's it's uh, ten beers. I think I would need to beers. to take that home. Now, I will say this: her trying to not have a child is a little more attractive. That does help. That might knock it down by a beer or two. You might be down to eight now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I think hearing that story, if she just said that to me at a bar and was like, "Hey, here's what I tried to do today. I tried to sell my kid." I'm like, "That's awesome. That means you don't want kids. We're in a good spot here." Uh, so that yeah, that maybe lowers it to nine or eight. Now, the local business was not identified. Any guesses as to what business she was trying to sell her kid for 500 bucks outside of? Publix? Possibility. Jameis was stealing the crab legs out there. Jack in the box. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess I don't. I assumed grocery store, but I don't know. Taco Bell? Fast, fast food makes more sense. Nah, I, don't, I don't think Taco Bell would, would be in that market. A pawn shop? Pawn shop would work. Yeah, they got the pawn stars out there. And she's a pretty shitty businesswoman, first of all. Like, she was looking for 500 bucks for something, and then she just left the thing there for free. Like, uh, no negotiation, no bartering. It just went from 500 to here. Take it. You can have it. Not that we're in the uh, the market of trafficking humans, but we've done that with couches and things in the past. We're trying to get a couple hundred bucks for them, and nobody nobody's biting on Facebook Marketplace, so we... Go to Facebook, buy nothing just to get it off of our hands. Maybe that's yeah. what she was rationalizing there. And just like leave it in the front of your house and then someone comes by and picks it up. That or the mailbox. Or the mailbox. Or the mailbox. Yeah, that's uh, just left the kid 500 bucks. You, like that's a, she would have to pay someone to take the kid. You know, like that's that's yeah. the rational line of thinking. It's like, I'm not paying you for your problem. You you're paying me for my problem. 
Well, that's always my response to Amber Alerts and people, whenever I say, ah, it's just one deadbeat relative or family member taking the kid from another deadbeat family member or relative. And people say, you never know, there could be that random instance. No, there's not that random instance because nobody wants your kid. I know you think everybody wants your kid, but the reality is for everybody except for orphans or people in the foster care system, this poor uh, little child included now, uh, they Kid, regular kids aren't getting kidnapped off of city streets. That is not happening to the degree that we worry that it is. Mm, what a story. 500 bucks. Yeah, she's yeah you're right, Alex. I'm not, I'm not a prayer, but yes, pray for her if you do that sort of thing, because that is, it truly is an awful story, even though we're, yeah. we're having fun right now. Oh, yeah. Awful, awful, awful. This woman should be jailed for a long time, and hopefully the kid finds a more loving parent or set of parents uh, than, than what they had before goodness the Good find. Good in the florida foster care system is that is not going to be the <laughs> florida woman back at it all right i see the fellas in the waiting room it's chip and it's zay chip how was the madonna concert last night oh man six she's 65 years old and she's first of all the concert did not start until 10 mm. Mm. What? She was still going at 1240 when we were like, I think we've heard everything we need to hear. Y'all left early at 1240? Yeah. Wow. I don't get it. Like she's 65. Shouldn't she be starting these concerts at seven so she can be in bed by 930 or 10? Did y'all drive back to Austin overnight? No, we we uh, spent the night in Hillsboro. Mm, smart and then made the rest of the trip wow so, you, i mean you, yeah go ahead it's a good show i mean it's a full-blown production and it's her life story so she kind of starts at the beginning you know when she shows up in new york with 35 bucks and she's talking about you know giving guys oral for use of their showers like uh i mean it was wild and then she just <laughs> goes from there from lucky star to holiday to like a virgin and all the way you know to where she is now it's it's crazy all the records she's set and all the i mean and she produced Alanis Morissette. I mean, people forget that. Like, wow. Jagged Little Pill was on her record label. It's my shit. God, it's Maverick my shit. That's, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize I didn't like Madonna, but now I know I don't like Madonna. That's her oh, worst. come on. That's her it's like worst. rain on your wedding day. Come uh, on, man. What y'all know uh, about that? How's the only brother here? Messing with some Atlanta's more set. Come on oh, now. Those are hits. I, I like you ought to know, just like every other uh, hetero human being out there. and gay human being for that matter. It's just a badass song. That song sucks, though, because it's a bunch of non-ironic examples, which I think in and of itself is ironic that she's singing about uh, irony and she doesn't even understand irony. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that song. Yeah, exactly. That's that's why I hate that song so much. It doesn't make now, any sense. Now, Chip, if she went over her full life story, did she get into the book of photographs era? And if so, did she talk about blowing that goat? <laughs> because that is a photograph in that book of photographs. Her filleting a goat. No, Tom she Brady? did not mention that. They just showed highlights of the sex book and all okay. the. Any chance, Chip, you told her that I have two showers at my place? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Listen, she is down. I mean, Madonna oh, is like, she runs the show. She's doing her thing. She, I mean, she she was with Tupac. She was with ah. Dennis Rodden. I mean, mm. she's had a good time, man. God. Madonna has done it her way. Forget Frank Sinatra. Mm. Madonna is like, excuse me while I whip yours out. Mm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so not a virgin when she released that song, huh? Oh, no. Mm. No, no, no. But, I mean, how about this? She was a dancer. 
She went to the University of Michigan on a dance scholarship. She quit two years into the program, went to New York as a dancer. Her plan B was to become the all-time leading selling female artist in the history of music. Wow. That was, that kind was her of plan J B. That was kind of J-Lo's path too, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she can't sing. She had to take voice lessons to do the Avita Perone, um, Ava Perone role in the movie um, Avita that Andrew Lloyd Webber didn't want her to have, but she got anyway because she's Madonna and ended up winning the Golden Globe for that. I mean, she's been in 17 movies. She's had, you know, she's the greatest. Well, she was the greatest touring artist until Taylor Swift. So this mm. era's tour. Mm. So, but she, uh, she was funny. She kind of paid tribute to Taylor Swift. She's like, um, this show is going to span four decades. You know what that means? I've been kicking ass for a long time. And she has, man, four mm. decades. Damn. Of music. Well, glad y'all, glad y'all got to go. Sounds like a great, great trip and a great time. And she's coming to Austin in May, I believe. Okay, you going again? No, we won those tickets. My wife won the tickets. Ah, okay. In some drawing, um, thank God she checked her email because she thought it was spam. And then they're like, "You won tickets to Madonna." Were the and tickets? Sure enough, Everything worked. Were the tickets good? Yeah, it was in a, it was in a, um, the platinum level at American Airlines Center. I don't know what that means. So <laughs> we kind of had our own thing. We had our own little box. It's like the middle, middle level, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, not the suite level? Yeah. It's awesome. Jackpot. Yeah. Power. And she, turns like the air off she wants it hot for her voice so it's like <laughs> i mean everyone's laughing the bartenders are like sweating i mean it's something else man mm. madonna love it all right guys well i'm sure you've got more stories and plenty of sports to get into so we will uh bid y'all do y'all have a great day hey appreciate y'all appreciate y'all hey in the immortal words of Judy Brown, happiness is a choice. We're happy you're spending some time with us. Chip and Zay holding it down one to three right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. The midday of Texas Sports Unfiltered. So, Zay, what do you think about Madonna? Well, Madonna. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Give me more. She should have stayed with Tupac. He'd probably be alive still. You yeah. know what I'm saying? He'd be doing more white things, like riding horses and going hiking instead of hanging out with Suge Knight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Madonna was a wild one, but life probably would have been a lot safer if he went the Madonna route. But you can't, the image, it was a lot about the image for both of them. You know, they did it, whatever. But yeah, love Madonna. Like a virgin, solid. She's had some hits. Yeah, she's had a lot of work done, but she looked good last night. Oh, yeah. Come on. She looked good last night. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I saw her on that Blonde Ambition tour in 1990, and she was, I mean, she's a dancer. You always have to go back to the beginning with Madonna because her concerts, she would dance for two, two and a half hours. And in this show... The dancers are dancing all around her, you know, and yeah, kind she can't of, move like she used to. Yeah, I mean, she's sixty-five. She looks good. I mean, she's I got a new hip. Yeah, you all know, that arthritis, right? <laughs> well, arthritis. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, man. I mean, and she's singing. It's not voice track. It's her, and for better or worse. I mean, there's some songs where it's a little crackly, a little choppy, a little little pitchy. Okay. But, you know, she's Madonna. 
you know the words you're gonna sing them with her and uh yeah i mean she didn't play my favorite song which is a bummer dress you up which to me is like her that is her and her madonna glory yeah her um, her you know but that's all right she played holiday she played lucky star and express yourself vogue all that like a virgin oh yeah all that so um yeah let's see here all right now yeah madonna yeah she was yeah she'd been with warren Beatty. she did the big tracy league of their own oh man i liked her in that yeah she was feisty in that yeah yeah and she yeah. wrote that song um about the uh the playground it's a kind of good slow song that she wrote that's the thing i mean she's got 300 songs that she's written 18 were you know chart topping hits i mean she ended up being a songwriter right. i just like she is a survivor dude like you start off as a dancer, you go to New York as a dancer, and somehow you end up as the greatest selling female artist of all time. Like Taylor Swift knew she was going to sing from the time she was a little kid. Michael Jackson knew he was going to sing. Prince was going to sing. Now Prince could dance. Michael could dance. Manada, you got to give it to her, man, because she cannot sing. And she is... <laughs> She can sing a little bit. She can sing a little bit, just enough. Woo! You know Paula. Remember Paula Abdul? Oh yeah, Lakers. Dance with Roger Rabbit and shit. Dancer, yeah. yeah. She was a dancer. Ooh. She was a Lakers girl. She was a choreographer. And then someone was like, "Oh, we can produce you," and she made some. You know, she made a platinum record. Yeah, and. I give credit to those people, man. When your plan B turns into just the waterfall of fame, fortune, good for you. Yeah. Hey, come on. Y'all on the code of text line. Y'all need to chill out. Somebody said Madonna's been ran through. No, she just has tried different types of men. She's a classy woman. Come on now. Don't let all that shower stuff confuse you. She's a classy woman. Like, she's a she's, survivor. She's having fun, man. <laughs> she has fun. Exactly. Ain't nothing wrong with a woman having fun. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Have fun. You, it's New York. The 80s. Come on now. Live it up. Yeah. Yeah. We ain't going to shame Madonna. I love Madonna. Dennis Rodman now. Come on. She was. She was I, read, I read Rodman's book. And he says that she was begging him to have a child. Oh, no, Dennis. And he said, no. Nope. nope. That's, what that's what I'm talking about, Dennis. Stand on business. Don't, Don't let you want to have you? a child with Madonna just so that you get child support? Hell no. Oh, Kim Kardashian tried to get that on Odell Beckham. He just broke it off with her. Yeah, man. That could have been the... Uh, Right call of the day, but I feel like it's fitting right now. Yes, Kim Kardashian and Odell Beckham Jr. were dating. She went out there and told some journalists or some podcast, whatever, that she would love to have another baby with Odell because he has good genetics. <laughs> and they would make pretty babies. And Odell said, yo, red flag, can't do it. It's been fun, but relationship, no, mm -mm, no. Nah. Not you. Sorry. You know, the way Kanye is, you see Kanye batshit crazy at this point. Odell, he don't want them problems. Have fun. Brady had his fun. He was creeping around with Kim right after uh, the little Giselle thing, and he retired. Just a little fun. They were seen together. That lasted about a month, if that. Tom Brady? Tom Brady. Look it up. Look it up. Go oh, was out here running wild. Wilson. Goat was out here running wild, and he made it seem like he wasn't really doing nothing. 
You know, they're like, oh, Kim Kardashian, Tom been hanging out, but they're friends, though. Hey, I Tom feel them. Brady. Yeah, I feel them. Do your thing, Tom. Do your thing. And then Tom was like, you know what? It's not going to work for me. It's not. Like, Why, Tom? Yeah, I just, I got to do my own thing. I'm still hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Giselle out with jujitsu, karate chopping and stuff, getting flipped around, and I'm still hurt. You know, it's, you've been cool. You've been a good rebound, you know, Charles Barkley style. But, hey, I got kids. I want to be good to my kids. You know, I take work very seriously. The NFL season coming up. I got to get my voice right. Everybody want to compare me to Tony Romo and Chris Collinsworth. That ain't going to happen. I'm the best at everything. I got to prove that. So Tom probably working on this game right now. He probably working on his broadcasting play by play right now, watching film, talking about how he would address it and throw out the X's and O's for the people to see. You know, he crazy like that. He's nuts. He's nuts. He wants to be the best. He wants to be better than Romo Collinsworth. Oh, my, uh, uh, my man that played tight end. Olsen, he wants to be better than all those guys. He's nuts. He should be having fun with this. It ain't going to be fun for him unless if he's the best. So Kim ain't ready for that, and he probably let Kim know. Real a month in, it's been fun, but sorry, I got a job to do. My man Tom, go. Hey, real quick, since we're on the subject of celebrity gossip. Oh yeah, did you see this TMZ? Oh, not my boy, dude. He got sucker punched. Oh, that's dirty. That's dirty. VY man. got sucker punched. Why? If I'm VY, if I'm, I'm tracking this guy down. Yeah, we got to track him down. And I'm making him pay. Yeah, we suing. We taking everything. You see the got. video? Oh yeah, it's a foul video. It hurt. Broke my heart. Got sucker punched. Sucker punched, man. Dirty. And they got it on film. TMZ got a good video. That, that's a bad video. That don't look good at all. You got it. Bootleg? <laughs> I can pull it up. Yeah, I can pull it up. <laughs> why, is somebody, why is somebody sending us an address with a guy's name? Like, that's the real person on the code of text line. I'm not going to say that out loud, man. Y'all are nuts. Because that, that can't be the dude that got my man VY. It's a tough video. Yeah, it looked like he was yeah. kind of calming things down. Yeah, de-escalating the thing. And then this dude is like, oh, that's Vince Young. I'm going to punch him in the face. Come on. Okay. <laughs> look, 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 look. I, it was bad, but I'm sure it didn't go down like that. How do you think it went down? Um, I mean, Vince, I, wasn't, I he wasn't, in, I, Vince wasn't instigating. No. I didn't see Vince instigating. No. But I have seen my man VY while out before. At, this was 10 years ago. He's probably grown from then. But I've seen my man getting the altercations at Lifetime Fitness and stuff like that. All right, we put it up on Super Bootleg. So VY's in the white cap. Yeah, see, he's trying to get the guy back. Now watch this. The dude just sucker punches him. Yeah. Like, what on earth? That, that, that's tough. Wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. At first, I thought it was Northgate or something. I was like, yo, VY, you in the wrong parts, man. I hope you ain't at Northgate, you know, because how can you do that to VY? Especially in his hometown. It says it was in Houston at some bar. You know, and I, I don't know. Like, yeah, wrong place, wrong time. But at the end of the day, like, you got to know and have a feel out. Like, okay, this might be my boy that's getting into something. We got to get him out of here immediately. Because these dudes around me looking like they're about to pop off. Like, you, you should be able to feel that. And somebody, you know, VY's level, again, he's just trying to, seems like, help a friend. But that dude... Yeah, sucker punched his ass. And yeah, hopefully we hear what really happened and VY gets what's owed to him. But 
Yeah, it was tough. It was it was tough waking up to that in the morning and seeing. All right, someone wants to know how old Vince Young is. Vince Young is forty. Forty, yeah. Vy is forty. Not VJ. Vy. Um. All right, <clears throat> Zay. We'll be talking to our man Chris Hummer here in a few minutes. Big Hummer. Talk a little college football. Um, little uh, spring football nugget. So it's fascinating what's happening right now with Steve Sarkeesian and these receivers. He's got this incredible room of receivers. Isaiah Bond and Matt Golden and um, John Tay Cook and DeAndre Moore and Silas Bolden will be arriving. You got Ryan Wingo and Aaron Butler. And the thing about Sark with his receivers, he wants his receivers to understand the entire offense, all the concepts, so that you're not just running a route. You know how you fit into the whole progression of the play. And as soon as you can prove to Steve Sarkeesian that you can command that and make plays and be where you're supposed to be and catch the ball and run that route flat when it's supposed to be flat and bend it when you're supposed to bend it, then you're in his circle of trust. And right now, you got all these dudes trying to get into the circle of trust. And it's... You know, everyone's like, everyone thinks they know how it's going to go. <clears throat> no, it's playing out right now. And it's it's going to be fun to watch because this could play out for a while. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I've been just so pro rotation. I mean, yes, Steve Sarkeesian in the past has really stuck to his first group of guys getting majority of the reps. But if you have enough ballers out there that are capable, like you said, of earning that trust then let them get out there and make plays so you can conserve energy and make these guys a little bit more durable down the line, especially in the rough and tough SEC. So guys like DeAndre Moore, guys like Ryan Niblick, Guys like John T. Cook that all were kind of waiting their turn this past season with Xavier Worthy and Jordan Winnetan and I Mitchell. What does it mean with the guys that you mentioned with Silas Bolden and Isaiah Bond and Matthew Golden? Like everybody's just expecting those transfers to get majority of the reps, which I don't think that's necessarily the case. Again, those guys that have been waiting their turn, they've been watching, they've been practicing, they've already been in the system. So yes, as talented as Isaiah Bond is with his speed and as good as Matthew Golden is and et cetera, these guys are pretty good too, and they know the playbook. And not to mention those dudes that just came in as freshmen in the Ryan uh, Wingos of the world. So, yeah, man, I get in this wide receiver room. Everybody should get an opportunity to do something. I ain't even mentioned Aaron Butler, who you said is as swift as, uh, you know, I don't know what out there last week when you saw him in uh, spring practice. But, yeah, all these guys are going to get a legitimate opportunity to showcase what they could do. And if you just come to the conclusion where, okay, everybody could do a little bit of something, then play everybody, Sark. Like, play everybody. Let yeah. everybody eat, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got to earn it. And yeah. Sark is – you know, once he knows he can trust you, that consistency, you're in. And then if and you want to be the first one in, because as yeah. we know, it can it can be tough to crack the crack the code um, with Sark. So it's it's like, OK, who's really about it? Who's really into the film study and the extra grind and digging in because the results are proven and we're going to get some more results when the draft hits Motown next month, a month, we're a month out from the NFL draft 
And it's, man, it's, it's been a minute since you've had a complete blank slate at the receiver position at, at Texas. I mean, certainly Sark's going in his fourth year. It's been, you know, since he got here that, uh, that we've had a blank slate like this. Cause you just had three big time receivers roll out. So, yeah. um, yeah, I think this is going to be fun. I mean, like I can go watch practice and see Aaron Butler gliding around, making it look easy, which he did again yesterday. Um, I love watching that dude. I mean, he, he's got acceleration. Um, but you know, Ryan Niblett's got acceleration. I'm hearing he's still a little raw. Um, DeAndre Moore, I hear, watch out. I he's heard he's headed. turning heads. Yeah. Yeah. He's, Especially if he has Jay Witt in him. Like, I know they both light skin and stuff. Let's not get that comparison <laughs> twisted or anything. But when Jordan Winnington at his pro day mentioned DeAndre Moore and said, yeah, he reminds me a lot of myself and – playing that slot position where you're getting a lot of those intermediate throws, you got to be really good yards after catch. You know, you got to be able to make guys miss, whether that's with your agility and juking dudes or using your power. And Jordan Winnington, he did a little bit of both, which if you look back, I mean, yes, Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy both showed out, but I still wish Jordan Winnington got more reps because when he did, like that Oklahoma game, Jordan Winnington was really the only one that stepped up and had a dominant-ass game, and I'm still – just losing my mind that he didn't get in the end zone on that goal line play, knowing what came after. But if DeAndre Moore could be anything like that, you know, just on the field wise, but also mentality wise, without the injuries, look out, look out. Cause I think he's just an afterthought right now. And if you've heard him speak, he talks about understanding, okay, yeah, I was a big time player coming from my high school and all playing around big time guys. But when I get here and I see Xavier Worthy and I see Jordan Woods and I see Adonai Mitchell all excelling and doing what it takes to be good, I got a lot to learn. And I think he's learned that. And I think it's made him better because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's bring in the man. Chris Hummer, National College Football Writer, Analyst, 24-7 Sports. Chris Hummer has uh, written a very interesting article about the quarterbacks who've been ranked numero uno in the uh, recruiting rankings and how they've fared over the years. Hummer, how you doing? doing what's up, guys? I'm doing well. How are y'all? What's up, man? Hummer? We're doing great. We love Tuesdays when we get to talk to Hummer, um, talk a little football. All right, so Hummer. Better than basketball after last week. Well, I need Creighton and Iowa State to play for the championship or else I got no, no shot. How's your bracket looking, Hummer? It's pretty solid, actually, man. I'm in a, I'm in a work pool with like 400 people, and I'm in like – I think 15th place out of like the 400. Like, oh, that's I'm solid. Rolling. I'm rolling. I need uh, I need Houston to keep rolling and I'll be in good shape. Okay. Who else do you have alive? Uh, my whole final four is alive. Uh, seven of the elite, seven of the eight for the elite eight. So doing all right. Okay. There we go. Let's go. I went, uh, I went real chalky and it's paying off, you know, got Purdue, yeah. Houston, UConn in the final four. Um, I tried to get a little creative, Hummer. I went yeah, with me too. Saint, I went with St. Mary's, and they St. Married me right out of the bracket. That was that was tough. I had St. Mary's. I should have known. Well, when I life. saw them, I was like, you know what? They could do it, but then it's always with St. Mary's. I don't mean to be that guy, but I have to. Too many white boys. Too many. <laughs> too many. Bad matchup. Sometimes it's just a bad matchup. That Gene Hackman Hoosier style. I got Creighton. That's too many white guys, too. And you're they got a couple brothers. They got a couple right. brothers. They, right. they got a couple. <laughs> Is Sean Adams you, used you to always say gotta have the right personnel for March, man? You always gotta have the right <laughs> personnel for March. Yeah, Sean Adams used to say the cracker factor. <laughs> like, don't 
you know, like when Sean said, when he played football, he was a receiver at Abilene Christian. If he had a white DB on him, he'd say cracker check, cracker check aisle one. Anyway, Hummer, we didn't oh. bring you on to drag you into some bathroom style conversation about the makeup of these athletic teams. Let's get to your article about quarterbacks who've been ranked number one and how they've fared because we know Texas has a couple of those quarterbacks on the roster right now. But what did your study show, Hummer? Uh, it shows that, so this was not just looking at number one overall quarterbacks. It was the quarterbacks who were ranked number one initially. So a lot of cases, these are guys that are in ninth grade going into 10th grade, getting their first ever ranking. Right. Um, so sometimes it works out like Trevor Lawrence, no doubt. Number one prospect when he was in ninth grade went on to become arguably the greatest, one of the greatest recruits of all time. One of the greatest um, college quarterbacks of all time. Um, on the other end of that spectrum is a class like, um, let's take a look at the 2021 class. So I don't know if Texas fans remember, but Preston Stone was a pretty big target for Texas at the time. Uh, ended up at SMU over Texas, which was a pretty big surprise. But the top five quarterbacks in that class um, when it debuted were Sam Heward, Jake Garcia, Tyler Buckner, and Jake Rubley. Um Y'all heard of any of those guys? <laughs> no. Preston Stone, to his credit, is the starter at SMU. Uh, very good quarterback. Um, they're excited about him for next year. But the rest of those guys, like, never made an impact in college. And I think that's a tough thing here. When quarterbacks start getting recruited in eighth or ninth grade, these guys are not always going to pan out after starting that way. And I think the study showed that a little bit. Those early number one quarterbacks don't always uh, jump off the page like you'd expect. Hummer Shadur Sanders had some very interesting comments this week talking about, oh, yeah, those 6A quarterbacks and 5A quarterbacks of Texas aren't having the success, which he couldn't have been more false from that. I mean, you went on to mention on your Twitter guys like Jalen Milrow and Quinn Ewers are doing pretty damn good. But I don't know. It just seems like the Sanders family in Colorado, they just – they do things and you're like, okay, that's cool. And then they do other things like Dion talking about how Travis Hunter and Shadur, when they're eligible for the draft, they're going to pick their team like Eli and Elway did. Like they, they just do stuff where you're like, man, these guys, they're trying to change the game, but it could rub a lot of people the wrong way. And I understand that at this point. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, that comment yesterday was ridiculous. Like, it, it's understandable if you're saying that private school football in Texas is better than people think it is. Like, totally fair. A lot of really good players come out of private school football in Texas. But to suggest that five, six, five 5A football, 6A football, 4A football in Texas isn't quality is just ridiculous. Um, you mentioned Quinn Ewers and Jalen Milrow. Like, you could also throw in um, Alex Orgy, who's the uh, backup quarterback in Michigan, was a 6A quarterback uh, in Texas. So three of the four teams in the playoff had qu quarterbacks who played from 6A football in Texas. So you don't stumble into those guys by accident. They prove it week in and week out that they're the best players in the sport. And I think this just, it's just part of like the Sanders brand. Like they've had this thing about them. And I'm not like saying it like this, but Deion Sanders, since he started becoming a head coach, has played the underdog, right? Like, He's the underdog, despite the fact that he's one of the best defensive backs of all time, one of the most famous athletes on the planet, and has inherent advantages over everybody, everybody else. And they've kept up that like underdog mentality since they've gotten to Colorado. And I think this is just part of it. Um, I will say part of it's to his credit. Like Shutter Sanders is obviously lying to himself. He's had every advantage throughout his life possible. Like his dad created a private school football team for him to play for. He played for his dad. His dad fired a very successful offensive coordinator last year to make sure they're more happy and more comfortable um, in that system. But like the best athletes always find a way to convince themselves they're being slighted. Like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant were famous for this in their careers. And I think that's what you're seeing Shadur Sanders do. Like I, everybody believes Shadur Sanders is a very, very good quarterback, um, but he's consistently having to trick himself, I suppose, that he's still being doubted. Michael Jordan's Hall of Fame speech was 30 minutes of <laughs> MFing people who doubted him. 
Um, all right. So Hummer, how is this going to, what's your gut about Colorado coming into this season? Because, you know, like you said, Dion changes out offensive coordinators. He's basically changed out his offensive line in the portal. Um, and we know offensive line is like about chemistry and working together and being in sync and not just throwing, not to play off that pun, a boy band together, you know, and, and hoping that it sounds good. What's your gut um, about what's going on at Colorado? Um, I think Deion Sanders is still learning how to be a power five head coach in a lot of ways. Um, and you see some of that reflected in the changes in his coaching staff. But I think what's undoubtable about Deion Sanders and undoubtable about his roster is it's in a better place than it was last year. And he has consistently essentially overachieved based on what we expected him to do. Um, maybe his internal expectations um, have changed people's mindset there. He talks about championships all the time, but that was never a thought for me with Colorado last year. I thought Colorado would have been a two or three win team. I believe they ended up winning five. So they did better than anybody expected. I thought Jackson State would take a little bit to get off the ground. Instead, Deion Sanders is winning championships within two years. And going into the Big 12 next year, I think Colorado is in position to win seven or eight games. I think that's very realistic. I think they're going to have an advantage over everybody in the league at quarterback and at the skill talent positions, particularly wide receiver. They're going to be four or five deep at receiver. I think they're going to have four, four of probably the best 12 receivers in the Big 12 next season. Like They are loaded at that position. And if that offensive line can protect, protect Shadur Sanders a little bit better, they're going to score. Um, I think where Colorado might run into some difficulties is their schedule. I don't know why anybody would ever schedule North Dakota State, but they did. So they open with North Dakota State. Then they go to Nebraska. They have to play Colorado State, a team that almost beat them last year. And then their Big 12 schedule ain't friendly. They get K-State, Arizona, Utah, Kansas, Oklahoma State, probably five of the six best teams in the league. Um, so I think they are going to be better this year. I think they're going to beat some teams, but I would be shocked. I, I shouldn't say shocked. I would be very surprised if they were competing for a Big 12 championship next season. You think Kansas is going to compete for the Big 12 title? I think they won. What did they win? Nine games this year with a combination of Jason Bean and a walk-on at quarterback for the most part. Um, and with Jalen Daniels back, and this is a big caveat, if Jalen Daniels is healthy, I do expect them to be in that mix. Um, I'll be curious how that offense looks with their coordinator change. Obviously, Jeff Grimes is taking over after they lost their offensive coordinator at Penn State. But I think Jalen Daniels is so good and provides such a dramatic increase over what they had last year at that position. I think Kansas, as long as he stays healthy, is positioned to score with anybody and I think could stumble their way back into a 9 or 10 win season if things break right. I, I do think Kansas can contend. Hummer, this uh, Travis Etienne story is interesting. Obviously, the Florida transfer now at Georgia gets into a DUI incident. And this is the last thing Kirby Smart needs, you know, with all the Jalen Carter stuff that happened, just all the other stuff going on behind the scenes, especially with cars involved. How is Georgia handling this and how's Kirby Smart handling this? <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. It's definitely the last thing Kirby Smart needs. They've had so many traffic i shouldn't say traffic because a lot of these are like duis and speeding ticket issues through their time and trevor Etienne is just the latest um we'll see what they say in the court of law i think history suggests that trevor Etienne might be suspended for a game potentially but i don't think he's going to get kicked off the team um but this is just another example of what's happened at georgia and kirby smart's time there um I'm not saying it's a Kirby smart problem necessarily, but there is definitely, um, there's definitely something culturally there perhaps that leads to, um, this happening more frequently than you see at other programs. Um, but at the same time, like I, I wouldn't expect a, I wouldn't expect Trevor Etienne to face, um, like significant consequences, I suppose, at least, um, in terms of the amount of games he plays next year. Hummer, um, a lot of conversation, obviously, about uh, Caleb Williams. Um, 
What's your take on Caleb Williams? What kind of NFL player you think he's going to be? I think a really good one. Um, I would be surprised if he wasn't a top. So like a top 16 quarterback in the league. I think he has, even if he has a bad career, I think he is going to be a upper echelon starter in the NFL. Um, I can certainly see a scenario where things go sideways. We've talked about this before. He has a propensity for holding the ball over ball, ball for too long. Um, he has a bit of a hero ball tendency, and I think that could get you in trouble. But like when you talk about a natural skill set and a person who's been trained to do this, like his dad has been crafting to be a quarterback since sixth grade. Um, I just think he's got talent that's really hard to overlook. I think he is one of the probably three or four most talented quarterback prospects the last like 15 years, potentially when you talk about everything in his right arm and his athletic package and the way he sees the field. So I would be very surprised if he straight up failed. I wouldn't expect this to be a Justin Fields or a Mitch Trubisky situation where the bears are shipping him off for almost nothing. I think uh, Caleb Williams is going to be a long-term asset in the NFL. Well, what about like just his character or how he represents himself as a leader? Because again, going back to like the FU fingernails, but Utah and stuff like that, that was a weird moment. And then I know you've seen that viral video picture going around of him at the USC uh, women's basketball game yesterday. And he has a pink phone and he has pink nails and stuff. And everybody's like, okay, I, I'm not being that guy, but there's are people in the NFL that would think that, okay, let's, What's this guy really on? You know, like, is he just about the flash or is he really about ball? And I don't know. I feel like he's going to be questioned for that from here on out until he really proves himself in the NFL. Yeah, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, I think Caleb Williams is the. Honestly, this sounds weird, but I think he's really one of the first like Gen Z superstar prospects that we've seen. Um and Gen Z, obviously, I don't want to lump every, I don't, I hate being thrown in the millennial bucket. You know what I mean? Like not every millennial is the same and not every Gen Z is the same, but I think some of the characteristics he displays is some of the things that we associate with Gen Z um, and the way they handle themselves as well. And I think that's going to be different in the NFL. And it certainly is going to be a negative if he doesn't succeed. I don't think anybody's going to care if he paints his nails or um, he's crying in his mom's arms if the bears are good, right? Like nobody's going to say a thing. Like those things will be celebrated as characteristics that are different, that set him apart. I think it does begin to become a problem if he's not successful. But I, I will say like, I've never really heard teammates disrespect Caleb Williams or talk about him in a negative light. Um, there's a reason why so many of his Oklahoma teammates went to go play with him at USC when he transferred. They weren't all following Lincoln. Obviously, that played a role in it. But Caleb Williams also commands a pretty significant amount of respect, and he has for a long time, um, dating back to high school uh, when he was a superstar prospect at Gonzaga. So I think he'll be fine in that aspect. Um, it might be a little bit different with 35-year-old grown men as opposed to 19- and 20-year-olds who look up to Caleb Williams. But um, I've never really heard anything behind the scenes about Caleb, the person that would lead me to believe that his personality would hurt him in the NFL. He's just confident. Like he's confident in a different way than I think we associate confidence with, but he's just confident. Good boy. Is Shadur Sanders Gen Z? <laughs> yeah. But I think Shadur's probably, <laughs> I mean, Shadur's probably in his own bucket, right? Like you grew up on a different planet when your dad's Deion Sanders, I would imagine. And um, I think you're raised in a different way than everybody else and probably think about yourself in a slightly different way than everybody else. I'm not saying that's a negative quality. Like he's clearly been very successful, but um, I think those are slightly different test cases. All right, Hummer, we get. I know you got to go, but um, can you give us some parting thoughts on on Texas? Down, boy. My dog said no more questions. I'm sorry. What was that? Well, maybe he's answering the question. Um, the question, a couple thoughts from you about Texas basketball and how you know you would characterize year two under Rodney Terry and moving forward? Uh, I thought year two was par for the course, I suppose. Um, not necessarily a disappointing season. Um, there were so many years when Chocolate Smart didn't reach the second round of the NCAA tournament. So many years Rick Barnes failed to do the same 
cannot call this season an abject failure in any way, in my opinion. But I think given the guards Texas had this year, Ringo Max Asmus, the way he played, you would have liked to see more consistency from this team. Um, so it, I don't know. I think we'll learn a lot more about Rodney Terry going into year three when the roster becomes more of Rodney Terry's roster, if that makes sense. And some of the um, players he inherited from Chris Beard depart. Um, so I'll be very curious about that. But um, I think you saw some things to build on and obviously bringing in somebody like Trey Johnson um, and Cam Scott, two guys who can contribute next year, um, give some hope for the future in that regard. All right. Yo, everybody's giving Trey Johnson love. Don't sleep on Cam Scott. He's two-time South Carolina Gatorade player of the year. The dude could put the ball in the hoop. You know, oh. it might not be as easy as Trey Johnson does it, but I think he could come in and contribute next year. I really do. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Trey Johnson, I, I agree with that assessment. I just think Trey Johnson, given his size and his ability – to score at all three levels and to create his own shot with some size. Um, I'm not saying like Mac A. Smith being your lead ball handler is an issue this year or your lead scorer was an issue this year, but there are definitely times um, in the paint where he, like you just want a bit, a bit of a more, uh, you want a bigger finisher if possible. I guess I would put it that way. Yeah. Trey Johnson could be that for Texas next year, which will be, which will be a boost, but um, obviously some pieces you're gonna have to replace in the portal as well. So I'll be I'll be curious what Rodney Terry does. I'm I'm not off the Rodney Terry train at this point. If I'm a Texas fan, but um, it's definitely incomplete in my opinion. I'm be very curious how next year goes and the SEC, which is a league I think we saw this week is a little more gettable than people might expect. Yeah. yeah. Trey Johnson, six foot six shooting guard. Cam Scott, six foot five shooting guard. Need That's size nice. on the wing. Need size on the wing. Very important. Now we just need a point guard. Oh. Come Tyrus on. Oh. Man. Um, yeah. Come anyway. on, man. That's unnecessary. All right. Hummer, you're the man. We look forward to it every Tuesday. Absolutely, guys. Me too. I'll talk to y'all next week. All Appreciate right. you, Hummer. Cheers. All right. Yeah. Think about that. Six foot six, Trey Johnson shooting guard. Six foot five, Cam Scott shooting guard. That's that's what the big boys play with. Yeah. And I think you could, as good of a scorer as uh, Trey Johnson is, I think you could put him at points sometimes. You know, because, again, if you watch the NCAA tournament, which a lot of y'all listening to us have – you don't need that old school six foot one, six foot point guard like Jamal Shedd, anomalies at this point. You know what I'm saying? Like those Marcus Domas for Illinois, he's six six. He's running point for those guys. Tristan Newton for UConn, he's six six. He's running point for those guys. If Hell, Kate Cunningham was six eight running point for Oklahoma State. That's what I'm saying, man. It could be done. It could be done. And that ability to score too. All point guard is is making good decisions. That's all it is. Like it's nothing like scientific to it. Everybody talks point guard because it's, you know, floor general and they want to compare it to quarterback. Like, no, you just got to make good decisions and pass the ball where it needs to go. If you have a team, a player that's not the best player that can't bring the ball up the court all the time, like Nikola Jokic is the point guard for the Denver Nuggets. He averages the most assists for those guys. Like they don't, Jamal Murray's not traditional. He just brings the ball up the court, but he's a scorer. He's six five. If I tell you, if I tell you Tyrese Hunter is going to be the point guard for Trey Johnson and Cam Scott, and my man Kendall Weaver, how do you feel? Uh, I need my boy Rodney Terry to call Kevin Bacon and go to Africa like the air up there and get one of them African brothers. You want – you're talking about I down need, low. Yeah, I, I need – if Tyrese Hunter's going to be my point, I need some serious size to where when Tyrese Hunter drives, because Tyrese Hunter is a good alley-oop thrower. You need a big that could catch that lob. Dylan D'Souza's not athletic enough to catch that. Kaden Shedrick isn't athletic enough to catch it. Dylan Mitchell is, but he's not big and strong enough on the defensive end. You need an actual footer that's big, like old Dante with Oregon or a Klingon. 
You know, Matt Painter, I just heard Matt Painter, uh, a recent interview with him, and he talked about all the picks, the 21th ranked kid through the uh, the 21st, excuse me, 21st ranked kid through the 500th or 300th ranked kid. Said it's really no difference if you develop the guy and if he has a good heart and wants to work. There's really no difference. Zach Eady, I want to say, was like a two-star recruit, maybe three. Maybe three. Just big, clumsy, but 7'4 and had good touch. Matt Painter said, you know what? We're going to work with this kid, and we're going to make him something. Look what happened. Two-time national player of the year. So they're out there. They're out there. It's just Rodney Terry. Are you going to have the discipline enough to develop these guys and not just expect a Mo Bamba type to come along and go one and done? Because Mo Bamba, he was all right. He wasn't that good here at Texas. He's really not that good in the league. He's all right, but he's 7'3". You know what I'm saying? And he's athletic. So the NBA is like, well, I guess we got a spot for you, but he don't have much longer. You know what I'm saying? He, he really doesn't have much longer. Again, I love Mo. Great song. You know what I'm saying? I love when they play it at the moon and when they play it at DKR. Very cool thing. That's a Texas thing for life. But those dudes, you don't need those dudes anymore. John Calipari has showed you that's not it no more. You need somebody that is actually developed, experienced, that has the athleticism, or you need to get those guys that you could bank on and develop that's going to be there for a while, like you said yesterday, and won't be gone within a year. You know, like, like you need those type of dudes. So Tyrese Hunter needs a very specific cast around him for him to be successful if he's going to bring that same game that he brought this past year, which I'm not banking on it. Now, Tyrese Hunter, I haven't heard anything about the transfer portal. I'm expecting him to come back. So get in the lab. You got to get in the lab a lot. That jump shot, it has to be more consistent. You got to develop a float game. You got to give one of those Tyler Kolick, you know, wide ass layup, you know, finishes. You got to get, you got to get a bag like that. You got to expand, you know, because the game that you had now and just watching more film, the decision making, you know, being locked in, understanding that I can't go and walk and try to throw the ball in by running the baseline. After it was a turnover, a dead ball, just like little little stuff like that, which I don't know how you can work on either. Get it or you don't. But still, like, like I, I need that with Tyrese Hunter. But yes, I could be good with Tyrese Hunter being your point guard if he has the right supporting cast around him. And that's up to RT to go get that. All right, let me ask you this. Um, did you by chance? Having to see the uh, Gonzaga Utah women's game? No, I didn't. I thought Utah already advanced. That was on me. Gonzaga pulled it off, which poor Utah. I heard all the stuff going on with them off the court. Like, that's really sad. And yeah, I can see why they probably weren't locked in for that game if it happened like before, which I'm assuming it did. Well, tell, tell the folks what you're referring to. Yeah, so the game was played in uh, some city in Idaho that doesn't have the best reputation uh, when it comes to diversity. And yeah, I guess the Utah girls, they were out at a restaurant, gathered around cheerleaders and just different people, part of the staff with the team. And a couple of trucks went past them and just screamed out the N-word while revving their engine. And then it happened again, like two hours later. And yeah, that's all I saw. I don't know if anything else happened, but yeah, just foul, really disgusting. And I've seen people, you know, online talk about the NCAA should have known not to put them there and stuff, but you expect people to be better. You don't really expect those things to necessarily happen. And again, Utah, that, that, that's the team. You know, you do that too. They got, you know, old girl, which is from, you know, I don't know where she's from, but she looks Filipino or Polynesian girl. That's really good that I thought the horns would have to face. But yeah, man, it, it's bad. It's a really bad story. And the coach talked about it, I guess, after the game. I don't know if it was after or before, but if that was on their minds, like, how can you pay attention to a round of 32 game trying to advance, you know, like, I don't know. I'm not saying that that's what happened. Gonzaga, congrats to them. They probably earned that win for sure. But, yeah, very disgusting story that that's one of the last things that you want to hear, you know, when 
just any for anybody, you know, alone the women's basketball team that's just trying to have fun and advance in the tournament. Yeah. That's uh that is uh awful. Um Gonzaga, the team that beat Utah and will now play Texas, the Texas women um in Portland. They're Don't like that. They got the home court advantage. Don't like that. That's close. That's a drive. That's a drive for them. I don't know how far it is, but it can't be more than four hours. Like, that's them fan base. Vic Schaefer, have them girls ready. You can't be looking ahead to Stanford. You, you can't be doing that. No. At all. Because that's very easy to do. Like, Cameron Brink and them. Like, Cameron Brink told that ref, yo, F you. When she fouled out, you see that? You see no. that? Cameron Brink a thug. Cameron Brink, yo, that ain't no swimsuit Victoria's Secret model. That's a thug right there. She told she fouled out of that game because our girl Audie Crooks fouled her out. And Cameron Brink went by the ref and said, hey, fuck you. Ref didn't do a damn thing. Ref was just so at all from the beauty, I guess. <laughs> the ref was like, how could I like that was like an incredible F you. Like, what can I say? Look how look how she said it. She's so cute, something like that. Like, I can't throw the tech on her. No, nah, th- give her that tech. Give her that tech, ref. Come on, have some backbone. I don't know if it was a male ref or a female ref, whatever. I'm teeing up Cameron Brink. Cause you heard that. She said it with, you know, intensity. Like, F- you after she fouled out. Oh, and I would have looked at Vanderveer while I did it. Tech. Mm, on Blondie, on Goldilocks, tech. Disrespect. I don't care where we are. I don't care if we're in Palo Alto. Tech. Because, yo, the women's game is so scripted. Caitlin Clark and them played West Virginia yesterday. It was like the free throw differential. I want to say it was like 25 to 8, Chip. May, not even that. It might have been worse. It was awful. It was awful. It was awful. I hate and, that. And West game. Virginia could have won that game. That's so sad, man. Like, we need to see Caitlin Clark. Which Caitlin Clark is dirty. Caitlin Clark has a lot of Brock Cunningham in her. She does. She does some things where I'm like, yo, Caitlin, you ain't no saint. She be arguing with her daddy in the stands. I'll be like, yo, Caitlin, this is, you're supposed to be the face. Her dad be trying to put her in the place. Be like, shut up. Play, take her out. <laughs> that was weird. Yo, she a thug too. Kaylin a thug too. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't know if uh I don't know if her teammates dig her or not. I can't tell because she doesn't he she doesn't make eye contact with her coach. She doesn't make eye contact with her teammates. It's weird. It's gone to her head, man. And she didn't do anything in that game. I mean, in the fourth quarter. And they were fouling those West Virginia girls out of the game. The the, the officiating so in the women's game is terrible. So bad. They're going to fall. You don't have to call it. Right. They're, they're going to fall. I'm not like trying to sex by any means. It's a fact. They are going to fall down. Just because they fall awkwardly. And they be failing and stuff. Don't mean you gotta blow the whistle. Let the girls play. They are tough. Let them play. Yeah, let them play. Because Iowa went to the free throw line thirty times yesterday. Okay. West Virginia went to the line five. <laughs> are you kidding me? Oh my! West Virginia God, went to the free throw man. line five times. Iowa went thirty. If, if I'm West Virginia's coach, I'm losing my shit in the presser. I am I am going after – I'm saying this is a disgrace. I get it. Y'all want her to be in the finals because it would be good for ratings. But don't screw my girls over by doing that. Like that, that, that is a, that's clear as day. That's clear as day. And I hate that because it's a beautiful game. I hate that. It's very Tim Donahue, that ref that was in the NBA during the mid-2000s. It's very him. You know, which again, you're seeing a lot of stuff going on that's sketchy. Shohei Otani, you know what I'm saying? A lot of stuff going on that's sketchy. A lot of money on these games and stuff. 
We get it. It's all about the dollar dollar bill, y'all. But come on, not like that. I get it. It was at Iowa too. 30 to 5. That's just that that's ridiculous, man. Yeah. <laughs> so ridiculous. That was awful. Yeah, yeah. Kayla the plug. Kayla the plug. I, 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 I respect it a little bit. I respect it a little bit because we, we need that in the women's game. I'm all like, yo, let them show emotion. Let them talk trash. You know, don't call fouls all the time. Like, just because they're women don't mean that they're not competitive. I get that. But she be taking it too far. She be pushing girls out the way and stuff. Again, very Brock cut at him. Yeah. <laughs> Brock plus Clark equals thugs. Yo, Brock ain't no thug. He's just 30. He's just 30. Kaylin, she she got a little thug in her. I, yeah. I see the thug. Brock from Westlake. We got to remember that now. Ain't no thug in Brock. Sorry. Ain't none. Zero. <laughs> Zero. That is a West Laker. Yes. Exit Rollingwood. That is Brock Cunningham. Absolutely not. But yeah, he dirty. And you know, I'll miss him. I will miss him. I don't think we gave Brock his appropriate shout out yesterday because knowing that this is his last game ever. Like he was hurt. Those tears after the game, man, they were real. You felt for Brock Cunningham. Because again, you, okay, say that he's dirty. Fine. But he's fighting for that burn orange. That's yeah, what he's he doing it for. He's yep. fighting for the university, all the ones that came before him, his family. Like, University of Texas means the world to Brock. That's why he stayed so long. He could have left. He could have transferred. You know, he got enough degrees. But he said, nah, this, this is a special moment, and I want to cherish it as long as I can. Thank goodness for COVID. I know a lot of people probably don't say that, but Brock Cunningham is probably like, thank goodness for this COVID year. And I get to play here, and I get to advance and go to the Elite Eight and do some big things and be the all-time winningest player in the program history. Yeah, Jorts Enforcer. Like, I will miss that dude. Is he flat out dirty? Absolutely. When I see him, I'm going to shake his hand. And tell him, yo, man, you make me proud. Okay, sometimes you need that dirty guy. Rodman hey. was dirty. Rodman Brock was Lame Beer. So dirty. Brock Rodman Lame Beer. Dirty. Lame Beer. All the dirty. Draymond. Eddie Ainge. Draymond. Draymond. Dirty. All those dudes rings. Steph Curry appreciates Draymond. Michael Jordan appreciates uh, 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 Rodman. Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars appreciate Bill Lambeer. That's just, hey, sometimes, sometimes that's the game. Sometimes that's the game. So, yeah, Brock Cunningham, outside of Austin, probably hated by all. I don't think he should probably ever leave here because he's good. He probably doesn't have to pay for much here. He probably will because he's a great guy. But, yo, Brock Cunningham, he'd go along the drag anytime he wants. Dirty Martins, places like that, and be like, yo, Brock, your money, no good here. Very Godfather style. Money, no good here. <laughs> no, 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 no good here. You know. So, yeah, Brock Cunningham, salute to you, man. Hell of a career. I gotta say, man, there's something off about Caitlin Clark. I don't. I'm not trying to be a hater. <laughs> Yo! There is something off. There is something I do not like about her. I don't like. I don't. Oh. I don't that was weird. What was going on between her and her dad? That was weird, man. She's too grown for that. That's what that's that AAU grade school stuff where you look up at your parents and stuff. Because again, why is she looking at him in the first place? She shouldn't be looking at him. That's disrespectful to the coach. You know, that, that's that's disrespectful to her. I used to do that with my pops, but my coaches would allow it because they knew that my pops knew more than them when I played for my AAU team. But that's AAU. I damn sure wouldn't do that to my college coach. Be looking at my pot like that that's very disrespectful. And yeah, you're right. Something's off. Something's off. I think she's let the fame get to her head. Cause she's in State Farm commercials. Like she's getting that bad. Gatorade. Man. Gatorade. I mean, she, she's getting that bag. Which you go back and you think about Angel Reese, and you're like, man, is Angel Reese really that bad? Like Angel Reese was salty that Caitlin Clark was getting all this attention. Cause she's like, why? Why? What has she won yet? She ain't right. beat up yet. So, yeah, I'm going to talk shit to her. I'm going to point at my ring. I'm going to do the things that she be doing because she a little dirty, too. 
because she be doing it too. So why can't I do it? You know, and everybody yeah. was butt hurt because, oh, Caitlin Clark, look, she did it to Caitlin Clark. She don't hurt nobody. Caitlin Clark's a killer. Caitlin Clark's a killer. Yeah, you know I'm, what I'm I love, I love what Angel Reese was doing. Oh man, that was it right there. I hope she brings it back. They gonna lose. They're not very good. I yeah, I was gonna lose that number forty five for Iowa. Their big girl in the middle. She was scared to death to take shots. Yeah, like that pressure. They're not. They're not. <clears throat> they're not built to win. Yeah, that pressure. And they if you have a guard, skin girl on the team. Little Disney character looking girl, she tough as hell, but yeah, she the moment might be too big. Well, it might be too big. That's a lot that of lights, Virginia, man. That West Virginia guard who was face guarding her was doing a great job until the refs fouled her out of the game and let Iowa win that game by 10 by going to the free throw line 30 times, and West Virginia went to the line five. Mm. Anyway, mm. So I'm, I'm just fishy saying. about that. Real fishy. Yeah. Anyway, back to Texas, the Texas women, this Gonzaga team. This will be a good test for Texas because Gonzaga, they got some, uh, they got some inside outside going on. They got those twins, the Truong twins. Uh oh. And they shoot threes. They were combined seven of 12 from three. You got uh, Kaylee and Kaylin. Kaylee and Kaylin Truong. And they they can hoop. They yeah. shoot threes. I don't know. Texas is going to have to be on their game, man, because they're not very deep, Gonzaga. But, yeah. you know. That'll be a good yeah, test. I, man, I, gosh. I saw March Madness put out their little promo. Women's March Madness put out their little promo picture with all the Sweet 16 teams that are in. And they use a player from each team to represent it. You see Paige Beckers for UConn. You see Caitlin Clark for Iowa. You see Angel Reese for LSU. For Cameron Texas, Brink. Cameron Brink for Stanford. For Texas, they have Shea Holly. And look, I love Shea Holly. I think she's one of the toughest players that I've ever seen. Like, she's an absolute warrior, defensive minded. Her stamina is ridiculous. But they know they're wrong for not putting Bass and Booker on that list. This girl yeah. is uh, this was the second team All American in the nation. She's the best player, player, player of the year. Big 12 player of the year, you know, like I, I don't want to go too much into it because there's a lot of reasons why they didn't do it. And they're all fucked up. And it really pisses me off that they would do something like that. Again, this has nothing to do with Shea Holly. Like Shea Holly's probably wondering why the hell am I on it? Same way too. But Madison Booker, if I'm Vic Schaefer, I'm like, yo, you're still being disrespected. I'm flipping it. You don't need Chip. We're flipping it both. Like, they still disrespect you, whether it's because you're a sister or whether it's because you're just not the Caitlin Clark image or the Paige Becker image or the Angel Reese image. But either way, you're being disrespected. And we're going to show the world who Madison Booker is because you're one of the best players in the country. And just because you're a freshman, like Juju Watkins, she on that picture Wait for UC, uh, USC. You know what I'm saying? But they put Shea Holly on to represent Texas, which, again, it's foul that they did that. But with, with Vic Schaefer, Madison Booker seems like one of them ones that would use that as motivation too. Like, oh, you're right, coach. They are disrespecting me. I should be in this picture with all of these other greats. And well, I'm just saying – Whatever it takes, Texas, you can't get off to that slow start like you did in these games against Drexel and Alabama. It'll be fine. You got to – I mean, they got to find – they got to find a way to get a little bit of something. 
from their, you know, from Shaylee, Shaylee G. When she's on, they can tear people apart. When she's not, it's a grind. I'll say this though, Aaliyah Moore played awesome against Alabama. Aaliyah Moore was in AMO mode. And when she's in AMO mode and she's ripping the ball out of people's hands and just taking it to people, and you get AMO and Deanna Gaston both playing like that, that's when Texas is at its best. Taylor Jones is going to do her thing. She's going to block three or four shots. She's going to complain that she's not, you know, that she's getting fouled. She should be going to the line for some and ones. But, <laughs> and that's good. Taylor Jones is a valuable piece. I mean, she's a 6'4 shot blocker. And you got athleticism in Deanna Gaston and Aaliyah Moore. Those guys are going to have to drive the train. And then Madison Booker obviously can get her own shot. But this is this is not going to be easy. They got to get through Gonzaga. Yeah, and we've been talking all year. Like this team goes as far as Shaley Gonzalez goes. I mean, we know what you're going to get out of Leah Moore down low. You know what you're going to get with Taylor Jones offensively and defensively. Madison Booker with her mid range game. Shay Holly with her defense. But Shaley Gonzalez, she makes her mark with her outside shooting, and she had a really good game against Drexel. Like she was lighting it up. Yeah. But then the next game, she goes back to those struggles. She's kind of like the Tyrese Hunter for the women's team. You know what I'm saying? It's like, man, you you have that potential. We've seen you do it so many times, but you can also go in some deep slumps. And Vic Schaefer doesn't take her out very often. So, you know, we talked about putting in our girl with a weird name. Like, why is she playing? Kakalenga Wenentanda. Wenentanda, yeah. Put her in, man. Like, with her athleticism, her length, like she can change the game, especially when she's knocking down that outside shot. But coach loves some, some Shaylee Gonzalez, and hey, Shaylee plays hard. She'll get steals. She plays tough defense. She'll take charges. It's just you need her to knock that shot down, especially when a lot of attention is given to Aaliyah Moore and Madison Booker. I think Shaylee could knock some shots down in Portland, and yeah, they should be able to get past Gonzaga. But you can't look too far ahead just because Stanford's on that other side. You cannot look too far ahead because Gonzaga, man, that's all they got there is basketball. They ain't got no football team. It's all hoops. Men, yeah. women, whatever else, hell other sports they got, it's really just all hoops. So they take it very seriously. Since it's in Portland, it's basically going to be a home game for them. So you got to negate the fan base and, yeah, come ready to play. Well, let's, uh, let's bring in our man. Hank South, he does a little bit of air thing. Recruiting guru, horns247.com for our <laughs> weekly chat about uh, all things recruiting and just, uh, you know, in general. How's your bracket looking, Hank? Uh, I, I stopped checking it. It's not good. <laughs> yeah, it's it was. You're the uh, opposite of Hummer. Hummer was like, oh, I'm like top 15, man, the 400 uh, yeah, yeah. team pool. And you're out here uh, like, I stopped checking it. That's well, what I probably, like to hear. You're a real you probably, person, Hank. You probably didn't go chalk like Hummer did. No, uh, yeah. I just, uh, I don't even. I guess for fun, let's just see where I'm at. I did a CBS sports bracket. Let's see. Yeah. Chip had St. Mary's going to what? The final four? Woo! <laughs> I had Baylor going to the Final Four, so that's not much better. But let me see. Let me see. I am currently a third. Uh, well, not, let's see. Okay, I rank two million four hundred eighty-two thousand four hundred ninety-one country. So it's that's not it's not good. <laughs> it's not bad. Not bad. Not bad. It's not bad. It's just not good. <laughs> not good. Yeah, but I've been there. I'm, hey, I'm there. You just enjoy basketball games, not stress about it, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, Hank. So we've got uh, we had KG K K J Lacey. Seems like every week we ask you about KJ Lacey. Yeah. Um, give us the latest. Yeah. 
Um, he was at uh, Westlake High School on Sunday for the Elite 11 Regional, um, which was pretty cool, um, you know, to have that that event in Austin. Usually, you know, living in Austin, you got to drive to Dallas or Houston typically to, to go to these kind of camps. But um, they had the Elite 11, and it was an all-22 camp. So it wasn't just uh, quarterbacks. It was um, notable linemen, um, defensive backs, and, you know, there wasn't a ton. Some of the guys didn't show up, but um, it was still, you know, we, we saw some other guys beyond just KJ Lacey and in the quarterbacks, but you know, KJ came out. I was, I was talking to his mom um, off to the side and, and she was saying it, it was kind of a last minute trip for him. Cause uh, he wasn't on the roster earlier in the week. And he was, he was, he, she said he was telling her, he was like, mom, I got to go to this one. It's in Austin. You know, I'm not, you know, I, there, there's one, I think in Oxford, there's one in Nashville that might've been a little bit easier for him to get to, but he wanted to come to Austin. Obviously, that's his future home. So, you know, he wanted to come uh, be in attendance for it. And, um, you know, he had a pretty good workout. Um, it was really, really windy. It was like 30 mile per hour gusts. So, you know, it wasn't like, I mean, the, everyone had had uh, had some uh, misfires. But, uh, I mean, he earned an Elite 11 finals invite for for the camp in, um, uh, in Los Angeles this summer. And, uh, and, and, you know, it looked pretty strong on the day. You know, there's a lot of really talented quarterbacks there. Um, and then, um, you know, obviously Keelan Russell, the SMU commit, the Texas is recruiting now. Um, Baylor's commit was there. There was an Oklahoma commit, uh, Purdue commit, and some, some other guys, just a bunch of local guys, and then, you know, a few from uh, from out of state. But the um, overall, you know, strong performers, KJ. Um, he visited Texas yesterday, um, and, you know, we caught up with him. And, you know, every time you talk to him, he's, uh, you know, he's all Texas. And, um, you know, there was some concern, I guess, um, earlier in the year from, from uh, onlookers that, you know, he was going to flip to Auburn. Um, you know, obviously, uh, he, he's closer to Auburn. Uh, they've been pressing to flip him. He's taken some visits, but, you know, talking to him, the vibe I got was he's completely focused on Texas. He, you know, he still talks to Auburn. He still talks to Ole Miss. He mentioned Oregon, but, um, the only visit he has official visit he has said is Texas, uh, for June 21st. And then, um, he's going to be back in Austin on April 6th. There's a big, um, big visitors weekend that, that day. And then, um, uh, April 20th for the spring game. So, um, you know, three more visits up coming to Texas. You know, he said he, he's still very happy with the decision. Um, he was wearing a Longhorn necklace. That looked pretty cool. Um, so I think all's good on the KJ Lacey front, if you ask me. Okay. KJ Lacey, Lacey of course, the uh, 2025 quarterback commit for the Longhorns. Yep. Just so that people are clear. <laughs> Yeah, the longest, uh, the longest tenured 2025 commit for Texas. You know, for a minute he was, I mean, really until uh, Emory Winston, he was the only commitment in the class. Either Emory or Brandon Brown, whichever one of those two committed before the other. But uh, yeah, June 3rd of last summer um, until December, you know, he was the lone 2025 commit. So um, you know, he, he's been around for a while, and um, you know, he's happy with Texas. Yeah, Hank, talk about defensive tackle Brandon Brown. He was in the ATX for the first time, four-star commit for Sark and them. Talk a little bit about his game and him as a person. Yeah, you know, he, he's he's a little bit undersized. You know, he's not your, your, your uh, you know, Devondre Sweat type, uh, you know, size we're talking. But um, if you watch his tape, I mean, man, he is just blowing guys up. Um, you know, he – that that was the first thing when he committed. You know, we knew about him. Um but I, I don't think anyone was really familiar with it, with his game. And, you know, you watch his huddle tape and, and it's, it's just like, I forgot how long it is, but, you know, 10 minutes of just, you know, getting after guys in the backfield. And, um, you know, that's what jumps out immediately. He's a really aggressive player, um, has a lot of burst, um, you know, quickness, um, every, everything you want, really. And the only thing, the only knock on him is, is you know, uh, his, his size. But I think we've all seen, you know, Byron Murphy is – has kind of put dispelled any uh, issues with that, with, with what he was able to do. And, you know, I think Brandon Brown could kind of follow in that trajectory. Um, but yeah, he was on campus for the first time. He committed to Texas without ever seeing Texas. And, and again, another guy that, you know, after he committed, uh, you know, it was Bo Davis that was uh, the guy going after him. He, he committed Bo Davis leaves. So, you know, I think it was a very fair question as to whether, you know, was, was Brendan Brown going to hang around? Was he going to flip? Was he going to go to LSU with Bo Davis or, you know, USC is pressing to flip him as well. And in some other schools, he has family ties to Florida where he's from. So I don't think anyone would have been shocked to see him flip, uh, but he kind of just hung, t he, you know, hung tight. You know, he, he, he waited for the, the defensive line coach to get hired. Um, he's, he's gotten to know Kenny Baker and, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, the, the positive of the visit, you know, he, he, um, so he was on campus with his, um, 
five on five team, the California power team. Um, they were doing a tournament in Houston. Um, they come up to Texas on Friday and their, their itinerary had them leaving at five. Like they were going to get on the road, get to Houston by, you know, eight 30 or so um, to get ready for the tournament on, uh, on, on Friday. He stayed until seven 30 with his mom um, just to, you know, get to know they, they went in and met with Kenny Baker, like just around five, I think. And, and you know, spent a couple hours with him. So, uh, you know, all the returns are, are very positive. You know, he had that tweet right after they were done that, you know, he's home. Um, so it seems like, you know, even with Bo Davis leaving, uh, Brandon Brown is still really happy with his decision um, to be committed to Texas. And that's not going to change the fact that, that he's going to take official visits elsewhere. Um, you know, he already has a handful of them set in the summer, including Texas. Um, but it sounds like, you know, they, they've done what they needed to do so far. And, and, you know, their first impression in Austin was a, was a really good one. All right. So as we kind of we're kind of going through the uh, names chronologically in the stampede. Um, Keelan Russell. So he's also a 2025 quarterback uh, prospect who is committed to SMU from Duncanville. Um, what did you see from the four star SMU commit who had a strong showing at the Elite 11 and is still in touch with Texas? Yeah, the vibe I get from Keelan Russell is, you know, you can call him an SMU commit if you want, but he is wide open. Um, you know, I, I think obviously he likes SMU a lot. They're the hometown school, but um, I, I, he, I think he's going to end up playing somewhere else. Um, and, 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 you know, it was kind of, you know, I, I was going into the elite 11. I was like, is this going to be a little awkward with, you know, KJ right there and, and Keelan right here. And, you know, Texas maybe wants both. Well, we know Texas wants KJ. They haven't offered Keelan yet, but it sounds like they're going to here in the next, you know, three or four weeks. Um, but Ke Keelan is a, is a really talented kid. He, he's bigger than KJ. Um, you know, he can zip the ball. They're both, it's kind of interesting. Both of them have had this, like, have had like a general generational receiver to throw to like KJ had Ryan Williams at Sarah land. Uh, Keelan has, uh, Keelan has DeCorey and Moore at Duncanville. Um, so that, that's probably helped them a little bit, but you know, they get into these camp settings, um, you know, especially Keelan and, you know, he was just zipping the ball, even in the high winds, you know, he was, he was throwing it really well, um, hitting his guys in stride. And uh, he got an Elite 11 finals invite as well. But um, talking to him, you know, we, we, we caught up with him in a, at the Under Armour in Dallas a few weeks ago. And, you know, he, he's been talking to Texas, been talking to Milwee Sark. Um, he's coming out for the spring game on April 20th. Um, and, you know, he, he says Texas is his dream school. Um, it, you know, the, the way he kind of started the interview on, on, uh, on Sunday was, you know, if Texas offers, like, I'm going to go to Texas, that was kind of the vibe you get. But then you ask him about, you know, KJ's there, you know, how, how would that, you know, play into things? And he was, he, you know, he's, he's like, I'm not afraid of competition. I'm, I'm, I would, I would certainly be willing to go in and compete, but at the same time, and he mentioned this, that, you know, other schools are recruiting him to come in and be the guy. So, you know, does he want to be part of a two quarterback class? You know, he he's willing to, but at the same time, you know, he's going to listen to all these schools that are, you know, you're our guy, you're QB one in this class. Um, so maybe that could hurt Texas, I, you know, if, uh, you know, it comes down to it. But again, you know, he said his quote was, you know, if Texas offers it, it it'll probably change a lot. So um, we'll see. I think he'll get an offer on that visit for the spring game. Um, so we'll see if anything happens after that. But he's got an upcoming official visit to Ole Miss. Um, he said Alabama reached out this past week. Oregon's talking to him. Um, you know, name a school. They're probably talking to him. He, he's been a really hot recruit this this spring. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that happens. But I think the biggest takeaway is I think, you know, it, it looks like Texas is pretty set on taking two quarterbacks in, uh, in 2025. And it makes sense with the numbers, you know, you assume Quinn Ewers is leaving after next season. And, you know, right now you would only have two quarterbacks, scholarship quarterbacks on the roster and in, in Arch Manning and Trey Owen. So, you know, you probably need two guys in the class just to, just to have your numbers. Right. So it'll be, you know, if, if Keelan's the guy, he's the guy, but you know, if, if, uh, if he sticks with SMU or, or goes elsewhere, you know, it'll be interesting to see who they kind of circle around, circle back on or, or, or decide to go after later in the year. And Keelan is pure pocket. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that's how I would, you know, characterize him. Um, you know, he's a big kid and he, he's got a, he's a really lengthy frame. He's a lot bigger. He's probably, you know, three or four inches taller than taller than KJ. Um, but yeah, man, he he can he can sling it. So uh, you you can see kind of you know what what Texas sees in him, kind of compared to the 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 guys they've been recruiting under Sark. 
Hank, talk about Galveston Balls, Jonah Williams, safety slash linebacker, big time five star that you wrote a piece on. And it looks like he's really paying attention to what Oklahoma's doing with Brent Venables, but he still considers Texas in the running. How yeah. thick is that and how good of a player and person is he? Yeah, he's a stud. Um, he he was the, the, uh, the best player at Under Armour Houston two weeks back. Um, you know, he's a guy that can play linebacker, play safety. It's kind of a, kind of a sensitive, su- touchy subject with him. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, I think he wants to play defensive back. Uh, he's, he doesn't consider himself a linebacker, but he has the skill set. You know, he, he can, he can be all over the field. Um, and, and, uh, you know, Oklahoma is the school that's, that's, you know, had the most buzz. I think he has a couple of crystal ball predictions to Oklahoma. I asked him about that, you know, I was like, you know, people think you're going to Oklahoma, you know, what, what, what would you say about that? And he was like, well, you know, it's a good thing. Those are just predictions because, you know, I wouldn't say that's necessarily the case. Um, he's going to be, um, he's going to be um, visiting Texas with his parents on, uh, on April 6th. So he's coming back for that. You know, this time, I guess, you know, last summer around that pool party for Texas in the end of the July, kind of had a feeling that Texas w- was, you know, leading that recruitment. Um, Oklahoma's obviously given him a lot to think about. Um, and, and he's got other schools obviously coming after him as well. But the, the like funniest thing of this all, not really not funniest, most interesting thing is, you know, he might not even play college football. Like he's a, he's a draft, he's an MLB draft prospect. So, you know, if he goes, gets taken in the first round, you know, he might just say no thanks and, and, and go the baseball route. And you, you see that sometimes, you know, Jerry and Ely, the running back at, at Ole Miss, that was kind of a similar thing. He was a five-star football or five-star recruit in football, but was also getting MLB draft buzz. Um, and I think there was a receiver for North Carolina a few years ago. You, you see it every once in a while, but he's like, he's, he's a legit MLB prospect. And uh, you know, well, it'll be interesting because he's also, you know, looking at the idea of playing college baseball as well. And he, he's been talking to the Texas staff. Um, he actually has ties to the Texas staff. Uh, one of the coaches can't think of the name right now, but uh, played baseball with his older brother um, in the Phillies organization. So, um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of moving parts in that one. Um, but again, you know, Texas is still chugging away on that. I, I think it's a Texas Oklahoma battle, um, but I, I think he's a guy that's going to take all of his official uh, all of his official visits, and uh, you know, then make a decision after that. Um, Hank, uh, twenty twenty five five star offensive tackle uh, Josh Petty um, seemed to uh, like his time in Austin. What? How do you size up that recruitment? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, offensive line is not an area, you know, Texas is is struggling to find targets um, in, in the 2025 class. You know, you got your three, your big three in the state of Texas with uh, Fasusi, Michael Fasusi, uh, Lamont Rogers, and and Ty Haywood. You got to imagine Texas is getting one of those guys, if not more. You know, I, my, my money's on Michael Fasusi. Um, I think he's going to end up in Austin. I, it's kind of funny. I think Pasus is going to end up in Austin. I think Haywood's going to end up at Oklahoma. And I think Lamont Rogers is going to end up at AM. So it's like everyone's getting one of them. Um, but then after that, you know, there's several options. Josh Petty's another uh, is one of them. You know, a five star offensive tackle from the state of Georgia. Um, you know, you would you would think with Georgia's success, that's like, you know, kind of the shoe in. You know, I like, go, oh, you're next up in, in the line of of talented offensive linemen they've had. Um, but you know, he's talked to Steve Wilfong after his visit, um, to Austin on Friday and, uh, you know, said it was second to none. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see, get him back on an official visit and, you know, crazier things have happened, but certainly, um, I think Texas made a good first impression with him. Um, and, 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 you know, again, they have, they have several out of state guys along the offensive line that, you know, they could really be seriously in play for Petty's one of them. John Mills is another from uh, San Francisco, um, three-star offensive lineman that, you know, it's probably going to come down to Washington where his family all is went and from and in, uh, in Texas. And he has a top six, but the vibe is Washington, Texas uh, for him. He has an official visit in the summer. Uh, Peter Lange, another guy in that area out in California, interior guy that um, uh, is related to Jake Lange, who used to work for the University of Texas. Uh, so there's a connection there and then um, a few others. But, um, you know, we saw one one uh, domino fall in the offensive line recruiting, and that's Byron Washington, that the big offensive tackle from uh, DeSoto that went viral in the state playoffs because uh, uh, you guys probably saw the photo just towering yeah, over massive. the defensive end. Yeah, he was a guy I think had an opportunity to commit at one point to Texas. But, um, you know, I, I think as as we stand now, probably a little bit lower on 
on on in the pecking order in terms of targets. But he committed to Syracuse this past weekend, so that's one guy. Um, you know, you can probably cross off the list in terms of guys in the mix. But yeah, it's going to be an it is going to be a bigger class too than we saw with the the the, uh, the three guys in 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 twenty twenty four. So it'll be an interesting position group to follow. Yeah. Hank. Any more word on what spring practice is like right now? I know you're really high on Jordan Washington, the freshman tight end that's in. Anybody else that you're high on or just heard that standing yeah. out in your opinion? Yeah, you know, you hear, uh, you know, I, th I think Chip's on the same wavelength as me with, you know, Aaron Butler, just a kid that's been really impressive in terms of, you know, the guy that maybe a little bit overshadowed it with this receiving group coming in and, you know, maybe he's the guy that that's going to stand out in year one um, at Texas. We'll see. You know, obviously there's there's a lot of options. I think DeAndre Moore is is doing really well in practice. Um, you know, Trey Moore was getting a lot of hype from from Sark um, in in the post uh, practice press conferences. So, yeah, it sounds like everything's everything's going pretty smoothly. Um, you know, uh, um, I guess what four practices, five practices in so far. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a been a good run so far. Yeah. Hank, uh, thoughts on Texas basketball? What a wild game. I mean, man, uh, to, for as poorly as they played, to still have a chance at the very end, was, it was pretty astonishing. And, you, I mean, Tennessee played horribly, too. I mean, they uh, missed, what, 22 three-pointers? twenty, And the, the, they went 22 from tw – for 20 from 25 or 22 for 25 at three points. And like the last two of them were in the last two minutes when, when, uh, when they finally kind of started getting something going. Um, but yeah, that was a pretty intense game. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see. I think, you know, we'll probably see a, a pretty new look Texas team. If I'm, if I'm guessing, um, come, come 2024, you know, with, the, with the new guys coming in, in the class of 2024 and then, um, you know, whatever they're going to, pick up out of the portal um and then the guys leaving so you know we'll we'll, we'll see but um yeah that was a that was a pretty thrilling uh, game i you know my, my thoughts is you know build it all around trey johnson and kendall weaver and just you know see where see where it takes you and uh see, see that's the thing hank are we really putting all our eggs in the freshman's basket like that's a lot yeah. like i get kd was here and he put on the show as a freshman but kd in my opinion is one of the top 10 players to ever touch yeah. the basketball like Trey Johnson to say that, like we're gonna put everything around him and Kim yeah. Weaver. Like, uh, I'm not, he has to be, yeah, is he that you know. good though? That, that's what I'm saying. Like you've seen him more than I have. Is he that good though? I mean, he's he's got some pretty serious scoring ability, and you know, obviously Texas could use that. They're losing a lot of scoring, um, you know, or likely losing a lot of scoring um this offseason. So, you know, that brings that, but you know, I, I shouldn't, you know, forget about Caden Shedrick too. You know, he he said he's coming back as well. Um, but I mean, again, if you go out in the portal and add these guys, you know, you're, 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 I think your goal is to add, you know, a lot of experience. So you're not putting it all on Trey Johnson, but I, I think, you know, it's put him as, you know, the focal point with Weaver and, you know, his, his, uh, his hustle and, and what he's been able to do, see if he can develop his game a little bit more this off season. And, uh, you know, depending on the pieces they add, they could, they could be pretty solid next year, especially when you have a, a little bit easier of a road, uh, in conference play, not to knock the SEC basketball is considering Texas just lost to an SEC basketball team, but you know, you're not, it's not the big 12. So, I mean, you know, maybe they can, they can have a little bit more, find a little bit more success in, in 2024 in their inaugural SEC run. Yeah. Hank, great stuff. Um, any thoughts on the, uh, Cowboys possibly, uh, Having Dak Prescott play out his contract without an extension in 2024. Uh, is that like, is that official? Someone commented that? That's, Not that's kidding. the word coming down right now. Um, um as of about an hour hey, ago. It'd be pretty cool, you know, let that happen, maybe tank a little bit and uh, get Queen Ewers in 2025. Oh, man. <laughs> Why not? Hey. You know, Jerry Jones has been around the tech. Like he was at what well, he was at the Texas Tech game. You know, he he's keeping his eye yeah. on the Texas on the Texas program. So oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. His uh, grandson Paxton Anderson just finished up at uh, at Texas. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Hank, great stuff as always, my man. Yeah. Appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Hank. All right. Hank you. South over at Horns twenty four seven dot com. Giving it to you. Little recruiting update every Tuesday. All right, Zay, let's uh, head into the commentaries. A couple of words. Um, 
how about uh, Brain Vault Mouthguard? I mean, this is changing the game. Developed right here in Austin by Austin's dentist, Dr. Greg Eckert, Dr. U-E-C-K-E-R-T. Um, and listen, proven, patented uh, to reduce the effects of concussion. So if you've got a competitor in your household, whether it's flag football, lacrosse, cheerleading, basketball, um, they need to be protected with the brain vault mouth guard. You've there, it's in college football, it's in the NFL, and it's it's changing the game. You want your competitor to play hard, but you want them to play safe. Brainvault.com to set up a fitting. Um, of course, Apple leasing, Apple leasing, getting you into the car you really want to be driving. I know that sounds simple, but it's true. They lease every make and model of car, and they don't care what car you pick. You probably haven't had that. Uh, new car experience before you go to a dealership, they're going to tackle you before they let you go without getting into one of their cars. If you had a bad leasing experience in the past, probably because you leased from a dealership, lease from Apple leasing. You're not paying for the future trade in value of that car. You're getting into a better car than you thought you could afford. And it's brand new. You want to change, make and model a car two, three years in no problem. The easy lease, Apple leasing.com three, four, six, nine, nine, seven, seven. Tell them Chip Brown sent you. And of course, when you're ready for the big screen of your dreams and the surround sound and new lighting, electronic shades, surveillance, only one place to go. Audio visual consultations, avconsultations.com. Our man, Tom McKay has been doing it for three decades, putting big screens and surround sound into your favorite restaurants. He's put it into three different houses for me. Um, let him do it for you too. You don't need to do a thing except call 255-8678. Let Tom and his crew bring everything to you. And of course, as NCAA basketball continues, cover three on Anderson up in Round Rock, cover two at 183 in Lake Creek. It's your NCAA tournament headquarters. I mean, you're going to get great food. The Sean Adams prime rib sandwich, um, the Buffalo chicken sliders. The Parmesan fries, the salads, the Cobb salad is unbelievable. The Ruby trout, and of course, the brunch on the weekends. Cover three. All right, Zay. <clears throat> Let's get into this commentary here. And I'm going to say, as I look into my crystal ball here for Texas football, um, I'm looking around, I'm looking at you know, some of these positions where your eye may not take you. So I'm going to take you there. And I'm going to take you to the tight end position. And I find this interesting because you've got Gunnar Helm, who's been solid, solid leader. He's on the leadership committee. You got Amari Nyblack, who's running around, making plays, learning the offense. You got Juan Davis. Juan Davis. Now, Juan Davis, there, there's about five players that I call now or never players. You got to make your case now or never. And Juan Davis is one of them. And I'm, I'm interested to see what Juan Davis can do because he's done seemingly everything right. He is, you know, up to 230 pounds. He was kind of wiry when he got to Texas, but he's put on the weight. He's He was a downfield pass catcher, not much of a blocker. He's trying to be that. He's trying to be the full package. Um, and now he's competing with Amari Nyblack, who's a junior. Juan's a senior. And Juan got a little sugar from uh, Steve Sarkeesian the other day. So. I'm just saying, Juan is in that now or never category. David Benda's in that now or never category, although Benda's played a ton. Um, you know, Jare Bledsoe is in that now or never category. Um, <clears throat> Mo Blackwell's in that now or never category. Talented players who have to make their case, either because there's younger guys or newcomers or whatever. They got to make their case right now. And I cheer for those guys. I cheer for those guys because they put in the hard work. 
They've put in their time, but now they got to put it together when the lights are on and show, yeah, I can be that guy that you can count on to deliver play in, play out, and, and give it to you. Because at tight end, everyone's eyes are on Gunnar Helm, they're on Amari Nyblak, they're on Jordan Washington, then early enrollee freshman who looks good. And Juan Davis is saying, hey, don't forget about me. Don't you know, about me. I've been yeah. grinding. I've been grinding. Yeah, and those four guys that you named, I think Juan Davis has it tougher than the rest of them due to how thick the tight end room is. I mean, Amari Nyblak, I expect that guy to come in and be a big-time player. I expect him to fill those same shoes that JT Sanders filled, but that's not sleeping on Gunnar Helm, which I think Gunnar Helm could have a huge season too, you know? So you got dudes if you're Steve Sarkeesian. It's just about maybe do I throw more, you know, 22 personnel packages out there or 12 personnel packages depending on the situation. I don't know. But just like we said about the wide receiver crew, if you have enough talent, in the tight end room also, then get all those guys love. Throw Juan Davis in there. You mean, I mean, one of Juan Davis' biggest plays was Jonathan Brooks' last touchdown, or not last touchdown of the season, but I mean like last touchdown in the Oklahoma game where he ran that in there, and Juan Davis substituting for JT Sanders made a big-time block. Like, Juan Davis made some decent plays. He just hasn't had the opportunity to make those big-time plays, especially catching the ball. So I do think he's at a – Really tough disadvantage with the talent that's in that tight end room. But, again, if he proves that he's trustworthy and you could throw him out there in situations like we saw with JT Sanders last year, like ah, everybody's going to be healthy. There's going to be times where you're going to need guys. So when your name is called, are you going to be prepared? I think Juan Davis can be those guys. We'll see this upcoming season. Yeah. Um, I know we got to get to the right call. but uh, I mean, we, got, we got 15 minutes. Come on. You keep rolling. Well, I do want to get your thought on Dak Prescott. If the Cowboys are not going, I'm good with this. I'm very <laughs> of good. You are very, 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 very good with this. That the Cowboys are not going to extend Dak. They're going to let him play on his final year of his contract and become a free agent, uh, just like the Vikings did with Kirk Cousins. Um, in that case. That makes me say, okay, you've got two things going on here. You either like Trey Lance and feel good about what you traded for in Trey Lance, or you're going to draft a quarterback. So let's go, baby. Yeah, let's see. I mean, Dak Prescott, this is it. You talk about make or break season. This is it. You know. You got your brothers out here dissing Jalen Hurts and shit and all these distractions. You're a new father and everybody blames you for these 12 win seasons, but losing in the playoffs. So, hey, make them keep you there and make them pay you a shit ton of money. And the only thing that's going to solidify that is a Super Bowl. So we got Jerry Jones, who have you seen Jerry in the meetings Lately, that those photos going around where he's just scribbling in the paper. <laughs> it's just scribble. I'll pull it up. I'll, pull it, I'll get it on bootleg, but it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good at all. It makes you think, okay, Jerry, it might be that time where Steven and the family might have to put you in a home. Because Is he just doodling? Yes. Oh, no. He's, he's become the crazy. He's, he's become the crazy uncle. He looks insane. Oh, no. He looks absolutely insane. Jarrah. Um, Jarrah's become the crazy uncle at the party. Oh, he's been that crazy uncle at the party. Uh, yeah, but I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think Lance Jones is it. Or Lance. Um, Ray Lance? Ray Lance. I don't think he's it. I don't think he's it. But <laughs> look at this. Look at this. Oh no. <laughs> That's his paper. Oh no. It comes from <laughs> this oh, no. picture. And it's oh, just God. scribble scrabble. Scribble scratch. <laughs> scribble scratch. Like, what are you taking notes for? Like, oh. you don't need you can have somebody to do that for you. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, that's just oh that's that's we very don't need 
We don't need Jared with a pen and legal pad. Yeah. All right. Well, Trey Let's Lance, I right don't think he's it. I don't think he's it. Um, all right. Let's get to the right call. Before that, though, Covert BK doing it for over a hundred years. And they've been taking care of the greater Austin area of people for that long and been doing it at an elite rate. Seven terrific brands to choose from GMC, Ram, Jeep, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, and Buick. Go to the beautiful 42 acres and see for yourself. They've been committed to giving you a high-quality selection of new and pre-owned vehicles. Go to covertbk.com for all the latest specials and inventory. Nobody beats a covert deal. Not now, not ever. All right, Shep. Well, a new rule was changed today in the NFL. The kickoff rule is done. What we've loved, the Devin Hesters of the world, the D'Angelo Halls over the world, you know, those guys – we won't see any more of those guys because they have now changed the rules to what the XFL is doing. They will have basically the kicking team up at the 35-yard line or the 40-yard line. They have the receiving team, about nine guys at the 40 or at the 35. Actually, I think it's at the 40 is where the opponents start, who's kicking it off. And then the receiving teams at the 35, you could have up to nine guys there. And then you have two returners. Those guys cannot move that are on the 35 and the 40 of the kicking and opposing teams until the ball is in the hands of the receiver. And the kicker could leave once he kicks it. So they're doing this for safety reasons. Um, again, the XFL, they paved the way for this. And... I mean, a part of me likes it if it means these guys get to play longer football because they won't be, you know, more prone to getting injured than cool. I'm with it. But there's something about the excitement of a kickoff return. And now these kickers at the end of the day, they're just so strong. There's a lot of touchbacks anyway. But still, this is one of those things where it's like, damn, they're getting rid of the game that I grew up really loving and enjoying. And obviously, they're not taking much away. It's just a kickoff. But what's next? That That's just kind of one of those things. Okay, we're here now. What's next? What else are they going to try to figure out to protect these guys and say it's the safety of the game that might take away from some of the theatrics and emotion that came with it from decades and decades plus? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it is – you know, it's it's not the game we once knew. We're trying to make it, you know, safer. It's a it's a car accident every play, and you you love it for that. Everyone goes to YouTube for the biggest hits. You know who's the biggest? You know collisions. We want to see it. But then you don't want to see what happens to these guys later in life. And so it's, it is, it's a, it's a end of an era. And, you know, guys like Eric Metcalf, who never got the credit they deserved when they were playing. I mean, if Eric Metcalf played for Andy Reid or Sean McVay, that guy would be unbelievable. I mean, he would get, he, he would be a superstar. Teams didn't know how to use him back then, but he was a great return man. He was Devin Hester before Devin Hester. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of sad in a way. I mean, I'm it glad is Devin, sad, man. Devin but Hester got in. He got into the Pro Football Hall of Fame right as they're ending this you know, this thrilling, exciting play that we've come to know and love. Yeah. I mean, think of all the Deion Sanders returns in the, you know. See, now that's the thing. Punt, punt returner, that, they're not changing that. Yeah, yeah. But just right. the kickoff, you know, that's, there's some nostalgic about it, which Barry, I don't know if this is it, Barry. Barry says, put a tampon on and start it at the 25-yard line. Jeez. <laughs> oh, man, I love people like Barry. I, I get it, Barry. 
I get it. I don't think you need the tampon part, but yeah, there's things, ways that, you know, you could still keep it the way it was, right? Like, this can't be it. Like, the XFL, really? You're really copying those guys? Are we serious? Do we remember what the XFL was when Vince McMahon had it that one year? Hey, don't be – if it's the right thing, it's the right thing. Don't be throwing he hate me in here. He hate me. Wow. I'm just saying, which I'm not going to watch that league. I might watch if our guy, um, you know, Glenn Stretch Smith is coaching. I might watch, you know, coach, but – other than that, The Rock, who the rich The Rock is back in wrestling. Have you seen this? I mean, Rock is back wrestling again. I saw him busting somebody's head open the other day, throwing somebody through a wall and some shit. I'm like, dude, I thought you hung it up. I thought you hung up the trunks to go That's Hollywood. He's made, he's made one too many bad movies. Yeah, they're really bad. If The Rock's not in the jungle, you can't use them no more. Like, there's so only so many jungle movies you could do, Dwayne. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you should have just kept shooting for the Jumanjis. Like, yeah. him, Jack Black, Kevin Hart, that was The Rock's best work. And that's just because, again, supporting cast, you got to have guys around you. You know, the greats have to have guys around you to be good. Not everybody could be Tom Cruise. You dig? So... Make another Jumanji somehow. Figure it out. Because that was it. They made two. Both of them were terrific. But that's because Kevin Hart and Jack Black are terrific too. Dwayne needs that. Him doing stuff on his own? Nah. <laughs> nah. Nah. Gridiron you, Gang, where he's the football coach. Baywatch. Like, Baywatch, see, that's what I'm saying. Like, if it was because of the women in Baywatch. Alexandra Daddario, come on now. That, that's must-see TV. That, that's must-see TV. You seen her in True Detective with Woody? Come on now. Woody's had a good career. Got to fondle them things and get with Rosie Perez and White Man Can't Jump. Yeah, Woody. Come in Tokyo. Yo, don't sleep on my guy, Woody. He might be a little loopy, a little nutty. He's cut from that same cloth McConaughey's cut from, but Woody's been in some shit. Hey. Great call on Rosie Perez, by the way. Yo, Rosie Perez. Talk about dancer. We were talking about dancer with Paul Abdul and J-Lo and Madonna. Rosie Perez, the beginning scene of Do the Right Thing, where she's just getting it the whole time, doing all that chest pumping. Oh, man. That's legendary shit right there. <laughs> you fucking stupid, Billy. Damn you, Billy. <laughs> It's it's all hot. Oh it's yeah, like literally hot outside. Yeah. That's, that's summer. Yeah, Yo, Rosie call. Perez, absolutely. That Good Latin call. fever. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You stupid Billy. Her voice though that that would have been the issue for me. A voice is a lot. I, you could be attractive and all, but if your voice is crazy. Or when you get mad at me, it goes to that Rosie Perez version. Like, no wonder Billy was hooping all the time. Billy should have been at – this is Rosie Perez, Chip. Billy should have been at home, fat, eating all the time, gambling. But he was hooping because he couldn't be stuck up with her all the time. You know? Hooping in the show. Billy. Yeah. Billy. What are you doing, Billy? They took the money. The Dookie brothers took the money, Billy. <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, shit. Look at this. Rosie Perez on Letterman trying to pronounce Isuzu Troopers the best. I've not Dave, seen that. Dave Letterman, that's cold, man. No, that's, don't, don't embarrass Rosie like that. Because you know that voice trying to embarrass her. That's my girl, man. She was underrated actress. Very underrated. Eddie wore out the pause button. I feel you, Eddie. Hey, ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing wrong. You don't got to be a master of your domain all the time. Ain't nothing wrong with that, Eddie. You know, that's a legendary scene right there. That's that's it. Alexandra Daddario don't got much to her. I'm sorry. She's not. She's no Meryl Streep at all. <laughs> she better use what mama gave her and see what she can do with that. But 
Yeah, I haven't seen anything with Alexandra's daughter where I was like, oh, she going to win something for that. Oh, this is a classic. Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Not it. Not hey, it, Alexandra. Love you, girl. I, I, but not it. I got one for you. Salma Hayek and Desperado. She's in that? Oh, yeah. See, you're saying, oh, yeah, like she's just looking good in it. That's not what I'm looking for. Like, no, was she really acting? Is the movie terrific? Is she one of the head yeah. honchos in the movie? Do they need yes. her in the movie? Yes. Desperado. Okay. It's a great movie. It's by Robert Rodriguez. From okay. Austin. Okay. And she's showing See? what God gave her. See, that's what I mean. I, see, now, now I can't I can't rely on that. I can't rely on that. I need a movie where she's fully clothed. Look, even Halle Berry won her Oscar what, what on Monster Ball. You're just talking about, just talking about Alexandra can, DiDorio. But still, like, we need to see the acting chops. Like, it took Halle Berry. As good as Halle Berry is, it took her getting banged out by Billy Bob Thornton for her to win something. Uh, you know what I'm saying? That's a shame. That's just trust good. me, will you? I, I will. I'm just you, you every time I, mean. I give you a movie recommendation, you want to fight me for God's sake. Uh, you're trying to you're help right. Me. You're right. I need to be more respectful. You're, you're right. Desperado. Okay. Desperado. Okay. Desperado. Oh yeah. CB. Who had a Suzuki Samurai? That would be Sean Adams. He used to almost tip that thing over, and he had his Fosgate speakers in the back. Oh, man. I was like, didn't they stop making those because when they took a hard turn, they rolled? He's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, dude. Suzuki Samurai. Man. Classic. Yeah, see? CB is with me. Just roll with it. Desperado. See, that, that Desperado. Oh, that came out like the 90s. Yeah, it's great. That's not what I'm Alexander Dodorio is not in that movie. If she no. is, she's a child. What are we talking about then? Okay. You're talking about Alexandra Dodorio in True Detective. Correct. In the scene with Woody Harrelson. You brought yeah. it up. Yeah. Okay. I'm telling you, there's a scene like that in Desperado. Okay. With, okay. So I'm she's not in that movie. Selma Hayek, no. Selma Hayek and Antonio Banderas. Okay, I thought you were acting like it was a remake. I, no. Desperado, I know that's a classic. Okay, I haven't seen it, but I know it's a classic. I always see the footage of Selma. Yeah, yeah, okay. Plus, we got you, you this. Got Best dance scene ever from Dusk Till Dawn. I'm telling you, Desperado beats from Dusk Till Dawn. Yo, she still looks good. Oh, my God. She still looks ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculous. I don't know what she was in that magic mic. I think. I think that was the last thing she did that actually got some love. She was in the trilogy with um, what's my man's name? Tatum. Shannon Tatum. Yeah. She was she was his cougar, I think, in that. She was grooming young boy. She had him doing all types. She was like his manager. And, then she was taking them behind the scenes and using them and then throwing them out there and making them work. She was his pimp, I think. I haven't seen it, but the way they make it look in the trailers, she was his pimp. I might I have love to check how, that out. I love how you just extrapolate and go places. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but it looks like she's his pimp to me. Hey, I just that's what they made it look like. I've never they made seen it look it. like. Shannon Taylor I don't know Walker. what I'm talking about, but <laughs> she looks like his pimp. I'm just saying. They made it look like she was throwing Shannon Taylor out to the streets, serving tricks. Now he wasn't. You so know, now he was just stripping well, though. And I so think I gotta go watch this cut. movie for you. You can't watch it with the missus. Watch it I with can't? the lady. See, yeah, watch it with the lady. Get some popping. Yeah, get some popping going on. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I I need to see the first one and the second one. I, I need Mike. To, Magic Mike. Bucky's seen it. Bucky, he'll vouch for it. He said McConaughey's out there dancing. He said he loves the way Childish Gambino be dancing. Donald Glover. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, man. See, this is what happens when they let us go over our time. I know KD and Trey. This is what happens. This is what you get. This is what you get. I'll hope be off air. I'm this waiting for Trey, uh, Trey and KD to come on. So I got a while out since we still on. Yo, we got to find out who punched my dude KD. I ain't taking that shit. Now I'm pissed off. Wait, what? Who punched my man? Uh, uh, v- VY. Sorry, VY. Wrong, wrong Texas legend. VY. Man who punched my like- dude VY. Damn, someone punched KD? Yeah, no, nah, KD's good. Wrong wrong Texas legend. VY. That's yeah, he got sucker man. punched. He got sucker punched. That's a weak move. That's, That's a weak move. Terrible. Like, I, I, I need to find out more because, again, you know, my man VY probably was just enjoying the night at the bar life right after the Cheesecake Factory with the homies and end up getting sucker punched. Like, that's not cool. He just wants to enjoy his life. Come on now, we know he's called. The dude was probably like Reggie Bush deserved the Heisman. Reggie Bush deserved the Heisman, and Vy was like, "Oh yeah, Reggie's my guy. I'm not trying to deal with that." And then, pow, before Vy could even make a move, man, you know that same dude I bet doesn't want to see Vy in the ring when it's one on one. I'm going Ken Mulkey on you. See somebody when it's a fair fight. When it's a fair fight, let's see what's up. Not no sucker punch stuff. When, you know, VY could have been on one, too. He could have been on that Patron a little bit. So those yeah, if you're just tuning back- in, uh, TMZ Sports has footage of VY getting sucker punched in a Houston bar. It's awful. But, yeah, we want to know who that dude know. is so that he can pay VY for uh, his medical needs. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and then some. Maybe- and maybe a little pain and suffering. Yeah, and then some. Then we're gonna make them wash the dishes at VY Steakhouse for months. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like we we this ain't this bullshit. Come on, man. And we I bet not find out he's no Aggie or has no sooner background either. VY said them guys don't know how many guys we have who are gangsta. But even gangsters getting sucker punched is no bueno. Yeah. Trey, you've seen this video? No, what? Vince Young getting sucker punched in the bar on TMZ. Oh, from your social media? No, this is last month. Ah, shit. No. Yeah, Yeah, it just came out. Uh, Yeah. Got... Need need this stuff to stop, Vy. We're <laughs> what? What's up? He was trying. You, to, can't, you don't even know what happened. Up. How you blaming him? You don't even he know what happened. Help. And then some idiot sucker punches him. Okay, all right. Now I've got Vy PTSD. Apparently, I've seen I've seen that fucking strip club video too many times. Wow, uh, we've all been to strip clubs, Trey. Yeah, but not all of us have uh, have gotten into fights at strip clubs. That's fair. How you boys Yo. doing? Doing great. How are y'all? Oh, man. We are chopping it up. My man Zay's telling us what movies he's seen and the plots of those he hasn't seen. And like Magic Mike, he thinks Selma Hayek is the pimp of Channing Tatum. Wow. And that third one, yo, I don't think he's banging any women, but I think he's stripping for them, and she gets a cut. I think that's the premise. Why are y'all going to see Magic Mike? Just curious. <laughs> well, we were talking about hot movies with Selma Hayek, and I said okay, Desperado. Fair. fair I said fair. Desperado. Desperado I have seen. That's good. And that is – that is Selma at her prime. Have you seen her lately? I mean, she oh. still looks good. Yeah, I mean, well, prime hadn't bad. gone down too much. That that meat hadn't, you know, spoiled that much. Yeah. <laughs> and then Zay went on about Selma and Magic Mike. Okay. All right. Well, I'll question Zay about that later. Hey, do either hey, of y'all... Hey, both vouchers for Magic Mike. So, you know, Buck, he has that old wisdom. You mean and that's a good who- thing? You mean the guy who gets pedicures and manicures every week? <laughs> that guy? Yeah. yeah, the one that doesn't eat chicken with his hands? Yeah, that one. 
just confirming, just checking, man. Um, so not not judging or giving any, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not throwing anything out there. Hey, do either of y'all have like 500K that I can get wired if you give me your password? Oh, man. I haven't checked my lottery tickets, but. Are you in with Shohei's bookie? Interpreter? That sounds like some Shohei stuff. <laughs> What's going on, Katie? I know you know some people in the baseball world, but I didn't yeah. know that tight. Yeah, I mean, I just didn't think wiring money was that easy. Oh hey, my God. dude, I've got oceanfront property in Nebraska for y'all. If y'all buy this story. Yeah, no, it's his show. He's got issues. It's like I was telling Trey, it's like JFK. I don't know what the real deal is. I don't know if he was betting or what, but the story they're giving and that changed. Yeah. How are you feeling if you're the Dodgers right now? Oh, uh, you're if you're the Blue Jays, you're loving life in the Angels as bad as they are. If you're the Dodgers, you got you're like, what the hell, man? And that's all backloaded, too. <laughs> yep. Um, and and by the way, with baseball, guaranteed, dude. Guaranteed. Oh, yeah. No, they'll – trust me, the Dodgers will fight to keep from having to pay that, and it will be tied up in court for years. Yeah. Ooh. All hey, right. Hey, me me no English in court, show. Hey, you'll be fine. <laughs> me no English. You will be fine. You will you'll be good. That's too much English, man. You can't even say that. <laughs> uh, Turning to uh, Sammy Sosa all of a sudden, you know, it's like, dude, I heard you speaking great English, man. Oh, he knows English. He ain't fooling nobody. He knows English. He like Jackie Chan or something. He knows English. I ain't buying it. Ichiro was like that. Ichiro, they said, you know, had an interpreter and never spoke English. And players who played with him were like, oh, he speaks great English. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, man. Yeah. See you guys, man. Love right, guys. You Good Have show. show. Cheers. Good job, guys. What's up? Yo, what's the uh, shirt there? Reading Rainbow, baby. Oh, LeVar Burton, Butterfly in the Sky. Great you, show from our childhood. Do you remember the song? No. When the butterfly in the sky, I can fly twice as high. It's in a book. I take a look at Reading Rainbow. Reading Rainbow. You could have just completely made that up, but it sounds good to me. That's the real song. So I haven't thought about that song in 25 years, so she's working today, I guess. All right. How are we doing to start this week? Good. Uh, busy as hell. Yesterday was super busy, but good, you know, and and um, I've not slept well um, for some reason. I had a bad nightmare where, you know, my with my ankle, the bone was coming out of the foot. Mm. And no, it was like, it was such a dream. It's why I hate dreams and finally woke up and had to probably, I went to bed at nine 30 last night, probably at midnight just for 30 minutes. Just like, all right, dude, just relax. You know, something's going on in your head. So, mm. but that's where my week is by years. Dreams are often, uh, the way we creatively process memories and emotions. So I wonder what that has to do with, with you. It has really to do with my ankle and, and me having issues with it. I mean, well, I not, know. not just that, but you're starting to get things right. And so maybe that's, there's a sort of, it's not really trauma, but there's something deeply repressed in there with regards to yep. how long you've been dealing with that shit. And so probably a, probably a fear of where it could have gone and the trauma of dealing with it and the pain and probably all that. Um, it's like a psychological detoxification happening while you sleep. Nightmares. Yeah. Even as adults or especially as adults, nightmares are no fun. They don't necessarily get you out of bed running, crying to mom and dad. Like, what happens with our kids from time to time where they have nightmares and they want to come sleep with us the rest of the time, but it'll still wake you up and freak you out for a second before you realize that it didn't actually happen in real life. Yeah. That's kind of what it was. I woke up. I'm like, dude, you're dreaming, relax, breathe, go back to bed. And I was like, no, that was too fucked up. So, mm -hmm. um, got some popsicle sticks and watch some TV for 30 minutes. And then was like, all right, let's go back to bed. 
popsicle stick like you ate popsicles yeah okay i told you I've, I've been buying them and um it's kind of my treat you know um so i was like all right have a couple of those and you'll be all right hmm. this otani story is freaking wild and i gotta give you credit for a week ago uh calling my attention to something that i just had seen a headline for and hadn't really thought twice about and this thing has only gotten more bizarre and less honest yeah and the week plus has carried out and here we are with otani giving a statement yesterday it ends up lasting 12 minutes even though the statement was technically closer to six because you had the translation happening as well he doesn't take any questions from media afterwards and the story which a week ago, according to various reports, was Otani loaning this guy money to help him pay off debts is now this all of a sudden turned into, oh, that was actually BS. This guy just flat right. out stole four and a half million dollars from me. There was also his representative who said that. So it, he, had, that, he, had, he had somebody who had been hired specific for crisis management that had started that initial story. And then now it's become this. I have no idea what the real answer is. I know that what they've trotted out for a week, which I told you a week ago, and that was like, that was a day into it. And I barely looked at it, but I just knew working at Morgan Stanley, you know, the SEC Securities Exchange Commission and FINRA and SROs are called, which were self-regulating -reg organizations, which every firm has. And to do that, if you look at the SEC and what they've, you know, penalize some of these firms for the amount of money, you understand why there are SROs. I couldn't take a piss at Morgan Stanley without the SROs, the lawyers who are watching us in-house asking me where I'm going. There's no way four and a half, five million, four point five was transferred that way. Like it, it there's no way. I mean, unless he's at a crackpot place, but I, I highly doubt that with his money. And his intellect, too. What do you think ultimately happens here? Because Major League Baseball can try and sweep this under the rug all they want to. I mean, there's a federal investigation going on right yeah. now. And if Major League Baseball isn't careful, they're going to be exposed as belligerent liars in an effort to protect their most valuable individual asset. Right. And colluding, which is what we talked about. I mean, he's obviously their most uh, valuable asset for the sport which is having its own issues and has been, but it's kind of on the way up to some degree. Um, but yeah, that could be colluding. Yeah, they're in a weird spot because they can't cover this up. And I'll give them some credit, which I don't a lot. Um, they nailed a lot of these baseball players who, that, that it hurt their popularity at the time to take those guys out. Um, so, I mean, if you've got the SEC, the feds, and... Um, independent organization you know really looking at it and investigating it's going to come out you know if he did something he was also the one thing i'll give him on this is he really drew the line if he has never gambled on baseball or even helped out with that then like he was lying there you know and also the defamation lawsuit from what he said about his interpreter if he is taking the fall for him could be huge too so I mean, I, I ultimately think that the story we got is not the right one or the correct one. And there is some lying going on. Who knows to what degree that is? Um, but yeah, it's going to be. Um, it's just it, it's just hard to buy any of that, man, much less all of it. So if he did bet on baseball, that's a lifetime ban, correct? Should be. But there was a guy who suspended um, I think for the Rays betting on something and so we don't know if it was baseball but it was undisclosed amount and it was you know and manfred came out with that where it's like that's how we're doing it now and he's been penalized for 80 games or whatever my guess is he gets like a year ban mm -hmm. um if he was really involved with this it's just it just doesn't make any sense man to to wire money it, you don't necessarily need a wet signature but I, mean, I remember wiring like $25,000 for people and the shit you have to go through with the SROs, especially wondering where it's going, why it is, why did this happen this amount of time? 
Um, I mean, I'm kind of kidding around, but not really. And people that are in finance know this or at banks. You can't do anything without the the self-regulating organization in-house, which is tougher than the SEC and FINRA, who are tough, you know, being on your ass and asking stupid questions. This would have set so many red flags throughout the infrastructure, you know, with technology, with all the people that are looking at it. Like it is, it's almost impossible. And I get, I've heard this too. Athletes have had money stolen. I, of course they have. I totally, this is a little different though, the wiring, you know? And usually the athletes that get money stolen have invested in some stupid investment with someone or it's their money guy, you know, who, who can pull that off and lie about it. That's right. This guy's an interpreter who makes $85,000 per year. Did you see Pete Rose's response? To I heard 300, but whatever. You're right. With four and a half million in debt. That he made $300,000 a year. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's great know. money. But I mean, if you have a four and a half million dollar debt to a bookie, you know, that's not going to crack too much. That probably makes more sense to be Shohei Otani's translator, 300,000 versus $85,000, right? Yeah. I mean, I would have paid him 500 every meal, everything you protect me. Um, but you know, and, and this could be one of those, like we talked about with JFK where <clears throat> we don't know what the answer is. This one's wrong. And there's a lot of people that are involved. Um, and the biggest thing though, is if Shohei is involved at all after the, the, like you said, not a press conference, the statement he gave through an interpreter with no questions, then I do like some of the people. I'll give Mad Dog credit today. Mad Dog came out and was questioning the whole thing like we are. And he's close with Manfred too. Um, but some of the people that I've seen, people I really respect, like Brian Kinney, Ben Verlander is one thing. He blows Otani. And I like Ben for the most part outside of all the Otani stuff, who I like on the field. Um, but Dan O'Dowd yesterday on MLB after the press conference, this is a closed case now. This is done. He said he's, he, you know, this guy lied and he didn't do that. No, we're, we're going to have an investigation. And like you said, with the people involved, the federal government has disproven themselves a lot with federal cases, whether it's political or whatever recently. But I don't think that they would play around with this. And and you're going to get the real truth. They have no reason to back Otani. Yeah, that's true. Did you see what Pete Rose had to say about the scandal? Yeah, I saw him kind of laughing that, you know, if I would have had an interpreter, right? Do you have it? You know, load it up. Uh, I'm just going to read it. Well, back in the 70s and 80s, I wish I'd have had an interpreter. I'd be scot-free. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I mean, yeah, it's kind of, you know, like in a... Um, Anytime they can't, the FBI can't solve a, a uh, bank robber who's been hit in a lot of places, they'll they'll go to the pen and grab one of the brilliant bank robbers, mm -hmm. give them some lenience or whatever, and, and whether that's even better meals in prison or whatever. But like, what's going on here? How do you figure this out? So so Pete, Pete would know, and he smelled what a lot of this do. M most of the public's not buying this. No, no, they're not. And at some point, it's going to behoove Otani and the Dodgers and baseball to come up with a more believable story, even if it's not the exact story, because it's just like what we talked about last week. The longer you lie and the longer you lie belligerently, the harder it is gonna, it's going to be for people to forgive you. But people will forgive yeah. especially if you ultimately own some version of your actions. I agree, but I think I mean it's already too late in terms of we've had two different stories from their camp, right? Um, Including from a crisis management team that was hired like days before ESPN started poking around on this. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, I love him. He's so much fun to watch and is super talented. So I'm also not one of these people that gambling would totally destroy me if he was doing it for college basketball you know baseball is different it, it or your sport is different mm -hmm. but part of this too is the whole influx of you know legalized gambling which i've been for 
to a certain degree. I mean, regulated, but but for and you know, athletes. I mean, hell, there was the basketball player. I'd never heard of his name, but uh, Porter or whatever, who is getting looked at right now. Oh yeah, the Toronto Raptors player, maybe. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's we've been having this conversation for decades now at this point about why it is right to just go ahead and legalize gambling. Here's the tricky nuance to that in 2024 is that you're talking about legalizing gambling 20 years ago. These things didn't exist that made it as simple as opening an app and pushing buttons. Right. Like the fact that that is what the reality is for more than half the states now, I think it's 36 states plus DC or 35 plates uh, states include. 30, or, yeah, I think it's 36. I think you're right. 36, including DC, is it's a very simple process now. Yeah. And so you know that the risk is always there, that there may be more people that end up succumbing to a sort of gambling addiction. But there are a lot of people who aren't necessarily going to do that, who would like to exercise their free will to put a little bit of money on a game where it's not as big of an issue for. But this element, makes the addiction challenge so much more difficult because this in and of itself is already built to addict you. I know. Yeah. I, I don't have that vice um, with either, but certainly gambling, you know that, like, I mean, I, I just don't, I gamble when I go to Vegas and the second I get out of there, I'm done. So I, I just, I don't have a bookie. I'm not online. I don't do any of that. And I probably should have. It probably would have been some of my best investments when I was really following close sports. Yeah, yeah. And I've given I've given friends advice getting back to show Shohei, and they've hit me off if I made him a ton of money. So, which is a great deal for me because I lose nothing, risk nothing, and and you know, but if I get ten percent and would have gotten one hundred, then clearly I would have made a better investment if something I really knew. But. Um, I don't have that addiction, but it's funny. I mean, uh, you know, nicotine's been hard for me. Caffeine's been hard for me. Sugar's been hard for me. There are certain things I can quit booze right away. There are certain things that you may, may be addicted to, but you can't on others. And I, I think we all have friends, whether it's porn, uh, alcohol, nicotine, um, you know, gambling, and especially guys that they may have two of them or one of them, but it's weird that that one they just can't get rid of. And this made this for the gambling addicts in my life. And I don't know about you, in college and even buddies today for me, I've got more people that are addicted to that than I'll give the four main ones for guys, sex, alcohol, or nicotine, or drugs, if you want to call it that. Sex, alcohol, drugs, gambling. Gambling's number one for a majority of my friends that, I mean, and I don't think it's, I don't think they're an addict to where they're losing their life, but I'm just surprised at how much so many of my friends still gamble a lot. Thinking about my friends, uh, that's probably how I would have to rank it too. I don't know what two, three, and four would look like. Actually, I don't either. Um, uh, two, probably sex, probably sex too. Yeah, it's either alcohol or sex. Maybe right, it's one a, of those others. Yeah, two A, two B, and then uh, significantly less people that are on hard drugs or addicted to drugs. Although alcohol counts as a drug too, but you get yeah. When, when, uh, I, when I said drugs for our friends, I meant more uh, weed or uh, or pills or whatever, or, or some type of medication they got hooked on. You know. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, cocaine. Like not no, not not coke. I mean, I I know one person who still does coke our age. Yeah, so synthetic meds. Yeah, I got you there. Uh, as far as the gambling is concerned, you're you're right about that. There are a lot of people our age who do that. But I think back throughout my life, I think I consciously tried to avoid getting too deep into that world because yeah. it was a problem for my dad when I was a kid. And one, one of, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why my mom ultimately wanted to divorce him. And so it's that situation where you either become your parent or you become the opposite of yep. that quality that your parent possessed. I went the other direction, believe my brothers went the other direction too. But I also realized that it is in my blood 
getting back to your point on things that we are more likely to succumb to, I think the gambling thing is could be a problem for me if I allowed it to be because whenever I go to Vegas, I get very impatient, win or lose. Wow. And I'm ready to just put more on the line to either get up bigger or try and get back to even. So, yeah, I make a conscious effort other than like fantasy football and like BK was in Vegas this last weekend. He asked me if I wanted to put anything on anything. And so I put a couple hundred dollars down, $200 parlay. First thing hit, second thing didn't, sadly. But it was just a couple hundred bucks. So it was not going to be the end of right. the world. But other than that, I'm not actively seeking out ways to place money on games. But I've got plenty of buds and a lot of them here in Texas too. So they're not on DraftKings right now. They they have they have actual old school bookies who are regularly betting on fucking everything under the sun, dude. No. NBA, I mean, college, women's basketball. Women's basketball, yeah. Is a big deal now. Apparently, that's a big that can be a big money maker too because they they haven't exactly uh, figured out the formula just yet to make things even closer. So there are those money bets each and every night? But football, obviously, baseball, hockey. I mean, people will bet on whatever they fuck whatever the fuck they can to make what it is that they're going to be watching that night just a little bit more entertaining. Yeah, I just don't end up watching it until unless I really want to watch it. You know. Um, but you're right. I Me, mean, you can nail the head. I've, I've got friends that are still fit on women's basketball. I'm like, do you like that? And I think I like women's basketball more than they do, at least Texas, or I can watch Caitlin Clark last night. But like, I would never put money on that. And I mean, honestly, like, it's funny. It's cool that you recognize that because I, you know, I knew BK was going there and we talked and he never even asked me about that. And probably knowing that it's just like that is not in my blood at all. Like, I'm ready to get out of Vegas in in two days regardless if i'm up four grand or down you know 800 or whatever because i would never let it go beyond that it's one of those places where you feel like you need another vacation when you're done with the vegas vacation yeah um i really want to do it again and i like to play blackjack um i'll bet a little bit of sports but I really want to go back for food i try to get him to go to uh bizarre meat by jose andres oh so good I mean, I, you were there recently, right? Yeah, back in November when I got to cash that Rangers ticket. Speaking of the rare sports bet that I make that actually hits. And so, yeah, Bizarre Meats was that much sweeter as a result. But no, I'm with you. Actually, this last time we went, because I had a sour taste on Vegas from the handful of times that I had been there previously, this one was better because we limited how much we were actually gambling. I found some blackjack games that had side action that I really enjoyed. And then also I started playing Pi Gal with Justine. And Pi Gal is a game that you can allow a tiny bit of money to go a long way. And they also have side bets that if and when they hit, they are they tend to cash out pr quite nicely for you too. So that didn't really do any shows, but I would go to Vegas shows if we had more time. And then the uh, the food thing. Vegas is much more accessible to people who don't necessarily want to go there to gamble. Like I'm yeah, not a good golfer, but Vegas has a pretty good golf scene yep. too, according to those who know good shows, the food, you can go to the outskirts and just, uh, just lead a more relaxed time. Shit, you can go to old Vegas. Now, if you want to get away from the strip yeah. and that's, that's more relaxed and more cost affordable too, for people who are trying to go on a budget. My number one thing would be food, which is why I'd have to go to the right person. But like, that's our main thing, you know, is, is going there. Like most of my trips, it's about gastro. And so, um, food, I play a little blackjack, but not like, you know, I did the first couple of times I went there where I don't want to be up till three in the morning, smoking cigarettes and fucking, you know, drinking, um, and playing blackjack, whether I'm up or down, you know? So that is something that I had forgotten about in Vegas that kind of made me wish that I smoked again is that smoking is legal in all the casinos. There is something enjoyable about it. It's the best part of Vegas is libertarians. The fact that they're still around, there was a place, you know, where you stayed with your brother for his wedding, uh, for Mike's wedding, um, is Grand on Padre. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, they're upstairs, second floor, bar restaurant but more bar they do live music there mm -hmm. um that was the last place in texas you could smoke 
Oh, and I mean, it was, I was back from New York and went up there and wolfed out a couple of heaters and hit on some broads, you know, it was like, I was like, this is amazing. Yeah, especially coming from New York, that there's still a place in Texas, but they outlawed that. I forgot when, like 2014, 2015, but it was still around for a little bit. It was the last place in Texas, the course South Texas, where they were like, yeah, it's Padre. You know, everyone's coming here to die anyway. Burning those indoor heaters. I've posited that an airline that gets especially desperate will start offering uh, smoke filled flights and discounts to people who are non smokers or discounts, discounts to anybody. Like, Whatever the next step below Spirit Airlines is, take it back to the early to mid 1980s and and prior with the smoking section on airplanes again. Well, coming back from New York, there was a place in the West Village, a couple of places, but one in the West Village is actually right near our uh, railroad house, funny enough, off Hudson Street. So we've been like 634 Hudson, uh, bars and books, books and bars. And you go in there and drink normally, but if you wanted to smoke in there, you could, you just had to pay a fee. It was like 20, 25 bucks just to light up a smoke, you know, mm. um, where I'm like, why wouldn't you just go outside? Like how many smokes are you going to have in here? Like just exactly. walk outside, like in between drinks and wolf down a heater or two, you know, suck down a heater, suck down a heater. But yeah, I mean, there's part of me just with the, you know, liberation of it, um, that, you know, and you shouldn't smoke. And it's awful for you. So I'm not trying to like promote that, but I also am not going to tell people how to live if something's legal or even illegal. Yeah. Justine and I were talking about this earlier today where she was just, her, her jaw was on the floor with how expensive a carton of cigarettes has gotten. She's like, I remember going and getting a carton of cigarettes for my parents when I was a teenager and we'd go down to the convenience store in uh, Crystal Lake, Illinois, and it was 20 bucks for a carton. That's crazy, man. And so uh, when I started smoking, I started when I was at Texas Tech, and there was one place in Lubbock that you could go that it was nineteen ninety nine for a carton. And otherwise, I think the packs were at least three bucks plus now. And now, God, three dollars would be an insane deal for a pack oh. of cigarettes. What are you paying? Ten dollars per pack right now? I mean, I haven't got a carton in a long time. I've cut down a ton. Um Packs are depends on where you go, but like seven bucks, eight bucks, I think, um, which so, is crazy. You know, I mean, it, it's yeah. that is one of those taxes I don't mind because it is something that should decentivize you. Exactly. Um, so I'm all that. now if you're outside and I've gotten a point now where I may just smoke if I'm out with a buddy drinking and, and getting something to eat, you know, after dinner um, to where. If someone comes up and you're outside and it's like, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. it's like, no, you actually suck at life, you know? Yeah. And you're probably on anxiety meds and white wine right now. So yeah, you don't, you don't need to make a big show of it. Okay. Yeah. But also quit judging. That too. Yeah. No, the anti-smoker deal is, is gone a little too far. See, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm never around it now. So I don't have my pulse on that like you do, but you still deal with that, that passive aggressive judgment. And some of those, some of the ridiculous histrionics that come with it too. Occasionally, but I never smoke at work. I don't smoke during the day. Like, you know, it's like, I've, I've really, I've cut down to where I'm at the point now. I just have to officially quit, you know, but I don't want to do the, the little packs that everyone's doing. Um, I've done the, the patch, which can help, but I just want to quit nicotine in general. And that that's been hard for me, man. Really hard. Some people have had success with hypnosis, but you also have to be the type of personality that is hypnotizable. And I don't know if you are that. I'll be fucking with him the whole time. I, that's, I feel like that's what I would be doing too. I don't think yeah. there's any way around that. Um, yeah. And if you are hypnotized it's not necessarily a bad deal but no. yeah trey and i are not that people that like i just i won't probably won't let myself get there it, exactly you have to be willing to want to go there and there's no way that i could treat that that process seriously enough to find that mindset but there are a lot of options now so i mean it's definitely one of those i know a lot of people are dealing with that that i've talked to and and a lot of people that are smoking a ton or dipping a ton you know, dips much worse for you than than smoking. You know, if you get 
in terms of you get one big snuff as someone who used to snuff, and I read this, maybe it's wrong, but I felt it too, like a huge uh, snuff of Copenhagen, and but a big one, um, that's worth 10 cigarettes. Mm. Depending on the type of cigarettes you're smoking with the nicotine. but In terms yeah. of the amount of nicotine that you're consuming, yeah. I got you. Mm, yeah, that, that very well could be the case. Never got the dipping thing. Tried chewing tobacco also. Yeah. That was always just a... Uh, that was just disgusting to me, but I, I did enjoy smoking back in the day, but I was also glad when I was kind of forced to quit by circumstance. And so you're yeah. right here now too, and all these tools exist and you can maybe utilize some of them. I think that you would be able to do it just based on your own self-discipline. Yeah, no, I mean, I know I can mainly because I quit snuffing and that that's yeah. much harder. And I did that and I think we were, we were still at the zone together then. And I'm like, all right, quit it. And took a little while but i got there and it's like once you once you get through two weeks of any of that shit like for me it's pretty you know you kind of coast at that point because your body's off of it yeah yeah the first three to five days were always the key for me with yep. cigarettes with booze with weed with conscious ejaculation with referring to myself in conversation with sugar with vegetables, <laughs> with fruits, with friendships, whatever it is, those first three to five days. Once I, yeah. once I can get through that in the quitting process, um, not crystal clear necessarily, but to be honest, there's some things that I will quit that I don't want to quit on a full-time basis. I will always love coffee. I don't have yeah. to quit coffee medically. I will take breaks. I took a break a month or so ago. I will eventually find my way back to coffee. I'm drinking coffee daily once again, but it's to to prove in some instances that you are stronger than the vice and some vices, uh, that point of moderation is zero. And for me, that's uh, that's cigarettes. Cause if I were to start smoking cigarettes again, taking drags here and there, that would, that would not end well. That would turn into, that would become, or that would lead to me becoming a smoker once again. And I, I agree. Know. But if I remember years ago, like maybe seven or eight years ago, you took a drag off one of my cigarettes and I, I was like, no, I'm not doing that. You take a drag and you never smoked since then probably. Was that seven or eight years ago or is that during my bachelor party? It was during your bachelor party. It's exactly well and downtown. So you've actually taken a bunch of drags and drag Queens home too. So, <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. That was, that was like the one naughty thing that I did for my bachelor party when everybody was, going to the strip club, you and I, since back to the strip club, you and I sat on the curb on West 6th and I said, let me get one of those cigarettes. I smoked a cigarette and I was like, God, that's an amazing head rush. I'm so glad I don't do this anymore. Yeah, no, and I felt good after because I, yeah, I was like bad. Yeah, I felt bad giving it to you. Know, it's like it's a bachelor party and you're like, oh, I never want to do this again. You the know, fucker grinds. Grinds maybe what I'm talking about. These are what a lot of people are doing now. It's like these little bags that have a bunch of apparently healthy nicotine feelings or whatever. But mm. I just want to go. I'm, I'm at a point now where I can go cold turkey. I'll probably just get like a, a patch and do that for a week or two and then wean myself down to where, you know, because a lot of it's the ritual too. Well, nicotine, like nicotine gum is viewed as a nootropic. It does have a positive benefit for brain function. It's just all the other bullshit that comes into play on top of it being addicting. And so when you've got something like nicotine that has positive benefits, but also has a ton of chemicals that come with it, like for dip, it was always the talk of fiberglass, how bad that yeah. was for you, as well as overdoing the nicotine for cigarettes. There's all sorts of fucking chemicals that, they're washing the tobacco in and there's chemicals in the filters too. Like that, it's it's a, a little bit, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but it's a little bit like coffee. Like coffee on its own, a certain amount of coffee every day is really good for you. But when you start dumping all sorts of bullshit in it, creamers, sugars, other sweeteners, and uh, start consuming too much, then it the pendulum swings and becomes a net negative. Coffee was a lot harder, I told you. And I didn't quit coffee either. I mean, I did for two or three months, but just to prove to myself and, and wean myself off. But I've had a couple since then, but 
you know, coffee was hard to get off, but once I'm off of it, like I can do what you did, have a drag every now and then. And I just don't want to do it every day, you know? Yeah, that it very quickly turns into a daily habit for me. <laughs> once I start, I'll do it and I'll be like, all right, I'm doing it once a week now. And then after two weeks, it's like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to make it three times a week now. And then th four, a month later, it's, it's an everyday thing again. Such is life, man. Such is life. Do you see all the changes and announcements made from the NFL today, from NFL owners meetings? I did. Uh, well, I saw the, and I didn't really look into it, but the kickoff rules changed, right? So we're, we're officially done, huh? Officially done with surprise onside kicks. They are trying to ramp the actual kickoff return numbers back up. It hit a record low 20% of kickoffs being returned last season. So they're implementing a rule that saw the XFL uh, get a 90 or 80, 90% return rate the last year that they implemented this rule. So the NFL is hoping to get 80% of kicks returned by the end of next season as guys adjust and acclimate and realize that it is not nearly as much of a danger now. Yeah, it's where they're 10 yards apart. I've seen that. And, and I think it's can... only five yards apart, so they start even closer to one another. So there's less there's less of that blunt force from a guy going top speed right. when you, or when you hit him. I get it. Um, I also saw that the percentages go way up, but there's part of me, too. It's just different. I mean, it's not going to feel like a rocket is smile taking two back against michigan in 89 you know right this yeah. would be devin hester and and uh against the colts i i don't really care about the kickoff returns what i want to see is them to figure out a way to do onside kicks right to give a team a legitimate chance to get the football back agreed and okay. surprise on kick should be there too but obviously you can't do that if you're doing this now so the Surprise on kick or surprise um onside rather. Yeah, onside. theoretically turns into a pooch kick that your guy can actually get to before the before one of the back return guys can. Okay. Because um, the the dudes that are lined up five yards apart are just going to be looking to crash into one another. Yeah, they've been very creative with changing onside kicks. I mean, the actual teams that are trying to execute and kickers and special teams coaches. So I'm sure they'll find a way. Um, yeah, and we've talked about it. Keep the sport alive. Um, and it did get old that every kick or as what you said, 90 percent or whatever, or whatever the percentage was for kicks that were touchbacks. Um, I mean, it just got, you know, you, you just never saw kicks taken back. So it's been dead forever. It's like college basketball. It's been dead forever. Now we're just changing some rules to maybe try and resuscitate it a little bit. You're also not allowed to call a fair catch to get the ball at the 30 yard line. Okay. So I'm happy about that. I never liked that. Yeah, I agree. If, if the ball is kicked in the field of play, you, if you can fair catch it. That's where you get the ball. That's what the fair catch had always been. And then it turned it, into getting it upfield. It's funny. I was watching an old NFL game. I say old, not old, from the late eighties. So no, that's not old people. Um, that there was a guy who didn't understand the rules. He was a rookie from college football and the ball bounced. Although even in college football back then, I think it would have been the same ball bounced and he didn't touch it. And it goes in the end zone and someone went running down there and scored a touchdown on the kickoff team. Like you, you either had to kneel it or let it go out of the back of the end zone. Right. But you know, this whole thing now, and you know, um, you know, whatever they're doing is, I get why they're doing it, but it just feels like every kick now, it's just not, you know, people are going down there and it's just, it's, it's going to either be out or the guy can just let it bounce even in the end zone and be like, nope, 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 nope. And the second he gets across the goal line, the officials are like, just stop, just stop. Don't kill each other. You know, yep. but it'll be good to actually get some action back, even though it'll be, you know, five yard action, but whatever. I forget if we talked about this last Thursday. I assume that you're not a fan of them banning the hip drop tackle. We did. And once again, boy, man, just zero recollection of what we talk about. Um, 
I'm going to bust your balls every time you do it. So, yeah, um, fine. I, I'm, know uh, I, I am comfortable in the fact that I have a lot of conversations about these things throughout the weeks and I forget when one thing is brought up and another isn't. It's okay. No, I do kind of feel like, you know, the, the fifth Mormon wife, to be honest. Um, you're, and, you're like the third and a half. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not blowing you well. You're, you're, you're the one that I was soaking with the most before we got married. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, All right, we're moving on from that then. We already well, talked. Hold on, no, hold on. Uh, I mean, I, so I've looked at it more. I don't like it. I don't like that. I just think it's going to be really hard to officiate. And we're just objective. You no. Know, so JJ Watt was saying, you know, just put him in flags. I mean, we're just moving in that direction. And I think every year when they get together and change rules, it's because of that, or it seems like it's turning in that direction. Well, the defensive players are all saying pretty much in unison, every rule change benefits the offense and makes it harder for defenders to do their job. And by the way, some of these rule changes had the unintended effect of making things more dangerous for the defensive players too, by the way. Oh, totally. Absolutely. But when you look at the injury rate for this style of tackle and you hear the smartest experts talk about these things. David Cho. Cho is the main guy. It is worthwhile. It is. Uh, I, in a sense, I hate it. I hate that I've, I've come around on this, but I have. And I'm okay with this tackle being banned. Unfortunately, the subjectivity is probably going to lead to a lot of future conversations about how you properly officiate this thing. Yeah, I mean, just start ankle biting the whole time and and tackling with the tackling with the feet, but that could be dangerous too. So, um, I mean, it, it's a dangerous sport, and there are some things in life that you risk, and it's just dangerous. And so, at some point, they're going to have to cut it out. The thing, other thing, I would say though is that. It's very easy for them with class action lawsuits and the fact that they were lying about this and hiding credible evidence that they had in research forever that this is not all about protection. This is right. also about when the NFL was unwatchable. There was a span between probably 96 and 2000 something. I didn't watch the NFL. You know why? Because I didn't want to watch 15, 13 games. And I've said it before, but I didn't want to see Jamal Lewis have 32 carries for 127 yards. And they're acting like Walter Payton and Barry Sanders went off for a three bill. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing about this. It's it's don't trust any of the sports media people. As someone who's been in it forever, Trey has too. You can trust us because we have no fucking, we have no dog in the fight. We, we, we really don't. Um, Never listen to a play-by-play -play guy when he comes on to talk about his team. Never, never. Don't listen to coaches' interviews. They're not going to say anything. If they do slip up 1% of the time, you'll get it later on social media. Don't listen to anyone nationally who works for MLB Network or the NBA or ESPN. And Jay Billis is like, college basketball is better than it was in 92. Dude, you know better, bro. Stop, stop. Stop fucking gaslighting me and selling me your fucking vacuum because you're a vacuum, you know, salesman. Stop. The NFL cares so much about its players' safety and health that they have decided to put two Christmas Day games uh, on this year's schedule with Christmas following on a Wednesday. But don't worry, Kevin. The teams that play in those Wednesday games aren't going to have to play on Sunday they play on Saturday, so it's like the Sunday to Thursday bit, but let's not talk about the fact that the guys who are playing on Wednesday and Saturday are also playing the previous Sunday, so that's three games worth of getting less rest than you would like to have under optimal conditions. Yeah, this reminds me of a business or an industry that is forced by regulation to have to do something and probably should, should as someone who doesn't want to overregulate, we have, and it's fucked our economy in a lot of ways. There's been a lot of good regulation too that we should have. Um, and checks and balances, and even the SEC and FINRA or SROs, maybe not SROs, they can go fuck themselves, but SEC and FINRA is created for a reason, right? And, and it goes back to the hell, 33 that there's a reason this was created and there should be checks and balances for people's money. Um, 
But like any industry, you can also turn that to help yourself out if there's something that isn't working for you. And the NFL was fucking boring as shit to watch for anyone with eyeballs. You may be a you know, Jersey fan, and it was like, dude, I'm watching the Browns. I don't care if it's 8-7. Um, but these rules changes shows that they're trying to get into safety and for any future class action lawsuit. Nope, nope, we were credible and we were transparent. And it also made their game a lot more watchable because every single rule made the offense more watchable. You remember me telling you in the 90s and early 2000s, dude, this is awful. The only way they can change this is to widen the field. Right. I mean, literally, because which anyone's eyeballs would have told you, you got to widen the field, extend it. You've got to, you know, if you've got a, my example was if you're hunting deer in a certain parameter, certain amount of acres, right, with a 1960s rifle, and then you get a 2005 rifle, well, the game's not going to be as, as fair as it should be. And that is a game hunting deer. They're trying to live and you're trying to hunt. And so that was the only answer outside of let's just legislate the shit out of it. And you can't touch anyone or breathe on anyone. And that's what they did. And it worked. Um, I think it's and I, and I actually like it more watching it. But I'm, I'm certainly not dumb enough to not recognize why it's more watchable. Yeah, and I feel like if they are going to make things easier for the skill guys on offense, you probably need to tighten up a little bit in the trenches because I think holding has gotten out of control yep. on offensive lines. And by the way, this isn't just an NFL thing. This is a college thing too. Like start calling those rules a little bit tighter. Give a little bit back to the defense here because quite frankly, sometimes it's embarrassing how easy it is for the offense. When you see guys being blatantly held along the line of scrimmage. I totally agree. And that is the obvious answer that, hey, we're worried about health here. We can't have Ronnie Lott and Andre Muddy Waters fucking deheading someone, which also most of us don't agree with either. Like there was a, a balance there, but they're going to they're going to give that and be like, hey, you know, well, you could have some clutching and grabbing. Um, but the reason they won't even mess around with the clutching and grabbing within five yards which they claim they that they don't call that, but they do. Um, you can't obviously hold someone as a cornerback or defensive back, but it's the same reason they won't change offensive line in, in both levels because it's about entertainment, Trey. And all at this point, they don't give a shit about people that really know the sport and like the sport. They want as many eyeballs on it as possible. And guess what? That's worked. Yep. All right. We are going to continue this conversation in about 15 minutes because right now I need to go grab a kid from school. You're going to get to take a 15 minute break and the people are going to hear my conversation with Bootsy Collins. The legendary Oh, OK. All right. I'll take that. Who played for James Brown, most notable for his collaborations with George Clinton, with Parliament Funkadelic. He was at South by Southwest a couple weeks ago premiering a new song and helping to promote a new artist that he has become a fan of over the past few years. Her name is Phantasma. I sat down in Bootsy's hotel room for a 15-minute chat with Bootsy and Phantasma. Here's that for you now. Bring it. Well, thank you so much for the time. How you I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Really looking forward to this conversation. And Bootsy, thank you so much for the time, sir. How are you on this wonderful day? I am doing wonderful. Bl blazzled. Yeah. Blazzled. Love to hear that. Well, Bootsy, you're here in town in part uh, because you are helping to promote uh, this wonderful young lady here, talented young lady as well, a fellow musician. Uh, why don't we start with how y'all initially connected to uh, eventually get to the point that we're at right now? Well, we started, um, as I recall yesterday, um, <laughs> when COVID hit, you know, or when it was about to hit and um, when, you know, we, we all started to have to work inside instead of being on tour and stuff like that. Um, and so um, I was, you know, getting really familiar with the Internet and, you know, uh, sending music out, receiving music, and checking people out. And, you know, I happened to run across um, 
Phantasma, you know, and she she had posted a few things and I was like, yeah, I like that, like that. And then we started communicating. And the next thing you know, um, we start hooking up, trading ideas, and and here we are now. Yeah. Fantasma, how big of a thrill was it to hear from Bootsy for the very first time, considering how big of an influence he was on the music that you were making at the time, with no real inclination that you might get to meet this living legend at some point? Yep, exactly. It was very, very, very thrilling. Um, I'm breathing and living Bootsy's music, and um, when I got the chance to, to work with him because he saw the music that I did, I was feeling very, very grateful, and still am. When did you first connect with Bootsy's music, or maybe the better way to put that is, when did Bootsy's music first connect with you? <sighs> you mean age-wise? Because spiritually, probably my whole life. <laughs> no, seriously, because, um, I mean, Bootsy's music is, is in so many different uh, songs and genres, like his, his influences. So I probably got in contact with his music even way before I knew that it was Bootsy. So That's a great way to put it. That's pretty good, yeah. Bootsy, I heard you say on stage yesterday that if there's one thing bigger than the music, it's the one. What do you mean by that? And where did, was that idea initially conceived? It was conceived um, by me interpreting what James Brown meant when he said, put it on one, <laughs> you know, uh, and his term, his meaning was all about the music the measures and, you know, the beat, where it falls at, and one, one. So that, that's his interpretation of putting it on the one, and they still do it on the computer. When you hear the computer, it kicks out. Kick, 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 kick. That's the one, hmm. you know. Uh, and he was explaining that to us before the computers and things started, you know. Um, up for the consumers, you know, and and so um, that's where I kind of start getting the idea of this is what I got to get, you know, when, in, in whatever I'm doing, I got to keep that in mind, you know, uh, it's all about the one. And so I got with George Clinton and he thought it was just such a great idea that he wanted the whole thing to be about the one, <laughs> you know, and Next thing you know, uh, what was the song? Uh, 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 on the one, everything is on the one. <laughs> yeah, that's where that all, you know, kind of start blossoming up and, you know, it became a thing, you know. So it's become a combination of the two then. It's like this controlled form of chaos or perhaps uncontrolled form of chaos at times. Yeah, it's that, but for me, it's bigger than that, and that's what we had started off with yesterday. Um, um, and what I meant by bigger than the one that James Brown was talking about and that what George took it and made a concept out of, bigger than, than that for me meant everybody and everything combined equals one. You know, we all are connected in one way or another, uh, genres of music as people, uh, as spiritual beings, as healers. Uh, I mean, all of that is combined into one. And so when I say um, my last album was uh, The Power of the One, that meant the power of all of us as one, you know. Um, so it ain't just about bang, chick, chick, chick. Dang, you know, it's the whole concept of all of us together. And that to me is funk because it's very unimaginable, but it's imaginable to me, you know, and the more I see it, maybe the more you'll see it, the more you'll see it, maybe the more she'll see it. And it, you know, the funk is just spreading and, you know, that's what we are. A lot of people don't want to accept that we came from a asshole and a pee hole. <laughs> but if that ain't funk, what is? 
Funk is making something out of nothing, as you said yesterday. Yeah, this is true. This is true. But think about that. You know, I mean, that's where we came from as physical beings. And, you know, you either embrace that and know that you're funky or you don't. And the ones that's left out, that's where they want to be. And that's all right. Considering how weird things have gotten in 2024, you guys thankfully got to meet through the pandemic and the fact that everybody was shut in. But with the weird social isolation and some of the after effects of that AI now creating more fractures and people just having a hard time with those face to face interactions, just how much more important is the idea of the one now Phantasma than it was even five, six years ago? We have to remember who we are, and we have to have to connect to our hearts. And I believe that if you do so, you get to feel the one, the oneness, the connection. I really do. <laughs> so um, I believe you should not just get too too much distracted by everything that is going on, all the crazy stuff, um, which is, which can be tough sometimes. But again, remember who you are, connect to your heart, and when you do that, you'll connect to people. And connecting is the one. Yeah. Connection, yeah. Totally agree, totally agree. Yeah. Bootsy, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you for your alien encounter story, because I've heard you <laughs> briefly <laughs> reference it, but man, I gotta hear about this, because oh. like you, I am a big believer that we are not alone out there. So what exactly happened with you and George in a car on your way from Detroit to Toronto, I believe? Well, you know, we kind of lost that space of time. <laughs> but what I can remember is liquid mercury. And I didn't know that that's what it was, you know, at the time this was happening. Mm -hmm. But it hit, the car, it hit the car. No cars was around us. I'm driving. Chuck Berry is on the radio singing... Um, uh, Johnny B. Good. <laughs> and this is all that I remember that night. Um, I don't recall what, yeah, it had to be at night because they had the street lights lit up and um, nobody was out there but us, me and George. And I'm driving and we listening to Johnny B. Good. And this thing hit the car and it started. You know, I don't know if you have ever seen Liquid Mercury. Yeah. Uh, like uh, Terminator 2. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I got to remember that. <laughs> um, but that's what started falling off the car and uh, the lights went out. And the next thing we woke up, well, when I woke up, we were back at George's house and knocked on the door and his girls came to open the door and she said, y'all look like y'all seen a ghost. And we looked at each other. It was, it was yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> so my, my recollection of it was like, it must have been some time missed because uh, I know something happened that I can't explain, you know. Um, but I was glad that it did happen because... Um, those records started coming right as after that happened, you know, um, uh, the Mothership Connection, um, all of those songs started happening. Oh, is that right? After that? Right after that happened. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we were going back and forth from Detroit to Toronto cause George lived in Toronto at mm -hmm. the time. And, um, we were getting, um, we were practicing, getting ready for the tour and all that. And um, that's how and when it hit, you know. Um, and so George didn't want to tell me because he didn't want me to think he was crazy and I already knew he was, <laughs> you know. And I didn't want him to think I was crazy, you know. So we didn't say nothing about it mm -hmm. to each other, you know, um, until after we started you know, doing the music and it's, 
you remember that night, you know, uh, we was traveling down the street and, and then George started talking about, um, it must have been some, what do you call that time that you... Space-time continuum? N- no, the, um, the time that you miss. Oh. It's a word for that. Um, what is it? Is it time lapse? Time lapse. Um, Gap. Uh, no, it, it, that's, that's close enough, though. Um, it was some time missing. Missing time. What's that called? I don't know. Anybody? I'm, I'm on interview here, but what is missing time? That, it, they got a word for that. I got it. Laps? Uh, it's, okay. it's the uh, the concept for, from Memento Blackout. It, that's close enough. Yeah. It's, yeah. The, it's the idea from Memento where you... Yeah. Uh, you it's missing time. It's like, it's like you know that it took time to get to a certain place, right? Mm-hmm. But you don't know what happened in that time. You know, so all I know is that when we got to George's house, it was like we just instantly appeared. Amnesia. That's good. That's good. (laughs) But I was a young man. I was a young man. (laughs) So So last last question now, if you don't mind, I do need to ask about the new single. This is not going to come out until this new single has been revealed at Lady Bird Lake on Friday. I'm excited to hear it. Uh, We're going to start with you here. What can you tell us about the influencers? Well, it's a very freaking hot single. (laughs) It's funky. I love it. Um, I got a chance to work with incredible artists. I'm I'm really, really excited and grateful for that. You said artists. Who else is other than Bootsy? I don't know. Am I supposed to? Yeah. yeah. Can we talk about that? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's Dave Stewart. It's Wiz Khalifa. It's Snoop Dogg. Yeah. And um, which are all artists that I've been looking up to my whole life. And I um, get, to, get to be on a song with them now. And I'm really, really excited about that. And I hope everyone likes it. <laughs> she showed she showed out it was like she supposed to have been in that mix anyway you know regardless you know um and so when we start kind of putting it, the song together i didn't i don't usually know where i'm going with it but my whole motto is i don't know where i'm going but i'm going <laughs> you know nothing is going to stop this you know i'm going anyway you know so you know dave and i started kicking back and forth, you know, and um, I start um, uh, telling him that, you know, maybe we're thinking too much, you know, because I, I, sometimes you can get to a point to where, you know, you, you try to outthink yourself mm-hmm. and get ahead of the creative process, you know, and Dave said to me, well, let's just, you know, let's just get stoned. Mm-hmm. And I was like, <laughs> get stoned. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's a great hook. That's a great hook. Go ahead, Sam. Speaking of stone, yeah, West Coast Stone is on there too. That's right. That's I right. just oh, found wow. that out, which is really, really cool too. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So you know, um, yeah, West Coast Stone. He does keyboards and stuff, and he's really great. He's actually he's going to be out here Friday too. So, uh, but to get the stone, get stone, and I was kind of like. Well, you know, everybody's, you know, kind of got a hands up about get stoned, you know, but, but they say, yeah, think about it though. You know, that feeling, you know, and I was like, yeah, it do kind of make you feel like that, you know, and because we were going back and forth on, um, should we call it get stoned? <laughs> you know, uh, it's like, no, I don't, I don't think, I don't think so. <laughs> You know, we got, you know, we got a little Tazzy here, you know, we're trying to get her to be, you know, be a, a role model, you know, and she's out here talking about, yeah, let's get stoned. Because <laughs> it makes sense for, uh, for some other people that are part of that bill, though. You know? Well, that's exactly why they're on there. <laughs> no, d- no doubt about that. Bootsy, you are a master with nicknames. I would be remiss if I did not ask you, just like with the alien story and the short time that we visited, do you have a nickname for me? Oh man! Wow, I put you on the spot. that that's really on the spot because usually you know when I come up with with names, they just come to me, and you know when I'm looking at you or when I'm thinking about you, you know it's like oh when I see you, it's like that's 
you know, you know, but when I'm asked, give me a name, I'm going to give you one. Okay. You ready? Now, see, see, this didn't come from, you know. It didn't come from the universe. Yeah, yeah. So it's like Gizmo. <laughs> I asked for it yeah, and I got yeah. it. Y'all, thank thank you so much for the time. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you so His much. name is Gizmo. <laughs> <laughs> he is Gucci. She is Phantasma and I am Gizmo. Thank you so much for watching today. You're muted. You're muted. Uh, <laughs> myself uh yeah there it is bootsy call that was great dude like the the alien story especially was just awesome man but yeah i didn't realize because i'd heard a version of that story before i didn't realize that that's what really caused p funk to take off so it's a seminal moment in those guys musical history is uh having that weird uh ufo slash et experience driving from detroit to toronto at night wow um yeah um how far is that trip because De detroit to obviously windsor is right over the br bridge detroit to toronto is pretty close too from what i understand i've never been to either city and i think two hours two and a half hours something like that tentative plan is to go to detroit for the texas michigan game in early september later this year okay and uh <laughs> So yeah, I'll I'll know about the Detroit side of things, but yeah, I don't know about that trip to Toronto. It is a drivable trip, though. Got it. Rodney was waiting for the cameraman to instruct the girl to take her top off. Yeah, unfortunately, the lighting wasn't great, which I didn't realize until uh, playing the video for the very first time after we got it. We got decent natural light. We were probably a little bit too uh, too far away from the window in retrospect, but that's how these things go. So I know I've seen her before. She she was really cool on that. Is that um? I thought Fantasia was black. Phantasma is her name, and there's some Fantasma. different Phantasmas. Okay. This one's spelled right. with two A's or two Z's. There's a slightly different spelling there. But if you just type in the influencers on Spotify or Apple Music or go to YouTube, you'll see what the proper spelling is because it'll be her, Bootsy, Snoop Dogg, Wiz Khalifa, Dave Stewart, I guess, is another name that they said. I'm not all that familiar with him. Hmm. Um, by the way, three three hours fifty three minutes um, from Detroit to Toronto, so much longer than I thought. Four hours, yeah, that's longer than I thought too. I thought it was closer to an hour and a half. Holy shit! Yeah, um, but no, I mean, great that's job. Not a, it's not a day trip. You go there and you stay for at least a couple of days. Agreed. Um, yeah, because Windsor is right across, and I covered something in Detroit, and the place to go to was was uh, Windsor. Um, and I love, you know, Montreal and that area, which is very close, like a one hour, one and a half hour flight from New York city. Um, mm. like very quick. Um, but no, that was, you're so good at that as we told you, but that was awesome. And by the way, boner has been gone for a long time for a reason, but gizmo mm -hmm. is, is now here, dude. As Ike says, I can't get wet and can't eat after midnight. I've got both of those things covered already, so I guess that fits into the whole Gizmo nickname. That is too funny right there. Way, way too funny. But great job, and that was cool to – he seems very – they actually both seem very genuine and very cool, and the fact that they, you know – I could tell early on, like most interviews with you, they knew this is going to be fun, and, I mean, I've done enough interviews. You can tell when someone wants to bail right away. <laughs> Yeah, I've done those types of interviews too. Thankfully, this wasn't one of those. I've had some weird examples of those too with people that were completely surprising, like Kevin like, Nealon. Like who? Yeah, so Kevin Nealon? Yeah, he was one. It's it's comedians a lot of the time because comedians think of themselves as better than local radio. You guys had one. Pauly Shore didn't oh. have the time for you guys, even though they were the ones that reached out to me to set the interview up. And Pauly Shore... He didn't uh, big league you guys. He was just a, being a colossal asshole on the air. He was a dick. I gave him a couple good jabs where I saw you laughing your ass off. But Chad said something that wasn't meant to be a jab, but it was such a, what did Chad say? <laughs> Chad just totally pissed him off to start it off. I can't even remember what it was, but he was oh. already in a bad mood before that point, and that just set him off. Yeah, because you, Trey, so good as a producer, got in our ears like, Paulie's on. He's been a total dickhead and 
you know, we'll see how long this lasts, but we'll bail if we have to. And Chad said something early on about, you know, whatever his career has been, and it pissed him off. And he fired back, and then I fired back at him. <laughs> And then it turned into like a pissing match. And I'm like, all right, Trey, like we're, we're done. And you were in our ear, like, let's end it, you know? Yeah. Pa look, Paulie is okay as a stand up. He Dude, obviously, you're Paulie sure. He obviously had his day in the sun as a. That know, was my line to him. You remember that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That is it. Like after, after he was being a dick to you guys, you dropped that one on him. Yeah, like he, he he you know he's had an okay career and he made a right. decent chunk of change in movies in what the 1990s, but he's also the beneficiary of some nepotism too, considering that his mom was Mitzi Shore and ran the fucking comedy store. So he and got dad to too, if I remember early dad on. Dad started it, but dad ended up out of the picture pretty quickly. By the time Pauly was doing stand up in the 1980s, that was Mitzi's show, and Pauly could do whatever the fuck he wanted to. And eventually yeah. he gets found and put on MTV and that turns into like a five-year movie career. And then people realize, oh, Pauly Shore's actually not that funny. The weirdness, the novelty of the weirdness is worn off too. So go back to stand-up now, Pauly. Go back to being an average stand-up comedian. There are people too who I've, I've really liked who are weird and most people don't, whether it's, you know, I thought Tom Green early on was funny it's probably my age but was funny enough i didn't think it was brilliant um but there are a lot of people like that and mainly bit character actors and movies or whatever i'm like dude like martin short's a great example some people hate him i think he's hilarious um but i understand the people that are like i don't think he's that funny um like come on just kind of know know your place a little bit right and and paulie with the nepotism and even his work, I never really liked. No, his work was not. Look, go back and watch his work now. He just, son-in-law is probably the best thing that he did. Some might say Encino Man. Others might say Biodome. But you get the point from just the movies that I'm listing out right now. I've never seen any of them. So I've only seen Polly Shore's MTV work. I think I've seen, maybe I've seen everything but Biodome. The Polly Shore, Stephen Baldwin vehicle. Probably why I passed. Yeah, I mean, look, it didn't didn't take audiences long to figure out that they didn't want to waste the seven bucks at the time to go to the movie theater to see that guy either. Yeah, and more the time. Andy, well, it's funny because he shows at Rogan's place, the Mothership, and his shows sell out pretty quickly. So I don't know. I mean, that's just his knowing who he is and understanding that he is a part of the history of the the comedy store and thinking that that's going to translate to. A lot of laughs right i have never seen a stand-up so i guess i can't form a hard opinion one way or the other but i'd be shocked if i walked away from that show thinking that he was hilarious so like gilbert godfried or and gilbert is actually a brilliant writer and stand-up um made the first 9 11 joke after 9 11. he did chris ellie is a good example of kind of a bit actor who i think is really funny always yeah. tickled my my balls or balls uh, depending on the uh, exact year. But I understand when people are like, I, I don't get it, you know. But like people like that, it's like, just go to enjoy your success and money and don't be a dick to, you know, local Austin radio. Although mm -hmm. Chad did, I forgot what Chad said. Chad had some setup and it's Chad, so he didn't mean it bad, but I could tell when he said it, I'm like, oh, fuck. Was and it this? Oh, oh, Hair, hair of the dog says pretty sure Chad called him a weasel because his, <laughs> his name used to be the weasel. Hold so on, bring that back up because this guy obviously knows our past. Yeah, and he's got a got the Kramer picture, which I had forever. I finally gave that up after a girlfriend said this can't be in the apartment. What? Yeah. yeah. She was right. She was right. I had it like, you know, hung like, you know, it was our family portrait. Ah. Uh. That's ah, okay. If it's if it's that small, if it's like an eight by ten, that's not that. No, nah, it was a big one. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, that's it was a big one. It was a big one. Maybe belongs in the uh, in the office off screen, I guess. Yeah, I don't think I had an office. It was in New York. They didn't have an office back then. It had seven hundred and fifty square feet. Well, your office doubled as your kitchen and your shower. Yeah, you remember that. 
It's like oh, people yeah. now come over. I'm like, dude, it's just me here. I've got way more room than I need, you know, and some people need a big house. Um, but I would just collect stuff and put it in the garage in the other rooms. It wouldn't be, it would not be beneficial to me hoarding too much, which my mind does. And I also am prone to do getting back to addictions. Like I, I will hoard stuff and I've had to really cut that out. It's been hard. I've gone through baseball Americas from 97 mm. and me throwing that out. is like the kid with the blanket, the, uh, in, uh, the blanket that you've been shoving up your nose for 15 years that you finally have to get rid of? No, what was the Michael Keaton movie? Um, Mr. Mom. Yep. Where he throws a banky in the fire. He's like, we're getting rid of stuff. We're cutting out, you know, and that, that's me throwing out like a uh, Dave Campbell's, which I never throw out. I end up giving it to someone and being like, this means a lot. Take it. You know, I'm sure they throw it out, but I can't do it. My dad's still trying to collect Dave Campbell's. Good for him. Can you buy and send me the Dave Campbell's? I'm like, no, but you can order it if you really want it. I don't want to inherit fucking 60 editions of Dave Campbell's when you die. That, I, I do not what, like that. Tell him I've got all of Durwood's from when it started. And if he wants to wire me some money, we got a deal. Nope, because I don't want to inherit that shit. No, I'm making fun of wiring money. Oh, okay. All right. All right. There we go. Do you really have Durwood's Sports yeah. Illustrated? Yeah, and, 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 and Playboys. I gave most of the Playboys away with the last girlfriend. She was like, why do you have all these? She's like, grandfather had them when he died. She's like, get rid of them. So she was Latina. So you know how that ended. Uh, with you getting stabbed in the stomach? No, getting rid of them. So I didn't. <laughs> okay. How far back did the Playboys go? Like 1960s? Yeah, I mean, kind of the whole Bush era, or like fat chicks, and then um, not not fat, but like you know that that was kind of bigger, and then uh, or more popular than the Harry Bush era, which I always hated. I'd take a shit in George Chandler Bastrop where they're living, and he'd have them there, and I was just you know it's like, why are you shitting for so long? Well, I got news for you. Um, before I was masturbating too. But just like looking at it, I'm like, oh my God. But yeah, the 80s is when it really blew up. Hmm. But Playboys were much more available back then. I remember this, the uh, Sanchez brothers, who I love, you know, Joe and Marcus and Eddie, shout out to Eddie. Um, we were right over here, and that's where my dad had his hair cut for 30 years. And I think still does, actually. And um, that's where I went as a kid and they had playboys on the top that my dad could read and I couldn't, you know, but they were, they were kind of, they were out in public a little bit more. It was also the eighties. So take that for what it is. I was about to say they were also more relevant. They were still relevant in the nineties and then slowly started to fade in the two thousands. And I think a physical edition of that magazine still exists, but no, I think they cut it off, dude. All together. Well, Hefner's no longer around. That fucking creep. Yeah, so, and they got they got woke, which they had to. But well, he he also got fucking popped for being the old creepy perv that he was the entire time. No doubt, no doubt. But they had, I guess, they had two transsexuals um, on the cover. Which I will say this: I saw the cover and I saw the story that was out there, and I'm like, who are the transsexuals? I was like, I mean, they they. They were hot. Got to be honest. Didn't look at Adam Zapp or Knuckles, but they were hot. Um, oh, they uh, they were they were your uh, top notch lady boy, as they would yes. call them in Thailand. Okay. And so I guess they had them on a cover, and that pissed off a lot of people. I mean, you know, I mean, everyone's so divided now, and of the divisions, there's this cancel culture, which will end a lot of stuff. But the reality too is that Playboy really got knocked out with online stuff, and there's no reason. Because, I mean, Sports Illustrated and Playboy, and I may be thinking of Sports Illustrated, actually. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, but same thing when they did their swimsuit issue, and that that's what it was. They get knocked out because, you know, why do you need Playboy if you can get online? Why do you need Sports Illustrated if I can get the story right away, you know? 
You don't. But I mean, when those would come in the mail, my dad never got Playboy. But we got Sports Illustrated. I got Sports Illustrated for kids. And when that came in the mail, that was a big deal. I mean, I I just digested the whole thing, you know, and you know, I can do that on CBS Sports in the morning now um, to where everything's so real time and there's current information, you know. Can I give you my feelings on Playboy putting trans models on the cover? Five it, was, it, it, was, it was it was it was it was Sports Illustrated just to get that straight. Um, so Playboy yeah. didn't do trans models. Sports Illustrated. I mean, maybe they did, but yeah, it was Sports Illustrated. Okay, so uh, can I give you my opinion on Sports Illustrated putting trans models on the swimsuit issue? Is that what that that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Bud Light. Uh, no, no, it's very similar to my Rodney Terry stance when he was hired as the Texas basketball coach full time. I don't give a flying fuck, but I am fascinated to see how it all plays out. Yeah. Wow. Well done. Yeah, I don't either. It's like, I mean, you know, who cares? I mean, look, I stopped, know, I stopped, I stopped paying attention to the swimsuit issue of Sports Illustrated about the year that I stopped caring about that football flip phone being in my room. Yeah, pretty much. Although I would have been after Petra Nimkova was the last one. She was in the tsunami. In was that the Indian Ocean back in the day in the early 2000s? Okay, she got she, but Petra Nimkova, you want to look her up and put her on air right now. Old school picks, Petra was, Nimkova, Petra Nimkova, probably Ukrainian, Eastern European, obviously, and just a smoke show. But that was the last one I remember looking at, and that probably would have been 99, 98, whatever. Um. It's funny. Once you start getting delayed, you don't need that as much. All right. But yeah, she was uh, her fiance or boyfriend got killed in that, which a lot oh of people gosh. did. And um, she survived, had a lot of broken bones and everything. But that's awful. And she still looks hot. It's all right. Well, well the, the, the boyfriend dying is. Yeah, you're right about that. And the whole thing. So, so here's Petra Nemkova. Oh, go to younger pics. Although she still looks good. Is she not young there? No, 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 no. no. She would have been. All right, there you go. What year is that? Uh, 2018. No, she's beautiful. I'm talking like go to like 2000 or go to Petra Nemkova Essa. All right. S-I. This is what guys in their 40s do, ladies. <laughs> oh, there geez. we go. I remember that one. Is this the one that you're that talking one. about right here? Well, I was talking about the one up top. On, go up top. Go up top. Other this way. Oh, well, all of them. I mean, she's gorgeous. So, but go up top. Go hey. back. Go back. No, it's, yeah. The one right up here. There you go. This one? Yep. Um, I don't know. The, half the face is cut off here. Yeah, well, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Ah, okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You might have been. On, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. She's a, might have been, you might have been onto something there. Thing, dude. Might have been onto something there. Yeah. Um. So there you go. Can you imagine that too? If you're her photographer who's dating her and. You're on vacation and it's like, boy, tonight's going to be good. And a tsunami comes and you're dead. It's like, you know, I mean, I guess I kind of, I got everything I could. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a, you're in paradise and then you're dead. Yeah. Yeah. That you're in paradise. A way to go or a terrible way to go. You're in paradise in many ways. Exactly. And then you're dead. Yep. And then you're dead. Well, what else is up? What else you want to hit? You got anything else? Speaking of nightmares, drowning is a that's that's a big one for me in terms of uh, ranking the ways that I don't want to die. I don't want to drown. Well, apparently people that have drowned, I agree. Um, but apparently people that have drowned and been resuscitated and can actually live again say that once your body accepts the water, it's the most euphoric feeling ever. Oh, wow. 
So remember that when you're drowning next time and you know you're going down. Be like, all right, just swallow it literally and mm. it's going to be fun at the end. Okay, what else is going on today? Um, Texas basketball season is officially over with. That's well, a- me- men's is. A day thing. Yeah. Yeah, I keep having to have this conversation with you guys. We don't we don't need to change the verbiage. It's the college world series and the college softball world series. It's college basketball and women's college basketball. That's okay. It's okay. But dude, but dude, Caitlin Clark, she's one of the best college basketball players of all time. If she went one on one with Jalen Rose, who didn't top 50, she beats him, right? Jalen Rose at the age of 50, maybe a Bobby, maybe a Bobby Rick situation, but Jalen Rose after a tsunami beats her 50 to one. All right, let's get real. Uh, I had this conversation. I think it was with Zay last week. Like I wholly admit that women's college basketball is a more entertaining product right now than the men's game is because the men's game is so ugly offensively. You have entirely too much player movement to go along with all the issues that have plagued that sport for decades now. But the women's game has to get the parameters of the surface of play right for me to even consider buying in. I'm sorry. I know that's that's going to upset some people. I, I I wholly support you watching as much women's college basketball you as you want to. I love the fact that the UT women's team is an entertaining product this year. And there's a lot of people who love basketball who were – felt a little bit let down or maybe disenchanted from the men's team this year that you have that women's team that you can root for, but the product just isn't quite there for me. I'm sorry. It's not with the women's game. I can watch Caitlin Clark. I can watch UConn and they've got Maya Moore and Tarasi and they're playing Tennessee. And I mean, watch a quarter or two, um, but I'll watch the women, Texas women, mainly because it's obviously my blood and the Texas, but it's also what team it is. So there were a lot of Texas teams for a long time there that I didn't watch and had to cover. And I'm like, oh my God. Did you Um, watch many women's basketball, Texas women's basketball teams growing up, considering that they won that national championship in the mid eighties? You know, the two for me, or, and actually for me, it was a small town. The two most popular teams, funny enough, in the mid to late eighties in Austin. I mean, the team ones that were at a softball game, people really cared about the women's basketball team. And I mean, volleyball. No, what's, what's the best serious sport here ever? Oh, baseball. Yeah. Baseball. Yeah. Yeah. To where it's, you know, finding out Texas lost two one at Craig fields because Bill Bates dropped a fly ball in foul territory or Clarissa Davis breaking down Cheryl Miller or the next year, them losing to probably La Tech. I think it was, there were, you know, people talk about how it's all chalk down the women's game. It's grown a lot though, to where, I mean, there were four or five programs, you know, in women's college basketball, maybe nine in college baseball when I was growing up. So both those have grown a ton. But yeah, I mean, so yeah, I did grow up watching them. I mean, I can tell you about the 86 team that went 34-0 and Clarissa and a lot of that stuff, but they went, just got kind of mediocre for a long time. So, and naturally, I don't love watching women play college basketball. Oh boy, I'm sorry. I just got distracted by somebody asking if we've seen this Vince Young video of him getting knocked out in a Houston bar. Did I tell you my dad died? I mean, you know, can, can can you pay attention here when I'm giving serious stories? This this is what happens when you start talking women's basketball. Again, no offense to anybody who likes women's basketball. That's how little it interests me. Well, and I'm trying to back them up. So, you know, it that's come so far. Do you remember the push shots we used to see back in the day? Oh, which, yeah. Which yeah. is why Clarissa, Cheryl, um, Cheryl Miller, Cheryl Swoops, like they stood out so much and Caitlin Clark can fucking ball bro. And, but a lot of these women now are fucking jacking it up and it is elbow in boom. I'm not having to push anything. It is wrist and to where it's grown a lot. The layups still bother me. I'm also always worried about knee injuries because of the physiology of women, which has been proven by females that have done serious studies on this, that, 
the back and forth lateral movement is why you get more serious knee injuries. And I'm always waiting for that. And so there is a part of me, I'm like, oh, you know, I mean, hell, was it Elijah Moore, the who went down with a knee injury last year? I mean, there are some things I know we can't say this, but there are some things that are different about men and women. Not that men don't have knee injuries. Trust me, if I went out and tried to do that right now, I probably would or blow an Achilles. But at that age, at a very top athlete to where just, you know, you see more of it. There's just, you can't deny it. I mean, you can if you want, but, you know. Yeah, as far as Caitlin Clark is concerned, she, she can play. Well, oh. she, she does look more like a dude playing basketball than a, than a woman. So that was the first thing. It was in the 90s, but Cheryl Swoops, the biggest compliment you gave is she looks like a dude. In, yeah, but it's not to Caitlin Clark's degree though. Dude, like the played, played like a uh, played like a dude, man. The the movement though looks looks more like a biological male than Cheryl Swoops ever did. All right, I'm yeah. I mean, are you talking just yeah? We're about to get in serious trouble here. I know, I know what you're saying. Um, no, we're not getting in trouble. We're having a conversation, right? But Cheryl Swoops helped Clarissa played like a dude, man. Um, I'm not look, Le, <laughs> Lenny Bruce floated a version of <laughs> observational humor that nobody else up to that point in the art form of stand-up comedy had done. Right. But Lenny Bruce wasn't doing observational humor like George Carlin was shortly after, and how that evolved and how it's evolved even more over the years, too. And that's not to say that George Carlin wouldn't wouldn't thrive in modern times. Lenny Bruce probably has a place as well, but like comparing Lenny Bruce and George Carlin in terms of what that observational humor is like, it's, it's, uh, there's a, a pretty drastic difference. I feel like there's a pretty significant difference in how Cheryl swoops versus Caitlin Clark moved. And a lot of that has to do with training styles and, and how much more laser focused training styles are in the off season and getting you to, to train smartly. You're not just trying to gain strength necessarily. There's a cavalcade of things that you're training for specific to your sport I would assume that Caitlin Clark is on top of all of those things right now in ways that ju just didn't necessarily exist in the 1990s. Agreed. So would you? No, I'm kidding. Um, let's get back to the men and your take on that. My take on the men's the Texas men's basketball team. Yep. Oh, that. Didn't play out exactly like I thought it would, although I did say heading into the tournament, this team would go as far as Dylan DeSue could get them. Now, they made it one extra game, considering that he wasn't very good against Colorado State. But this has been an up-and-down basketball team all year, and when you're going to get uh, poor efforts from the field, from both DeSue and Acemas, the likelihood that they were going to beat a two-seed Tennessee team that plays a physical brand of defense and certainly has their own issues on offense was pretty minimal. And so I never really invested myself emotionally in this basketball team all year long and saw what their likely ceiling was. And that's exactly where the season came to an end in that round of 32. Yeah. Going back to Thursday, I actually nailed it. I told you that we had no idea, but I was like, I think they win this game and play Tennessee really tough. That's I actually bet money on them beating Colorado state by four plus points with BK and I got that one right and got the fucking Kentucky over under wrong. You sure? uh, Are you sure there's not a problem there? Or, uh... No, it was a $200 parlay right. taking right. Texas, taking right. the Kentucky Oakland over because Kentucky has been hitting overs all year long. According to my buddy, who's the lead handicapper for Nesson in Boston and does stuff for Fox sports too. And that one turned out to be like two points short. So 200 bucks down the drain and I'm not continuing to bet on those things either. No, I know you're not. Um, well, even your Rangers bet, people would hear that and say, you had such good odds that I think BK was there. And would you put like a hundred bucks down or something? No, he was trying to talk me out of the hundred dollars. He was trying to talk me into just making the playoffs. I'm like, no, I'm just going to let it ride. When I was, when the, uh, when the Rangers made the World Series, people were like, "You got a hedge right now. You got to cash it in. They'll they'll still give you a huge winning. You just won't get the full seven thousand. I was like, "Nope, we're letting it ride." After well, the games, it was one to one. They're like, "You should do it now." Nope, I'm letting it. This guys, I'm just letting it ride here. It was that actually that actually shows you don't have a gambling problem, 
And most people may hear that and be like, no, that doesn't make sense because he's letting it ride. If you did, that means you've got 10 other bets and you would have taken the hedge and then been like, I'm turning this around for, you know, I think the Gonzaga women are really going to beat, you know, Vermont. And it's like, right. yeah. what's Korean baseball doing tonight? Well, we used to work with somebody who lived with a house full of, he had a wife and I think it was all girls in his house. And so they had to watch American Idol every Tuesday night or whenever the you fuck. Gamble that on that? You would gamble on American Idol, yes. No, this really is bigger than I think. And I also realized with some of my buddies, not to mention any names, Trampy, um, that Honig. they actually have a pretty good handle on it, you know. Um, but we were talking the other day with another buddy in their group they have, and they had what how much was it? I forgot. Was it 60, 80 K up on stuff or in on stuff? That's a lot of money, man. Even if it's a group. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't get it. Yeah. I mean, go buy a bunch of T bills, man. I, so I, that's, what, that's what I was thinking. Cause I have just recently talked to somebody who's talking about an investment group and it's like, we pull our money and then, they're talking about doing it in the stock market, which does does not appeal to me at all. But like what you do, like finding a company that's really smart about acquiring properties and developing those properties and eventually turning them around, like those sorts of things. If you get a group together that can put the necessary money forward that uh, then turns into a really smart investment that might hit in a year, or two years or whatever the uh, the projected timeline is. Like, I think that does make a lot of sense, but to do it on gambling on sports, you can do it in like an office pool for the lottery. Although the lottery is gambling for people who are really bad at math. So there are yeah. people hundred dollar pots and they'll have like a thousand dollars worth of tickets that they buy for this $2 billion lottery. Whose drawing comes up tonight or tomorrow. Like I, I do kind of understand that, but I also see that as a pretty big waste of money, but that's like my Rangers bet. It's like, all right, here's a hundred bucks. I'm not expecting to get this money back, but if it in the small chance that it happens to hit, boy, that would be pretty freaking awesome. Yeah. Funny thing about the lotto is the people that play the lotto or that could that it's okay to play the lotto shouldn't play the lotto because you can invest, you have enough money to invest somewhere else. And the people that do play the lotto because of the hope don't have enough money and maybe month to month to where they should not be spending even 20 bucks on that, yeah. considering the percentages, you know. Sure. Um, but I mean, they, they, but it also gets back to the government, you know, throwing that out there and, and kind of taking advantage of the most desperate people. Yeah. And the hope is, is that the money that is being earmarked, bookmarked for the public education system, which oftentimes is what uh, state lotteries are supposed to be funding is actually going into the school systems and, and right. being spent wisely too, by the way. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got to trust the politicians at that point. Right. So, yep. Good luck with that. Um, so, uh, Rodney Terry now comes the most important part of the job. I would argue for any college basketball coach is yeah. it's the off season, the season of roster management. And he is likely going to be losing four of, is eight rotation players this offseason. He's going to be losing to Sue, Ace Miss, Brock Cunningham, who did his no himself no favors on his way out with that stupid foul against Tennessee. Which I, I didn't remember. see it, man. I actually ended up watching probably 10 minutes, which and not because I don't care about the team. I just was was busy with shit and distracted. But I so did he slam a guy down? Yeah, he just like grabbed him and threw him to the ground. It was completely unnecessary. He got another flagrant one for it. Tennessee hits two free throws. They hit a three-pointer after that. It's not – butterfly effect keeps things from happening like they would have had the play not happened, but Texas lost by four. So you're talking about a close game like that where the, you don't have those two free throws and that becomes a different shot for Ace Miss or somebody else, then maybe he's not hoisting that ill-advised three from close to the baseline. I did see that, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so that that was unfortunate. But Cunningham's gone. It Horton is gone. So they potentially return Dylan Mitchell, 
Tyrese Hunter, uh, Caden Shedrick. Dude, and- Mitchell's a first round pick. What are you talking? He's a lottery pick, bro. Mm-hmm. Did you watch his game this year? Like, yeah. wh- where's your basketball eye, right? Exactly. Kendall Weaver is the other guy. It's potential. And so the question becomes. I mean, Dylan, Dylan Mitchell, his only other option is to go to another college program, but do Dylan Mitchell and Tyrese Hunter come back? And do you want both of those guys back? I think the consensus right now amongst most is that you do want Dylan Mitchell back. Yeah. It seems to be somewhat split on Tyrese Hunter. I know what Tyrese Hunter is capable of, but I've also seen a guy who has just been wildly inconsistent over these last two years as his passive personality has led to other guys being the primary ball handler. So I think if Tyrese Hunter were to come back next season, it's hopefully in more of a role like what we saw him in at Iowa State his freshman year, where he led that team to a Sweet 16, where he is the main guy with the ball in his hands. He's distributing, he's scoring, he's still a really good defender, and uh, this, this team finally gets the benefit from him playing consistently from game to game. But if that's going to be a problem for Terry or Terry wants to bring in another point guard and split duties, he should probably encourage Tyrese Hunter to go find a situation that does fit that scenario that I just painted. Yeah, it's uh, well painted. I would say it depends on who's coming in and also where your cash flow is. Like, I mean, what, how much money do you have in NIL and what possibly could you bring in? But I mean, I'd like that both back. Yeah. For consistency alone to where you just don't have that in college basketball. And people have asked me, they're like, so you just think because the top 20, 30 guys over a four year period aren't there, that it bothers it that much? Like you forget what basketball is. There's a chemistry. Watch guys that have played together for six months and watch guys that have played together for four years. It's like, dude, how'd you know the backup, dude? Because I played with this motherfucker and 9,000 pickup games and a million games over the four years. I I know what he's going to do. And by the way, the sport for as bad as it is still recognizes its best players. Look at the All-American teams from this year. The top three teams are littered with juniors and seniors. There are a few guys who are underclassmen. I think only one or two freshmen. Everybody else is in that third, fourth, or even fifth year in some cases. Yeah, I still I didn't wouldn't, wouldn't watch and it's amazing how much I didn't watch of this. And it wasn't, it was just busy. It wasn't even like, you know, screw college basketball, but I just did not watch a bunch. I mean, I watched probably more than I'm thinking, but um, Jay Wright, I saw on Twitter, was talking about Kentucky and their loss, which I didn't watch a second of that Oakland game. Um, and just saying, you know, college basketball's turned to a different spot now. And you can have guys who will be much better NBA players, but you're not going to win a ton of tournament games when you're facing grown ass men, but it's more the chemistry of those guys playing together. And that's why I think it's impressive. What Houston's done is they can add people and you add a, um, what's the guy? There's a guy from Baylor. They've added the guard, um, you know, to go with Shed and guys that have played together for a little bit. And, you know, it looks like the chemistry is there. And, um, you know, I mean, there basketball is art. It, it's, it's creative. It is, you know, it's hard to pinpoint exactly how everything adds up and gives you the sum of the parts being as good or better than, than what the individual parts are. But I think we're seeing basketball since, 98 you'd probably go early 2000s on say that last part again you kind of cut out there for a second on that last sentence i think we're kind of seeing how important chemistry is and oh, just I, see. Yeah. I mean it's the ten thousand hour rule with the beatles yeah. you know i mean to where it, you just sound different and look different in that sport especially when you've been playing together i mean i can be the shortstop for you know if i'm a good one for a pitcher who just came in Blake Snell just comes in or Dylan sees for the Padres and yeah, you know, he can pitch well and I can feel well. And then I go up to bat and it's nothing to do with Blake Snell. So they, they, that's where chemistry to me is the only other thing that's close to it is an offensive line. Hmm. Yeah. Even having a full season in basketball under your belt with the same guys is huge. Like last year's Texas team, they played together. Most of them that first year with Chris Beard. 
And so that next year, and this is part of the reason why Chris Beard has been so effective at building rosters going back to his time in Texas Tech is that he is plugging guys in versus making wholesale changes. Now, he had to make wholesale changes when he came into Texas, but he also needed to get guys that fit his system offensively and defensively. They played right. that first full year together. That next year, it's still that core group of guys while adding Tyrese Hunter and Dylan Mitchell, who was perfect as a role guy on that 22-23 team. And unfortunately, as Dylan Mitchell, as the lights got brighter for him and he needed to be more of a dude on this year's squad, which he showed signs of starting to get it early in the season. He but did, once Dylan Mitchell came back, all of a sudden, he just he didn't re just revert to the mean. He regressed in a lot of ways to where you just wondered if he had just woken up from a nap right before the game started. He was so out of it at the starts of games, and as a result, rendered pretty useless slash ineffective throughout the course of those 40 minutes. He did, but compared to, and I'm not talking about alley-oops and, and rim-hopping and blocking shots, which I understand that is his, his potential. One of my issues with first-round picks in the NBA now is that you can put this up for two years and be a first round pick that he did flash more this year with some offensive game, you know, a little jump hook, lefty jump hook. It was not consistent at all, but it really goes to show you his freshman year. There was nothing. There. I mean, people after his freshman year, legitimate basketball people were like, yeah, you should go like, go where <laughs> go to, go to a park and play pickup every day. Um, and the people say that about Greg Brown. Greg, they're like Greg Brown just needs to get the NBA clock going. He just needs to get in the system, and he's gonna he's gonna thrive. I'm like, no, he's not. I've no. watched this guy as a fucking true freshman in college. He's not anywhere close to even being an average college player. And I love how people turn that around because we're talking about the betterment of the sport, and they'll be like, yeah, but he's gonna get his coin. That's not the conversation here, bro. Yeah. Um, you know that that's not the conversation. And if, if that's your reasoning, just say that. And I'd be like, all right, I get it. Um, but yeah, Greg Brown was like that. I don't know if you saw, though, that with Ron Holland, at least, it'll be good. Or Trey Johnson. Holland was the other one. Yeah. That they, they're going to cut out the Ignite team. Yeah, I'm glad that that's not going to be an issue. Unfortunately, Ron Holland, this isn't his fault necessarily. I think he either hurt an ankle or foot and he's out for the year. So. <laughs> Uh, we'll see how that affects his draft stock. The other kid. Probably, who, probably not much. <laughs> no, you're right. Because he, he, you haven't seen the skill disproven or the potential disproven, let's say. And AJ Johnson went and played professionally in Australia. So I'm not sure what his status is going to be heading into the NBA draft this summer either. But it'll be good for Texas to get Trey Johnson in this summer and i forget who the other guy is apparently terry has a it's a smaller but still a, a pretty pretty decent recruiting class and there were guys on the roster that this year who didn't really play all that much that uh, people are really high on but i don't know i take all these things with a grain of salt at this point because unfortunately and just watching this roster develop or not develop over these last few years i feel like we have more cases of guys who don't seem like they're getting better like they need to with Rodney Terry in charge and his assistants beneath him that, trying to help out with the overall development. That's fair. And I worried the same thing about Beard for the five months he was here and previously. Yeah. But here's my, here's my comparison. See what you think about this compared to the NFL and how they draft and with college football and give it time. But also if there is an injury, I mean, Michael Pinnock should be a first round pick. He may not be. Like, I think my my projection is a gamble there. Um, that he'd probably be an early second. I think they're going to move up. But what he showed on the field the last two years, I mean, hell, he'd be, you know, super high in the NBA. It's the same as, as, and I thought you did this well with Justine. She did it with you. But my friends that are in happy marriages that have lasted, not all of them, um, took time to vet stuff. And there was a lot of dating. There was a lot of figuring out who you are. How do you react in these situations? As opposed to someone that's like, hey, we're engaged. You're engaged. You met four months ago. It's like, dude, she's the, she's the best. And they're almost going off potential or hope of, of the little they've seen and projecting that she's going to be the best mom, wife, you name it.
without any real tangible evidence where the NFL is more the friends I've had or me, which I ended up not getting married because I'm like, fuck, I'm passing on Greg Brown. You fucking get me a saw for three years at UT, not three months. Yeah. And by the way, oftentimes that's as simple as age, funny enough, and the marriage and sports analogies where you're talking about a 19 year old kid who suddenly becomes a millionaire and still hasn't really even figured out the basketball thing to the degree that he needs to, to be a good professional versus a guy who has been in college for three years and the maturity that that requires of learning how to be not just a better college athlete, but a college student also. And some of the lessons that can come with that. And then you're more physically, mentally, and probably emotionally mature too by the time you are able to be drafted by the NFL. I mean, I'm sure you forgot the interview and even playing it, but the Evan Turner interview you gave, um, like that was a great example. He's like, I wasn't ready. He's like, you would have been tough. I think. I'm sure he got a lot of shit from people around him. Like, dude, you got to go. You got to go, which is my biggest thing. I'm not telling you, you don't have to go. And if you go, just tell me it's about money and whatever. We're good. Um, I totally get that. But it turned around 2000. Really late 90s. I mean, Kenny Anderson, 91 is the one. But really 2000, 2001, two around there where it was, or ah, fuck, I forget. I stopped caring in, in 98. Um, but it was, you got to go. You, he's got to go. He's got to go. Why does he have to go? Like, if his family's not in distress right now, and he wants another year of college, or to do what Evan did, and Evan came from a really rough background, which he talked about. His family probably did fucking need that money at that point. Um, but if it's better for you and long term, then don't force someone and tell them they have to go. You know, be like, hey, man, we're laying it out for you and you could rip up your knee and, you know, there's a lot of money on the table. And so. But that's coming from all types of people, whether it's your money person, your agent, could be family, could be friends. And that's why people like Evan just blow me away that they were so mature. And I have no, no idea where Evan's family was at that point, but he did talk about it in the interview that it's like, dude, I had like 50 cents in my pocket when I got on the bus. You know, um, hell, most of us would like to have that type of money at that age. I don't care where your family's from. But um, the fact that he was that mature, just don't don't hold a gun to these guys' heads or give them such it has to be this way advice when it doesn't have to be that way, especially with NIL now. And that's where I think NIL can help college basketball out where it's like, you know what, bro? Like, do you know how many, you know, college sophomores or juniors are going to make 500K and get a free education? And you can build connections around here and grow up a little bit more at 19 before you get into this, you know, used to be a grown man league, whatever the NBA is now. But flying place to place, managing that money, that's a fucking, that is grown ass stuff. And, and that's where the Evan Turners, you know, I think really benefited. And it may not work for everyone, but it, it, that doesn't mean the other side works for everyone either. Sorry to distract here, but when did you talk to Evan Turner and how can I hear this interview? Um, I talked to him. Oh, we were at a strip club around here. What is it? Yeah, I'm good on strip clubs. Yellow Rose. Oh, uh, Fluckers? Fluckers? Uh, is that the strip club? Yeah, we're eating wings and I was bidding on it on my phone. So the <laughs> audio wasn't good. You've seen that or heard <laughs> that or kind of heard that. And, uh, yeah, no, it's good stuff, man. I think you'll like it. I was wearing a Walter Payton shirt, too. Oh, cool. Uh, remind me, Wal Walter Payton, uh, offensive lineman for the Philadelphia Eagles in the 1970s? I don't remember where he played or what he did, but I do remember he was one of the best guests on Butterfly in the Sky. I can fly twice as high. If it's in a book, take a look at Reading Rainbow. Where'd you get that shirt, by the way? <laughs> uh, I just bought it online. I think it's, yeah, homage. Oh, that okay. might be it. Home field 
there's a great t-shirt company that they they've got me with their advertising on social media because they've got a couple cool looking shirts and i bought a few including this re reading rainbow show by the way i need to play this on the way out i'm not going to play the vince young well quickly quickly let me say that like how many dudes in your hipster coffee shops come up to you and hit on you or how many like lesbians like grab your wrist and they're like i feel you with what the reading rainbow shirt the rainbow oh uh no it hasn't happened yet all right well i'm putting some bets on it oh really oh uh, yeah because I'm, gonna, we, I'm gonna parlay it we all stereotype these things you can't say gay anymore and just mean happy it's got to mean something more now you can't just be well, wearing i didn't mean that just the rainbow the rainbow's the signal for for gay people which it's is also the signal for reading rainbow it's also sure. also the old school signal for the university of hawaii fighting rainbows Yes, sir. Timmy Chang, shout out. It's also the path that you fat, uh, follow to get to the pot of gold that the leprechauns have been hiding. Hey, That's I need to play this on the way out. Racist. So I'll say, I'll, I will say goodbye to you now. We talk way too much fucking sports today, by the way. I, I promise less of that on Thursday, but. <laughs> how, how dare we? <laughs> this is apparently DMX dubbing into the Reading Rainbow theme song. From back when DMX was still alive. So CD sent this. Yeah, we're gonna play this on the way out. I've never seen this before. So I, gotta, I, got, I love both. So I can't wait to hear this. Yeah, exactly. So we're gonna do this on the way out. Thank you to everybody for watching and listening today. Subscribe, download the free app, all that good stuff. And now here is DMX with a reading rainbow cover. Oh, come on. Go show, show. Butterfly in the sky. Come on! I can go twice as high. Let's get it on. Take a look. Nigga. In a book. My nigga. Reading rain. All right. All right. I'm sorry. I did not realize that that was a part of the reading rainbow. <laughs> like, I fucking love DMX, but I also was thinking, I was going to ask you, like, that was like my two worlds colliding. So we had to watch in school Reading Rainbow. And oh, Lamar Burton was awesome. I mean, hell, I gave you that song. When the last time I thought that song, I mean, heard it or thought about it, was 25, 30 years ago, maybe as we're kidding around about it in our early 20s or whatever. But I also love DMX, different part of my life. And I was like, bro, there's no way there's not some in bombs or some C bombs or some whatever bombs. I didn't think there would be in bombs. I thought there might be cussing. I thought we would would have would have <laughs> that got that quickly with the reading rainbow. <laughs> that was uh yeah, that's that's the perfect way to end today's show. All right, we're done now officially. Okay. Oh,